My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of Some Enchanted Car Hop. It was just an ordinary drive-in hamburger joint on Vermont off Sunset, but they called it Hamburger Heaven. And just to carry out the idea, they'd hired six angels to wait on cars. Three blondes, a redhead, and two brunettes. I was lucky. I drew the redhead. Only she didn't serve up what I ordered. All she brought me was trouble. The whole thing started when there were only eight more shopping days until Christmas. I fought my way through the necktie and socks set, and by the time I reached the office, I was ready to start celebrating New Year's. But my boss, the lion, had other ideas. When I walked in, all 280 pounds of him was up on an office stool. He was tacking a dried-up sprig of mistletoe over the door. Jeffrey! Jeffrey, my boy, come in, come in. The festive season is at hand. How's that again? I said the festive season is at hand. I'm filled overflowing with the Yuletide spirit. Yeah? Well, you better take those nails out of your teeth before you spring a leak. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right, my boy. I got carried away. Yeah, sure. You and Tiny Tim. We're, uh, expecting women clients? Uh, women clients? Oh, oh, you mean the mistletoe. Well, Jeffrey, you never can tell when a sweet young thing might accidentally happen in... Stop drooling, Fatso. You dropped out of the mistletoe set 50 pounds ago. Well, maybe so. But I still believe in Santa Claus. Now, where was I? You were up on the stool with berries in your hair. No, no, I mean about the new client. What have I told you so far? That the festive season is at hand? Huh? Oh, oh, then I haven't told you about our new client. His name is Ward Hamilton, Jeffrey. He was in just a few minutes ago. Fine figure of a man. Well-dressed, distinguished, and prosperous. That explains the Christmas spirit. How much? Jeffrey, the Christmas spirit cannot be measured in terms of money. This is the time of goodwill toward men of unselfish devotion. Sure. How much unselfish devotion did he buy? Fifty dollars worth. It's something about his niece uh, or daughter or some friend or something. What about them? Well, it seems this girl's been receiving packages, uh, flowers, candy, that sort of thing. Well, what's so mysterious about that? Doesn't she know it's Christmas? Well, for some reason or other, Ward Hamilton says she's worried about them. Uh, he'll tell you all about it when you see him. The address is on the desk. It's out on Iredell Road in North Hollywood. So I find the Santa Claus that's been sending the packages. Say... That's right. This case does fit right in with the season, doesn't it? Sure. And Merry Christmas to you, too, fatso. That started it. I hopped in my sleigh and headed my reindeer out over Coenga Pass. Ira Del Road was twin rows of California bungalows with Christmas decorations strung out in front. All except one house. It was the address Lion had given me. Redwood front on the usual cream-colored stucco. White ranch-type fence, swimming pool in the backyard. No Christmas anywhere. Behind the fence, a big Dalmatian wagged his tail and grinned at me in a nice, friendly sort of way. Only he was growling when he did it. I circled wide and made the porch, but I didn't get as far as the doorbell. What do you want? Mr. Hamilton? I'm Regan, international. Regan? Oh, yes, the detective. Come in, Mr. Regan, come in. He was big and gray-haired, the man of distinction. But what he had in his hand wasn't a glass. It was a whip, black, ten feet long, with lead weights at the tip. In here. I appreciate you coming right out, Mr. Regan. I'd like to get prompt action. Is that what you use that for? Well, oh, the whip. No, no. No, just a hobby of mine. I practice hitting toy ducks floating at the swimming pool. Well, nice way to get use out of your pool during the winter season. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, Never mind that. Uh, sit down, Mr. Regan. I want to tell you about Mary. That's the niece. Niece? No. No relation. I'm a close friend of her family's. Her parents died several years ago. There was no one else, so I've tried to take over the reins and help the girl along. It hasn't been easy. She isn't broken to harness. Mm, it's a nice metaphor, but it doesn't fit. Not at all. 
Mary Winter is a strange girl. Very strange. She's the shy, retiring type. Ah, I see. The detective training. You're thinking ahead, assuming that she's not attractive to men. Nothing could be further from the truth. She's a lovely girl. Very lovely. Auburn hair, green eyes, fine, firm, youthful figure. Desirable is the word, Mr. Regan. Desirable. Uh, you understand what I mean. You make it pretty clear. So, um, that brings us to the anonymous packages. For almost six weeks, someone has been sending Mary gifts, almost every day. Flowers, candy, novelties, that sort of thing. No name, no indication where they come from. Mary has no idea either? No. But she's reacted them to them badly. They're making her nervous, upset. There's something I can't afford to have happen. Come again? Uh, Mr. Regan... I can observe that there's little use in trying to keep anything back from you. My interest in the package matter is because of money. Now the story begins to make sense. Mary is strange. Perhaps I should have said peculiar. Her aversion to men is almost... Well, I've been sending her to a Mr. Farthing, a human relations counselor. A psychologist? Uh, Something like that. And it costs money? Yes, it costs money. The more delay in cure, the more it costs. Frankly, Mr. Regan, I'm tired of the obligation. She worked... Yes. Uh, she works at one of those drive-in stands, car hop. Something wrong with that? The place is called Hamburger Heaven, Mr. Regan. And you want me to find the guy who sends the packages so he'll marry her, or so you can get rid of him? It works the same either way. <laughs> uh, you'll take the job, Mr. Regan? Sure. I'll find your guy. Maybe he'll look good under your Christmas tree. Ward Hamilton gave me the girl's address in Hollywood. It was a tired stucco four flat just off Kingsley, the home of Mary Winter, the girl who hated men. And then it was too easy. Standing out front near the curb was a little man in a trench coat. He carried an umbrella over his arm and he paced up and down watching the apartment. That was too good a bet to pass up. You going somewhere? I, I beg your pardon? Someone you know lives in there? Why? Why, that's none of your business, sir. The name of the friend wouldn't be Mary Winter. Get out of my way. That's what I thought. Hold it. Let go of my arm. Let go, I say. Why are you watching Mary Winter's apartment? I warned you. Let go. Let go. Answer me. Very well. I'll answer you. The umbrella in his hand came down on my wrist, and he broke for the corner. By the time I turned, he was out of sight. On the ground, broken, was the little man's umbrella. I picked it up. Real break. Name engraved on the handle. In nice big gold letters, it said, Smith. I headed for Mary Winter's apartment. I knocked, and nothing happened. Knocked again. The radio in the room told me somebody was in and liked their music loud. I tried the door, and it worked. I stuck my head in to look around. A redhead came in from another room in slacks and hauled her. She saw me. She dived for the closet and came out wearing a coat. Then she snapped off the radio. Get out of here! Look, I tried knocking, but... Get out before I call the police! The name's Regan. Ward Hamilton sent me. You're... you're lying. You're trying to trick me! Phone him, he'll tell you. What... what what, what do you want? About the presents you've been getting. Tell me. I... I... I'm not sure... I can't trust you. Well, look, for the last time, I'm supposed to find out who's sending them. Either you help or you don't. Now, take your choice. All right. I'll listen. But don't you come a step closer. I sat down one corner of the room. Redhead, other corner. She was tall, graceful, beautiful. Everything a guy could want. Except for the look in her eyes. Scared. Hunted. I waited for her to start it. They began several weeks ago. The presents. I... I don't know who is sending them or why, but I... Any I, card? Identification? No, nothing. You sure? You think I'd accept gifts from a stranger? Well, take it easy. Nobody said that. What did Farthing tell you? Farthing? This human relations council you go to. Oh, you know about that? Yeah, I know about that. What did he say? That... That I shouldn't worry... That I, I should find out. That all? Oh, you don't understand. You're like all of them. Get out of Wait, here. Wait, one question. 
You know a little guy about 30 carries an umbrella, wears a trench coat, shy? No, no. Are you sure? Think. A little guy. No. No, I don't know him. I've never met him in my life. Now, get out! I left the redhead sobbing softly to herself. Maybe a lot of flowers and candy would be kind of nice to a lot of people during Christmas, but not to Mary Winter. She was mixed up, inside and out. I headed back to my car, and then I was mixed up. It had looked easy until I got to my car. That's when I got complications. A big complication. Fat 40 with a gun. Get in, Shamus. Now what? Your choice, Shamus. Like what? The winter dame, uh-uh. Your property? Not my type. Belong to the boss? Question, Shamus, uh-uh. Beat it, will you? I'm not through with you. Okay, get through. Stay away from Mary Winter or you get trouble. Real bad trouble. Any questions now, Shamus? Yeah. Who pays you? You shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> it looked like it was going to be a real holiday season. Brotherly love all over the place. The next stop was a man named Mr. Farthing. Only the sign on the door said John J. Farthing, human relations counselor. It was a plush layout. Waiting room the size of a box top. Rich, solid. Lined with deep green leather chairs, brass studs. On the wall, Van Gogh, Gauguin, that kind of stuff. The receptionist was out, and I took a crack at the thick mahogany door. Yes, come in, please. What may I do for you, sir? The name's Regan, international detective. Oh, sit down, Mr. Regan. Now, is something troubling you? Girl named Winter, Mary Winter. Go on, Mr. Regan. She's a patient of yours? Why do you ask? A couple of questions about him. I see. Since you know her background, I thought you could fill me in on a few things. I said since... I heard you, Mr. Regan. Well? Perhaps, sir, you're aware of the nature of my work. Since I assume you're an intelligent man, I don't believe it's necessary to be much more explicit than that. Try it for size. Very well. Cigarette, Mr. Regan? Thanks. There is in existence a code of ethics. Some practitioners call it the Hippocratic Oath. I'm not a doctor, as you know, yet I too, Mr. Regan, have a moral code. I'm listening. Nothing in my code, either morally, ethically, or in any other way, allows me to discuss the affairs of my patients. Is that clear? Yeah, that's clear. I'm sorry I can't assist you in whatever it is you're trying to do, Mr. Regan. I'd like to help, but as you see, my hands are tied. That makes two of us. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mr. Farthing, gray suit, ivory cigarette holder, and gold cufflinks stood up and shook hands solemnly. I left. He'd given me nothing. And there was only one thing wrong with that. Mr. Farthing was right. I decided to check in with my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. The International Detective Agency, Anthony... Save Smith. it for the customers, Fatso. Jeffrey, where have you been? Look, I just started this business two hours ago. What's eating you? Just this. I have here in my office with me a young man. He has an interesting story, Jeffrey. It seems he's been sending gifts to one Mary Winter. What? That's correct, Regan, the man you're supposed to be looking for. Well, don't just stand there. Get over here at once. This young man can't wait all day for lazy detectives. And besides, he needs help. He needs help? Yeah, that's right, Jeffrey. The man you were supposed to find. His life's in danger. <laughs> This is CBS, and you're listening to Jeff Regan, investigator, and tonight's adventure, Some Enchanted Car Hop. It started when a guy named Ward Hamilton hired the lion and me to find out who was sending packages to a car hop named Mary Winter. 
I met a little guy with an umbrella and a big guy with a gun. And a human relations counselor who called himself Mr. Farthing. Then I phoned my boss, Anthony J. Lyon, and found the mysterious Santa Claus who'd been sending the girl gifts had walked right into our office. When I got there, I found the lion sitting with his fingertips touching as he talked to the man across the desk from him. Like I guessed, it was the same guy I'd seen outside Mary Winter's apartment. The little guy. Thirty, trench coat, and nervous. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, come in, come in. I want you to meet our new client, Mr. Smith. Mr. Ernest Smith, he's in trouble. Uh, well, if he isn't, do? he should be. Jeffrey, what on earth do you mean? I found your Mr. Smith outside the girl's apartment. He wasn't looking for frost on those windows. Oh, oh no, 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 Mr. Regan, that, that, that's... Uh, yeah, what Mr. Smith is trying to say, Jeffrey, is that that's not true. Mr. Smith is in real trouble. You sell it to him? Jeffrey, how can you say such a thing? Mr. Smith feels his life is in danger, hence he has retained us to act in his behalf. That's true, Mr. Regan. I'll admit I sent the gifts to Miss Winter. I didn't realize, I didn't Get know... Get to the point. Now, now I'm afraid... Since I saw you this afternoon, someone's following me. Fat guy, big coat. Yes. I came here for help. Someone doesn't like my sending the gifts. Well, that's real bright. Well, you can start with Mary Winter. She doesn't like them, Mr. Regan? Then there's a guy named Hamilton. She, She's married? We call him a guardian, family friend. Oh. Finish your story. I, I like Miss Winter. I... I wanted to do something for her. So you've been sending her anonymous presents for almost six weeks. Isn't that carrying the Christmas spirit too far? Well, uh, well, I, I like her. That's not abnormal, is it, Mr. Regan? Yeah, of course not, Mr. Smith. You keep out of this, fat yeah, But, Jeffrey, our client... We got another client named Hamilton, remember? Besides, you haven't met the girl. Neither have I. What? I've never met Mary Winter. Is that... Abnormal, Mr. Regan? Oh, dear. Uh, dear, perhaps I'm sicker than Mr. Farthing told me. Say that again? Uh, Mr. Farthing, my human relations counselor, he takes care of me. Now, wait a minute. Maybe this is going to add up. You've never met Mary Winter? No. No, but you've seen her. You've seen her in the waiting room of Farthing's office. Why, Mr. Regan, how on earth did you guess? That's exactly it. She was reading a copy of Reader's Digest, and I was reading an old National Geographic. It was a fall... Never day. mind. Well, Lan, I think that wraps that up. Hey, Jeffrey, what do you mean? Mary Winter is afraid of unknown guy sending packages. Unknown guy turns out to be Smith. Take Smith to Mary, show her he's harmless. Collect our feet. Yeah, yeah, but, Jeffrey, what about Mr. Smith? What about the man who's following him? Maybe he just imagined it. Come on, Smith. We're going to visit a redhead. <laughs> The lion didn't believe Smith imagined it any more than I did. But he only sputtered, and I loaded Smith into the car and headed out to Mary Winter's apartment. It looked simple. Then, like a glass of mild eggnog. What I didn't know was that somebody had slipped me a zombie. It was turning dark when we pulled up in front of the place. Smith stayed at my heels like a sheepdog. I knocked. This time, she opened the door. Oh, Mr. Regan. What are you doing here? Brought your Christmas present. Only this one's harmless. Oh, no. Take no. it easy, sweetheart. Just a guy named Smith. You might even like him. No, no, please go away. Please go away. <laughs> Smith and I walked on in, and Mary backed into a chair in the far corner of the room. She and Smith looked at each other and didn't say anything, so I waited for the sparks to die out of her eyes. But they didn't. There was something else on her mind. This... This is the man who sent the packages. You guessed it. Smith, Mary Winter. Mary Winter, Smith. Get him out of here! Huh? I said get him out of here before before he kills me! Oh, no! Sit down. Now, just a minute, lady. He won't hurt anybody. Just take it that's, easy, will you? To take quiet. That's what you're... Oh, thinking. no, no. I'm Now, listen, hurt. sweetheart. Wait a minute. It's Christmas. You've heard of that, I think, haven't you? People send presents to each other because it makes them feel good. Now, Smith sent you presents for the same reason. He's going to kill me. You're like he is. Trying to trap me. Oh, that does it. All right. Look at this. What, a card? It came in a box of flowers. It was delivered here to my apartment tonight. Each man kills the thing he loves. Well, Regan, try and explain that. Try and... Shut up. I... Did you send this, Smith? No, no, Mr. Regan. I didn't send it. I, I sent flowers and candy and nice things. Mr. Regan, at the window! I left them with their mouths open and ran for the hall and then outside... 
The girl may have had an overworked imagination, but her mind didn't knock over that garbage can. It was dark and peaceful and still outside. Me and a half moon and nobody else. And then I saw him, thick set, crouched, moving away from the window. I dove after him. We went down together as his hand came out of his pocket. The heavy gray 45 got itself in my direction, and I grabbed at the wrist behind him. The gun fell into the rose bush, but he got to his feet. I warned you once, Shamus. Stay away from that girl. Who said so? Never mind. I'll get off the chase now before it's too late. It'll only mean to go. Were you going to say... Trouble? The big guy was 200 pounds of unconscious as I bent over him. A heavy camel hair coat was wrapped around him. The same guy I'd seen before. I unbuttoned the coat, figuring some identification might help, only when it came open, I didn't need any more. He was wearing a tailored starch jacket. It wasn't the kind you see every day. It was white. That gave me the lead I needed, and I headed fast for my car. Ten minutes later, I stopped at a drugstore on my way out to the valley. I phoned the lion and told him to check on farthing. Then I headed the car out Coenga. The pass was crowded with home-from-work traffic. It took me 25 minutes to make Ira Del Road and the home of Ward Hamilton. This time, the Dalmatian was out for the night. But Ward Hamilton wasn't. He opened the door. Well, well, Mr. Regan, come in. You work late. Our time clock's out of order. Oh, perhaps you'd like one for Christmas. No, thanks. Wouldn't fit in my sock. <laughs> well, Mr. Regan, I take it by this visit that you have good news for me. You call it that. You know who's been sending the girl those gifts? A guy named Smith. Uh, how's that again? Smith, Ernest Smith. His birth certificate says. I'm afraid I've never heard of him, Mr. Regan. He saw Mary in the waiting room of Farthing's office. Never met her. Shy little guy. Well, now isn't that something... Well, I must say, Mr. Regan, you did a remarkably fast job. There's something else you ought to know, Hamilton. Chances are Farthing's a phony. Mr. Farthing? Looks like. Why, it, it seems absurd. Just thought I'd let you know. Want me to go on with the case? Mm, what do you mean, Mr. Regan? I found your guy, Smith. That's what you hired me for. And when I get to Farthing, he'll sing like a prima donna. He'll sing? Talk. Well, then keep going. Okay, Hamilton. It's your money. It's your life, Mr. Regan. Be careful. I made a fast phone call to the lion on my way back into town. And that tied it up. Farthing was working late when I got there, only when he looked up and saw me, he wasn't happy. What do you want? Conversation. A lot of it. Mr. Regan... I must ask why you've come to my office at this hour. I told you, for conversation. Then I may regard this whole thing as a sort of joke? Maybe. Only the laughs you'll get wouldn't get by even on television. I demand an explanation of your attitude. Fair enough. Start with your name. Not Farthing, it's Farnham. Howard Farnham. Hmm? You want more? Uh, where did you get that? I had a phone conversation with my boss. He's got ways of getting things. Like your record... Five arrest bunco, one arrest forgery, one arrest fraud. No conviction. You were lucky. Maybe you won't be this time. You haven't got anything on me, Regan? How about blackmail? Not a chance. Maybe not yet. Only you were getting set for a job. I believe the guy's name was Hamilton. You can't prove it. Well, it was your mug, the big guy in the white jacket. He meant business. Does he do your legwork? Uh, listen, Regan, you can't pin blackmail on me. Sure, maybe I had ideas, but I don't claim I'm a doctor. I don't hand out any pills. Just advice, Regan. That's all. Just advice. That's too bad. You know, there are a lot of people that take phonies like you seriously, Farnham. A lot of people that could use advice. Real advice. Mine's real. They say, uh, should I marry him? And I say, yes or no, depending... On how much there is in it for you. What do you want from me, Regan? Who paid you to put the bee on Mary Winter? Never mind, Farthing. You won't have to answer that. Come on in, Hamilton. I've been waiting for you. You're bragging, Mr. Regan. It made sense if I could get you to join Farthing and me. You might have something to say. You're showing up. Check my story. What story? Like this. man named Hamilton's supposed to look out for a young redhead named Mary Winter. Only Hamilton takes one look at this number and suddenly he's not fatherly anymore. He decides to move in for himself. It's absurd. Is it? You convinced the girl she couldn't trust any man in the world but you. 
Should have been the other way around. You're the one she couldn't trust. Isn't that right, Farthing? Leave me out of this, Regan. I run a legitimate business. Leave you out? Well, that wouldn't be fair. You were the guy Hamilton came to with money. He paid you to tell Mary Winter who's the man for her. Am I right, Farthing? You're lying, Regan. No, no, I'm not. Everything worked fine until along came a nice, shy little guy with an umbrella, Mr. Smith. Met Mary in Farthing's waiting room, starting sending her presents. You know, that must have really stopped you, Hamilton, trying to figure out who was cutting in on your Romeo act. Regan, I've had enough out of you. I thought you were getting nosy. You hired me to find the guy, and I did. End of story. Except if anybody should happen to tell Mary Winter what kind of a guy you really are, Hamilton, you might suddenly find yourself out of a lifetime career. You'll never tell her, Regan. I'll see to that. Forget one item. For a last touch, you send Mary a threatening note. Really put the pressure on. You're washed up, Hamilton. This revolver says I'm not, Mr. Regan. Well, then, come over here, out of the way. We're going to take care of Mr. Regan. Self-defense, not a chance with Farthing's record. Am I right, Farnham? Do as I say, Farthing. Go ahead, Farnham, go ahead. Murder will look good on your list. I... I won't play ball, Hamilton. I told the girl what you wanted, but I'm not in this. It's your fight. I can make it yours. Don't try it. I am as good with this gun, gentlemen, as I am with a whip. Farnham, watch out. <laughs> Farnham ducked as I hit Hamilton's wrist. The bullet buried itself in the desktop and the gun hit the floor. I got the gun as Hamilton moved in fast. Only what he got for his trouble was the barrel across his head. <laughs> Farnham crawled up to his chair, sat down, puffing. I let him catch his breath. When I waved the gun in his direction, he didn't mind phoning the police. The heavy guy in the white jacket showed up bright and early for work the next morning, and the cop greeted him with a pair of handcuffs. He got off with assault and battery, and Farnham, alias Farthing, made the blotter for a light charge. Hamilton wasn't that lucky. His read assault with intent to kill. It was noon when I got to the lion's office. He was admiring the Christmas tree stuck in the corner. And from the sounds that came out of his mouth, it looked like his holiday fever was becoming serious. Noel, 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 Noel. Bone is the king of... Oh, hello, Jeffrey. They're looking for a replacement for Vaughn Monroe? Jeffrey, how unkind. It's the season for songs. Sunday is Christmas, my boy. And today is payday. Uh, <coughs> so it is. Hmm. Well, perhaps I could manage a small token, a, a sign of my gratitude. Thanks. Yeah, by the way, uh, what about Mary Winter, the car hop? How is the girl, Jeffrey? Oh, I left her with Smith last night when I went after Farthing's mug. Jeffrey, you didn't? Alone together? And that girl hating all men and that boy shy backwards? Jeffrey, how could you? How cruel. It's too late now, Lion. Maybe we'll read about it in the afternoon paper. Double murder. Double hamburger. <laughs> What did you say? I drove by Mary's drive-in this morning. There was a car parked there. Jeffrey, you mean... Little guy behind the wheel. Trench coat, umbrella. He looked an awful lot like our boy Smith. And then you talked to them? For a minute. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Tell me, Jeffrey, tell me. What did Mary say? She said, with or without onions. Merry Christmas, Lion. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced by Sterling Tracy, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for Jeff Regan, Investigator. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was me, lady. Who's you? Freeze, mister. Don't turn around and don't move a muscle. Because if you even breathe, I'll blow you right through the wall. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Death in the Dark. 
While the Norths are peacefully asleep in their Greenwich Village apartment, two men are working feverishly in a warehouse on the east side just before dawn. One of them holds a flashlight, while the other applies a large metal bar to the hinges of a heavy black safe. Coming, kid. You'll be popping in a minute. Need any help? No, I can make it all by myself. There she goes. I'll give you that can opener. The spring are good. It won't take much longer, will it, Lenny? I mean... Take it easy, kid. Can't rush this kind of a job. Uh, Put some of those tools away if you want to keep your hands busy. I'll be through in about ten seconds. What's the matter? I thought I heard somebody coming. Uh, But being so jumpy, that was me. No, it wasn't. It's the watchman. He's coming. Quick, douse the light. I'll get over by that door and smack him as he comes in. Got a belly, ain't you? Yeah. Well, give it to him good. Watch it now. He's coming. Who's in there? Come on, answer me. Who's in there? I'm warning you now. If there's anybody in here, I'm gonna... Oh. Okay, kid. Now we have to work fast. Get this box out of here and take it down to the car. There's dough. What about him? Never mind the watchman. Just do like I tell you. Get the dough out. I'll clean up around here and meet you downstairs in five minutes. Okay, okay. I'll be waiting for you in the car. Yeah, sure. Little punk. Never take him on the job again. Oh. My head. Stay where you are, mister. Keep your mouth shut. I don't like watchmen. You. You were in here all the time. I said to keep your mouth shut. You won't get away with this. You won't get out of here alive. I won't. I'll get out of here alive, all right. Only you're going out in a basket. Homicide, Lieutenant Wigan speaking. No, no, not yet, Sarge. Oh, not a thing. Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. North are in my office. Okay, I'll get back to you later. Uh, that murder last night has got the whole department in an uproar. That watchman's murder on the east side? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. They dropped it in my lap at about 6 o'clock this morning, and I haven't been able to come up with a thing except this. Well, what's that, Bill? The murder weapon. The guy that cracked that safe last night used this on the watchman and then forgot to take it with him. What is it, Bill? A sash weight? No, no, it's part of a sectional jimmy. What in the world is a sectional jimmy? Well, have you ever seen one? Oh. oh. It's a tool that's made for burglars. It's like a like a crowbar, only it splits up into three sections so it can be carried in a grip without being seen. Huh. I never knew there were tools that were specially made for burglars. Oh, there's plenty of them. And they aren't easy to come by, either. This one was made by a pro. Do, do you know who made it? Well, Pam, I'm not sure, but I, I got a pretty good idea. It's got the same markings and workmanship as a jimmy we picked up about two years ago. Belonged to a thug named Newsel. A safe cracker? Uh, one of the best. Well, then that should make things easy, Bill. If you know who made this jimmy, all you have to do is arrest him and you got the murderer. Well, it isn't as easy as that, Pam. The man who made this jimmy didn't rob that safe last night. How do you know? Because I sent him to jail about six months ago. Well, then he's gotten out. Uh, that's it, Bill. Uh, this Newsel man has broken out of prison. He couldn't have, Pam. Why not? Because I sent him up for murder. He was electrocuted the day before yesterday. Get away from that window, kid, and sit down, will you? I want to pay you off and send you home to your mother. I ain't got no mother. You know that, Lee. A joke, a joke. I was making a joke. What's the matter with you, kid? You got no sense of humor? Well, I don't know anymore. After what happened last night, oh, I don't... forget it, Willie. It's all over. It's not all over for me, Lenny. Don't you understand? He's dead. The guy's dead. Won't walk no more. He won't speak to anybody. He won't ever see his family again. How do you know he's got one? I read it in the paper. He, he's got a sister. He's got two kids. Oh, will you shut up? I'm sick and tired of you whining all the time. I can't help it, Lenny. I can't help thinking about him. Poor old guy, I keep seeing him lying there. I can still hear him moaning when he went down. Why did you hit him so hard? I didn't. I just tapped him on the side of the head like I showed you this afternoon. <laughs> that was some tap. Paper says his skull was broken in two places. But I didn't do it, honest Lenny. You know I wouldn't kill anybody. I just wanted to be a big shot, go along with you on a big job. I didn't want to kill anybody. Frank. 
You get off that one note and start picking up your money. You got 600 bucks coming to you. I don't want it. Don't you see? I'd go crazy if I had that door. I'd give myself up. Cut it out, Frankie. Give myself up. Yeah, that's what I do. What are you doing? You've got to behave, kid. No, no more. Please, no more. All right, then. Hang on to yourself. You start cracking up, we'll both be in the soup. I'm sorry, Lenny. You ought to be. Remember, next time you start losing your head, I'll knock it right off. Uh, darling, you do know where you're taking us, I presume. Why, of course, Jerry. I got the address of Bill. Whose address? Mrs. Newsell's. And who is Mrs. Newsell? Don't you remember, dear? Uh, the man who made that sectional Jimmy. Hmm? He's Mrs. Newsell? No, dear. He's the one who went to the electric chair. Mrs. Newsell is his widow. And what do you expect to find out from her? Oh, whatever we can, if she's willing to talk. And if she's real talky, she might tell us something about that jimmy that was used last night. How would she know? Well, her husband made it, didn't he? Maybe she knows who he sold it to. Say, that's an idea. Only I doubt if Mrs. Newsell will do any talking to people like us. <sighs> oh, we don't have to be like us. So we can be two other people. Who? Two thugs from Detroit. Uh, we're safe crackers. And we need a new set of tools. Oh, so naturally we went to her. Naturally. Uh, come on, Jerry. We're in the market for a sectional Jimmy. <laughs> All right, dear, that's enough ringing. If anybody's home, they certainly will. Oh. Yeah? What is it? Mrs. Nozel? Who wants to know? You an insurance man? Who, oh, me? <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Tell her who I am, Sadie. Tell her yourself. It was your idea coming here. Coming here for what? Look, honey, my name is Fegan. Muggsy Fegan. This is my tomato. Pleased to meet you. What do you want? Well, ain't you going to leave us in or something? Your husband's an old buddy of mine. We've done time together. My husband is dead. Yeah, I know. We heard the sad news yesterday. And it happened so sudden. We didn't get a chance to send flowers. What do you want, mister? Um, we just done a hot job in Detroit. And we had to pull out fast. Uh, so we dropped our, um, our can openers in the ditch. What's that got to do with me? Well, we can't do nothing without no can openers, so we thought you might fix us up. Are you kidding? I don't handle any of that stuff. Don't you even have a couple of odds and ends lying around the house? Not a thing. I got rid of all my husband's junk a year ago. Where? Who, who'd you sell it to? Nobody. You must have sold it someplace, because one of them sectional jimmies was used on a job last night. Yeah, that warehouse job. On the east side... Where that watchman was killed? That's right. The police found a hunk of that jimmy right next to the body. How do you know? Oh, we get around. Well, start getting. You know too much for me. Now, wait a second, honey. The police get around too, you know. And if you ain't going to be friendly about this, I might just take a notion to call them Eat up it. and... it. Oh, look, baby, I got to know where we can find Eat it. Eat it, I said. <gasps> well, I... Oh. I didn't know you was going to say it with a gun. Come on, Sadie. Yeah. We'll get that Jimmy in the five and ten. Yeah? Hello? Lenny? Who's this? What are you so careful about? This is an old pal of yours, Flo Newsom. Well, how are you, Flo? Crying my eyes out. And that kind of the old man frying? Connie, you never get around to see me anymore, Lenny. Well, I've been kind of busy lately. So I heard. I understand you were kind of busy last night on the east side. Hmm? I want to see you, Lenny. When you coming over? What did you say about last night? You want me to talk about it on the phone? Well, no. Then when are you coming over? Right away. So, you think I'm in trouble, huh? Well, what do you think, Lenny? Did you ever hear of a guy named Muggsy Fegan? Mm, nope. Neither did I. 
That guy was a phony if I ever saw one. And so was that dame. Well, what are you worried about? They can't prove nothing about that, Jimmy. They can prove my husband made it. And if they start snooping around, they might find out I gave it to you. Who's going to tell them? You? I might. Ah. Ah, you wouldn't do a thing like that, honey. After all, I'm an old flame of yours. You're an old flame of a lot of people. But you're the only one that counts, baby. Sure. I count up to about five grand, Lenny. What are you talking about? Five grand. That's what I want to keep my mouth shut. Your mouth can be shut for a lot less than that, baby. Is that a threat or a promise? How do you want to take it? In cash. I'm not talking about the money. I'm talking about you. If you don't watch your step, there'll be another funeral in the family. I think you're bluffing, Lenny. I'm not bluffing. You're asking for the moon. And you're going to pay it. This ain't just a safe-cracking job, Lenny. There's a murder rap that goes with it. Not for me, there ain't. The kid done the murder. I still say five grand. By tomorrow morning, or the phones start ringing. Okay, baby. You'll get it. You'll get just what you're looking for. <laughs> Homicide, Lieutenant Wagon speaking. Hello, uh, Bill. Uh, this is us. Uh, we're in a phone booth uptown. Both of you? Pam, you're all over my shoe. Never mind, I'm talking. Oh, uh, are you there, Bill? Ah, uh, yes, ready and waiting. Uh, well, uh, you won't have to wait much longer. We practically got the case all solved. Fine, fine. Where do I send the wagon? Oh, now, don't be facetious, Bill. You remember that Mrs. Newsom? Yes, roughly. Watching her apartment ever since we were over there this afternoon. Get to the point, dear. This is the point, Jerry. What is the point? That we were watching her apartment. Oh, and about a half hour ago, a big thug went in there and came out again. He stayed about 20 minutes, Bill. Jerry, please. And when he came out, he was plenty mad. But that isn't all, Bill. We followed him back to his apartment. And? Uh, well, there isn't any and yet. Uh, we called because we didn't know what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Go home. Oh, now, Bill. You're wasting your time, Pam. Just because you happen to see a thug go into somebody's apartment is no reason... it wasn't just somebody's apartment. It was hers. And if this thug is the one who used her crowbar... Jimmy. Well, what difference does it make as long as we know his name? It's Gorman, Bill. Lenny Gorman. That mean anything to you? No, but I'll check on it. Well, you don't sound very excited, Bill. Well, frankly, Pam, I, I'm not turning handsprings. Our leads, we just won't, we just won't call you anymore. Oh, well, now, Pam, I... Goodbye, Bill. Uh, uh, Pam! Pam! I... Uh, oh. Who is it? Me, Lenny. Frank. Wait a second. Okay, kid, come on in. What'd you call me for, Lenny? What's up? Sit down, kid. Well, what is it? Something's wrong, isn't there? They got a lead on us. They found out about something. Will you sit down? I'll tell you all about it. Well, go ahead and tell me. What are you waiting for? For you to calm down. Now, listen, kid. I know how you feel about what happened last night. If I was in your spot, it'd be the same way. It's a rough deal killing a man. What do you mean? Homicide. It's a rough deal. When you're young like you, you got a chance of beating a larceny rap at all kinds of angles. Not with murder. They give you the seat for that, whether you're young or old. Lenny, what are you doing to me? What are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to give it to you gradual, kid, so you'll understand what I'm driving at. Now, you got work to do. Work? You want me for another job? Something like that. I won't do it. I'm all through to you here. I won't do it. You'll have to do this job, kid, whether you want to or not. Unless you're ready to go to the chair... Why? What's happened? Somebody found out about you. Somebody that feels like talking to the cops. Who? A dame. Besides me, she's the only one in the world that knows you killed that watchman. You've got to take care of her before it's too late. I don't get you. Take care of her how? Show you how. With a brand new forty-five. Lenny, you're just kidding, ain't you? You don't really want me to kill somebody? You've got to kill this dame. 
She wants a million bucks for keeping her mouth shut, and you can't pay it. Don't you get me? She'll tip the cops. Why? What's she got against me? Nothing. That's just it. Nothing. If you don't cough up 5,000 bucks, she sends you to the chair, just like that. I don't care. I don't care. Do you know what it's like, Frankie? When you're up there in the death house, I mean? You think you got it bad now. Wait till they start getting you ready for that chair. Getting you ready? Sure. They got to get you ready, kid. They got to shave your head and the hair and your legs. While they're doing it, there's a priest in your cell saying prayers. I don't want a priest. You will then, Frankie. You'll want a priest then more than ever. Because you'll know what you're going into. You'll know that there's something waiting for you at the end of that hall. And once you sit down in that, you're never going to get up again. You're never going to see nobody. You're never going to even breathe except that one last time when they give you the juice and it squeezes out of you. It hits you like a bomb, kid. If you wasn't strapped in that chair, why, you'd... Bounce all over the place. Is go. that what you want, Frankie? Is that what you want to go through? No, no. All right, then. Take this gun and do like I tell you. Well, don't blame it on me, Jerry. Blame it on Bill. If he had had the decency to come over here when we called him, we wouldn't have to be doing this. Well, we don't have to do it anyhow, Pam. After all, there's nobody forcing us to sneak into Lenny's apartment. Well, I've got this window practically open now. Yeah, there she comes. Do you want to go first, or, or shall I? I- I'll go, dear. Just give me a boost. Right. It's enough. Fine. I-, I can make it now. Can you? I don't know why not. Yeah, there we are. Why, oh, I can't see in here. Yeah, here, take my leather. Thanks, darling. See anything now? Not very much. Is this the living room or the bedroom? Yeah, I think it's both. Well, y- you look through the dresser, Jerry. All right. I'm going to try that closet. If this Lenny man robbed that safe last night, maybe we'll find the money. Well, I haven't found any money yet. All I see in here is winter underwear. Well, look. Closet's practically empty. No. No, it isn't. Jerry, come here. I found something? I'll say I found something. Look at this. What is it? Don't you see what it is? It's the other two pieces of that sectional jimmy. Now, if we can only prove that they all fit together. Oh, guys, what was that? That was me, lady. Who? Don't turn around. Just stay right where you are and don't move. Because if you even breathe, I'll blow you right through the wall. Come on in. Thanks. So Lenny didn't come with the money himself. He sent you. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a lucky thing he sent it with somebody, because I wasn't bluffing. No, ma'am. All right, son, where is it? Let me count it. Yes, ma'am, I got it right here in my pocket. Well, give it to me. Don't stand it. Put that gun down. I can't. I gotta do it. Don't be a sap, kid. If he told you... No, don't come any nearer. I gotta do it. You don't? There ain't a reason in the world. Please don't say no more. Please. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to know you. But you just can't kill me. No, no more if you say another word. Stop it, kid. Don't put it. Hey, what's the idea of frisking us, Lenny? We ain't got no guns. Well, I'm just making sure, mister. When I find somebody going through my apartment, I like to be careful. Now, what's the idea? Uh... Uh, no idea. Uh, we just blew in from Detroit and we're looking for some burglar tools. In my closet? Come on, open up, sister. Ain't you the two phonies that was over to see Mrs. Noozle? Phonies? And you never heard of Muggsy Fegan? Luck wise, guy. Ain't got time for fooling around. Who are you? What's your racket? I'm telling you, safe cracking. Okay, you asked for it. Now come with me. Oh. Where are we going? Come with me, I said. I'll tell you all about it. Jerry's going to take us for a ride. No talking, see? Just open that front door and get a move on. Okay, okay, we're moving. Then move. Straight down the hall and out the back. Just a minute, Lenny. Huh? Oh. Here, I'll take that gun for you. Yeah. Yeah, stay where you are, Lenny. 
I'm a police officer. Bill, how'd you get here? Well, you told me where you were, didn't you? I pay attention to phone calls. But you weren't going to pay... Well, I happened to look up Lenny Gorman's record, and it interested me. Especially the part about safe cracking. What are you talking about? You ain't got nothing on me. Well, we have. Bill, he's got the other parts of that sectional Jimmy right in his closet. You're a cuckoo. Take it easy, Lenny. Mrs. Newsom might be able to give us some information about that. Yeah? I don't think Mrs. Newsom will do any talking. Well, we'll see about that. Come along, all of you. I sent some of my men over to her apartment, and I want to find out what they picked up. Ah, <laughs> oh, now, easy now. Just try to take it easy, Mrs. Newsom. I'll get the doctor, Bill. No, 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 wait. The doctor's busy with that Frankie kid. Golly, it's what happened in here. That's what I'd like to know. You! You're the one that made him do it! You sent him here to kill me! Who? That Sherman kid, Frankie Sherman! Had the gun right up against me. No, no, Mrs. Newsom. You gotta get hold of yourself. Can't help it. I was so close, I thought I was dead. Well, what happened? The cops. They, they got him in the shoulder before he could pull the trigger. There was one of them at the door and another one on the fire escape. Riley, Haynes, where are you? In here with the kid. You want me, Lieutenant? No, no, stay where you are. I'll be in in a second. Well, we were just coming out anyway. The kid's gonna be okay. Good. Yeah, I'm gonna be fine. Why didn't you finish me off and be done with it? Watch what you say, kid. They'll use it against what you. What do I care? They got enough against me now to put me in the electric... Shut up, you sap. Quiet, you. Let the kid talk. What do you want me to say? I tried to kill her and I couldn't make it. Why, Frankie? Why did you try to kill Mrs. Newsom? Don't answer that. You got a right to have a lawyer. Keep out of this, Lenny. You can have a lawyer any time he wants one. What good is a lawyer? He can't do nothing for me, not where it hurts inside. Look, I killed a man. There ain't a lawyer in the world that can make him live again. You killed him? Last night in the warehouse, I killed a watch. Frankie! He was coming in while we were cracking the safe, and I hit him with a blackjack. Well, I didn't have nothing to do with it. I wasn't anywhere near him. Weren't you? No. I was standing over by the safe. He's the one that killed him. You better study up on your law, Lenny. What are you talking about? You can't pull me in on a murder rap. I didn't even touch him. I'm not so sure about that, Lenny. What happened after Frankie killed the watchman? Well, nothing happened. We just grabbed the dough and beat it. Wait a second, Lenny. We didn't grab the dough. I took it down to the car myself. You came down later. I thought so. Who cares what you think? I do, Lenny, because I've been thinking the same thing myself. Now, according to the autopsy report, that watchman was killed with a heavy bar of steel, part of a sectional jimmy, not with an ordinary blackjack. Not with a blackjack? You mean I... I mean he was struck several times, heavy blows with a big steel bar. But I only hit him once. I only hit him on the side of the head. Lenny. What do you want? You did it, Lenny. You killed him yourself after I was out of there. You killed him and you made me think I did it. Go on, you're crazy. You did. You killed him. You almost got me to kill her. Look out. I won't. Look out, you lousy dog. Oh, hey, hey, stop, stop it. Stop it. Now, let me go. Let me choke the wife out of him. Hands off, I said. <laughs> you don't have to get even with him, Frankie. The state will get even for you. Say, Pam. Uh, yes, dear? Whatever happened to that piggy bank I had up here on my dresser? Um, uh, piggy bank? Now, you know I've been dropping quarters and halves into that thing for a long time. Oh, uh, well, uh, when did you miss it, Jerry? Right after we got finished with all that safe-cracking business last night. Oh. Say, you didn't happen to get an idea and break into it, did you? Well, um... As a matter of fact, Jerry, when the laundry man came this morning... Oh, I see. Uh, but I was going to put the money back, dear. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I hid the bank. I didn't want you to discover it. Say I... no more, darling. I understand everything, except for one point. What? Well, that piggy bank doesn't open until the whole thing's full. How in the world did you get the money out? Oh, that was easy, Jerry. I used the sectional jimmy. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. 
This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example, America's popular all-round mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in a matter of seconds, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as smaller quantities of other leading brands. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you transcribed another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, if you have a little corpse in your home, swap it in for something useful. Mr. Diamond? Yes? I'd like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, bless your little heart. One hundred a day in expenses. My name is Raymond R. Walter, an attorney at law. Would you mind coming right over to my office? Will you have a retainer ready? By the time you get here. Where is here? 758 East 45th Street. Just sign the check and I'll stamp in the amount with my track shoes. Then I can expect you. You could even clock me. Who knows? You may witness the first four-minute mile. I quickly bounded over to the sink, pulled out a bundle of soaking laundry, grabbed a straight razor that looked like it had been used to hack out shrapnel, applied the Brillo to my overnight beard, and 20 bloody strokes later, I observed myself in the mirror. Wounded, sire, but not dead. By 11 o'clock, I was standing in the reception office of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. I looked for the secretary, but none was to be seen. Then the door of Mr. Waldron's inner office opened, and a man about six feet tall, sporting a heavy black beard and thick horn-rimmed glasses, stood facing me. I suppose you're Mr. Waldron? Yes. Uh, Take this chair, if you will. Thank you. Now, uh, what's your trouble? Oh, not mine. My client's. You see, I'm supposed to give you $100 as a retainer until you speak with my client this evening. Uh, before you wave the bills around, tell me something about your client. My ethics get so double-jointed when someone shows me money. My client is a she. Hmm. Well, you certainly present the beginning of an interesting argument. Her name is Miss Mary Bellman. Miss? 28, blonde, showgirl, very attractive. Hmm. Ah, uh, so she killed 30 members of the volunteer fire department. I like tough cases. She's in fear of a life, Mr. Diamond, and since I'm her attorney, she called me and asked me to hire a good detective. You said Miss Bellum was in fear of her life. Uh, somebody trying to kill her? I think it best to let Miss Bellman tell you. She has all the facts. Uh, here's her address, and here's your retainer. She expects you at eight. It was close to 12 when I got back to the office and spotted my landlord nailing up my door. His eyes dropped blushingly down to his waist when he saw the two months back rent in my hand, and he hurriedly explained his carpenter work on my door as a delayed April 1st joke. I paid him off as the last board fell and then left the building and went to my flat on 53rd Street to take it easy until that evening. By 7.30, I was dressed in my best suit, the gray one that stands out from the rest because the rest are one brown gabardine that even a starving moth would gag on. Suddenly, I remembered my dinner date with Helen... So I put in a fast call and told her butler, Francis, that I'd be a little late. Then promptly at 8 o'clock, I walked up to the door of Miss Mary Bellman, prospective client. Yes? Who is it? Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh. Come in. Have you got it? Well, I don't know. Got what? Look, how about the envelope, huh? Envelope? John said it would be in an envelope. But if you don't have it in an envelope, just kindly give it to me. Then I'll fix us a drink. Oh, well, maybe you better fix the drink first. This is it... some kind of a joke. Oh. What's the matter? What are you doing here? Who? Oh! Everything happened so fast, I didn't even have time to guess what it was all about. Someone belted me with the Chrysler building, and I went down like a loose ski in a snow slide. 
As I hit the floor, I felt a pair of hands pull open my coat and relieve me of my thirty-eight. The floor fell away, and I dropped into a deep black pit that smelled something like a dirty carpet. When I finally came around, it was like squeezing myself out of a starch diving suit. I got my eyelids apart, and there, standing in front of me, were two very good reasons for wanting to go right back to sleep. Oh. Oh, he's coming around, boss. Good. I want him to see it when I give it to him. Oh. Slap him around so he comes to in a hurry. Sure. Come on. Oh. Wake up. Wake up, you hear me? No, okay. Come on, sit up. All right. Oh. Oh, my head. It's going to be your stomach in a minute. Full of slugs, your dirty, no good come Oh, well. Oh, Louis Hall, huh? You slugged me, Louis? Why'd you kill her? Huh, Shamus? Why? Why? Uh, what? Mary. Look at her, Shamus. Oh, uh, where? Holy smoke. Yeah. My pretty Mary. Tell me why you shot her, huh? You think I shot her? You're gonna die anyway, Diamond. In a minute, I'm gonna kill you. But I gotta know why you done it to Mary. What makes you think it was me? The shotgun, ain't it? You got an empty shoulder holster. Well, that's your gun, ain't it? Yeah. I... Sure. Well, this is a gun that shot Mary. One slug gone. See the slugs in her. Oh, you got the wrong boy, Hall. Oh, knock him off, boss. He's lying. He's done it. Shut up. Oh, sure, sure. I killed the girl and slugged myself, hoping that someone would come in and pin it on me. Boss, I think you're the... Yeah. Anybody in there? What's that? The U.S. Marines. Keep it quiet. Okay, honest. Use your pass key. If that doesn't work, use your head. Okay, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. The cops. Come on, Tony. We're getting out of here. Great, but what about the shamus? I don't want to knock you off if you didn't do it, Diamond. But I'm going to find out. Then maybe we talk more. Well, let's go. Let's go. Right out the back way. You mallet head, you've tried everything but your button hook. Well, I guess maybe we've been a busted in, huh? Okay, give me a hand. Put your shoulder against the door. Now, one, two. Hello, Walter. John, what are you doing here? I came to see a client. We got a report on the homicide. Where is it? In the other room. Take a look, Otis. Yes, sir. How did you get mixed up in this, Rick? That's a pretty good question. Lieutenant! Yeah? It's a dame. It's the dress and high heels. He spotted them right away. Who is she? Name's Mary Bellman. Hey, who called you to come over? I don't know, but we traced the call that came from a phone booth right next door to this building. How long ago? 8.15. Mm, right after I got slugged. You got slugged? Thoroughly. Otis, go call the coroner. Right. Let's see. One shot came right out between the shoulders. Yeah, when I came to, I could still smell cordite. Well, where's your gun, Rick? Well, right now, it's with Lewis Hall. Louis Hall, the gambler? Yeah, the guy who owns the Ace High Club. When I came to, Louis and one of his boys were getting ready to kill me for killing the girl. He waltzed out of here when you showed, took my gun with him. Maybe he knocked her off. Uh, maybe. Anyway, I think whoever did it used my gun. I still don't see how you figure in this deal. Well, a character by the name of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law, called and told me to come by and see my recently deceased client. Come on. Let's see what we can find out about a Mr. Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. Well, I was in it up to my earlobes again. Walt had Otis put out a pickup on Lewis Hall and his torpedo. Then we climbed in the squad car and headed for the offices of Raymond Waldron. On the way over, I told Walt what had transpired since that morning. One, Waldron hiring me for Miss Bellman, saying he represented her. Two, seeing Mary Bellman in the strange way she had greeted me, as if she expected me to have an envelope for her. We got to the building, found the night watchman, went in, and in two minutes we were standing in front of the door marked 402. Isn't there usually a name on the door of an attorney's office? Uh, usually. Maybe that's why I saw it there this afternoon. Now, uh, let us in, will you, Pop? Hey, sure, boy, but there ain't nothing to see. We know Mr. Waldron's not in, but we want to look around. <laughs> sure, boy. Oh. <laughs> look as much as you like. Reception room, boy. Where's the furniture? <laughs> Pretty dull looking, huh, boy? <laughs> uh, what about the inner office? Well, no sense going in there. It's as naked as this. Well, it was all here this afternoon. Was there someone in this office this afternoon, Pop? <laughs> you think the boy's lying? <laughs> sure, like he said, some lawyer fella. Had all the furniture moved out, run out on a week's rent, too. Landlord's in an oxygen tent. <laughs> Your 
You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall Drug Products and your Rexall family druggist. Right now, here's a lady with a problem for him. Every summer, it's the same thing. My children either eat their meals so fast or fill themselves with all kinds of cold drinks and hurry-up snacks. And then we have our usual siege of what I call summer stomachs. Well, ma'am, a lot of mothers have that same trouble. And a whole lot of them have solved it with Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Why, how's that? Well, it's a quick and effective way to neutralize excess acidity and a remarkably gentle laxative. What's more, because of its special formula and exceptional purity, Rexall Milk of Magnesia has almost none of that unpleasant, earthy taste. Would say the children will like that. And because it's Rexall, ma'am, you know it's laboratory tested. All you have to do is follow the tested instructions on the label. Well, from now on, I'm asking for Rexall Milk of Magnesia. At Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now, back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Mr. Raymond R. Waldron had skipped, furniture and all. We thanked Pop, went downstairs, climbed into the squad car, and Walt checked in with the precinct. He put a tracer out on Waldron and learned that Lewis Hall and his henchmen were yet to be found. The coroner's report of the dead girl, Mary Bellman, confirmed the obvious. Death by 38, the slug having been found in the wall. Ballistics had a full report and were waiting for the gun to show up. It was six to an even that Louis Hall still had it and that it was mine. On the way over to Hall's nightclub, Walt told me that Hall had been going with a girl named Willis, Jean Willis. And he was a little surprised when I told him of Hall's recent interest in the late Mary Bellman. It seemed that Jean Willis and Louis had been an item for nearly a year. In fact, she was working as a headliner in his nightclub. <laughs> What a dime. Yeah. Better not leave the doors open too long. The smoke will run out and the walls will fall down. I'm going to see what I can find out about Louie Hall, Rick. You want to try looking up Gene Willis? Meet you back at the bar. Rick, I'm on duty. Well, who said you got a drink? You've got on shoes, but you're not walking. Oh. Any table, sir? No, thanks. Now, where can I find Gene Willis? You a friend? I might be. I'm afraid, Miss Willis. Oh, oh, my goodness. I dropped $10. So you did. Uh, looks a little messy. <laughs> I uh, hate to see you dirty your hands, sir, so I just keep it and you can go wash up. The huh? uh, washroom's right next to Miss Willis' dressing room. Right down that hall. I'll see that you're decorated by the Department of Sanitation. Who is it? Hey, who are you? Name's Diamond, honey. I'm a private detective. Good for you. I hope you're happy in your work. Now beat it. I'm looking for Lewis Hall. He's out. Uh, down the street somewhere. Having your initials tattooed on the soles of his feet, no doubt. Look, Wiseacre, blow or I'll yell and have a couple of boys show you the fastest way out of here. Honey, before you do, I think there's something you ought to know. Yeah? What? You open that pretty mouth of yours and you may end up swallowing a fist. Oh, yeah? You know a Mary Bellman... What? Know her? Yeah, she works here. She ain't showed up tonight. Something happened to her? What makes you say that? Wishful thinking. Oh. You used to be Louis Hall's girl, didn't you? Yeah, until she came along. Now, look, what is this? What's going on? What do you want Louis for? You really don't like Mary Bellman much, do you? I... Yeah. She's all right. What would you say if I told you someone put a bullet in her tonight? What? Where's Louis, Jean? Somebody took care of the little... Well, what do you know? Good. If Louie did it, I'm real happy. Because he found out what kind of a... No. I don't know where Louie is, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Now, get out of here. Okay, okay. But the law may be around to see you. Dandy. Now, beat it. Do me just one favor, will you, Jenny? What is it? Don't move. I want to remember you just as you are. Why, you crummy... <laughs> You moved. Well, I went back to the bar just in time to see Walt look around the room like a shoplift on bargain day. 
Then he slipped the bartender a bill and downed a stiff belt with the speed of an alcoholic 30 seconds before prohibition was to set in. Good evening, Lieutenant. <laughs> that was a dirty trick. <laughs> I just saw the girl got nothing but a fast shuffle. I couldn't find out anything about haulers. Boy, either. Now, get your breath and let's get back down to the station to think about this thing. Let's go. Hiya, Lieutenant. Hello, pink eyes. Huh? Oh. Anything on the dead girl? Uh, here's the report. Thanks. How are you, Shamus? Fine, notice, fine. Still under contract to the Museum of Natural History? That ain't very funny. Wait till they pick up your option and try to collect your head. Shut up, you two. Listen to this, Rick. This lab report says Mary Bellman was the one-time girlfriend of John Webb. Oh, the John Webb I sent up on an embezzlement rap eight years ago? The same. He got out a month ago. See, wasn't he suspected of being in on that Etna payroll holdup? Yeah, but we never could prove that one on him. Mm. The dole was never recovered either. No, but the roll of bills and the dead girl's pocketbook checked with the numbers and the bills from that holdup. Walt, I'm getting an idea. When I sent Webb up, he was pretty unhappy. Made a lot of threats to me. You got the serial numbers from that holdup? Here's the whole list. Well, check him with this money. Your own dough? Okay, but I don't get it. Notice, did you find out anything on Raymond R. Waldron? The, the guy that was supposed to be the attorney? Yep. Well, he ain't no attorney. He ain't even with the state bar, and I can't even find a Raymond R. Waldron in the phone book. Rick, where'd you get these bells? Oh, they check. You bet they do. Where'd you get them? Raymond R. Waldron. Gave them to me when he hired me. Otis, go get a picture of John Webb. Right. You think Waldron and Webb are one and the same? Waldron had a beard and wore glasses. It's been eight years since I've seen Webb. Hey, it fits. If Webb is Waldron, he's got a motive. For one thing, he'd love to frame you. Yeah, but we're going to have a hard time proving Waldron is Webb without fingerprints. Not only that, we're going to have a hard time just finding him. Uh, here you are, Diamond. Thanks, Otis. Uh, give me a heavy lead pencil, Walt. Right here. Hmm? <laughs> Get him, some artist. <laughs> oh, shut up, Otis, shut up. Now, let's see. There's a beard. Put some glasses on him. Uh-huh. There you are. Well, Raymond R. Waldron. Or John Webb with glasses and a beard. I'll put out a gem. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Walt. I got an idea. Let's pull a real old stunt, huh? A real old stunt would be a cinch for us. Let the papers print a story that Mary Bellman is not dead. Webb must have made sure. Look, I didn't say that I was positive that Webb did the job. Louis Hall was standing with my gun in his hand. Gene Willis hated Mary Bellman for stealing her boy, Louis, and uh, we're loaded with suspects. Well, she did only have one bullet in her, and there is a possibility that she could have knocked herself off. Oh, <laughs> stop sitting on your badge and call the papers. Say that Mary Bellman is in Bellevue in a serious condition. Due to an anonymous phone call, the police found her and rushed her to the hospital. I know, and she's expected to recover consciousness at any moment. Right. Uh, Otis, how would you look in a blonde wig? Huh? Come on, I'm going to put you to bed. Lieutenant! Walt called in the reporters on the police beat and gave them the story. Then went over to Bellevue and set it up with the staff. All the rooms in one section of the second floor were emptied, and we took over 207. The boys came over from the station with the blonde wig, and Walt and I slapped it on Otis and tucked him away to go belly by. A screen was put up in the back of the room, and Walt and I sat down behind it to wait. I've got six of our boys dressed as interns on this floor, and a policewoman on the switchboard. McCarthy is making like the night physician. If anyone tries to see Mary... Bless her little heart. He's to show him up. Tell them they can't stay long. The minute anyone shows, they'll call us on... Oh, that might be it. Yeah? A girl, Lieutenant. Nice looking. Wearing a big mink and carrying a handbag. Right. Girl. Gene Willis. Might be. Be here in a second. Keep well behind this screen. You can only stay a minute. I'll be outside. Thanks, Doctor. Mary... She's digging into her handbag. Let's take her. What? what? Let's have the money. Take your hands off of me. Hang on to her, Walt. What's the meaning of this? Ah, you hey. always carry a gun, Jean. Hey. She was going to kill me. Who's that? That ain't Mary. She was going to kill me, Lieutenant. Shut up, Otis, or I'll give her back the gun. You can't pin anything on me. I think we can, baby. Holy cow. 
Moore Company. Yeah? You can't do this. Dear, shut up now. Yeah. Okay. More company? Yeah, all those gorillas. Said they were around. Louie. Oh, no. Honey, I no. warned you. Keep it down, no. lady. I won't let him get caught. I don't want him to get caught. Shut her up. I don't want him to get caught. Sorry, dear. honey, but I, I have don't want to. Him to get... <sighs> okay. <sighs> Lift her over behind the screen. All right. Yeah. There, there. All right, let me back there. Shh. Who's making noise? You can only stay a minute. Okay, Doc. You stay out here, Tony. Right, boss. Mary. <laughs> Mary, baby. I'll get the guy who done this. All right, Louie. Who's there? The police and you're covered. Okay. Try anything and the guy in the bed will start shooting. The guy in the... Frank, give me your gun. Then, Mary, she's... She's... She's really dead, Louie. I guess maybe I wish too much. I ain't smart. Here's your gun, Shonis. You had the right gun, all right, but the wrong boy. Here, Walt, give it the ballistics. We got Jean Willis over behind that screen. She came up here with some crazy idea of protecting you. Jeannie, she think I done it. Yeah, the crazy kid, she ain't got no... It's getting crowded. Yeah? What's going on? Trying to run down a killer, Louie. Okay. A guy just came in. Mm, wearing a beard? No, he asked what room Mary Bellman was in and then let some flowers walk down. Uh, oh. oh, we better get that girl out of here. Get her out in the hall. All right. Come on, honey. Oh, Louie. Yeah. Hey, Louie, I didn't mean to... I'll talk. give you a hand, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant. The fire escape. Somebody out there. Oh, Louie, I only wanted to help you. I... Quiet. Don't move, anybody. Maybe you, without the light, he won't see us. Look out. He's going to shoot from there. Get that light. Who got him? I didn't even have it, time to get my gun out. I, I didn't. I was too scared. Well, I thought he'd at least get in the room. Lieutenant, you okay? Yeah. Keep everybody out of here. Where'd you get the other gun, Louis? I only give you yours. Remember, Shamus? Let's have that one, Louis. I done what I said I was going to do. I don't know who the guy is, but I guess he's the one to kill Mary. Can you see the guy, Rick? Is it Webb? Yep. Yeah. Alias Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law and very dead. outfit, Helen, baby? Uh-huh. You like it? Make a silkworm lose his mind. <laughs> I fixed some sandwiches. Thought you could eat them in here in the study. Oh, beats the kitchen. How can I see what I'm eating? A moth would crack up if he had to land by one lousy candle. Thought it was kind of romantic. Soft lights, music. Oh, honey, honey, honey. My rear old stomach has been neglected all day. Food should make it happy. I hope so. Hard day? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm, what's this? Mm. Oh, very toothy. Peanut butter and caviar. You you make them? Of course. No. Yes? Walt, Helen, right there. Feeding his face. Wait a minute, Walt. No. Here's the way it breaks down. Walter or Webb decided to kill three birds with one stone. Oh, the big pig. He wanted you for sending him up. He wanted Mary Bellman because she was blackmailing him. Seems she threatened to tell the police that he was the one who got that payroll. Oh, that's why she asked for an envelope. She thought I was bringing the payoff. Yeah. Well, Louis Hall was the third bird. For stealing Webb's girl while he was doing time. That's it. You've been a living doll. What do you eat? I think this one's cheese and liverwurst. <laughs> How are you going to sing? I haven't thought about it. Me, 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 me. <laughs> You'll never make it. Don't bet on it. I will bet on it, a double sawbuck. I know you haven't got it, but you're on. Hoop-dee-doo, hoop-dee-doo I hear a poker and my troubles are through Hoop-dee-doo, hoop-dee-dee This kind of music is like heaven to me Hoop-dee-doo, hoop-dee-doo It's got me higher than a kite Hand me down my soup and fish I am gonna get my wish Hoop-dee-doo in it tonight When there's a trombone playing I get a thrill, I always will 
when there's a concertina. I always smile, cause that's the style. When there's a fiddle in the middle and it really is a riddle. Plays the tune so sweet that I could die. Lead me to the floor and hear me yell for more, cause I'm a hoop de doing kind of guy. Hoop de do, hoop de do. I hear a poker and my troubles are through. Hoop de do, hoop de dee. This kind of music is like heaven to me. Hoop de do, hoop de do. It's got me higher than a car. Hand me down my soup and fish. I am gonna get my wish. Hoop de do in it tonight. Now, oh, honey, during that phone. All right, Fatty. What do you got to say now? Didn't think I could sing with a mouthful of liverwurst. <laughs> it was worth the twenty. I bet you feel awful. No, but I'm sure glad I wasn't eating spaghetti. Why? Well, I strained so much on that last note, I would have knitted a T-shirt for my tonsils. <laughs> Dick Powell will be back in just a moment. And now, once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's the time of year for a friendly warning about sunburn. Remember that overexposure may cause serious and painful burns. But in case you do get a sunburn, I want you to know about Rexall Gypsy Cream. You'll actually be amazed at the immediate cooling, soothing relief you get with Rexall Gypsy Cream. And what's more, it's not a messy ointment, but a quick-drying, greaseless liquid, easy to apply harmless to close. Ask for Rexall Gypsy Cream at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Ladies and gentlemen, Last year, a great part of America's security went up in smoke. When traveling this summer, you can guard against forest fires by following these few simple rules. Crush out all cigarette, cigar, and pipe ashes. Break matches in two before throwing them away. Drown all campfires twice before leaving them. And always find out the law before using fire in wooded areas. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Good night, everyone. This program was transcribed. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. For the woman in ten with sensitive skin... There's Caranome hand cream. Statistics show that one woman in ten has an extra sensitive, extra tender skin. And for that woman... There's Caranome hand cream. For like all Caranome beauty aids, Caranome hand cream is hypoallergenic. Pure, mild, safe for most sensitive skins. It softens, beautifies, protects. Remember, for the woman in ten with sensitive skin... There's Caranome hand cream. Only one of Caranome's beauty aids designed especially for women with sensitive skin. Ask for Caranome at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Hear Juvenile Menace on Dragnet tomorrow night on NBC. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Earl Foreman, Johnny. In Sarasota? That's right. Florida? Where else? Well, hi, Earl. How are things in the land of infernal sunshine? What do you mean, infernal? Well, it's got pretty hot down there these days, isn't it? Makes good fishing weather, Johnny. Yeah, but without a case to work on, what possible excuse would I have? Maybe I have one for you. Oh? Yeah, and maybe it's murder. Earl, I'll be down on the next plane. <laughs> Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company Branch Office, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Parley Baron matter. Expense account item one, $131.50. Transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. Knowing Earl Poorman, I didn't bother checking into a hotel, but instead took a cab to his office in the Conroy building. Tall, lanky, easygoing, he welcomed me like a long-lost brother. Oh, Johnny, you're looking great. And I'm glad you're here, because you can clear up this case in a hurry, and then you and I can get out in the Gulf and do some real serious fishing. Oh, well, that's okay by me, Earl. Your last just... trip down here, you remember, they weren't biting so good. But, oh, Johnny, so help me now that... Oh, I see you've got your bags with you. Well, uh, yeah. Good, yeah. because you're going to stay with us out the house. Now, I'm not going to take any argument. I told that old battle axe I'm married to to hang out an extra towel for you. How is my... Oh, she's great, just great. I never did understand how I was lucky enough to grab that dame, Johnny. Oh, well, now, I think maybe she kind of cares for you, too, Earl. <laughs> now, uh, about yeah, women come... show funny taste sometimes. Hey, maybe the old horse will go fishing with us. Mike? Yeah. Anything over ten pounds would pull her right out of the boat. <laughs> but now, what kind Listen, of a problem... she's been getting pretty good with a rod and reel. Look, look, will you? This fishing uh, talk is just making my mouth water. First, I'd, we'd yes, better discuss... Yes, I, I, I know. Once I get started on fishing... I know. It... All right, now. Let's it... get down to cases, huh? Uh, oh, all right, if you insist. I insist. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was just trying to stall off having to. You know where Lido Key is? Lido? Yeah, a mile or so offshore, just beyond St. Armand's Key, where we live. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, a client of mine, a man I've known for years. He retired, bought himself a piece of property there, built a nice little home on it. His name is Parley Barron. So? Well, I've handled all his insurance for him, including a straight life at 50000 Uh-huh. Beneficiary? His wife, Laura Barron. And what's happened to him? Well, Friday morning, now that's the day before yesterday, he left the house just to do some errands. Well, go on. Yeah, well, he hadn't got back home by about 5 p.m., and his wife started calling around trying to find out where he was, and nobody seemed to know. So finally she put in a call to the police. Who's your man there? Uh, Sergeant Harry Brackett. Oh, I remember him. Sure. Go on. Well, then around 7 p.m., they found Barron's car. Found it parked down by one of the fishing docks. But no sign of him? Not a sign, not then or since. Had he gone out fishing? Police questioned everybody, the boat owners, all the boat delivery, everybody. Old Will Bright, who runs the dock where the car was parked, he was closed up. Sign on the door saying he'd gone up to Gainesville. Well, could <laughs> Barron have had any reason to disappear? Oh, no, no. Well, not that anyone knows of. What kind of a person is his wife? Yeah, yeah. No, she's very sweet, Johnny. She's a bit of a bore. But... Oh, they doted on each other. All right, how about enemies? Parley Barron? Never. Sweet old guy. I sure hope you can find him. I, that he's still alive. I'm afraid I, I doubt it. Well, so far you've given me no reason to believe he's dead. Well, it's just a feeling, I guess. And I don't like it. Mm. Well, what else can you tell me, Earl? Nothing, really. Then maybe I'd better talk to Mrs. Barron and to the police. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. You take my car. Oh, thanks. It's the new air-conditioned cat out in the back of the building. Well, what did you do? Oh, Michael picked me up. Now, we'll see you at the house for dinner, huh? Well, that may depend on what I find out in the meantime. Whenever oh. you're ready, there's food and there's a bed waiting for you. And uh, I hope you... Well, I just hope you find Parley Barron. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, yeah, Johnny. He was. Earl seemed so sure that Barron was dead. I was pretty down in the mouth about it. But I wondered, did he know something about the old man that he hadn't told me? Ah, that didn't seem like Earl. He gave me the Baron's address on Lido Key, and I drove out there. Laura Baron was a fragile, gray-haired little old lady wearing steel rim spectacles and with, well, with almost a sanctimonious air about her. She sat primly, properly straight in her chair as we talked, a Bible in her hand. Then Mr. Earl Poorman has told you as much as any of us knows, Mr. Dollar. I see. But uh, even the smallest bit of information may hold the key to finding your husband. Only prayer can help us now, Mr. Dollar, or help him if he's gone to the great beyond. How, uh... Well, tell me, how is he dressed on Friday morning when you last saw him? As you see him in the picture there on the table in old gray pants and a rather tattered sport shirt and that old straw hat. That shirt is blue? Yes, he was so happy the day that picture was taken. He just finished making an addition to our dock with his own two hands. He was so proud. Now, 
Yes, I, I'm sorry. He'd hoped to get his own little boat, too, for fishing. He loved to fish so. Yes, well, uh, tell me, please, do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm your husband? Oh, dear, no, no, Mr. Dollar. And you'd had no, no argument or disagreement with him before he left here that morning? Huh? We had had no disagreement even about little things in 41 years of blessed marriage. Oh. Not even about his work. I see. Uh, what did he do before he retired, Mrs. Barrett? Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask that because I, I've always felt that the good Lord wouldn't approve. Of his work? I'm a very religious woman, Mr. Dollar, and as I say, in 41 years we never questioned one another's thoughts or actions. But... What was your husband's work? I, I won't say that it was sinful because he wasn't a sinful man. Polly was a good man and many times he made it plain that his work helped to save lives, too. And I accepted it because he felt he was doing right. Yeah, well, you still he haven't told me, Mrs. Barron. That... Always deep in my heart. Mr. Dollar. Yes. Have you thought that perhaps it may have been the intercession of divine providence that has taken Parley from us? Uh, <clears throat> no. But no, you I... must consider it, mustn't you? Because the workings of the power that guides our destinies, our birth and our Mrs. death... Mrs. Barron... They are sometimes too mysterious for us mortals fully to comprehend, much less question. Well... And so... If my beloved Parley has been taken from us for some divine purpose or for something he might have done unknowing that was not in accord with the supreme Mrs. will... Mrs. Barron, I'm sorry, but I would like to know what your husband's work was. I know, and perhaps it was my humble mission on earth, the cross I had to bear to guide him away from it to... Chemicals. He was a chemist, Mr. Dollar. Explosives. Explosives? Yes. Heaven, please forgive me for not having led him into some other Where field. did he work? Tampa. Dufresne Chemical Corporation. Dufresne. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Explosive things to kill in defiance of the Almighty's purpose that we love one another. Yeah, but we... now how, uh, how long ago was this? He retired in 1951. And since then? Here in Sarasota. Uh-huh. And to keep himself occupied. Oh, this lovely home of ours and his fishing. Though he never caught anything. Oh, I see. Never caught anything, Mr. Dollar. Do you suppose that that was some retribution for the work he had done so long? For some error in his living or thinking? Well, I... <laughs> well, who knows, of course. Yes. Who knows? But we should consider it, shouldn't we? Uh, uh, where did he do his fishing? He never told me, but he left here almost every day to try his skill. And always he came home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mrs. Barron. I'm sorry to have had to ask you so many questions. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. My faith will sustain me through this ordeal. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. Here, you must take some of these pamphlets with them. Oh, Read them. Yeah. Any aid to piety of the mind is good for all of us. Yes, well, thanks. The I... inspired word may help us all. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I like to think that on the whole, I... Well, maybe I'm not too religious in the sense of going to church regularly and that sort of thing, but... Well, at least I try to live a decent sort of life and observe the golden rule and stick to some ideals, and... But in an atmosphere like that, well, I couldn't help wondering if her husband didn't have good reason for wanting to get away for a while. In any event, I'd got nowhere on the case, so I phoned Sergeant Harry Brackett. That's item two, ten cents. But the desk at headquarters said that he wouldn't be back until about 6 p.m., and since I really had nothing to go on until I could see him, I dropped in on Earl again. You kidding? We'll take the boat, run out into the Gulf, and get some fish for dinner. It's the best time of day. So who was I to refuse? And within the hour, we were fighting the tide through the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys on our way along into the Gulf. Eh, yeah, Johnny, I find I always have my best luck along about this time of day, just before sundown. I still ought to be back there working. Why? Sergeant Brackett won't be back at headquarters until 6 o'clock, you told me yourself. Now, what can you do until you talk to him and find out what leads he may have? Oh, man, him? you are a funny one. You call me long distance to get down in a hurry, then insist I go fishing instead of working. Don't you know, fishing's the answer to more problems than anything else in the world. You got worries? Go fishing. You'll forget them. Got a nagging wife? Oh, don't let Mike hear you say that. <laughs> well, she's different. You little shrimp. But you know what I mean. A writer, he wants ideas, he goes fishing. A businessman, 
A detective? Huh? Uh, go ahead and say it, an insurance officer. <laughs> sure. I'll bet that more than once when you've been stumped on a case, why, if you had just relaxed your mind by going out somewhere and wetting a line... I wish it were that easy. And so far as this matter is concerned, I haven't even got started on it yet. Well, relax, anyway. Who knows? Maybe the answer to what's happened to poor old Parley Barron will, will, well, will just come to you. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sure, sure, instead of you chasing... Earl. Me. Huh? Yeah? Up ahead, just to the right there. Where? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Somebody's old beat-up straw hat. Yeah, and a little further. You know something? The tide will carry that skimmer right smack into the Earl, sea of beer. Look. And if the fellow that lost it look, knows... further far. over to the right. Huh? What is that floating there? I don't know. Well, it looks like... Oh, good Lord. Johnny. It's a body, Johnny. We'll drift over to it. That's a body, all right. And that straw hat looks exactly like one I saw in a picture this afternoon. Here. I got it. Can you reach him, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go now. Oh, good boy. All right, now let's see. Oh. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure, Earl? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johnny, it's poor old Parley Barron. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Everyone loves kids, and every kid loves candy. American servicemen have heard the tearful cries for candy in most parts of the world, in Europe and the Far East during World War II and after. And there's never seemed to be enough candy to go around. Well, more than a dozen years ago, during the Berlin airlift, an Air Force lieutenant from the United States discovered he had no candy to offer some German children. However, he promised to drop them some candy the next day as he came in for a landing. Improvising a parachute out of his handkerchief, Lieutenant Gail Halverson dropped the candy bars the next day as he had promised. Now, this idea caught on among other Air Force men in the airlift, and that's how Operation Little Vittles began. The idea spread far and wide, and soon military personnel, civilians, business firms began to aid the goodwill program by supplying candy and handkerchiefs. Time after time, as the sleek cargo planes of the United States Air Force swooped low over the landing field, a shower of little bundles of sweets dotted the sky as their tiny parachutes carried them safely to the ground. And the hungry German children gathered up these bundles of mercy, which the communists try to keep from them. The men of the United States Air Force did a great job satisfying a lot of appetites, but they did more. By a wonderful sense of understanding, they nourished the cause of freedom, the right of all men and children everywhere. And now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Parley Baron Matter. Two days' exposure to the elements and the creatures of the sea had made almost unrecognizable a body that Earl Poorman and I found floating in the Gulf of Mexico off Sarasota, Florida. But Earl was certain it was the remains of old Parley Barron, who had disappeared two days before. The men on duty at police headquarters confirmed the identification and placed the body in the morgue to await the autopsy surgeon. On a hunch, I asked Earl to drive me over to Will Bright's boat dock, where Barron's car had been left parked. It's like I just finished telling the police over the telephone. I wasn't here when poor old Baron come for his boat on Friday. Oh, uh, what a shame, such a nice old man. Where were you, Mr. Bryant? I was up to Gainesville, picking up some fishing tackle from a wholesaler. Well, then Mr. Barron must have got a boat from someone else that morning. Oh, no, 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 sir. No? No, poor man. no sir. Why not, Mr. Bryant? Oh, he never took out a boat from anybody else but me. His own boat. Uh, at least it was the one I kept set aside for him. And that's what kind of puzzled me, Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. Well, you see, when I come back to you Saturday night, his boat was right here at the dock. But it weren't tied up in its usual spot where I always tie it up. Somebody had moved it. Must have. And it weren't my helper, Pete. You no, know, Johnny, that means he may have taken it out, but whoever did him in returned it. Oh, possibly. Mr. Bright, which one is his boat? Oh, right here. I'll show you. I always give him the same one. Never let nobody else use it. 
That's why he kept his fishing tackle just laying in it, always ready to use. Here. Yeah, I see. I've heard he wasn't a very good fisherman. No, no, he never brought in a thing. Of course, maybe he was so soft-hearted he put back everything he caught. Or maybe his daily excursions were just to get away from his wife, Mr. Bright. Now, don't you say nothing against her, mister. Maybe she is a little touched on religion. Sure, she tries a different kind every couple of months. But she's a fine woman, uh, just like he was a fine man. And everybody knows it. Yeah. The whole town is mourning here. Excuse me. What are you looking for, Johnny? Well, I just noticed something about this tackle lying in the boat. Mm-hmm. Well? Come on. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bright. I'd like to tell you what I think might have happened. Yeah, maybe later. Thanks. Well, what did you what did you find there, Johnny? Earl, did Parley Barron ever go fishing with you? You were good friends. No, no. He always wanted to go out alone. Yeah, but not to fish. Huh? That tackle box hasn't been moved in months. The paint is still dark under it. What? And that reel, I could hardly turn it. Well, then what? I don't know what. But Barron was using that boat every day for something besides fishing. Any ideas? You know him pretty well, have you? No. Let's get over to headquarters. Earl felt he ought to go back to his office where his wife, Mike, had promised to pick him up, so I borrowed his car again and went over to headquarters alone. Sergeant Harry Brackett, who was assigned to the case, had returned. It was on the phone when I walked in on it. He gets back to town, Mrs. Dana, so please have him call me immediately, will you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir, what can... Johnny. Yeah, hi, Harry. Yeah, Johnny, I'm sure glad you're here. I got a real mixed up case on my hands. The Farley Baron matter, huh? Well, you know about it? That's why I came to Sarasota. Earl Foreman called me. Have you found out anything? Not that much of you. Well, only what's here, the autopsy report. What's in it, Harry? Doc Snowden says that Farley Baron was dead before he was put into the water out there in the Gulf. Oh. No water in the lungs, you see what I mean? It probably means murder. Have you told anybody this? No, not yet. Why not? Well, I don't know. Maybe because I just can't figure anybody in the world would want to kill Parley Barron. Did you talk with Will Bright down at the boat dock? Just before you came in. You know, it sounds like somebody went with Barron in his skiff that morning. Killed him, dumped him over the side, and then brought the boat back alone, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. Pete Marino, a little kid who plays around Bright's dock all the time, is sort of a self-appointed caretaker when Bright isn't there. What about him? Well, Peter saw Mr. Barron take off in his skiff Friday morning alone. But he didn't see him come back. Pete went home for lunch. When he got back to the dock, skiff was in. Uh Uh-huh. Then whoever did it met him out on the water somewhere. Maybe several people, so that one of them could return the skiff. He'd be taking an awful chance, wouldn't he? How do you mean? Yeah, Doc's in a pretty isolated spot, all right, but the killer showing up in Baron's skiff without the old man long, that's too much of a chance. How else could it be returned? <sighs> Tied. Tied? Little Pete says that when he got back to Doc, the skiff was there, all right, but not in his usual place. So Wilbright mentioned. Also wasn't tied up. It was just sitting there. Oh, then you meant untied. No, I meant T-I-D-E. When the tide's rising, it floats everything from the pass between Lido and Lombo Keys right up to Will's dock. You think the boat just floated back by itself? You got a better idea? Harry. Yeah? Are you sure it was Baron's body we picked up out there? After all, the fish and whatnot disfigured it pretty badly. Johnny, I've known him for years, and didn't Earl Pullman recognize him immediately? Yeah. And the clothes he was wearing, his own straw hat. Well, have you checked on his dental work, things like that? I'm waiting now for Dr. Dana. He was his dentist to get back there. You know, that's a funny thing. Why? I called Dana the minute that body was brought in. Yeah. After all, teeth are about as solid identification as you can get. Oh, I thought you were sure anyway. Well, I wanted to be doubly sure. Anyhow, when Dana didn't get here right away, I called him again. I got his wife on the phone. And according to her, he suddenly left for Tampa. Urgent call or something. Where in Tampa? She didn't know. At least you wouldn't say, but it, it seems kind of fishy to me. Well, it may just be that one of his patients... Dana. That's right. The man who got so much publicity about atomic radiation studies, effects on the teeth and so on. That's the one. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, when you're stumped on a case, says Earl Foreman, go fishing. We did. We found a body. What are you getting at? Me, when I'm stumped, I play my hunches, no matter how crazy they may seem. And the hunch I have right now, man, is the craziest. I'll see you later. <laughs> I learned a long time ago in this business, when you got a hunch on the line, you play it for all it's worth. Item three, ten cents for a phone call from a booth in the drugstore just around the corner. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Daner? Uh, Yes, this is Mrs. Daner. My name is Larkin, Mrs. Daner, from the Federal Bureau. 
the Federal Bureau... That's right. So you can see why it's important you say nothing to anyone about this call. Well, how can I be sure you I'm are? simply checking to make sure your husband has followed instructions. Oh, I see. Has he left for Tampa? Why, yes, the minute he got the phone call. Did he tell you who called? Why, no, but I did hear him mention the name Dufresne. Dufresne? Yes, only he didn't know I heard. And... Oh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. Just be sure you don't mention it to anyone else. Oh, no. Goodbye. <laughs> Item 4, 390, at the sign of the Flying Red Horse on the way to Tampa. The least I could do for the use of Earl's car was fill the gas tank. On expense account, of course. The FBI gag had worked before, so I used it again to bowl my way through the gate at Dufresne Chemical Corporation and to the office suite of Dufresne himself. I wasn't at all surprised to see activity in the suite despite the late hour. Sir, are you the man the front gate just called about? Yes, that's right, FBI. Which is the door to Mr. Dufresne's office? Well, I'm afraid he has some people with him, sir. What did you say your name is? Never mind. Is this the door? Sir, please, we'll have to wait. Come in, Mr. Dollar, come in. Oh. I'm Arnold Dufresne. This is Dr. Dana, and this is Mr. McLaughlin of the Federal Bureau. How are you? We've been expecting you. Oh, uh, have you? Sit down, Dollar. I guess this is your show now, McLaughlin. My credentials, Mr. Dollar. First, I suppose I should prefer charges against you for impersonating a member of the Bureau. Uh, yeah, well, I... I can uh... hardly say that I blame you, though, under the circumstances. Incidentally, our men in Sarasota's had quite a time keeping track of you... You mean there was a tail on me? From the moment you arrived. No kidding. Well, we didn't dare take the chance that you might upset things for us. After all, you've a reputation for being pretty sharp. We should have anticipated that you might be called in on the case, but though we planned things very carefully, we, uh, well, shall we say, overlooked you. Even as we almost slipped up with Dr. Dana here, who would identify that body. Look, will you please tell me what this is all about? A man named Poorman called you in Hartford and asked that you come here to investigate the disappearance of his old friend and client, Parley Barron. Right? Yeah, that's right. Now, where is he? What happened to Barron? Do you know? We do. And we were afraid you might find out and let the, uh, or shall we say, cat out of the bag. That is why we were all ready to send for you to come here, but, well, as it turned out, you came over yourself. Uh, Mr. McLeod. Parley Barron, by the way, Mr. Dollar, is all right, alive, healthy, and happy. Then that body we picked up? Dressed in his clothes? Well, during the last war, Mr. Barron, as a research chemist, made vitally important contributions to our, or shall we say, national security. Oh. He was too valuable a man to lose, even though his wife objected to his work for religious reasons. Uh, yeah, I uh, gathered that from talking to her. Or perhaps you even thought she might somehow be implicated in his disappearance. Uh, the thought certainly entered my mind. Well, in any event, so that he could continue to have a happy home and at the same time carry on his tremendously important work, we arranged for the little deception that has been going on for some years now. His so-called daily fishing trips. That's right. But each morning in a small hidden cove, I needn't tell you where, he was picked up and brought here to Tampa to carry on his work. <laughs> Well, I'll be done. No one was the wiser. Even our, shall we say, uh, competitor nations in atomic and missile research who were bound to keep tabs on such a man, they knew only that he was working for the Dufresne Chemical Corporation. They and that... did know that, huh? Well, we must suppose so. International espionage is pretty well organized these days. Yeah. But uh, now this disappearance, Mr. Were changes in plans for nuclear developments had made it mandatory that he spend some time in... Uh, well, elsewhere. Where? Well, shall we say somewhere in New Mexico or something like that. So to openly send him there would have indicated to our competitors what these new developments could be. That had to be avoided at any cost. Therefore, the plan for his disappearance was carefully worked out and carried out. Then whose body was it we picked up? Well, some poor unidentified old derelict who was on his way to Potter's Field. I see, I see. Well, believe me, if the Bureau functions this thoroughly and everything it does... Oh, we try. Well, what about Mrs. Barron? Oh, she'll bear out. We, of course, made sure of that in the beginning. And then when her dear husband does return... Well, what will it be? When his work is finished. And, of course, that'll be too late for our friends across the sea to catch up with us. And we've worked out a completely plausible story to cover his absence. Oh, I'm sure you have. Now, Dr. Dana here will return to Sarasota in the morning. He will confirm identification of the body that was fished from the sea with only uh, sufficient reservation to protect his professional reputation when Parley Barron reappears. All right. 
Now, what an insurance claim is filed on Baron? Well, I'm sure Mrs. Barron won't file for some time, unless urged to by your friend Poorman. Oh, I can prevent that without telling him anything. That's fine. What's more, with the penchant that some companies have for, shall we say, slow action on claims? Well, don't let them hear you say that. Well, Baron will be back before you need to worry about it. Now, is uh, that okay with you, Mr. Dollar? Uh, Shall we say, okay. And once more, I tip my hat to the FBI. Expense account total, including plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford, $421.50. Remarks? For obvious reasons, I have used fictitious names throughout this report and, of course, delayed filing it until obtaining official clearance. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange old character... The most beautiful girl I've ever met. And money all over the place. Counterfeit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Will Wright, Barney Phillips, Lawrence Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When October dies and the river wind takes over, Broadway is arranged in plots of crowd and coldness. There's a new quality on Broadway, shrill, having to do with top coats and early darkness and frosty sounds. And twilight is brief, a darting ebb of light in the sudden autumn chill and hurry, hurry, hurry to this place or that, home, or to a hot dog stand or to the neon that winks a promise. Hurry, kid, make a phone call, find somebody. It's night already. And it seems the night comes sooner in the tenement district, or somehow it never quite leaves, in the barrio, 
in Spanish Harlem. That's why the people gather together sooner and start their music earlier in a small nightclub like La Cantina, where I was, and Detective Gomez was, and the man who led us across the floor. Through here, senores. Down these steps. He's in the cellar. You were the one who found him? See, si, I went down here to my store bin to replenish the beer for my customers. He... Well, you will see. Is there any other entrance to this cellar than those steps we just came down? You will see, senor. Look, don't make a drama out of it, Luis. Just tell take us... Take it easy, Gomez. There, on the beer cases, stretched out, wet, dead. Now, tell us, Luis, how did it get in here? Coffin, senor. You see a window through which deliveries are made from the alley. Mirror of the window is broken through, so... Well, take a look in the alley, Gomez. Okay. You know who he is, Luis? See. Si. Is Ricardo Miguel, the boy who lives near, the boy who works at the pastelaria, our senor Loca, uh, the bakery shop, also not far. Stamped. Four places that I can... Is the floor show, senor, be gone? Yeah. It is sad you cannot take the time to see, senor. It is exciting. It is sad you are not the time. Beating against the cellar tomb containing a boy's death, the rhythm clack of a woman's high heels, dancing in measured frenzy, to a nimble passion plucked from a guitar, to the percussion of men's applause, to the olays hoarsely whispered deep in the throat. The light bulb sways to it, the shadows dance, and the huddled boy shrieks his stillness. And into it after a while, Gomez with information. There were bloodstains in the alley outside. The boy had been knifed there, had fallen or was pushed through the cellar window. Leave Gomez to the official gathering of the dead. Walk a barrio street to the bakery of Senor Lorca. Try it. Find it closed. Then walk some more. Scavenge the barrio night for scraps about the murdered boy, about Ricardo Miguel. And from an alley wall, moist with autumn's night mist, a form detaches itself whispers into your ear that Ricardo loved a girl much. Reina Martinez lives alone in a room on 110th. Alone. Try her, senor. Go there to a numbered room in a tenement hall. Try. Good to me. The night is good to me. I'm from the police. You bring yourself to the wrong door, senor police. Go skin your knuckles in another place. Yorena Martinez? The barrio woman spit my name at you because her man looked at me? The boy was stabbed, Ricardo Miguel, murdered. Because he loved Reina? Let's talk about it inside, Miss Martinez. In a little while, a boy comes for me. To buy me wine. To take me dancing. I have not combed my hair. I have not painted my mouth. Another time we will talk inside. Now, Miss Martinez... Tell me about Ricardo. I told what there is. He loved me. He was knifed in an alley. We found him in a cellar. Maybe you can tell me why something like that had happened to him. You will not mind if I make myself ready for the boy who comes for me, eh? I fix my hair for the flower he always brings for it. Ricardo Miguel. Let's get back to him. Ay, pobrecito. Poor boy. Poor dead boy. You like my hair so? It won't matter at headquarters. <laughs> so impatient, senor police. All right, I tell you. Then I will tell you, Ricardo. Tell me. He worked with me at Lorca's Pastelaria. He baked little cakes, little pastries. And in between, he spoke love talk in my ear. Sometimes I listen. Often? When he bought for me little things, I listen. You know, jewelry, silk blouse. This that I wear now, he gave to me. I made a promise when he brought it to me. No, I cannot keep it. Pobrecito. Poor boy. That's all there is about Ricardo? He worked with you, loved you? And now he's dead. Sometimes he's the pattern in the barrio, senor police. Why should Ricardo be... Donald! Oh, Mona, little monkey. Who is he, Reina? Oh, the police, Mona. I have finished with him. You like Reina? How she looks for you? What does he want here? A boy was murdered. With a knife. A boy who loved me. Ricardo, the pastries. What do you want with her, mister? What's Reina got to do with it? She just told you. 
When was he killed? Maybe three hours ago, more or less. Who are you? Donald Jordan. College boy with an alibi for Raina. Three hours ago and a sack full of hours before that, Raina was with me. It took that long to show her the ducks in Central Park Lake. That's where you were, Miss Martinez? Donald told you. My mono told you. In other words, you're each other's alibi. Mm Mm-hmm. Each other's. Come to Raina, Donald. Come on, little monkey. Ven. Ven aquí. Come on. Then watch him move toward her, stop. And the girl considering him, and the gesture, her hand sleeking her black hair before she went into his arms. And see a thing, her eyes open, looking over his shoulder and out into the night. And turning to the boy, smiling to him, kissing him, her hand smoothing her hair again, and her eyes watching me as I left. The next morning, back to the barrio, back to the front footage devoted to tenements and window watchers and the people of the doorsteps and the chalk talk. Back to the place that had been closed the night before, the pastry shop of Senor Lorca. Buenas dias, senor. Good morning. I am sorry, senor. Sorry about what? This morning, my stock, it is uh, scarce. However... Because I... Ricardo didn't show up for... My big Ricardo is muerte, dead. So for the next few days... I know. I... I'm from the police. See. Si? You know that Ricardo was murdered, don't you? Seguramente. Of course. Of his dying, I know all about. Oh? See. Si. It has been told all around the barrio. I see. I need some information. I want you to help Seguramente. me. Seguramente. Why not? I want you to tell me all you can about Ricardo and about Reina. Of Ricardo, a boy who bakes pasteles, who lived alone and baked between the hours of nine and five. Excellently. Who I will miss. How come Reina isn't here this morning? I will ask her the identical question when she will come in. Was she here yesterday? Uh, for a time. Then a young man took her to look at ducks. Such a girl as she to look at ducks. Loco. If you would see her, you would... I've uh, seen her. But then you understand. Is there another such one as she, senor? I ask you this because in your profession you must go about the city and see women sometimes of exquisiteness. Yet I do not believe you have seen such a one as Reina. The face of her, the form... You are married, Lorca? In truth, senor, and because you are of the police who enjoy to listen to truth... I wait for Reina to grow up to enjoy me. Then I will be married. Quite a few men seem to be in love with her, Lorca. Ricardo, for instance. See, si, for instance, Ricardo. Why should anyone want to kill him, Lorca? Quien sabe, I shrug. Shrug to denote I do not know. I do not know. Why, indeed? Uh, another question, Senor Police? No, no, that's all for now. Uh, gracias, Senor. Gracias. Adios, mi amigo. Hey, old fellow, and well met. Top of the morning, Danny. We said good morning to each other a couple of hours ago, Gino. Off the dime. What have you got? What I've got is what you're going to get. To wit, a report on the college youth, Donald Jordan, even as you request. Okay, okay. Detective Gomez told me that this Jordan youth is a student at McKay College. That the dean of men whom he questioned told the good detective that this Jordan youth is indeed bright, a gold star student. And found out that this Jordan youth was indeed free to watch ducks yesterday afternoon because he had only morning classes. I see. Well, what have we got on Reina Martinez? Reina Martinez, to wit. According to our files, it seems this Reina Martinez has been a caller at our pokey on various occasions. Once on the occasion of clawing the eyes of a fellow female. Once for waving a knife under the nose of a brush salesman, and another time for carving her initials with a like knife into the epidermis of a friendly barfly. Knife, huh? Yeah, from what you told me of her, Danny, from this Reina Martinez, nobody would mind. What's a knife prick from a girl like you that? You gave me a thought, you know. I'll go ask her.
What does this girl look like, Danny? You'll see. Come on. This house. One side, friend. Take it easy, Buster. What's the hurry? I said one side. He's a big one, Danny. Okay, friend, you asked. Yeah. Come on. Come on, settle down. It's a lot better, young fella. I ask you something. What's the hurry? You guys crazy. Take your Why hands. Why were you running? In a hurry, I run. Police. Huh? Police officers. Look, I didn't have anything to do with it. To do with what? Look. Bring him along, Gomez. Come on, kid. Did you come out of this room? All right, we'll see. Inside. You heard him in. Yeah, I see. I didn't do it. I swear, I swear I didn't do it. I didn't kill it. I didn't kill Ray. I didn't kill it. I... You were listening to Broadway is My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Say, that was some night the gang gave Jack Benny last week when the spendthrift squire surprised them all by inviting them not to a nightclub on him. And the surprise finish, the gang will be waiting for Jack for sure tomorrow night. Yes, Jack Benny, Mary Livingston, Dennis, Phil, Rochester, Don, and tomorrow night, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Listen for them all on CBS Radio. There's fun every minute. The winds of October begin their departure from Broadway, and departing, leave in their wake the gutters choked with regret, the corridors echoing lament. And Broadway picks through the leaving, searches for lost treasures, for images misplaced, left behind in that movie palace, forgotten in the sudden realization that this was your subway stop. There was the girl with the soft fur held close to her throat, covering her face right up to her eyes. The way she looked at you... That was one you'll remember, kid, right through the fall season. And there was that late time on Broadway when the bar was closing. And the guys with convention buttons on their lapels bought you a drink, said, Whenever you're out my way, look me up. That was October, the image and the farewell. So why look for anything else, kid? That's all there is. Except a girl dead in a room you've been in before. Except a sobbing protest. I didn't protest. kill her. I didn't kill her. Except the scream of a radio. Shut that thing off, Gomez. Yeah. Nothing I can do about that, Danny. It's down the street somewhere. Look, I told you I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, you told us. What's your name, kid? Garfield. Bobby Garfield. Rain and me, we were just... What do you do, Bobby? I play football. Let me tell you, huh? Rain and me were just... You're a football player, huh, Bobby? I like football. I play for McKay College. I'm a sophomore. They brought McKay me here. College, huh? You know a boy named Donald Jordan, Bobby? Yeah, I know him. Same fraternity. Look, what is it with you guys? You gonna let me tell you how it was? Sure, Bobby. Go ahead. Tell us how it was. Rain and me, just kind of good friends. You know what I mean? Uh-uh. Tell us. What are you guys twisting it into me for? I didn't kill her. You act What'd like... What'd you do with a gun, Bobby? Throw it away. Let me tell you, huh? Rain and me... I met her right after I came to New York to play football. She saw me play once. Came up to me after the game. Said I played so good, why not celebrate? You're telling us how you didn't kill her. That's why you tried to run away, huh? Because you didn't... We were dancing, see? Kind of dancing to that music you turned off. You can still hear it. We were dancing to that. All of a sudden, there was a shot. I guess from where that window's open to the alley. All of a sudden, Raina just... Dropped down in my arms, and there was blood on my shirt from where she. Uh, see it? Uh, look, I gotta call somebody. I gotta call somebody on the telephone, sir. Sure, you do. We got a phone at headquarters. You can make your call from there. Put the cuffs away, Gomez. We won't need them. Got a gentleman caller, Danny. Huh? Who? A gentleman who comes in answer to Bobby Garcia's phone call. Oh, show him in, Gino. Uh, this way to see Danny Clover. Oh, that'll be all, Gino. How do you do, sir? Very well, thank you. Uh, sit down. Uh, thank you. 
My name's Clover. Douglas, sir. John Douglas. Bobby Garfield called you. Bobby's in a lot of trouble. The trouble, Mr. Clover, is a thing youth is prone to generate for itself. You and I understand that. The trouble is murder. Now, sure. May I ask, Mr. Douglas, why Bobby called you? Of course you may. Didn't you know? I'm a football coach. No, I didn't know. Bobby comes under my tutelage as an end, an excellent one. McKay College's pride. Offensive end, of course. Of course. What else about Bobby? What else about him? I found him in New Mexico, prevail upon the McKay regions to make his way to New York easy. They certainly agreed with me. He's very fast, is Bobby. <laughs> Got a speed racing the super chief across the New Mexico deserts, I tell sports reporters, for color. He was found running out of a room where a girl was shot to death. This, sir, is confounding. I told my squad, I keep telling them, no dates until after the season. So, surely there must be a mistake. Bobby listens to me. There's no mistake, Mr. Douglas. Who was the girl? One of those flirts from Greenberry School across the river, I'll wait here. Reina Martinez, a barrio girl. Of course, if there's um, anything... Well, what am I expected to do? Answer another question. Do you know a McKay student named Donald Jordan? No, he's not football. I wouldn't know him. Uh, I still don't know what I'm uh, expected to do about this... Uh, this altercation that Bobby has gotten himself into. Just talk to him, Mr. Douglas. He's under suspicion of murder. He asked for you. Of course. No, you'll pardon me, sir. Thank you. And watch the leader of men go talk to one of his boys, not knowing what to say, not knowing how to pep talk a boy out of a grief the coach had never played against before. And imagine it. The pat on the shoulder, the voice modulated to the acoustics of a cell. Then the curiosity taking over finally, gentle, insinuating. Tell me about it, son. Tell me about the girl. Tell me what there was about her that made you... Then wipe the smirk off your mouth because you've asked these questions, too. But go on asking them. And because you're a policeman, ask them with the official stamp of approval... Of anyone, of an employer of the girl now dead. Of Senor Lorca, for instance. I told you, Senor. I told you of the exquisiteness of Reina. That she is dead does not change my philosophy about her. Where there is such as Reina, there is such as death. You kill her, Lorca? Listen to me, Senor. Listen very closely. How could I lift my hand to Reina except to... How... This way, with a gun in it. Then shoot her through a window while she was dancing with Bobby Garfield. That's how. Explain me. Explain me something. Why should I do this when I don't even know this, this Garfield? Bobby Garfield. He knew Reina loved her like Ricardo Miguel did. Someone found an alley where Ricardo was, stabbed him to death. Then saw Reina in the arms of Bobby Garfield. Shot Reina, killed her. Watched Garfield being taken to prison. It all worked out real good for a man like you, a man who says he loved Reina, a man who Reina didn't love. I tell you something, senor. All this that you said, I could wish it, wish it deep inside here. But I could not do it. I'm only a seller of pastries. I have not the, the, what it needs. Then you so... didn't know about Garfield. About dead Ricardo, my pastry boy, I knew. About the college boy who took Reina from me to show her dogs, quack, quack. Only these rivals I knew till now. I regret you told me about this Garfio. One more thing, uh, uh, that old name. I may speak to the phone. Go ahead. Lorca's pasteleria. Huh? Ah, a detective. See, there is a detective here. This is what you want of Lord. Momento. For you, senor. Thanks. Danny Clover speaking. Danny, I disturbed you only because Dean Crawford of McKay College phoned in and wants you to come to his office right away. Did he tell you why? He said he's got a shocker for you, but an immediate shocker. Those were his very... Thanks, Gino. Maybe I'll have to get back to you, Larka. So don't go away. <laughs> Did I say something funny, Dean Crawford? No, not you, Mr. Clover. I said something funny. I made the remark to myself. Oh? This week, Mr. Clover, just this week, 
I sent in my resignation to the Board of Regents. A thing unheard of. No dean ever quits at McKay. We get fired. I quit, effective the new year. And that's funny? Scandalous. To use a McKay term that's hardly ever used. And then, think about it, Mr. Clover. One of the students is involved in a murder. All in the same week. This is a black week for McKay. I wonder about something. About what? Statistics. How many McKay boys have gone out into the world and committed murder? As still Dean of McKay, I'll match my boys against anybody. Look, Dean Crawford, you called me. Said it was urgent. Suppose you tell me something urgent. I got a letter a while ago from a daddy. A daddy who is sending his son through McKay. He's a worried man. What are you talking about? The daddy of Donald Jordan. Worried about the bills his son has run up. No wonder. Lingerie, jewelry, baubles. For a sex we only mention in psychology, too. Female. The letter came after your Detective Gomez had left. How close was Donald Jordan to Bobby Garfield? I'll tell you how close. We have an arrangement here. Assign a football player to a scholar. Arrangement. Garfio was coached in his studies by Donald Jordan. This is known as intellectual freedom. Donald writes Bobby's themes, does his assignments, which leaves Bobby free to think about nothing. Admirable. What else can you tell me about them? Which one of those rascals do you think killed that girl? I asked you a question. I've told you everything I can, Mr. Clover. Well, McKay Semper Fidelio, as we always say. Don't you always say? No? I don't blame you. Bye, Mr. Clover. Bobby? Come on, Bobby, on your feet. What? What do you want? Let's go, Bobby. We're going for a visit. Visit? Yeah, we're going back to school. There's rooms on this floor, Mr. Clover, right across the hall from mine. He never goes to the bonfire rallies. He's probably in. This one. The most studious room in the fraternity house. Who is it? You, Bobby. It's me. Bobby Garfield. Bobby, I thought... Oh. Let's go inside, Donald. You sure? Gee, I'm glad to see you're out, Bobby. Yeah, I knew you would be. That's why I came right to you, so you could be glad. That's right, Donald. Bobby told me a lot about you on the way over here. I don't understand what you're doing here. We'll get around to it. I get bad news for you, kid. Bad news? Yeah. You remember something? The day we were inducted into this fraternity? What are you talking about? The day we put four fingers up in the air and gave the secret hand clasp and said the words. The second finger meant loyalty. You haven't been true blue. What did they do to you in jail, Bobby? You talk crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Frat boy. Crazy. Cut it out. Yeah. I'll cut it out. Pardon, I didn't have a paddle, fraternity brother. Is this how you police act? Bring a crazy man into my room and have him beat me up? I'm sorry, Donald. I told him a few things on our way here. I didn't know it would upset him this way. Look, I don't know what this is all about. Why don't we all go down to the bonfire? Sure. Sure, let's do that. It'll make a big impression, Bobby. You being out of jail, gonna play tomorrow. Come on, guys. We're going, all right, but not to a football rally. You're under arrest, Donald. What? Two crazy men. The policeman and me. What do you mean, I'm under arrest? For what? Well, what reason? Murder. Ricardo Miguel, Reina Martinez. You're kidding. Especially Reina Martinez. Now, there was a dame. Take my word for it, fraternity brother, there really was a dame. You talked about me, didn't you? You and Raina. Oh, we had a few chuckles. Whenever your name came up. You ready to go, Donald? What did you say about me? You know what we said. What you say to yourself. Leave him alone, Bobby. I didn't kill anybody, Mr. Clover. You killed one of Raina's boyfriends, Ricardo Miguel, to prove something to her. That she couldn't have anyone but you. That you wouldn't let her have anyone but you. You don't know what you're talking about. Believe me, he knows. 
Four fingers in the air. Ricardo Miguel was killed. You had an alibi for that. You were with Raina. That's right. She told you I was with her. She lied for you. She alibied for you. Because for an instant, she admired you. She did. She did. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. What are you laughing at? I laugh because I remember something. A couple of Saturdays ago, right after a football game. When Raina waited. Until I came out of the stadium. Came up and told me who she was. We celebrated the occasion. <laughs> You took her to that game, didn't you, Donald? I'm only sorry I didn't kill you two. You almost did at that. Who were you aiming at, Donald? Raina or me? While you were peeking at us from the alley. While you were... <laughs> Who were you aiming at? Raina. I wanted to kill her and I did. What she did to me. The things she made me do for her. The things I got for her. And she laughed. The neon spins and Broadway blares out an eight-beat rhythm, the tempo of hunger in dance time. Grab yourself a dream and get with it. Close your eyes and pretend you're holding something special. Keep them closed. Dreams last longer that way. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Dick Crenna was heard as Bobby Garfio and Sam Edwards as Donald Jordan. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Marvin Miller, Lillian Baeff, Herb Butterfield, and Edgar Barrier. Looking for a lively date for tomorrow night? She's on the younger side, but her appeal is to all. Interested? Then meet Corliss Archer, CBS Radio's atomic teenager with her fun-making gang on most of these same stations tomorrow night. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the Frankie Lane Show is your date with slick syncopation every Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of A Thousand Violins, Almost. It began with a lovesick violinist whose mash notes all sounded off-key. Then I met a long-haired violin maker and his daughter, a girl with ambitions to play the harp. Only the prize guy was the one with the gun. He fixed it so I ended up playing second fiddle to a corpse. It was the kind of a day that when there's nothing left to do, you go get a haircut. So I settled down in Sam's barber shop up the street and waited for my number to come up. Instead, I got a cloud of three-for-a-dime cigar smoke. Anthony J. Lyon, my boss, puffed in. Aha! 
Fatso. Oh, there you are, Jeffrey. I've been looking all over for you. Well, keep looking, Fatso. I'm in the chair next. Your hair good? Oh, that can wait, Jeffrey. We've got a new client. You want a detective or a sheepdog? <laughs> it's very funny, Jeffrey. I'll admit you could stand some trimming around the ears, but today I've agreed to help our client. He gets the tremor. Jeffrey, how can you say such a thing? We must get back to the office at once. Mr. Rome is waiting. Mr. Rome? Hey, Charles Rome, a young violinist, very talented. Sure. Hey, that makes us brothers. Brothers? What on earth are you talking about, Jeffrey? Both long hairs. Come on, Fatso. <laughs> I told Sam I'd be back later for the haircut, and the lion and I walked around the corner to our office. Mr. Charles' room was waiting all right. Tall, thin, blonde guy with long, skinny fingers that tapped along the edge of his chair. He was maybe 23. On the floor beside him was a black violin case. He looked nervous. Well, well, Mr. Rome, I told you I'd locate him right away. Hey, Mr. Rome, my number one operative, Mr. Regan. Uh... Oh, how do you do, Mr. Regan? Hi. Hey, Jeffrey, Mr. Rome here will tell you his problem, and I'm sure you can help him. Okay, Rome. Start at the top. Uh, yes, sir. Well, uh, you see, Mr. Regan, it's about Tina. Tina Lanier, my, my fiancée, she uh, uh, returned my ring. That's your problem? Well, there, there's more. Uh, when Tina did that, she, she wouldn't tell me why. But I'm sure she still loves me, Mr. Regan, I'm sure. Another guy? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. She loves me, I tell you. Okay, take it easy. There's... There's one thing I ask, Mr. Regan. Follow Tina, talk to her, find out, but that's all. What? Uh, Jeffrey, Mr. Rome has already discussed this with me. Uh, he, uh, he's especially anxious that we limit the case to the girl and no one else. You, 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 you must promise, Mr. Regan, that there may be others, but you're to pay no attention to them. Just the girl. What are you selling, Rome? Jeffrey! Listen, Lion, I'm tired of buying half-baked stories from any client with a fee. There's more than I wanted. Well, I, I, I can't tell you any more than that, Mr. Regan. It's Tina I'm worried about. Yeah, that's the truth, Jeffrey. Our client... Okay, okay, our client. Only one of these days we're going to know what we're getting into first. All right, Paganini. Where do I find the girl? The tall, skinny guy wrote out an address on the back of a sheet of music paper. It turned out to be a small shop. Cracked white plaster, tiny black sign over the door out on Sunset Boulevard. Lanier's Music Appreciation Shop and Violin Repair Service. I parked the car and went in. It was old violins all over the place. Strings, bows, rosin, busted bridges, pieces of wood, jars of varnish. Amidst the debris sat a little man behind a battered counter. He was sad-eyed, curly-haired, and sixty. His fingers were carefully fitting two pieces of wood together. He didn't look up when I came in. There was a bell on the counter. Uh, uh, oh, oh, a customer. Please forgive me, but that's why I have the bell. I, I don't hear so good, and sometimes I'm too deep in my work. You're Mr. Lanier? Yes, Antonio Lanier. It was Laconata, but you see, the name of Lanier, it's, it's much more American. Is your daughter in? Tina? Well, uh, Tina, she's... Uh, uh, hey, Tony. Leave this for Nick, huh? Uh, Nick? Oh, yes, yes, Nick. Y yes, I leave it for him. Tell him it's a uh, good fiddle, and I want it fixed right. You got that? Uh, sure, sure, I got that. It, it will be fixed. Okay. You're going to tell me about Tina. Uh, Senor, I don't know why it is you wish to, to see her. My, if it's not too important, I suggest uh, some other time. Reason? Well, it's uh, something private. Also, Senor, Tina's not in. She's not returned from her harp lesson. Harp? Yes, uh, she's studying with the great Robert Olenger. He's very fine. Oh, Tina. I'm going to my room, Father. Tina, come here. I must uh, talk with you. It's no use, Father. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Now, leave me alone. Nice girl, Tina. Oh, Signora, please, you mustn't judge Tina too quick. She's a sweet girl, a kind of girl. It's uh, just that, it, well, she's not herself lately. How long does she usually stay in there? Well, who can tell? But tonight, tonight she will be out. Tonight is the concert. And this she does not miss. The Philharmonic, the fine music. What's the girl running from? Please, Signora... I'm tired, very tired. Perhaps we talk some other time. Please, you must go. The little 
little man hurried out of the room and disappeared behind the same door his daughter Tina had slammed a couple of minutes before. Only when he glanced back at me, there was a different look in his eyes, far away, like he was looking right through me. Outside, the sun was setting behind a neon sign, only I didn't get to admire the view. A taxi pulled up and a slim, distinguished-looking guy, gray at the temple, stepped out. He was wearing white tie and tails, and like everybody else, he carried a violin case. He walked right past me without batting an eye and went into the shop. The taxi drove off and I headed for my car. But when I got there, I had a customer waiting. Only the thing he had in his hand was no violin. It was a knife. You know me? You're the guy I left the fiddle for Nick to fix. That's right, Maestro. I'm the guy. Get to the point. You're playing the wrong tune. You can talk plainer than that. Sure, but I'm a musician. I prefer to put my message in my own idiom, if you get what I mean. You play the knife? Oh, no. The shiv is just protection. I play the cello, maestro. And I'm telling you to join another orchestra. Tina Lanier doesn't want you hanging around. End of composition, maestro. The guy with the knife waved a quick downbeat in my direction and disappeared. I headed for home and a shower and some concert-type clothes. An old double-breasted suit and a shirt my laundry claimed was white. I just finished a quick shave when I heard somebody playing boy drummer on my door. I opened it. Oh, uh, may I come in, Mr. Regan? Why not? You've got a musician's union card. Charles Rome, double-breasted suit and white shirt, but no violin case, sat down. He had something on his mind, but from the look on his face, it didn't add that he was anxious to go into it. I washed the shaving soap off my face and dressed while he sat. That's when I got an idea. You dressed to go out? Why, uh, uh, yes. Concert? Uh, Yes, Mr. Regan. How how did you know? You and Tina used to go to concerts together. We used to. You're going tonight, hoping to see her. Well, that's true. Uh, But, but, Mr. Regan, I came to see you about Tina to talk to you. Go later. Have you got a season ticket? To the concert? Yes. Next to Tina. You bought them together. Well, it was before we... we... Okay, I, I got news for you, Rome. It's going to be a big evening, only you aren't going to be there. Oh, but, 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 Mr. Regan, it's my chance to see Tina, to, to talk yeah, to her. Yeah, there'll be talk, all right, but you won't be in it. But, but, but Give I... me that ticket, Paganini. I got a date with the lady who plays the harp. It was a big night at the Philharmonic. Crowds in mink and earrings, starch shirts and top hats, and the rest of us in the balcony. I found the seat Charles Rome had bought and settled down to wait for Tina Lanier. Ten minutes later, she showed up. She sat down next to me without looking right or left, and things began to happen. A tall, slim guy, gray at the temples, full dress, came out on the stage. He took a bow, and the audience calmed down. And I recognized him. The guy I'd seen going into Antonio Lanier's violin shop. I took a quick look at the program, but I didn't need it to know the guy with the baton was Robert Erlinger. Tina's harp teacher. Tina Lanier sat there with her eyes closed and listened to the music. But I had a job to do. I nudged her arm and she turned with a start. Her eyes blinked and then she recognized me. What do you want? Talk, sweetheart. Leave me alone. Why did you ditch him? Who are you talking about? Charles Rome, your fiance. I won't answer that. You might be smart. I know what's smart. Go away. Quiet, please. Rome's got a right to an explanation. He got his ring back. Who are you, anyway? Jeff Regan. I don't know you, Mr. Regan. Leave me alone. Quiet, please. Okay, sister, it's your life. Only Rome isn't going to like it that way. Maybe you'll want to know about the man with a knife at your place. What? Yeah, the little guy who carries a shiv. Long, sharp. Charlie Rome might be interested. You saw him? He saw me. I don't like knives waved under my throat. If you won't be quiet, I'll call the manager. Mr. Regan, please, tell Charles. Tell him I'm sorry. That's all. That's all there is. You sure? Yes, I'm sure. Now, go away. So my talk with Tina Lanier got me nowhere. Except the fact that somebody was putting the screws on somebody else and it didn't add up to a broken engagement. What it did add up to was a lot of violins. 
I thought about that as I headed for the little red sign that said exit. I made my way past a couple of frowning ushers to the alley outside. When I got there, it was dark and empty. Me and a couple of bottles and torn ticket stubs. I walked out toward the street and then stopped. Somewhere in that alley was somebody else. Maybe behind the fire escape. Maybe behind a big poster. And then I was sure... Okay, Maestro. Get your hands off. I told you, Maestro. Knife again. Yeah, the shiv, Maestro. Sharp steel in this blade. There's enough to make you look like a bag of confetti. What's Tina Lanier to you? It's not your business, Maestro. I told you to stay away from her. I told you it was off key. Now I'm going to show you just what a... Knife... The mug folded into a heap on the alley. He could trade in the knife any time. He wouldn't need it where he was going. I headed out of the alley toward where the shots came from. There was a cab driver at the curb waiting for the concert crowd, and I grabbed him. Only he saw nobody and said nothing. The guy who put the slugs in the cello player was gone. I headed back to my car and hopped in. Now I had to have answers and have them fast. Jeff Regan was too close to a killing not to have a lot of it rub off. It was going to be me and a murderer... Are the police? It started when a lovesick violinist hired the lion and me to find out why his fiancée, Tina Lanier, gave him the go-by. But it ended with me and a corpse in an alley beside the Philharmonic Auditorium. The corpse was a mug who wanted me to stay away from Tina. I'd first met him at a violin repair shop out on Sunset. And that's where I was heading now. To Lanier's Music Appreciation Shop and Violin Repair Service. Owned and operated by Tina Lanier's father. It was close to nine o'clock when I got out of my car, went inside, and rang the bell on the counter. A medium-sized, sharp-looking character with a pencil-lined mustache came out from the back room. Yes, sir? Lanier in... I'm sorry, sir. The shop is closed for the evening. Okay. But tell Lanier I want to talk to him. I'm afraid you misunderstood me. I said the shop was closed for the evening. Look, Mac, this is business, and I don't mean fiddles. I go tell him what I said. Very well, if you insist. Oh, uh, by the way, my name is Nick, not Mac. The suave gentleman named Nick went back through the door. A couple of minutes later, Antonio Lanier shuffled out to meet me. He was wearing an overcoat, and even in the dim light of the shop, you could make out tears in his eyes. You wish to see me, senor? Yeah. I wonder perhaps if you could wait until tomorrow. That's pretty important, Mr. Lanier. Yes, I suppose it is. You see, I have to go out. It's important, too. Uh, Maybe I better tell you something. There's been a murder. Murder? Yeah, a little guy. I saw him in your shop today. He left a violin for Nick. Yes, yes, I know. You know about him? I know he was killed 30 minutes ago, senor. The police telephoned to tell me. You mean... That's correct, senor. The man with the violin is dead. And my daughter... My daughter, Tina has been arrested for murder. Antonio Lanier walked out of the little shop and I watched his bent shoulders as he shuffled off down the street. Then I realized what had happened. Tina Lanier had followed me when I left the concert. That meant she'd gotten to the alley just after the shots were fired. She could add the rest easy. A couple of ushers, maybe, hearing the shots, had run out and found her. That was enough for the police to take her in for questioning. Well, there wasn't much I could do until morning, so I headed home for some sleep. I dreamed about a group of excited figures all talking to each other. Only when I looked closer, they weren't people. They were violins. The next morning, I drove down to the police station. Lieutenant Candid, homicide squad, was at his desk. Now what's bothering you, Regan? The Lanier girl... Well, I can understand why. Cut it out. I've seen some lookers in that cell, Regan. Remember the Pendleton dame a couple of years ago? 
Some woman. Chopped up her husband with an axe. What about Tina Lanier? Remember the Carlton woman back in 39? There was a dame. Red hair, green eyes, legs. <clears throat> what was it she used? A letter opener? Ice pick. Oh, yeah, ice pick. Oh, I hated to see her go, Regan. Gas chamber? Not guilty. She's married again. Millionaire. Which brings us to Tina Lanier. Yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Maybe not the fire that Carlton woman had, but not bad. Get to the point, Candid. What have you got on her? She killed a guy, Regan. We call it murder. There's more. Sure there's more. There's always more. Like? Like she was found standing over the guy. Guy's name, Joe Fenton. Petty crook, knife artist. San Quentin boy, Regan. Did a year in 1945. That's no motive. You know something else? While Fenton was in prison, he played cello with the San Quentin Orchestra. Cute? I'm still listening. Okay. How about this? Tina Lanier's been dating Joe Fenton for two months. The boyfriend. What? That's right. Got witnesses for that. Um, what's Tina Lanier to you, Regan? She was engaged to a guy named Charles Rome. Client. You're betting on him? I'm not betting on anybody. I think you got the wrong customer. Oh, it's a drab job, Regan. Dames like Tina brighten up the place. You understand? Sure. I understand. Mm -hmm. See you around. Yeah, see you around. That gave me a lead. Joe Fenton, Tina Lanier. I headed for the office of my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. Only when I got there, I got another surprise. Sitting across the desk from him was Antonio Lanier. Violin case under his arm, circles under his eyes. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, I've been looking for you. Mr. Lanier wants to talk to you. Well, that makes us even. Jeffrey, what on earth are you talking about? Mr. Lanier has retained us to clear his daughter, Tina. Mr. Lanier is a client, Jeffrey, a client. Is that right, Lanier? Yes, sir, Mr. Regan. Yes, sir, that's a correct. Well, then, maybe you'd like to talk now. But Mr. Regan, I... There's questions, Mr. Lanier, like... Like about Tina. Tina someday gonna be a fine artist. She will be recognized as a true... If she stays away from guys like Joe Fenton. Yes. Yes. Okay, Lanier. One more question. Who's Nick? What? Nick, your helper, the guy Joe Fenton left the violin for. Well, Nick... Uh, Nick is just as you say, my helper. I... Uh, I hired him uh, several years ago. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, why are you ago. questioning our client this way? Because we've got to get facts before we get a total. We were hired to find out why Tina dissed Charles Rome, and now she's got herself booked for a murder she probably didn't commit, and her father expects us to clear her. We can't go into this thing wearing a blindfold. Yeah, but Jeffrey, aren't we going to help Mr. Lanier? Yeah. Yeah, I'll drop him by his shop. Maybe if he gets his hands on a violin, he'll relax. <laughs> Lanier sat in the front seat as we drove out sunset. He didn't say anything. His tired little shoulders were hunched forward as he stared out of the window, watching the traffic. In front of the shop, he thanked me again and went inside. I started to drive away and then stopped. A cab had pulled up behind me and a tall, thin guy with graying hair stepped out. Under his arm, a violin case. Robert Erlinger, the guy I wanted to have words with. Dr. Erlinger, I presume? I beg your pardon? You got a minute? I don't know you. I know you. Uh, what is it you want? It has something to do with the murder. Your pupil, Tina Lanier, is on the hook. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was on my way to see Mr. Lanier to express my sympathy and to offer my services in any way. Okay. You want to help? A couple of questions. You play the fiddle? Mr. Regan. I play every instrument in the orchestra. Well, then why carry a violin? I was taking it to Mr. Lanier for repairs. Oh, you mind if I look? I don't see what possible interest my violin would hold for you. Well, just let me decide. Very well. But I must ask you not to handle it. It was beginning to make sense. A lot of separate strings, like on a violin... Only when you tune them, make the notes fit each other, and draw a bow across it, you get music. I headed for the downtown library and found a binding of all the issues of the San Quentin News, the prison paper, for the year 1945. The year Joe Fenton had dropped in. 
I spent two hours covering every page. And then I had it. The last note. Call it the lost chord. But it sang like a canary. I checked for my gun and drove out toward Hollywood. It took me 30 minutes in the nighttime traffic, and then I was there. Yes, so who is it? Regan. Who? Oh, it's you, Senor Regan. I'd like to have words with you, Lanier. Well, Senor, I'm very busy. I'm doing a rush job. Ah, uh, so am I. So? Yeah, it's about Tina. Oh, and then, of course, we will talk, Senor Regan. About Tina, I'm always willing to talk. Well, that'll save us a lot of trouble, Lanier. Yes, yes. So please, uh, sit down here. Thanks. <clears throat> got a little story for you, Lanier. Short story, but covers a lot of territory. Yes, I'm listening, senor. It uh, starts with a guy and his daughter. A violin maker who put a lot of faith in his girl with talent. A guy who'd sell his soul to give the girl everything. Yes, that's, that's it true. This guy sold his talent for making violins. Sold it for a dough so he could give his girl harp lessons. Maybe. Seems this guy made a mistake once. Went to prison for it. Mistakes? We all make mistakes? Sure. Only the guy I'm talking about made another one. While in prison, he met a couple of musicians in the prison band. They had ideas. Used the guy's talent for making violins. Phony masterpieces. Take regular fiddles and doctor them up so they look like real dough. You... you know. I know. You sold yourself back up the river, Lanier. But Tina... Yeah. Yes, it's a true. My senor, such a talent. Such a talent cannot be wasted. The only Tina ditched a career in a nice guy like Charlie Rome for dough. Your mistake, Lanier. But she was not in her right mind. She didn't know what she was doing. But you did. You killed Joe Fenton and your daughter's set to take the rap. No. No, I will not let her. Senor Regan, when you came in, I was a thinking. Thinking all alone, with my violins beside me. I had decided, Tina will suffer no longer for my mistakes. I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them everything. I'm going to... Let me well, I'm going to tell the police anything, Lanier. Medium-sized guy, pencil line mustache, gun in his hand. The guy I'd met the night before in Lanier's shop... Nick. Stay where you are, Regan. Ah, you're the other half of the team. You and Joe Fenton. Saw your picture about a half hour ago. That right? Library. Back copy of the San Quentin News. Picture of the prison orchestra. You and Fenton and Lanier. Oh, isn't that nice? Real nice. My picture in the paper. That's too bad Erlinger didn't see it. Before he let Tina talk him into bringing his violin here for repairs. Yes. I saw Erlinger's fiddle. A Guinarius worth about 50000 you used it to model from, to have Lanier make the phonies. Erlinger's a dumb cluck. He never knew the difference. Besides, he got his original Guarnerius back. Sure, he's dumb. That way. But so is Lanier. Quiet, easy going, little man. Probably would have lived to a ripe old honest age. You mugs hadn't dropped him. We just told Lanier what kind of a chance a man with a record had. We convinced him, Regan, he was better off using his brain for something lucrative. You mean you blackmailed him? You can call it that. He took persuading, but he's finished now. You just killed a guy. You're the one who's finished. <coughs> Not yet. Bad timing. Out of my race. Now we're even. Operator? Police. The nearest violin shop. Sunset. Yeah. Bring an ambulance. It took a week to patch up the hole in my arm, but... Antonio Lanier wasn't that lucky. He died, trying to do something right for his daughter, Tina. And maybe he succeeded. Tina Lanier and Charles Rome dropped in to see me a couple of days later. 
The scared look was out of her eyes, and even with the tears, there was something soft and warm. By the time I was in shape again, I needed a haircut so bad, even the dog catcher wasn't interested. And I figured my barber, Sam, could take the full afternoon for the job. Hey, what's the matter with you, Jeff? I never seen such a head of hair on a St. Bernard. Ah, busy, Sam. What do you mean, busy? A fellow with a soft job like you guys got no reason not to have his hair cut every two weeks, maybe ten days. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, here you are. I've been looking all over for you. Hiya, fatso. Hey, Jeffrey, what's the idea of not showing up at the office? Just because you got a little bandage on your arm doesn't mean you can take a week off. You gave me the week off. I did not. Oh, yes, so I did. He caught me in a weak moment. Oh, well, that makes us even. Beat it, fatso. I'm getting a haircut. Yeah, so I see. Needed it, too. Well, when you're finished, Jeffrey, I want you to report to the office at once. We've got a client. Client? Yes, big oil man from Texas. Lots of money. Seems as though he met some man on the street one day. And they Sam, had words about some oil stuff. turn the chair and around. Man, well, thing, Jeff. Man. Yeah, that's better, Sam. Man, huh? client, you got time for shampoo, Jeff? Nothing but time, Sam. Give me the works. <laughs> Jeff Regan Investigator is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Aron. Jeff Regan Investigator is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan Investigator. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If some of you have wondered where Mike Shane has been during regular office hours the past few days, you'll find the answer on the front page of this evening's San Francisco papers. That's right, the murder trial of Jack Holmes. At this moment, which is along about 6.30, Phyllis Knight has one of those newspapers spread out on the desk before her. As she glares at the headlines, Mike is talking on the phone to Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Faraday, yeah, I just got back from court. Didn't take the jury long to decide. Less than two hours, Mike. That boy is no more guilty than I am. Sure, somebody killed the watchman, but not Jack Holmes. Now, don't take it so hard, Mike, just because his sweetheart hired you to investigate. All right, all right. Maybe I'm sentimental about those two kids, but I say Jack Holmes isn't the killer type. And with a nice girl like Janet Miley... Oh, Faraday, Faraday, I let him down, and Janet was so certain I could take help him. Take it easy, Mike. You did your best, but... The evidence was against you. Yeah, sure. If you're sure it was. Is that unusual? Why, I've cleared dozens of guys when it looked like... Jack, like... what's wrong? Hello. Hello, Mike. I'll talk to you later, Faraday. The girl's just walked in. Janet, are you sick? You're white as a sheet. Here, get her some water, honey, quick. Yeah. Mr. Shane. Yes? Jackie. Yeah? Jackie. Oh, here, here, sit down, honey. Let me help you. Oh, the poor kid. She's all unstrung about the verdict. No, it's more than that. Her hands are like ice. He didn't do it. I just... Discovered what? the grocery. What? Janet, what are you trying to say, honey? My room. Somebody went through. Huh? Oh, oh, Janet. Here, here, Janet, drink this water. Janet? 12, 15. I, I just discovered. I went and told him. I thought he would. Oh. Mike. Mike, she's fainted. I'm going to call a doctor. Phyllis. Yeah? Call Inspector Faraday. She's dead. Okay, Mike, I fixed it. We can go to Jack's cell now. All right, all right. Now, remember, honey, not a word about Janet's death. Jack will go all to pieces and we'll learn nothing. I know, I know, but it seems so hard-hearted. This way, kids. Ah, oh, boy. Sad business, I guess the girl figured after that jury's verdict she didn't have anything left to live for. Suicide? Uh-uh. No, no. 
If Janet found something she thought would clear Jack, she certainly wouldn't take poison. Unless she took the poison before she got the information that would clear Jack. Hmm? No, then she would have called a doctor. If we can believe her dying words, she went first to some man, told him her discovery, then came to us. She didn't even know she was poisoned. All right, but who did it? We only knew what she was trying to tell us. Better pipe down. That's Jack's cell with a jailer standing outside. Oh, yes, sir. Now let me do most of the talking. All right, Morrissey. Open it up. Yes, Inspector. Hello, Jack. Hello. How do you feel, Jack? Oh, top of the world. It's so cheering to be condemned to death for a crime you didn't commit. You had a fair trial, my boy. The jury could decide only on the evidence presented. I told them I left the warehouse that night way before it happened. At 12.15, I was at home. But no, they take the word of that cab driver. He did pick you up at the warehouse door, and he said the clock in the drugstore read a quarter past 12. I checked the clock myself the next day. It was an electric right on time. So did I, Jack. Unless the cab driver was lying, and he seemed like an honest guy. I see. Even my loyal detective, Mr. Shane, says I'm guilty. Oh, no. No, Jack, you don't understand. Go ahead. Say I killed the watchman. Say I stole the diamonds. You never were working for Janet and me. Yes, we were, Jack, and we still are. That's why we're here. It's about Janet. She's not so good. What? What are you trying to say? She came to the office a little while ago and tried to tell us something, some new evidence she had found, but, well, she got sick. What's wrong? Is she all right? Where is she? Now, easy, son, easy. She's still at the office. She said a lot of mixed-up things, Jack. Her room had been ransacked, something about a grocery that you weren't guilty, and she had discovered proof and told him so. Him? Who's him? Oh, that's what we don't know. Did, uh, uh, does Janet have any close men friends she might go to? Not that I know of. We've been engaged for almost a year now. She never mentioned any. Our boss, Mr. Phillips, is a good friend of both of us. Yes, yeah, he's paying the fee on the case. She might have gone to him, or maybe to his partner. Mr. Russell? Oh, no, not that old crap. Well, why come to me? Janet's the one to tell you. Well, as we said, Jack, she's all busted up over this thing, and she isn't well. Well, she can talk, can't she? she... Can't she? Jack. I can see it in your faces. Something's happened to her. What is it? Tell me. She... She's dead, isn't she? We're awfully sorry, son. see, you went out to my home, Mr. Shane. That's right, Mr. Phillips, and your wife told us you were working at the office this evening. Yes, Russell and I spent so many days in court on the trial. We had to work evenings to keep up with business. Now, oh. I wouldn't imagine there'd be such a turnover in the wholesale jewelry line. You'd be surprised. Our firm cuts and mounts gems for at least half the better jewelry stores in the city. Then the robbery and loss of the diamonds didn't hurt your trade. It would have, Inspector, except for the capture and trial of Jack Holmes. Of course, we're covered by insurance. If you'll step into the office. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Yes, Bauer? May I see you a moment, sir? Uh, yes, excuse me, please. Uh, go right into the office. Okay, sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Russell. Miss Russell. Good evening. I uh, believe you and your sister know Inspector Faraday. Of course. Yes. How are you, Inspector? Fair enough, thanks. So the lady executives work nights around this company, too. If she's the treasurer, she does. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And now, Mr. Shane, I suppose you'd like your fee, now that nothing more can be done for poor Jack. Well, I'd hardly bring Inspector Faraday along just to collect the check, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> well, I assume... The case is cracked wide open again. Janet Miley has just died. What? Janet? She was poisoned. She staggered into our office about an hour ago, gasped out a few words, and she died. I was afraid of this. Remember, Anne, I said to you, if the jury brought in a guilty verdict... It wasn't was no... suicide, Mr. Russell. I said she was poisoned. Poisoned? Her dying words were that she'd found new evidence and that she had gone to him, some man, and told him. Well, of course, she came to me, but she didn't say anything about evidence. What time was this, Mr. Phillips? About six o'clock. She was crying and hysterical. Begged me to help Jack to get a retrial or an appeal. I tried to comfort her. Excuse me, Mr. Phillips, but I thought you'd like these invoices. Sir. I'm very busy, Mr. Bauer. Oh, yes, sir. I'll leave them here on the desk. If Janet found any new evidence, it'd hardly be likely to clear Jack Holmes. 
I'm pretty well convinced that young man is a born criminal. Mr. Russell, that's unfair. Is it? Look at the court testimony. Phillips and I found shorties in Jack's account books. We called him back to the office that night to explain he couldn't. Said he wanted to spend the night checking back through his records. Phillips and I left. Next thing we know, 1,300 carats worth of diamonds are missing. Night watchman's found dead. You never found the diamonds? Of course not. He hid them. I'm afraid it's true. The watchman's clock was smashed. It stopped at 12.10. The cab driver picked up Jack at 12.15. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you mind leaving the room? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. He's new here. Bauer is the nosiest secretary I've ever hired. Bauer! Now no, I remember. Remember what? Well, I was in the outer office this evening. When Janet came out of this room, Bauer stopped her. I heard him say something about going out to a bar and having a little chat. I'm going to call him back. A bar, eh? Do you suppose the poison was slipped into a drink? Mr. Bauer! Oh, Mr. Bauer, hold on. Stop! Hey, Inspector, what? what's wrong? He's running for the front door! He's running. We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Week in and week out, a lot of motorists go along wondering why their engines lack power without realizing that much of their trouble may be due to dirty or worn-out spark plugs. Yes, that's right. Defective or worn spark plugs are to blame for a great deal of poor engine performance. For example, engineering tests show that faulty spark plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of every ten, which not only cuts down your mileage, but causes your engine to lose power. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engine has been losing power, it's a pretty safe bet that the Union Oil Minuteman Spark Plug Service can do you some good. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. Or if new plugs are indicated, he can quickly install them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. While Inspector Faraday hurries off in pursuit of the fleeing Secretary Bauer, Mike and Phyllis have set off on an errand of their own. And now in the hallway of a certain apartment house. Oh, here we are. 327. Not much fellow here. Mike, that secretary, Bauer, he's tied into this somehow. Mm-hmm. Snooping around to hear what we said and then running from the inspector. Well, I'll leave that problem to Faraday, you know. Wow. Place looks all in order. Hey, wait a minute, honey. For bed. It's not made up, it's cut to pieces. Yeah, the stuffing pulled out of the mattress. What on earth were they looking for? Let's go here, let me see. Oh, the bathroom. Mike, look at the medicine cabinet. And the floor. Uh Uh-huh. Bottles and jars scattered all over the place. Every one of them with its top or Look at this cold cream jar. Here, the cream's been scooped out and dropped all over the basin. Huh? Oh, that's an old trick, honey. Hiding gems in a woman's makeup. Mike, you don't think Jan... But she had the diamonds. Well, somebody thought so. Maybe she did. No. No, that guess that. That's too dizzy. Well, come on, let's check the other room again. Yeah. There's something worth looking into. A desk. Yeah. Somebody else found it, too. Drawers yanked out. Everything's a mess. Well, I doubt if there's anything left for us, but I'll double check. Still searching. No. No, just the usual stuff. Say, how about that wastebasket, honey? How about it? Here. Put huh? in my thumb and pulled out a plum. What a big girl am I? Yeah. A check torn in half. Mm-hmm. Paid to the order of Janet Miley. Two thousand dollars. And signed by... Well, I'll be a... Anne Elizabeth Russell. I think this note went with it, Mike. It's the same handwriting. Janet, take this and do as I say. And that's all. Take this and do as I say. Which apparently Janet did not... $2,000 is a rather expensive no thanks. Well, stuff this in your purse, Angel. We're about to go places and ask questions. You know, if you ask me, Shh, Miss honey, Russell... Quiet. What? Hmm? So please, the door. Quick. Snap off the lights. Yeah. I'll flatten against the wall. I'll jump him when he comes in. No, I don't like. 
All right, buddy. Come on, up with your hands. What? Let go of me, you dope. What? Faraday. You? Yeah, me. Oh, I thought you were chasing Bauer. I got away. I phoned Phillips for Bauer's home address. Turned out to be a gas station. Oh, a phony, eh? Well, we've got a lead that may be better. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Give the doorbell another push, Mike. You know, I wish these people would stay put. First we go to their homes, but they're working at the office. Now they're not at the office, they're home. Somebody's coming now. Yes? Oh, it's you again. Don't strain your enthusiasm, Mr. Russell. May we come in? Uh, yes. Mr. Russell, we would like to talk to your sister. And? Oh, well, she's upstairs. Will you ask her to come down, please? Yes, if you'll go into the living room. Anne? Oh, Anne, will you come downstairs? May I ask what you people want? Oh, you'll hear it. Oh, by the way, sir, I believe your sister is treasurer of your company? She is. For how long? Six or seven years. How long was Janet Miley with your firm? Mm, several years. She worked in the same department with Jack Holmes. Look here, I insist on knowing what this is about. Alfred? Are you in here, Anne? Oh, you're all back. Yes, these people say they want to talk to you, Anne. Phyllis, uh, give me that check and note. Ready and waiting. Miss Russell, would you look at this note and check, please? So Janet gave them to you. What did she tell you? Right now, I'm more interested in what you told her. What was Janet to do for your $2,000? Two thousand. And what's the meaning of this? I was merely trying to save you from yourself, brother dear. Save me? I've watched you for a long time, Alfred. What is... I saw the way you were mooning around Janet. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? I know you proposed marriage to the girl. And now with Jack out of the way, you thought she'd say yes. But I'm not going to have another woman in this organization. I have trouble enough as it is. That doesn't explain the $2,000, Miss Russell. Of course it does. I offered her the money to get out of town and not come back. And what right had you? You're not running my life. Well, this puts a new slant on everything. Could be that Russell wanted Jack out of the way so he could have a clear track with Janet. Uh The diamond robbery might have been conveniently arranged. That's a lie. If Miss Russell didn't want her brother to marry Janet and the girl wouldn't buy off, then perhaps Big Sister thought of another way out. You mean the poison route, Phil? How dare you? You, you, Uh, 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 you mustn't. I know some naughty names, too. Oh, surely, Mr. Shane, you've got some brains. You don't believe such insane twaddle. Are you referring to my colleagues, Miss Russell, or to your story? No. It could be possible you and your brother Alfred have been uh, putting on a little act for us. I'll answer that remark, Mr. Shane, but right now you're wanted on the phone. What? Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Shane, this is Power. I've got to see at once. What? Where are you? Listen. I have the real dope on the murder. Meet me at the old Dutch windmill in Golden Gate Park. What time? Let's see. It's just about 10 o'clock. Make it 10.30. And come alone. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Bauer. So it's Bauer. Where is he, Mike? Quiet, Inspector. Well, Mr. Russell, I I think we'll be running along. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. I'm sure you will. No, no, please. Don't bother to see us to the door. Mike, where are we going? Golden Gate Park. Bauer wants to talk to us secretly. A great secret with somebody listening on the line. What? Who's listening? Miss Ann Russell on the extension phone right in the hall here. Is it Mike? Ten twenty-eight. Now keep back in the shadows with Faraday. Oh, this guy Bauer certainly picked a romantic spot to meet the old Dutch windmill in the loneliest corner of the park. Not to mention spooky. Look at those four huge veins above us, like the arms of a giant hovering over our heads. Oh, Angel, your poetry picks the doggondest times to bust loose. Well, I can't help it. I'm nervous. What time is it now? Ten twenty-nine. I don't know. This may be a trap. Bauer may be after you, Mike. I don't like anything about that bird. I don't like anything about tonight, period. Psst. I see a light through the bushes. Car's coming around the turn. Got your gun, Mike? I'm all set. Now keep back in the shadows. This sounds like he's driving fast. What was that? Sounded like a gun. Why, Grandma Faraday, your nerves. Here he comes. Mike, he's passing you. Mike? Hey, Bauer! 
Fire! He's skidding. Is he hurt? Is he yeah. hurt badly? Can't tell yet. Open his shirt, Mike. What's a waste of time, Inspector? Look at the back of his head. Oh, guess I was right. We did hear a shot. But who would do it? Who knew he was coming here to talk? Oh, that phone call. Yeah, Ann Russell. Well, I guess there's no mystery about this killing. Hey, Faraday, here's his wallet. Maybe it will answer a few things for us. Let's see. Hmm. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm old enough to be told. Mr. Bauer wasn't any ordinary secretary. He was an insurance detective. Planted in that office to find the missing diamonds. Well, then maybe he ransacked Janet's apartment. Yes, he did. It says so here in his pocket notebook. Search girl's room, no evidence, no jewels. Janet went in to see Phillips. Something's up. Took her to bar. Told me to check on mistake. 12.15. 12.15. Mike. Remember? Huh? Janet tried to tell us something about that. Twelve fifteen. That was when Jack was picked up by the taxi driver. Yes, according to the clock in the drugstore window. Inspector, let's telephone the coroner and then then what? Go take a good look at that clock. <laughs> Oh, this is a waste of time, Mike. I checked that clock the day after the robbery. So did we, Inspector, before the trial began. It's an electric. It keeps perfect time. It couldn't be wrong. Save your breath, pal. Mike's in another stubborn spell. Oh, the drugstore's closed for the night. Yeah, but there's the clock. You can read it a hundred feet away. Neon hands, neon numerals. Uh, it says 11.10. What time have you got, Faraday? 11.10. Now are you satisfied? Jack came out of the jewelry place two doors north of the drugstore. The taxi picked him up. The driver saw the clock in the window... The window. What are you staring at, Mike? The grocery store over there. Inspector, call a cab and get the driver who picked up Jack Holmes. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. As a featured part of this service, the Minutemen also inspect your ignition cables. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Normally, they give little trouble. But if anything happens to them, if they get broken or frayed, or if the insulation is damaged, even brand new spark plugs won't help your driving. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. And by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich, full spark needed for complete combustion. So for a careful check and double check on your car's firepower, have a Union Oil Minuteman service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll get honest, accurate work, and you'll notice the increased power and snap from your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It's a few minutes past midnight. At a lonely street corner in the commercial district, Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are talking to a scared little taxi driver. Look, Phyllis, it's just like I said in court. I'm cruising along here and I see this guy. The inspector and I know that, Smitty. Now, we just want you to show us. Now, do exactly as you did that night. Yeah, cruise down the street and pretend you're picking up Jack Holmes. And we'll get in the back seat and ride along. Okay, okay. Climb in. Here, darling. Come in. Thank you. I turns this corner here, see? Mm-hmm. And I moves in along when I spots him crossing the street. He waves at me, so I slows down. I stops right about here. Jack was standing in the middle of the street. You opened the door. Which one? The right one. He climbs in and gives me the address. Well, go ahead. Open the door, Smitty. See, ain't you got no imagination? Now, Smitty, when did you see the clock? Right now, when I leans over to close the door. There it is in the window, see? All lit up with neons. Okay, look at it. What time does the clock say? Uh, gee, it's just like that night. 12.15. Mike, you were right. He made the same mistake all over again. Look at it again, Smitty. Look hard. Now, come on, look hard. What do you mean, look hard? The clock says, hey, there's something screwy. The numbers, they're backwards. Right, Smitty, right. You're not looking at the clock. 
You're looking at the reflection in the grocery store window. The real clock is across the street in the drugstore. The drugstore clock reads a quarter to twelve, but the reflection looks like a quarter after twelve. Thirty minutes different, Smitty. Gee, I got a sworn. Say, I did swear. You ain't gonna pinch me, are you? No, Smitty. Now, are you willing to do something for us? Me? Yeah, sure. Anything, fellas. All right. We're going to pick up three passengers, and one of them is the murderer. Here we are, folks. Here's the office. Right. Mr. Shane, I doubt we'll find anything in here that the police haven't already gone over. Well, they have the wrong slant, Mr. Phillips. You see, someone planned to steal those diamonds, but they needed a fall guy, Jack Holmes. So they faked the shortage in his account books. Then they called him that night, very indignant at discovering his dishonesty. Just a minute. I was the one who found him out. Shut up, Ann. Jack said he wanted to check back through his records. He didn't leave till a quarter to twelve. About midnight, the thief came here and stole the diamonds. The night watchman surprised the thief and was killed. Then the cab driver blundered about the drugstore clock, and Jack was really on the spot. For the killer, it was a beautiful out. Janet discovered the mistake this afternoon. She told it to Bauer. He checked her story. When he discovered Janet was dead, he tried to tell me what Janet told him. That's why he was killed. Oh, that's rubbish. Bauer ran away from the inspector. Why? He must have had a reason. He had. He wasn't ready to talk yet. You see, there's one detail we didn't tell you people. Bauer was a detective himself. He was what? Oh, yes, yes. Hired by the insurance company to find those diamonds. You mean that he was... What? Do you think he found the diamonds? I'm sure he didn't. If we can step inside the office, Mr. Phillips, I'll show you why. Now, Bauer had a suspect, but it was the wrong one. He did know, however, that Jack was innocent. And uh, when he telephoned me, the same call you listened in on, Miss Russell... The killer knew he was trapped, unless... I don't believe it. I didn't hear anything on that phone. Oh, yes, you did, Miss Russell. You ought to have recognized it. Now, perhaps you will now. Mr. Shane, stop this cat and mouse business. Please, please. That clock on the bookcase there, in five seconds, it's going to strike the hour. Now, listen. One, two, three... This is fantastic. Four... Well, distinctive chimes, aren't they? This is the same clock I heard strike while I was talking to Bauer on the phone. He called from this very room. There was only one man who knew where I was who could tell Bauer where to phone me. Mr. Phillips. Me? You're insane. Am I? Bauer told you Jack was innocent. You sat there in your chair and heard him say to meet me at the old Dutch windmill at 10.30. So you killed him. He trusted the wrong person, just as Janet did. She came to you, told you about the drugstore clock. You had to stop her tongue. You poured her a drink from this water jug in your desk with poison in the glass. You anything to say to that, Mr. Phillips? No. No, nothing. I thought not. All right, Inspector. Oh, come on in the house, kids. Huh? Mrs. Faraday will be glad to fix us some eggs and coffee. Oh, no, no, no. It's pretty late, Faraday. I think we all better get to bed. Look at Phil here. She's almost asleep. I am not. I was just thinking. How did you know, Mike, that the clock you heard over the phone was in Philip's office? Oh, I heard it the first time we went there, dear. It just took me a little while to get it placed in my memory. Mm. Clocks ran all through this case, didn't they? The watchman's clock stopped at 12.10. The drugstore clock that convicted poor Jack. The office clock that caught the murderer. Yeah, sometimes a clock can tell more than the time of day. Oh, oh, Mike, that's corny. But Mm -hmm. I knew you'd say it. I was just waiting for it. Well, I guess Michael's entitled to a little corn off the cob tonight. (laughs) That was neat thinking, my boy. A clock reflected in the window and the hands reversed by 30 minutes. Doubt if I'd have thought of it myself. Oh, Faraday, please, Mike's ego. Huh? Besides, I think I know why he's so leery of clocks lately. Mm? Oh, now listen here, honey, if you mean yes, Go on, Phil, let's have it. Well, Mike had a date with me for 6 o'clock, and he was an hour late. No, no, Angel, please, no, no. And guess what his alibi was? He thought he saw a clock that said 5 p.m. It was a grocery scale with 5 pounds of potatoes in it. This is Mike Shane again. On June 4th, we come on the air one half hour earlier. Remember now, that's not next Monday night, but the Monday for following, 
June 4. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Put that gun down, you little fool. Shut up, Mr. North. Be careful, Jerry. Listen to her, Mr. North. She's making a lot of sense. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denning. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Diamond Noose. Apartment 4B, 24 St. Anne's Place, New York, is occupied by Mr. and Mrs. North. Mr. North is a publisher. Apartment C, in the basement of the same building, is occupied by Samuel Ryan and his son Skip. Mr. Ryan is a janitor. An apartment on the sixth floor and an apartment in the basement. A publisher and a janitor. How could the life of either of them ever affect the other? Pam! I'm almost ready. Oh, darling, the Wilsons are expecting us at six, and it's nearly that now. Zip me. Where? Back. Thank you. Mm-hmm. How do I look? Oh, peachy keen. Come on, now let's go. I need something. A hug and a kiss? And must my dress? Hmm. Just a kiss, then. No hug. And smear my lipstick. I know. What? What I need. The necklace Aunt Harriet gave me. Oh, but it's in the safety deposit box at the bank, dear. Uh Uh-uh. I brought it home when I went to the bank this morning. Uh, Will you get it out of my jewel box for me? Okay, but we've got to get going. Oh, stop fretting. We'll be at the Wilsons in plenty of time. Pam! What? It isn't here. The necklace? Well, don't be silly. Of course it is. Well, see for yourself. But I distinctly remember putting it... Oh, no. Oh, no what? Well, I-, I took it out later to try it on. Now, let's see. What did I do with it? Oh, Pam, that necklace is worth... I wanted to see how it looked in the soft light, so I went to the mirror in the hall. And then the telephone rang. It was Ethel Wiley, Wiley dear. She's just back from Europe. Pam! She had a wonderful trip. Italy, France, Aunt England... Harry, it's and Harry, necklace, Pam. Where is it? On the telephone table in the hall. Oh, oh Pam, dear. Let's, let's not be so casual about it, huh? I'm sorry, Jerry. Okay, now. Now, come on. After all, that necklace is the closest thing we have to an annuity. <laughs> it's perfectly safe. See? Here it is. Right... Jerry, it's not here. Nope. But I... Uh... Oh, you, you, you put it down somewhere else, Pam. Well, no, I... Oh, now, you must have. Now, think. After after you talked to Ethel Wiley, what, what did you... Jerry, the necklace was right here. You, you're sure of that? Positive. What? Darling, it's been stolen. It, it couldn't have been. But it has. Has there been anybody in the apartment today? No. Well, then it's... it's... Wait. Yes, there was someone in here. Mr. Ryan. Ryan? The the janitor? Well, I was out at the grocery store. He let himself in to fix the faucet in the kitchen. Well, well, at least the faucet wasn't fixed when I went out, and it was when I got back. Oh, but Ryan, he he seems like such a nice old guy. Oh, I can't believe that he... Oh, now, now, Pam, you, you, you must have put the necklace somewhere else. But I didn't, Jerry. Darling, if that necklace isn't right here on this table, Mr. Ryan took it. Well, then I, I suppose the only thing to do is call the police. I guess so. Okay, now. Oh, no, now, now look, there's something wrong. I, I just don't think Ryan would do a thing like this. Well, and before I call the police, I'm going down to his apartment and talk to him. <laughs> How about it, Hody? What do you think it's worth, huh? Oh, I don't know, kid. A couple of bills, maybe. Two hundred? Is that all? I'll say three on the outside. Where'd you say you got it? One of the apartments in the building. 4B. People named North. Pa made me go up with him to help him fix a faucet. I saw the thing. It was just laying there, so... 
Gosh, Hody, you sure we can't get more than two or three hundred? Why all of a sudden such a big urge for dough, Skip? I want to get out of here, Hody. Get a joint of my own like you did. I can't stand it anymore, the way Pa's always yammering at me. Go to school, study hard, make something of yourself. <laughs> Don't be a bum like your brother. You know what it's like, Hody. Pa put you over the same jump. Yeah. Look, Hody, would you let me move in with you? Now, hold it, kid. Just for a little while, Hody. Just till you and Jackie get married. <laughs> you want a 99-year lease, huh? What? Skip it, Skip. Oh, no, wait. What's the matter with you and Jackie? Nothing's the matter with me. Ain't you getting married? Not that I know of. But when I saw her over at her old man's store the other day, she talked like what you... What Jackie talks like and what I do is two different things. Now, let's drop the subject, huh? Sure, sure, Hody. Okay. Now, about this necklace... Let me take it and see what I can do. Oh. Dr. Nicholas. Take it. Skip. In here, Pa. Skip, did you sweep down the back step? Well. Hiya, Pa. What are you doing there? Skip called me and asked me to come over. Skip, go to your room. Oh, Pa. You heard me. But I... Go on, kid. See you later, Hody. Sure. I thought I told you that you're not welcome here. So I'm going. Out the back way. I put all the garbage out the back way. You're getting to be a real humorist, ain't you, Pop? Hody. Yeah? I'm telling you for the last time. Stay away from Skip. Leave him alone. You're dirt. You're scum. When you make dirt and scum out of everybody you touch. If you weren't my old man, I'd beat your ears off. You draw the line at beating your father? This surprises me. Ah. Hey, Hody. Jackie. What are you doing here? Well, I was over in my father's store. I, I thought I recognized your car. What do you want? Want? You haven't called me for over a week. I haven't seen you for two weeks. What do you think I want? I want to know oh, why I... Oh, look, we can't talk here. Why not? I got something to do. Then where can we talk and when? Well, how about my place in, say, an hour, huh? All right, Hody. Your place in an hour. And this is one date with me you'd better keep. You must be mistaken, Mrs. North. The necklace must be in the apartment somewhere. I know it isn't, Mr. Ryan. And you're the only other person who was in the apartment today. But I let myself in the back door and I was in the kitchen all the time. I... What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? Skip. Skip? My boy. He was helping me and I left him there for a few minutes while I came down. Skip! Yeah? Come out here. What do you want now? Come here! You rotten little... What's the idea? Mr. Ryan. Take it easy, Mr. Ryan. Let go of me. Where's the necklace? I ain't got it. Let go of me. Stay where you are, Pa. What? Stay where you are. You'll get hurt. A gun? Yeah, a gun. And it's loaded. Now get away from that door, Pa. Move. Look, you little fool. You shut up, mister. Be careful, Jerry. Listen to her, Mr. North. Give. So long, Pa. Give. <laughs> Hello? Hody, this is Skip. Oh, hi, kid. How's everything? Hody, I'm in a jam. The necklace. The people I stole it from came to Pa. What'd you do? Well, I, I kind of lost my head. Pa started slapping me around and I, I had to pull a gun to get away. You picking a rod? Yeah. Look, Hody, I gotta have some dough. Do you know somebody who'll give you something on that necklace fast? Well, uh, yeah. Where are you calling from, Skip? A drugstore. Okay, give me a couple of hours. It's 6.30 now. Then make it 9. Where? Your place? No, no, not up here. Paul, no, you might come to see me. Yeah, you're right. Well, look, you know that beer joint over on First Avenue called the Garden Spot? Yeah. You remember you used to hang out there a lot when you lived with Pa and me? Yeah, yeah, I remember. At nine. On the nose. Please, Mr. North, I, I know it's a lot to ask. Well, it certainly is. Your boy steals a $4,000 necklace, pulls a gun on us, He's and you a... a good boy, Mr. North. Ha! Huh. Jerry. He is, Mr. North. Or... 
He was until last winter when he started hanging around with a bunch of young toughs in a saloon called the Garden Spot. And then Hody started coming around. Hody? My older boy. He's bad. Mm. Hody's always been bad. He's just 25, and already he's been in reform school twice and, and prison once. He's the one who's given Skip these ideas, who's trying to make a thief out of his brother. And it looks like he's succeeded. No, Mr. North, he hasn't. Skip will be all right. I, I know he will. If you let me find him, talk to him. Let me tell him that you won't go to the police if he'll return the necklace and, and promise never to do anything like this again. Oh, let's do it, darling. Please, Mr. North. Well, all right. Thank you, Mr. North. We'll give you until tomorrow morning. And if you haven't found him by then, or if you have found him and he won't do as you ask, I'm going to the police. Understand? Oh, yes, yes. All right. Come on, Pam. Mm. to have my head examined. I don't think so. I hope you're right. Well, we'd better get upstairs and call the Wilsons and explain that we'll be late. We're not going to the Wilsons, Pam. Oh, why not? Because we're going to follow Mr. Ryan. If he finds that kid of his, I have a hunch he's going to need someone who can yell for help. Relax, Jackie, relax, will you? It's not like that at all. Then how is it, Hody? You keep standing me up, you don't telephone. I've been busy. What's her name? It's not anything like that. Oh, Jackie, you know how I feel about you. Maybe you'd better remind me. Come to Papa. No. Baby. No, that's too easy. Sure. Nice and easy. Hold it. <laughs> Come here, you. Oh, Hody. Hody, why do you treat me like this? I'm sorry, baby. You love me, Hody. You do, don't you? I'm mad about the girl. Oh, you're... Oh, never mind. Now, nah, that's better. Hey, let's do something tonight, huh? What'll it be? The colony? Stork? 21? Hody. <laughs> okay. Smiley's beer stoop. It'll be him. Now Hody. you... Yeah? I'll settle for the city hall in the morning. Now, Jackie... Why do you keep stalling, Hody? You said three months ago we were going to be married. It takes dough, Jackie. A lot of dough. And that's why I haven't been seeing you lately. Honest, Tony, I've been working like a dog, trying to get a little ahead so we can do it up brown when we take the plunge. I'd like to believe that, Hody. It's the truth. Oh, baby. I don't like this waiting around any more than you do, but be a little patient, huh? All right, Holy. That's better. Now, you go home and get yourself dolled up, and I'll meet you at Smiley's. Usual time? Usual time. All right. And wear that pink dress of yours. The one that's cut... <whistles> you know. All right. Whew. Yeah? Jigger Stoats, how did you telephone me? Yeah, Jigger. I got a necklace I'd like you to take a look at. Okay, bring it around in the morning. I got to see you tonight, Jigger, right now. I'll be over in about ten minutes. Why the five o'clock rush? I'm leaving town tonight. Well, look, friend, if your merchandise is that hot, it's I It's not that. Look, Jigger, the necklace is worth three thousand, easy. Four, maybe. And I'll give it to you for one. I don't like guys who want to hurt it to me favors, Hody. Where'd you get the merchandise? My kid brother lifted it. And this is cool ice, Jigger. Believe me. Then why the rush down love? It's... It's a dame. Uh-huh. She's breathing down my neck about City Hall. Uh-huh. I'll be easy to do business with, Jigger. Can I come over? <laughs> okay, Hody. Ten minutes? Ten minutes. You, you don't understand. Stanley Hotel, 316. Okay. Please, Hody Ryan is my son. I don't care if he's your grandfather, Pop. He's checked out. He's <laughs> gone. I don't know where he went. Now beat it, huh? Leave me alone. What are you so anxious to find Hody for? 
from what he said, you two weren't planning to go to a father and son banquet together. I don't care about Hody. I'm looking for Skiff, and I'm sure he's with Hody. Now, please, Miss Williams, if you know where Hody is... If I knew, I tell you, but I don't. Now, go away. Will you leave me alone? Now, now, look, mister. If the kid's only 17, he ain't never been in here. I don't serve to minors. But he hangs around here all the time. You're mistaken. No kid 17 is allowed in here. Now, move along and leave me alone. Oh, brother, what a sightseeing tour this has turned out to be. We trailed Ryan to one hotel, one pool hall, one apartment house, five public phone booths, and out of this place. What's it called? The garden spot. Hmm. Looks as though it should be called a garbage dump. Yeah, well, since it was your idea to follow Mr. Ryan, you haven't much room for complaint, Jerry. Well, maybe not, dear, but who was it that, that wanted to call the police when the kid... Oh, brother. Here we go again. Oh, no. There's Ryan getting in his taxi. The yellow cab company's certainly going to be in the black when Ryan settles up with that meter. Well, that's... Oh, Jerry, wait. Hmm? Darling, look. Where? I'm going into that beer parlor. Skip Ryan. And if father doesn't see him, oh, Jerry, what do we do? I don't know what you're going to do, darling, but I'm going to call a friend of ours who happens by a comforting coincidence to be a police officer. Bill? Bill. But here he is. I'm telling you, kid, and for the last time, get out of here. I don't want no customers with fathers who come snooping around. But it's after nine. Are you sure Hody ain't been around? If he'd been around, I'd seen him. Now, will you? Okay, okay. The door's that way. I'm going to wait out back. Ah, oh, Hody, Hody, where the devil are you? Don't you? Hody. Hody, where are you? Over here. Where? I can't see nothing. This alley's as black as... Here. You. Just past the door. Over here. Where? Hody, I can't see... Uh, Hody. Uh, Hody, what's the matter? Uh, take a look at my back, kid. I got a knife in it. <laughs> Boy's still in there, Jerry? You didn't see him come out, did you? No. Well, then. Mm-hmm. Oh, where the devil is Bill? He should be here by now. I still say you shouldn't have telephoned him. After all, you did promise Mr. Ryan. I called Bill Wigand as, as a... As a friend, not as a policeman, I know. But that's drawing a rather fine distinction if you're asking Oh, me. here he is. Bill? Yeah, that's his car pulling up across the street. Come on, let's go. Okay. Here we are, Bill. Hello, Pam. Hi, Bill. Hi, Jerry. Well, what's this all about? Well, it's like this, Bill. A boy named Skip Ryan, the son of the janitor in our apartment building, stole a necklace of pants. He's, he's sitting there at the bar now. Where? Well, right. Hey, what the... Jerry, he's gone. But he was right there just a second ago. Come on. Now, look, will you two oh, tell hurry, me what Bill. this... Uh... Bartender. Yeah? Uh, the, the boy, the one that was sitting here, where is he? What boy? He was sitting right here a minute ago. Oh, you know who we mean. Now, come on. Look, who are you people to come busting in uh, here? This is who I am, fellow. Oh, sorry, Lieutenant. Well, when I wouldn't serve him, he left out the back way, the door to the alley. Well, that's better. Come on, Pam and Jerry. What happened, Hootie? Who did it? Jackie. Jackie? Huh? Oh, I... I should have closed the transom before I talked to Jigger. Huh? Uh, Jackie. Jackie heard me tell Jigger I... I wanted to run out on her. <laughs> and she followed me and... Someone's coming out of the beer joint. I'll Shh. tell him... But who... Golly, it's dark. Like the inside of a park. And the kid's probably six blocks away by this time. Hold it, let me... Shut up. Come on, come on. Let's go back inside. And you two tell me what this is all about. Huh. They're gone. Hody, you're hurt. You should have let me tell him. I got other plans. But, listen. What? The necklace. I got a grand for it. A thousand? But you told me you couldn't get more than two. Oh, I got more. But listen. Now, listen to me. I don't have it now. Jackie took it. Now, let's you and me go back and get it, huh? 
But you can't walk this... It's only a couple of blocks. I know it, but you... So if I can't walk, I'll crawl. I'll... I'll keep this date with Jackie if I have to get there on my hands and knees. Uh, we're, we're doing okay, huh, Skip? Yeah. Sure. We're doing fine. Another block. Cody. What? Up ahead. At the corner. The cop on the beach. Back against the building. Cody, you can... Get me back against the building. Come on. Ah. Okay. Now, if he doesn't leave in a minute, we go around the block. You'll never make it. Huh? Think so. Watch me, kid. Just watch me. We're almost there, kid. Let me put my arm around your shoulder, huh? Sure. Hey, Mike. Hey, Lurk. Hey, what's the matter, kid? Your pal take on too much ballast? Yeah, yeah. Want some help? No, no, he's okay. Do yourself, kid. Come on, my daddy. Oh, good boy, Skip. Well, Jackie, here we come. Huh? Made it, Skip. Made it. Huh. Ring the bell. Now that gun you got. Jimmy. Why? Jimmy. What do you want it for? To collect a thousand bucks. Shh. Okay, Odie. Hello, Jackie. Odie. What's the matter, Jackie? We had a date, didn't we? Odie! It's ridiculous to go cruising around this neighborhood anymore. Jerry's right, Pam. Now, look, why don't we just... Skip Ryan went into that bar for some reason, not just to have a drink. But the fact remains that we've lost Skip Ryan and Mr. Ryan. So so why don't Uh, we... Jerry, stop the car. Pam, what the... Stop! Okay, okay. Now, will you tell us what... That apartment house. Well, what about it? It's the one Mr. Ryan went into while we were following him. And you said he apparently called on someone in apartment 905. To which I must reply, so what? So maybe Mr. Ryan got some information from apartment 905 that would be useful to us, dear. Are you proposing that we go in there and... Yes. Oh, Bill, for Pete's sake. She's your wife, Jerry. Coward. In the name of heaven. Squirm, baby, squirm. I love every minute of it. Cody. And you'll excuse me if I don't sit down on it. But the knife in my back makes reclining in the easy chairs a little... a little uncomfortable, you know. The dough, Cody. That's all we came for. That's all you came for. It's there in my purse. Take it. Cody, please. You heard the lady. Take the dough and beat it. No. I wouldn't have done it if you'd played square. I wouldn't have. I loved you, Cody. Give me that gun, Cody. Stay away from me, kid. Don't let him do it, Skip. He tried to double-cross you just like he did me. You shut up. He collected a thousand on the necklace and was going to give you I said shut up. I'm not going to let you kill her like this, Hody. Now, don't come any closer, Skip. I wouldn't want to... Watch out. Answer it, Jackie. Stay where you are, you dirty little... Give me that gun. Drop that gun, Hody. Drop it. Don't, Skip. Don't. All right, all right. Break it up. Come on, break it up. Get the gun, Jerry. I've got it, Bill. What? Why didn't you let me do it, Skip? Oh, Jerry, look. Good Lord, a knife in his back. Why, Skip? Why didn't you... I don't know, Hody. Hody. He can't hear you, son. He's dead. Okay, Bill, thanks for calling. Well, that does it. What, Jerry? Jackie Williams has confessed. Oh. She admits following Hody Ryan to the fence, Mm -hmm. and then to the beer hall where she killed him. Oh, oh, and they've arrested Jigger Stotts, too. Well, it's about time. Oh, oh, Jerry, when can we get Aunt Harriet's necklace back? Well, uh, not for quite a while, I'm afraid. Well, why? Well, it's, uh, it's been impounded as evidence. They can't do that. It's the law, Pam. Well, I don't care. Jerry, you know how Aunt Harriet is... 
if she ever found out that I'd been so careless with something she gave me, she'd... Well, well I, I wouldn't be her favorite niece any longer. Oh, Cut me out Pam, of her will Pam, and... your Aunt Harriet's way out in Wyoming. Well, yes, but what <laughs> So how will she ever find out about the necklace? Now, just relax. <laughs> I'll get it. Yes, what is... Mm. Pam! Pam! Jerry, what in the world is the matter? Look who's come to visit. Aunt Harriet! Next week, more adventure of Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the winter moon dips low over Broadway and hides again behind the scudding mists, Broadway is numbed. The year's ending is too swift. There's too much nighttime in December, as if the dimness of the subway had moved one flight up, as if the lights were not quite lights, but yellow things that drain off into shadows. It's a time of the muffler, the hurry up, the time of the wind. The dreams are dying, and it's a long while before April comes again. The place where I was, also one flight up above the street of the tired apartment houses and hotels. The avenue leased to anybody on the premise that home is any place where the rent is cheap. Hotel Savannah. The man who walked beside me and explained it all to me. After all, Lieutenant. After, after all. all. What? The do not disturb sign has been hanging on the front of the door all day. And here it is almost midnight. So? So, a place like this. Rent a room for three fifty. Pull out the old pills. Leave the world to its own sorrow. The Savannah's getting quite a reputation for... Oh, this is the room. Now, that's how I found her. Right there on the bed. I could tell right away she wasn't a suicide. That bullet hole, no gun. Who is she? Took the room yesterday. Registered as Mary Smith. Ah, I keep a straight face as long as the payment is made in advance. Even she didn't have luggage, so what? Quite a few of my friends have not a presentable suitcase to their names. What about her visitors? This is her home away from home. That's our philosophy here at the Savannah. Why shouldn't she have visitors? After did she have any? I don't know. People come and go. A regular little world in itself, this Savannah. I remark this to myself often as I stand at the desk. Like I was looking on into a regular little world. That's why I always Don't say, say it, Mr. Burgess. I'll take it from here. And consider the place where a girl lies dead. A room of transients, a cubicle, a lotted, sold to the passer-through. The mark of their passing, the scars where cigarettes were ground into the desktop. The hotel stationery, the postcards with the scenes of gaiety tinted in, ink-stained, finger-smudged, blank. The sign, please turn out lights when departing, leave key at desk. The bed, where passing sleep is sold at the current rate. And in it, Mary Smith, dead by violence. (laughs) 
Phone it in. Check other hotel personnel. Be told for the day she'd been there, the girl was quiet, discreet, no trouble at all. Visitors? Maybe, maybe not. Policy not to notice things like that. And take it home with you. Try to sleep against the image, desolate, lonely. Not quite make it. And welcome the coming of day. Somewhere to go, someone to talk to. You have a bad night, Danny. You have the look of someone who has slept with rocks in his bed, head to foot. That's your morning's greeting to me, Sergeant Tataglia? You see, other mornings you refer to me as Gino. But this morning, Danny, why is this morning different from all other mornings? You got something for me, Gino. Goes without saying. Sure, I got something. We coded that girl's fingerprints, that Mary Smith, put them on the wire to the chums of the FBI during the night. Had an answer? Those chums of the FBI are veritable Johnnies on the spot, Danny. You had an answer, huh? On the spot. According to the info lately come to hand and now contained in my breast pocket, Danny, this Mary Smith was not a Mary Smith. Oh, no, not at all. All right, Gino, who was she? A Peg Ramsey, formerly of the Women's Army Corps, which makes her a former wife, which makes it easy for our Washington co-workers to check such things as fingerprints flying through the night. Such things as... As what? As the occupation of the deceased prior to say. This Peg Ramsey, heretofore known as Mary Smith, was a member of the publishing firm, Taggart and Ramsey on Lower Madison. It brightens the morning for you, Danny, this info? You tried, Gino. You really did. Thanks. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Get around to believing you, Mr. Taggart. Miss Ramsey was murdered in a cheap hotel named the Savannah. We want you to help us. What was she doing there? Was she registered? Look, Mr. Taggart... I can't believe it. I, I just can't believe it. Let's try it this way. What did Miss Ramsey do here at your publishing house? At our publishing house, Mr. Clover, Peg is as much responsible for the success of Taggart and Ramsey as I am. Of course, I'm directly responsible for a book club's choosing four of our novels. Peg only had three, but then... Just tell me what she did. Had final say on what we would publish and what we wouldn't. Along with me, of course. Also, the discovery of talent and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. Friends? Every unpublished author in the world. You must understand, Taggart and Ramsey enjoys an enviable reputation. We publish stuff that others wouldn't even touch. Of course, sometimes we take a loss publishing literature, but we make up for it. Put out a crossword puzzle book and... Yeah, but what about special friends, Mr. Taggart? Oh, working on the premise that special friends can be special enemies, huh? That happens in our latest mystery, Kill the Murderer Dead. It'll be released for publication in May. Mr. Taggart... Peg had a very special friend. Who? William Walter. Who is William Walter? A writer. Where do I find him? I don't know. I have no idea. Peg handled him. What made him so special? Well, according to Peg, he was special because he was talent. The once-in-a-lifetime talent. Personally, I've heard that phrase too many times. Last year, after such a talent, we had to publish jumbo crossword puzzle books 5, 6, and 7 in a hurry. And that was the relationship between Miss Ramsey and this William Walter, publisher and writer. Oh, I think more. I think Peg had her times to be a publisher and times to be a woman. It's my belief from observing Peg that she mixed the two up for this boy. What else about this William Walter? He was brought here from North Carolina. Brought here? You mean your firm subsidized him? <laughs> a writer's dream, but no. He was brought here by a Mrs. Janice Kirk, a self-styled discoverer of talent. Knew Peg slightly, brought him to her with a couple chapters of a novel. Peg believed in this boy and gave him uh, an advance. And where do I find this Mrs. Kirk? Oh, I can tell you that easily. At the Ruxton Hotel. I've had cocktails with her there. An attractive woman, the way those women from North Carolina can be. Now, uh, will you pardon me, Mr. Clover? And at the hotel, ask for Janice Kirk. Be told she's been seen entering the cocktail lounge. Go there. The head waiter raises his eyebrows with an effort, tilts a patrician head slightly to the left, and that way indicates the woman sitting alone, sipping the colorless drink, sipping the colorless music, weaving its frightened way through potted palms. And on her face, the smile of acceptance for the music, for the furtive cocktail time laughter, for the glances of men, attached, unattached. Hello there, and all that. Mrs. Kirk? I saw Alec tilt his Roman coin head, and that brought you to me. Whatever the reason, I'm glad. It's been lonely. I'm from the police, Mrs. Kirk. You didn't have to tell me that. You could have let me believe you'd walked in here and seen a... 
Well, an interesting face, sitting alone with her lost thoughts, and you took pity in it. You could have let me believe that. I've just come from Alfred Tigert of Tigert and Ramsey. Alfred, he... you tell him I'm very disappointed in him. He hasn't asked me to cocktails and Well, it must be hours now. You tell him that. He said you knew Peg Ramsey. Miss Ramsey, I've taken notice of her. I've talked to her, I remember. I wouldn't call that knowing a girl. Now, why did he go and tell you I knew her? She's dead, murdered. She gave her name as Mary Smith and was killed in a hotel room. Why? Didn't she have a home of her own? I didn't mean to say that. Truly, I didn't mean to be flippant over death. Not a death like that. Not an empty way to die. Taggart told me something else. I'm sure he did. It was about the boy, wasn't it? He told me about a boy, young writer, William Walter. William, sweet William, sweet, sweet William. Maybe you can tell me more about him than Taggart did, Mrs. Kirk. Well, I know I can. I know more about him than I know about myself. Wasn't it I that discovered the burning tree of talent in him? Wasn't it I that beat him, tortured him, soothed him till he put it all on paper? Figuratively, that is. I did that to him, figuratively. Wasn't it I that brought him here so his poetry could cry out across your metropolitan skies? Where is he now? I don't know. You said that I said I don't know. First William stayed here, right here in this hotel close to me. And he took to living in all kinds of places, dismal places, dirty little finished rooms and tenement sordid hotels. Let me just high and dry for months so as he could taste your city. Then you haven't seen him. There is a phone call for you, Mr. Clover. You can take it here. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. You want it, Danny, right away. Savannah Hotel. Why, Gino? A boy shot to death in one of the rooms. Savannah Hotel, Danny. The same one. I hate your telephones. They interrupt just when... Something bad's happened, hasn't it? I know it from your face. Something real bad. And I'll tell you another thing, Mr. Clover. I should have kept my big mouth shut about the reputation of the Savannah. Right down here. Same floor, same hallway as the last time I was here. Not only that. Same room. There he is, Mr. Clover. You know who? Yeah. Registered about noon. Gave his name as William Walter. Said he was a writer. <laughs> First time we ever had a writer. And in the room of transience, yet another one sprawled there across the bed, a boy, like a tired puppet, discarded. And the bullet hole in his temple gave him another quality, an attitude suddenly and forever caught in an instant of time, and the gun held in his dangling fist, the end of him, the death of William Walter. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A titled Englishman whined and dined at a swank Park Avenue address is then mysteriously murdered. It takes no less than Mr. Chameleon, master of disguises, to make a dent in the Hand of Fate murder case. Follow Mr. Chameleon on this engrossing police operation tomorrow... Yes, that's tomorrow on CBS Radio. Mr. Chameleon is now heard at a new time, Sundays, on most of these same CBS radio stations. On the eve of the merry holidays, Broadway treats itself to a ten-cent sprig of mistletoe, stands under it, watches the women walk by. They hug the warm fur close. Let the December wind riffle it against their mouths, their cheeks. Let the wind breathe them away from you. And for background, the music flowing out of the tinseled metallic throats of loudspeakers. And the kids standing carefully away from the assorted street corner Santa Clauses, eyeing them, studying them, lifting great puzzled eyes to the grown-up who holds their hand. Good, huh, kid? Makes you glow, so find the coin, drop it in the pot. Pay off for the year that never was. And in a room, again, the place of the dead. Be alone with it for a little while. Be alone with the boy with a bullet wound in his temple. The boy would come to the great city with poetry to offer, and in return had been given this, 
The end of searching, the end of pain. Be alone with it until Detective Mugovan comes back. I had a little talk with Burgess, the manager, Danny, like you told me. Yeah? Says the boy made a big to-do when he registered. Burgess tell you why? Uh Uh-huh. Seems his kid, William Walter, insisted on having exactly the same room where the girl was killed. Manager tried to talk him out of it, offered him other rooms. Kid wouldn't have it any other way. I think I know why. Sure. Boy was a writer. That gives him a right the emotions the rest of us aren't privileged with. That's why he has to die in a room You through, Mugovan? Yeah. I guess I've been in it too long, Danny. Here's why he wanted this room. Found it in his pocket. Marriage license. I looked at it, Danny. Thanks. Hmm. Issued to William Walder and Margaret Ramsey. That'd be Peg Ramsey, the murdered girl, huh, Danny? Yeah. A place like this is probably going to keep the marriage a secret. Uh-huh. Hey, come over here, Michael. Found something else. Here on the desk. Oh, it's written so fine. Wait, I... got to put on my glasses. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Peg, beloved Peg. All of it is done, finished... For you, now for me. For someone you breathed life into, then dying, took it from him. Done. Finished. He wrote this, Dan? We'll check it at headquarters. I think we'll find he wrote it. With a gun in his hand like that, this note, how he insisted on the same room, suicide, huh? Call it in, Mugovan. Uh, come on in, Mugovan. Been down a technical? Yeah, for an hour, more or less. Took me that long to get out of Gordon what he knew as soon as I walked in. Now, guys like Gordon give mothers a bad name. <laughs> gave you a rough time, huh? Yeah, had me looking through microscopes, gave me a short lecture on the theory of spectrochemical analysis. Then when I didn't applaud, he got angry. <laughs> Anyhow, the gun that William Walter allegedly killed himself with also fired the bullet that killed Peg Ramsey. Murder and suicide, huh, Mugovan? I guess so. What do you think? Take a look at this suicide note. Well, I saw it, Danny. No, well, I know you saw it, but look at it again. It's a suicide note. Is it? Hmm? Show me where he says he's going to kill himself. Show me where it says that he... What is it, Gino? Lady outside to see you, Danny. What lady? Name's Janice Kirk. Show her in. This way to see Danny Clover. Thanks. That'll be all, Sergeant. Well, please sit down, Miss Kirk. This is uh, Detective Mugovan. How do you do? Mrs. Kirk. I'm going to leave town tomorrow, Mr. Clover. I see. Yes. This is a lonely city now. I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of it because so many things, mostly... William Walter? Yes. Oh, I want to say, Mrs. Kirk, how sorry we are. Thank you. Mrs. Kirk, one thing I'd like to ask you, just what interest... The way you said Mrs., the little glance that just happened between you, you and this other gentleman... The missus means I was once married. My husband is dead. I see. And just what interest I had in William. He was a great writer. I said I was lonely. Now that William's dead, the world's a little bit more lonely, too. Though it'll never know it. Just why did you come here? I want to ask something of you, may I? Of course. I brought William here. I want to take him home. I want to bury him. We've already sent notification to North Carolina to his uh, next of kin. But in this case, don't you see, it should be me who should take... Well, call it responsibility. Call it whatever. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kirk. Until we hear from the next of kin, we have no authority I loved him. Is that what you wanted to hear me say? Go ahead, exchange glances again. Snicker a little bit behind your hands. Mrs. Kirk, what the lieutenant said simply means... Well, you see, it really makes no difference at all. For a moment, consider her fury at being deprived of the dead boy and understand it. Understand it because of the sudden statement of love for him. Blurt it out, bitter, explosive, no longer to be contained. But let it also open a door onto new questions. The finding out of why a boy's life must be taken. A boy of talent. A boy who was about to be married. A boy who had apparently scrawled a note against the insistent calling of death. Murder, suicide, Make sure which. Let it take you to a place you'd been before, to a man you'd talked to before. I can't tell you how glad I am you came back to me, Mr. Clover. I just can't tell you how glad. Why, Mr. Taggart? Well, uh, 
This is perhaps an uncalled-for thought after those dismal doings at the Savannah Hotel. Even tragic, you might say. Peg and that boy. Just tell me, Mr. Taggart. Well, I was wondering, uh, just a fleeting thought, mind you, did you happen to find the manuscript of the boy's novel? Did he perchance die with it there in the hotel room? No, no, we didn't find it. Why? Uh, well, you must forgive me for this rather scavenger-like idea I've had, but... Not that we won't take care of the boy's estate, mind you, but it, it seems a provocative publishing stunt. You want to publish the work posthumously. A boy kills himself, leaves a novel. That will make a splash in the literary world, huh? Yes. Uh, I would have tried to put it more tastefully, but that's it, exactly. Sorry, I can't help you. Well, then I can't for the life of me imagine what else we have to talk about. The reason why I came. I'm not sure the boy killed himself. He was going to marry Peg Ramsey. Did you know that? Marry? No, I didn't. Imagine. You said you met the boy when he first came here, that you... Quickly, a quick introduction from Peg. As I said, his work impressed her, so I okayed an advance for him. That's why if you find the manuscript, I feel it rightfully belongs to me. And that's all you knew of him? The advance, Peg Ramsey's interest in him, sponsoring of That, him. and the money I've already expended on him. For advanced publicity on Peg's newfound genius, I even hired Tonto Jones. Who? Tonto Jones. Ace Blurbist. The Guy de Maupassant of book jackets. Told him to stick with Walter, get to his marrow, find out everything about him, and write it in a hundred words to fit the back of a book jacket. I'd like to talk to a man who knew all about William Walter. You have his address? Greenwich Village, somewhere. The girl will give it to you on your way out, Mr. Clover. You were going, weren't you? So downtown now, to Greenwich Village. Turn off 11th Street on the bank. Past the bargain basement bars where the floor shows chuckle at the customers and the local color is prefabricated. And find an address, another basement, where the door is a painted mural of pink and satyrs with a motto in French over the brass knocker. When the door opens, the man puts a finger to his lips. Shh. It's the last side. Huh? Schoenberg bought the records today. Come on. Come on. Everybody's inside. All right. Grab yourself a hunk of floor and sit. If you don't mind, I'll stand. What did you bring? What? I told Barbette to tell everybody to bring a record. Didn't she? I brought a badge. Hey, who are you? Aren't you one of Barbette's... Police, I'm looking for Tonto Jones. Why? Where is he? Me? What do you want me for? A few questions, Tonto. By the way, where'd you get that name? Well, I spent a summer in Mexico trying to write. The natives gave me the name affectionately. It stuck. All right. Now tell me what you can about William Walter. I was going to do his dust jacket for him. You mean that stuff on the cover of a book that tells how good it is? What do you mean, stuff? Just tell me about William Walter. <laughs> I could have done it, too. Have somebody to support me. I could have written a novel. Did William Walter finish his? About a week ago. Pretty good, too. Oh, not that I would have approached his subject matter that way. Then you read it. Parts of it. Other parts he read to us. To us? Mm-hmm. People who drop in from time to time. We had varied opinions as to the novel's significance. Of course, if you're the type who's satisfied with sheer entertainment value... Where well, is the novel? Manuscript? Uh-huh. Oh, he left it here for me to look over. A couple of days ago, Janice picked it up. Janice Kirk? She said Willie sent her for it. I gave it to her. Hey, Tonto! We're disturbing your guest, Tonto. Go back to him. I'm just leaving. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Clover. May I come in, Mrs. Kirk? Well, you don't want to talk to me now. I've been crying. I look a mess. It'll only be a few minutes. You promise? Yes. Well, then, come in. You wait right here. I'll go in the next room and do my face. We can talk. Well, go on. Talk to me. I've just come from Greenwich Village, Mrs. Kirk. Mm, I hate it, don't you? I spoke to Mr. Jones. Tonto? That's right, Tonto Jones. You know what Tonto means? No, I don't. I didn't either till I looked it up. Means crazy. Statue is stupid. No one pays any attention to what Tonto is doing. I do. How do I look better? Of course I look better. Can you tell I've been crying? No. Now we'll talk. Did you like the novel? 
Uh, be more explicit, Mr. Clover. I'm always reading. What novel did you mean? William Walter's novel. You know something? I told you I love the boy, and I did. Even after he was so cruel to me. What about the novel, Mrs. Kirk? Well, that's what I mean. He didn't even let me read it after all I did for him. Maybe you didn't understand me, Mrs. Kirk. I said I saw Mr. Jones down in Greenwich Village. Well, he's a liar. About what? About anything he told you. He said you picked up Walter's novel a couple of days ago. I don't think he lied. Nobody else has that manuscript. And I suppose nobody will ever read it. I suppose not. Mrs. Kirk. Yes? Yeah. You told me how hard you worked to foster the boy's talent, how you brought him here to New York, how everything was wrapped up in that boy and his novel. Doesn't it bother you that the manuscript is missing? Well, I... Do you have it? No, no, I don't. Did you destroy it? Did you? <laughs> well, what difference does it make? I'm just curious to know what the novel is about, that's all. I burned it before I read it. As soon as I got it here, I tore it up and burned it. That was the first part of it, wasn't it? Huh? What? To destroy everything about the boy. Destroy somebody you loved? How can you say that? You loved him, all right. Only he was going to marry Peg Ramsey. Did he show you the marriage license? Oh, he was never going to marry that girl. He just wanted his novel published, that's all. I don't know. Marriage license usually means marriage. They were going to keep it secret, but they told you because you deserve to know. Deserve to know? Do you know why they told me? To be cruel to me. To laugh at me. To slap me in the face with it. So you killed her. Do you know what she said to me? Do you know what that girl said to me? I'll pay you for the train fare you spent to bring him to New York. <laughs> Even if I had killed her, could you blame me? But the boy, you said you loved him. Him. Sitting there when I came into the room. I was ready to forgive him everything. I walked over to him, put my hands around his back. He shrugged them off. Kept writing. Writing a note to a girl who was dead. Did you ever hear anything as crazy as that? A note to a dead girl. We thought it was a suicide note. Then he went over to the bed and he sprawled out and put his hands behind his head and then he stared at me. He stared hate at me. Because you killed Peg Ramsey? He knew it and he didn't go to the police. That made me think he still loved me. Why didn't he go to the police? Because he knew I'd crawl back to him. He wanted me there so he could tell me how much hate he had for me. How much he despised me. You didn't give him the chance. You destroyed him. Everything that he touched, you destroyed. The final thing to ride on the train. And he'd be back there with the baggage, the litter, and the animals... Let's go, Mrs. Kirk. No one's going to do that to me. What he did, not to me. Who did he think he was? Let's go. Night bursts open like a sudden flame on Broadway. The crowd swarm dances between the silhouettes of a thousand buildings. Dances its fury away against the time of morning until the night soaks up the sound and pain and color and turns it into dawn. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Betty Lou Gerson was heard as Janice Kirk. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Steve Roberts, and David Wolfe. Sing the praises of running brooks, babbling brooks, and he who brooks no evil. But you'll sing the praises yourself of Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, Sunday nights on most of these same CBS radio stations. As Connie Brooks, 
Eve Arden is sometimes running after a man, often babbling about men. And she brooks no evil that interferes with her pursuit of a man. So maybe the poets should sing her praises, too. Our Miss Brooks is fun to hear Sunday nights on CBS Radio. Bill Anders speaking, and remember, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy open fire on your funny bone Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Who? Who is this? Who wants to speak to Mr. Wolf? Nobody. Nobody? I said that. Hang up. It's late and it's too cold. And even if it weren't, I would not consider for one moment moving from this room. Please, Mr. Wolf, I can't hear a thing this old gentleman's saying. Does it matter? You heard what I said? No. Now, what did you say? You were late because she was killed. Who was killed? I can't hear you. What is it about, Archie? He says he was due here an hour ago, but she was killed. Who was killed? What does he want? Uh, do you want us to solve the crime? I say, do you want us to find out who killed her? Oh. He says he knows who did it, but he has an important message for you. Well, then come right over. We'll be waiting, Mr. Jenkins. Archie, why do you insist on taking every silly little case? Because, boss, we need to recover from March 15th. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures of this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This case I like to refer to as the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Perhaps a better title would be Wolf Goes A-Hunting. For in a way, this was one of those unusual instances in which my boss, of his own free will and without any coercion, actually decided to leave the house and go to the scene of the crime. It started when the strange old gentleman who phoned us finally arrived. Well, there's our client, Mr. Wolf. Evening. It's me. Who's me? Oh, I, I just phoned you. I, I'm Jenkins. I got a dispatch for Nero Wolf. Oh, you're Jenkins. Well, come in, come in. Uh, Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Jenkins. Says he has a dispatch for you. Yep. Yeah. Are you Wolf? I am. Where is the dispatch from? Don't know. You, you don't know? How come? Oh, I know, but I'm supposed to say I don't. See? That's my job. What is? Just to say I don't know. What about the matter? Yeah, who was killed? Oh, my goodness. It was a terrible thing. We were just crossing the turnpike, and this fella come at us out of nowhere. The killer? Yeah. Must have been drunk, I guess. Well, how did it happen? Did he shoot her, stab her? Oh, no, no. He ran into her with his car. And she was only nine years old. Your granddaughter? No, no, it was Bessie. But the police got him. I, I have to appear, I guess. Probably get 90 days, he will. For Murder? Murder. Was somebody murdered? I must have missed something. Look, we're talking about Bessie, and what do you want us to do about it? Nothing. Bessie's my old horse. Oh, no. Uh, but say, who was it that was murdered? Nobody yet. Good night, Mr. Jenkins. I thought you said it was important. It might be. At least that's the way I was told. What might be? Uh, this here letter I was bringing to you. This is dispatch. Well, gotta get along now. Uh, goodbye. Well. 
Get him. What a pixie. What is in the envelope? Mr. Wolf, look. Five $100 bills. And the note says, Mr. Wolf, your services are desperately needed. Come up this weekend as my guest. Signed, E. Malott. Edward Malott, the wealthy manufacturer. Hmm. Well, looks as though you're going out this weekend. Well, our GP may have respects to Mr. Malott, and I hope you enjoy the weekend. Good night. Something certainly phony about this. There's no party going on here tonight. Yes? What is it? Is this the Malott place? It is. What do you want? My name's Goodwin. I'm a guest of Mr. Malott's. A guest? Yes, he invited me down for the weekend. Weekend? Oh. Well, you better step in, please, Mr. Goodwin. Quite a bolt you've got on that door. Yes, isn't it? Just sit down there, please. I'll get Mr. Malott. He's in the library. Oh, here he is. It is Mr. Goodwin, sir. Says he's come down for the weekend. Mr. Goodwin? Good evening. You've come for the weekend, you say? Well, yes. Wasn't that the idea, Mr. Malott? Well, I, uh, I don't understand, Mr. Goodwin. Didn't you send me this note asking me to come here? Note? I did not. Oh, well, well, this is my personal note stationery. But I don't recall sending this. I didn't even type it. And I'm in the habit of signing my name with a pen, not with a typewriter. E. Malott. You're certainly Edward Malott. Yes. Services are desperately needed. What does this mean? What services? Who are you, Mr. Goodwin? Are you serious? I'm a private investigator. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. Oh, indeed. Nero Wolfe, eh? I know of him, yes, indeed. And you really don't know anything about this note? I do not. Are you having a weekend party here? <laughs> I most certainly am not. Then who sent this? And there were five $100 bills as a retainer. I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, uh, Dorothy. Yes? Would you step in here, please? Uh, Miss Davis is my private secretary. Uh, she may know something about this. Yes, Mr. Malott. What is it? I... Uh, Dorothy. Oh. Dorothy, this is Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mr. Goodwin? Well, I... How do you do, Miss Davis? Uh, yes, yes, well. Uh, Mr. Goodwin is assistant to Nero Wolfe. You don't say. Nero Wolfe, the detective? Well, I've heard a great deal about him. And about you, too, Mr. Goodwin. Well, now I'm mighty glad to hear you say that, Miss Davis. Uh, Mr. Goodwin has Edward, a note here. Is anything wrong, Edward? I heard voices. Oh, do we have company? Nothing is wrong, Eva. I was calling Dorothy, that's all. Oh, oh this is Mr. Goodwin, Eva. My wife, Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mrs. Malone? Mr. Goodwin, I... Oh, yes, how, how do you do? Uh, now, as I was about to say, Dorothy, yes. Mr. Goodwin... What's going on? Mr. Goodwin, uh, this is my son, Larry. Good evening. What's wrong? Uh, Mr. Goodwin has been invited here for the weekend. He has an invitation supposedly written by me. At least uh, it's on my stationery. Look at this, Dorothy. Know anything about this note? No. No. I certainly didn't write it. But it's my personal note paper and my signature is typewritten. I'd uh, never do that. Well, somebody sent it. Who's Jenkins? Jenkins? Never heard of him. A little dried up old man. He delivered it to us. Yeah, maybe it didn't even come from this house. I'm positive that it didn't. Never heard of Jenkins. You have a typewriter here, of course. Yes. I'd like to see it. Uh, certainly, Mr. Goodwin, in the library. How far have you come, Mr. Goodwin? From New York, Manhattan. Oh, and it's such a dreadful night, too. Yes, yes, and it is rather late. Late? It's only 7.30. Why not stay here for the night? Plenty of room? Uh, yes, Mr. Goodwin, plenty of room. Well, I, I don't really think that's necessary. I, uh... On the other hand, it would be a tough drive back to the city in this storm. I'll accept your hospitality, Mr. Malott. Very good. Oh, uh, Jeffries, show Mr. Goodwin to the uh, east wing. And uh, take care of his car. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Goodwin. You, you, you mean you're all going to retire now? I haven't even had my dinner. We retire very early here. But Jeffries will prepare anything you want. Good night. <laughs> Speaking. Archie, boss. Well, I'm here at Malat's place, but there ain't no party. What happened? Are you in the right house? I'm afraid I am. They've all gone to bed. Weird bunch. His wife, who looks very sickly and I think wants to say something to me alone, and Larry the son and Malat's secretary, Dorothy Davis. She has me bothered a bit. How unusual. Especially if she's pretty. A beauty. But she seems to know all about me. Hmm. 
You better come home, Archie. I can see you're in no condition to handle this case properly. Give them the money back. Oh, I forgot to tell you. They don't want me here. Malat didn't send the note. No one here knows anything about it, so we can keep the dough. Interesting indeed. The circumstances would indicate that you should stay there and wait for it to happen. For what to happen? For whatever it is the fates have conspired to have happen there while your shining little ego is in the midst of it. Bye. It's Archie Goodwin, Mrs. Mallott. Come in. Come in, please. I saw you give me the eye when I was about to leave. I've been waiting till I felt sure they were all asleep. Now, what's up? I wrote you that note. I sent for you. How do I know that? Old man Jenkins is a scissor and knife sharpener who happens along every month or so. They wouldn't know him. I put five $100 bills in the envelope. Okay, Why? My life is in danger. I've been threatened. I received three notes through the mail. They were all postmarked in New York City. Could I see them? Here they are. All typewritten. Hmm. The first one reads, There is no love for you in Grey Gables. The second, Why stay on in the face of death? And the third, The time is shorter than you think. Do you think this is a, well, an inside job, Mrs. Miller? Well, at first I didn't. But lately I've come to think it is. What caused you to think that? For some time I've been having severe spells. I thought it was indigestion. But then it occurred to me that I always broke out in cold perspiration. I was left horribly weakened, terribly thirsty. Thirsty? You fear you're being poisoned? Yes. And since the thought came to me, I've been living in fear. Fear of every bite of food or drink. I had so shattered my nerves that I have to take these yellow sleeping capsules to even close my eyes. Well, as your husband and his secretary and your son, Larry... Larry is my stepson. Which one do you suspect? The secretary, Dorothy, or my husband, or both. What's the motive? Well, they're in love. She's been here over two years, and they've spent most of their time together. The idea never occurred to me till last week. And when I watched them, it, it was quite obvious. Anybody else know about these three notes? Oh, no. Then I'll keep them for a while. Good night, Mrs. Mallott. And don't worry. What are you doing, Mr. Goodwin, snooping around at Father's library? Well, Larry, I was just trying to find out if this Remington was the machine you used to type those notes. What? What notes? The notes you sent your stepmother. Why, I don't know anything about any notes. Then why were you so startled? I'm not startled. I just, well, uh, why would I threaten her? So you do know about them. I didn't mention the contents of the notes. I just happened to see them on the table in her sitting room. You don't care too much about your stepmother, do you? Oh, she's all right. You don't care too much about Dorothy either, do you? I certainly don't. Why not? Well, I don't like her tactics making a fool out of my father. If anybody here sent those notes, she did. You think Dorothy would have a motive? I certainly do. Of course, you wouldn't have a motive, would you? No. Well, I'm inclined to think you would. Well, just what motive would I have? You don't seem to like any woman who's too close to your father. Maybe because you'd resent anyone sharing in the estate if your father died. If I were you, Mr. Goodwin, I'd leave. Tonight. And the sooner the better. Good night. Oh, Archie. Arch- oh, confounded boy. Yes, Archie? You have the wrong number. This is Sherlock Holmes speaking. Why didn't you go to bed like the others? You don't have to push it. It'll happen. Even Malat thinks she's being slowly poisoned. Suspects her husband and his secretary. He could be right. What are the symptoms she suffers? Gastric disturbances, weakness, thirst. Indeed. What about the son? Have any ideas? He doesn't like his stepmother and is decidedly against his father's secretary, Dorothy. He knew all about the notes Mrs. Mallott had received, saw them on her dressing table. He believes Dorothy's the culprit. Then I should say that Dorothy should be the next on your list. You can say that again. Be careful, Archie. Use your head this time. Incidentally, Larry advised me to leave the place tonight. Bit of a threat it was, too. What shall I do, Mr. Anthony? Do nothing. The trouble will come to you. Bye. Oh. Hello there, Mr. Mallott. I thought you'd turned in for the night. It's quite obvious you thought so, Mr. Goodwin. 
What are you doing in the library? Why, just looking for something to read. You'll find the books all around the walls, not on my desk. Well, I was looking for a particular kind of book. I'm very much interested in poisons. Poisons? Yeah, a hobby of mine. You happen to have any books on toxicology? I do not. And what's that book on the fourth shelf right beside you? Why, I... I uh... Oh, oh toxicology... Where did that come from? Never saw it before. Hmm... Uh, perhaps it was in that uh, assorted collection I bought a couple of weeks ago. I uh, hadn't noticed it. Larry probably put them on the shelves. Mr. Mallard, how long have you known Dorothy, your secretary? Uh, a little over two years. Did it ever occur to you that she might be, well, infatuated, in love with you? What? Well, of all the... Now, see here. I don't know what you're up to, and I don't know how you got hold of my stationery to write that fake note. It isn't a but fake I... note, Mallard. I'm only trying to find out what's back of it. Mr. Goodwin, there is nothing going on here that requires the services of a detective, and Dorothy is not in love with me. I didn't say she was. I asked you if you thought she might be. Well, since this conversation seems to concern me, I suppose I am at liberty to come in. Oh, you're still up too, Miss Davis. Did you hear what this man said, Dorothy? Yes, I did, Mr. Millard. And I'd like to have a few words alone with Mr. Goodwin, if you don't mind. Mr. Goodwin, would you mind coming with me for a few minutes? No, not at all. And... Well, it's rather late, Mr. Mallott. Don't you think you should retire? It's a heavy day tomorrow. Well, uh, uh, yes. Yes, I suppose I should. And please, don't let this upset you. Mr. Goodwin has been misinformed. I'll straighten him out. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. The bar is right across the hall. I'll fix you a nice, soothing drink. That'll be nice. Well, now, what would you like, Mr. Goodwin? In the way of drinks? Oh, well, some seven-up. Really? <laughs> Just sit down over there. Okay, what do you want to talk about? Well, where did you get the idea that I was in love with Mr. Millat? First, suppose you tell me if you are in love with him. Yes, I am. But until a few minutes ago, he wasn't even aware of it. I worship him and his work. I never wanted him to know because he's married. It would have caused trouble and I'd have had to leave here. And now he knows it's true. Well, now that he knows, what will happen? Well, I'm going to leave tonight. Now. I see. And since I don't own a car, Mr. Goodwin, I'm going to ask you to do me a very great favor. Will you run me into New York? I want to leave without a word. If I wait till morning, I'll have to explain to Mr. Millard and... Well, that would be most embarrassing, Archie. Oh, now it's Archie. You, you don't really mind, do you? No, no, I guess I don't. I should, maybe, but, uh... Don't you like your drink? What'd you put in this drink? What do you mean? What'd you dope it with? <laughs> Archie, why would I do that? Might be several reasons. There's nothing in that drink. No? Then suppose you drink it. Why? <laughs> Give it to me. I'll throw it out. If you want another drink, fix it yourself. I'll have my things ready in five minutes. Are you going to take me? Sure. Certainly I'm going to take you. But are you sure you have to go tonight? I must go tonight. Now. I wish I knew why. Mr. Wolf's always so right. What? Just talking to myself. Dorothy! Larry! Jeffries! Come upstairs! What's happened? Call Dr. Hauser. Something terrible has happened to Eva. <laughs> well, Dr. Hauser? Ah, oh, poor Mrs. Millat. No, there's nothing to be done now. It's all over. Eva, Eva. You'd better lie down, Mr. Millat. I'll phone and take care of everything. I'll be here if you need me. I uh, have to make out the certificate. Yes, come along, Mr. Millat. Just a minute. You too, Larry. I don't want to make this any more unpleasant for you, but, Doctor, just what are you going to put on the certificate as the cause of death? Acute gastritis. Is that what you've been treating her for? Well, she's had several attacks lately. I'd warned her to be cautious of her diet. And that was wise advice, too. Did you know about these attacks, Mr. Mallott? Yes, I did. And you, Dorothy? Yes, I knew. And you knew also, Larry? Uh, no, I I knew she hadn't been feeling well. How long had Mrs. Mallott been suffering from insomnia? Oh, a year at least. I prescribed Nemitol. In yellow capsules? Of course. I wrote a prescription ever so often calling for 12 capsules. You all knew about that, of course. I thought so. And would this be the prescription, this little box of capsules here on... Well. What's the matter, Mr. Goodwin? That box was open on this nightstand when we stepped into this room. All right, let's have the box, Mr. Mallard. Thank you. Why'd you pick it up? Uh, because I... 
I didn't want the stigma of suicide on Eva's name, nor mine. Suicide? Yes. Eva had this prescription filled yesterday morning. The dose is one at bedtime. Twelve capsules. She took one last night. I glanced at the open box when I came into the room, and there were only eight capsules left. I, I knew instantly what had happened. She'd taken an overdose. Doctor, do you think three capsules would be sufficient to cause her death? I doubt it very much. So do I. Mrs. Malott didn't die from an overdose of sleeping capsules. She was poisoned. Poisoned? Are you crazy? By whom? By you. Or Dorothy. Or Larry. No. I didn't do it. I didn't write those notes. What notes? Mrs. Malott had received three notes threatening her life if she didn't leave this house. Each of you had a motive, so I'm sending this body to the coroner for an immediate autopsy. I won't permit it. The police will see to it. You have no choice. <laughs> Yes, Archie. What now? Do you know who did it? How do you know anything's happened? Let us call it extrasensory perception. Well, Mrs. Malott was right. She's dead. Her doctor knew nothing about the spell she was having as being caused by anything but indigestion. How about an autopsy? It's all in the works. Looks like a metallic poison, all the symptoms. Oh? Did you search the house carefully for such a poison? I did. I'll check the drugstores in the morning. Somebody in that house will purchase some poison. Let me know when the autopsy report is in. Right. Let's see now. We have Mr. Malott, Dorothy Davis, and Larry the son. He's Mr. Malott's son, but not the child of Eva Malott, remember? Yes. Is it true that Dorothy is in love with Malott? Yeah. Dorothy admitted it to me, but claimed Malott wasn't aware of it until the night. And earlier this evening, Dorothy tried her best to get me out of the house, insisted that I drive her into town. She tried to give me a drink, which I think might have contained knockout drops. You don't say. Archie, I should have Fritz drive me up to the Malort place at once. Archie, are you there? No, boss, I just fainted. And that, Mr. Wolf, is most of the story up to now. Very interesting. Yes, indeed. But it isn't true. I did not put anything in Mr. Goodwin's drink. Then did you ask him to take you into town? Yes. And I might have been found in a ditch. Oh, it's ridiculous. Why did you try to get Mr. Goodwin to take you to town? Because I felt it would be too embarrassing to remain until morning. Maybe you'd already given Mother the big dose of poison and wanted Goodwin out before it was discovered. Well, you Wait a minute. That... Now, Mr. Miller, you claim that you knew nothing about Dorothy being in love with you. Should we believe that? You can believe it or not. Dorothy had a motive to get rid of Mrs. Malott. It seems that Mr. Malott had one, too. And so did Larry. What? You admitted to me that you didn't like your stepmother. And that you disliked Dorothy even more. I didn't say that. You said Dorothy was making a fool of your father. You resented the possibility of any woman sharing in the estate. You knew about the sleeping capsules, and you could have put poison in some of them. You could have written those threat notes. And by getting rid of your stepmother and placing the blame on Dorothy, you'd be getting rid of them both. But I didn't. I did not write those notes. You were the only one who knew about them. I was not the only one. I saw Dorothy coming out of Mother's room. It was this afternoon. Mother was out taking his son back. Dorothy did it. She's the one. I think you're the one. No, no, Dorothy wrote those notes. That's a lie. No, she probably slipped into Mother's room and wrote those notes on Mother's portable. What? In just a minute. Archie, come here. I never heard of sex lies. I didn't do it. You can't send me to jail. I'll kill you first. Larry, drop that gun. Don't come near me, any of you. You're such a fool, Larry. Give me that gun. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Come on. There. Now, you better quiet down, kid. Or Inspector Kramer will take care of you when he arrives. Well, Mr. Wolf, what goes on here? Where's Goodwin? I sent him upstairs, Inspector Kramer, upstairs to Mrs. Malott's room to check on something. Now, here he is. Yeah? What have you been doing, Goodwin? This, Inspector, is the piece de resistance. This is what Mr. Wolf has been waiting for. This little black box contains a typewriter, a portable noiseless Remington. Mrs. Malott's typewriter. What? I didn't even know she had a typewriter. Larry knew she had one. And this is undoubtedly the very typewriter the threat notes were written on. All three of them. You were right, boss. Oh, I knew she had a typewriter, but I didn't write those notes. Oh, shut up. Archie, how do you know the notes were written on this typewriter? I've compared the type and the ribbon. They're both the same. These notes were written on this Remington. It was Dorothy! Larry, I don't believe a word you've been saying. Dorothy couldn't possibly be guilty of such a thing. 
anyone is guilty, you yourself certainly have all the earmarks. Everybody's against me, even my own father. But I'm innocent, I tell you. Let me get it. I think I know who it is. Hello? Yeah, just a second. You better take it, boss. Wolf. Oh, yes, go ahead. Let's have it. Yes. He's here, but he won't mind. Yes? I see. Uh Uh-huh. You just finished. Oh. Good. Right. Bye. Was it the coroner? The coroner. Reporting that poison was found in the sleeping capsules. And the body. Did they find poison? They did. You're right again, boss. I'm going up to Mrs. Minot's room for a while. I want you to come along with me. Find anything yet, Archie? No, mostly bills and invitations to bridge parties and so on. Ah. You find something, boss? Yes and no. This pocketbook detective story. What about it? I'm just flipping through the pages and I find this corner turned down. Well, well. What is it? Look and read. Why stay on in the face of death? Interesting. The very words used in one of the notes. Give me the book. Of course, uh, this doesn't prove a thing either. But it does confirm what I was... Oh, oh. What now? This cinches it. Get them all up here, Archie. Tell Kramer to bring them all to the bedroom. Well, Mr. Wolf, what now? As you all know, Mrs. Millot was poisoned. By someone who had an opportunity to put it in the sleeping capsule. Someone in this household. Yeah, but which one? The kid? I never bought any poison in my life. Be quiet, will you? No, Inspector, it wasn't Larry. And I suppose you think I put the rest of that rat poison in your drink, Mr. Goodwin. No, Dorothy, it wasn't you. But how did you know it was rat poison? I didn't. I just guessed. I can think, too. Then if it wasn't Dorothy or Larry, you you must mean me. No, Mr. Lund. No, wait a minute. It had to be somebody. Yes. This is going to be painful for you, Mr. Malott. Well, you... You mean that Mrs. Malott did commit suicide? It was more than suicide. It was suicide with an attempt to have both you and Dorothy convicted of murder. She planted things? She did. I can't believe it. Show him the pocketbook, mystery. Here's the proof. Some of the threat notes were lifted bodily from this novel. But look on the back cover. Isn't that Mrs. Malott's handwriting? Yes, and this is the other note. The one to you, Mr. Wolf. Composed in pencil before she typed it out on her machine. Then, Wolf, the note you received was the same typing as the threat notes. See for yourself, Inspector. Then why the Dickens didn't Archie compare them right away? Just one of those things, Inspector. There are times when even a good detective is a bit on the, uh, shall we say, dull side. Don't you find it often true, Inspector? Hmm? <laughs> Nice of you to go all the way out there, boss. I was a bit stuck. Quite all right, Archie. Yeah, there's something that still bothers me. So? How can such a sweet, motherly type as Mrs. Malott cook up such gruesome ideas? She was a very sick woman, mentally as well as physically. She probably felt she was going to die. And her warped mind seized on the opportunity to make sure that this Dorothy didn't get her man after she was dead. And speaking of Dorothy, she's a mighty pretty... Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Some beer, please, Archie. If you were so certain that Dorothy wasn't guilty, what was the idea of spending so much time questioning her? Huh? Why, I, I, I... Never mind. The raised eyebrow department answered the question. Well, there are certain rules a good detective always follows. Some are in the book, others aren't. You mean there's nothing in the book which says a good detective shouldn't spend a few minutes with an attractive brunette... Even though she is a murder suspect, the author of that book can be none other than the incomparable Archie Goodwin. (laughs) Good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. (laughs) 
Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Irene Winston, Ted Von Elts, Jerry Hausner, Vic Rodman, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the shot in the dark. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music in the air tomorrow evening, music and fun, brought to you by Dennis Day, Judy Canova, and Grand Old Opry. Charming and boyish Dennis gets himself tangled in another bewildering situation, while Judy Canova gets together with her comedy pals for some mountain-style goings-on. And Saturday also means a killer cycle trip to Nashville for Grand Old Opry. Friday's fun includes Sam Spade and, of course, the magnificent Montague on NBC. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Vanishing Postman. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a baffling seven-year-old crime and solved a murder through the eyes of a blind man. There's no time of year when a busy homemaker needs cool, leisurely relaxation more than during the summer months. And you can have that kind of relaxation when you do your homemaking the easy Linux way. Just follow the example of wise American homemakers everywhere who have learned the magic shortcut to household care. Those three great Linex home brighteners. Linex clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linex cream polish for fine furniture. And Linex self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Start now to enjoy extra relaxation every day. Enjoy that added leisure in a home that's sparkling with bright new beauty. Just ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linex home brighteners. And save time the easy Linux way. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Rain has rolled in across the great city again today. The black skies thunder and crackle with lightning. The streets are glossy and slippery as glass. As Nick and Patsy drive homeward in the detective's powerful car, a torrent of rain beats against the windshield. When suddenly... Nick, look out! That car! No! Oh, oh, Nick! Oh. You all right, Patsy? Uh, I... Oh. I guess so. Oh, golly, I was scared. Lucky we went into this alley when we skidded off the street. Yes, and lucky that pile of rubbish cushioned the crash. Might have had a bad crack up. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? When we smacked into that rubbish pile, we uncovered an old leather pouch lying underneath. See? Hey, you'll get soaked, Nick. It's an old postman's bag, Patsy. Falling to pieces. Must have been here for ages. Oh, Nick, come on back. Find there's mail in this bag. Letters. Hello. There's a name printed on the strap. R. Dr. Draper. Oh, well, it's probably the name of the postman. Now look at these letters, Patsy. The postmark... August 1938. 1938? Then this bag's been lying here seven years. Hey, look here, Patsy. What, Nick? The buckle from the strap has fallen into the pouch. There's a bit of metal wedged in the buckle. Looks like a lump of lead. Well, it should. It happens to be a bullet. (gasps) Well, let's get over to the post office at once. I'm afraid the explanation of this undelivered mail may be murder. Ah, 
enough. That seemed mystery. I found that postman Robert Draper vanished seven years ago, and that the police and postal authorities believe him to be guilty of theft because a registered parcel containing $10,000 in securities also vanished at the same time. Oh, Nick, he stole them? Theft can't account for that bullet we found wedged in the buckle in the pouch, Patsy. Oh, no, no, I suppose not. For seven years, Robert Draper stood convicted of theft. Well, I'm going to find out whether he's guilty. But... How are you going to dig up evidence in a case that happened seven years ago? I'm going to get special permission from the postmaster to deliver this mail that should have been delivered seven years ago. Well, we've learned nothing so far in the first 47 letters we've delivered. Perhaps we'll have better luck here with the 48. Yes? Are you Betty Barnes? Yes. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Oh, please, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you. I have a letter here for you, Miss Barnes. Mrs. Barnes. Oh, sorry. I have a letter that should have been delivered seven years ago. Seven years ago? I'd better explain. You see, seven years ago, the postman who served this district disappeared. His name was Robert Draper. What's going on here, Betty? Dan, it's about Pop. What? Well, he... Great Scott. uh... Don't tell me that Draper was your father. Now, Now, look here. We fought that case seven years ago. There's no sense raking it up again and making out Betty's dad was a crook. Pop never stole. Why should he? He'd saved $12,000. He had plenty of insurance, $20,000 worth. Mrs. Barnes, please. I'm not trying to convict your father all over again. I'm trying to find out what really happened. But you'll have to help me. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. Now tell me, what happened on that last day? Well, Pop left in the morning. You see, he lived with us and... He always used to drop in at home for lunch. The day he disappeared, he just never showed up for lunch. When Dan came home that night, I sent him out to... Yes, I I went out to check up Mr. Carter. They said he never returned to the post office, and that's all we know. We never saw Dad again. I see. Mrs. Barnes, you have a picture of your father I might have. Uh, I'll, I'll get him one, honey. You know, Mr. Carter... It was on my birthday that Pop disappeared. Oh, how awful, Mrs. Barnes. Well, here's one, Mr. Carter. He's not in uniform, but it's the best we've got. It's taken a week before he disappeared. Thank you. I'll let you know how we make out. Oh, yes, here's your seven-year delayed letter, Mrs. Barnes. What? Oh. Oh, Dan, look. It, it's a birthday card from Pop. It says, Happy birthday, daughter dear. Best. Wishes on this day. My heart would always find you near. So I were miles away. Oh, Bob. Bob, darling. But, Nick, we've delivered 17 letters since we left Mrs. Barnes, and not one of them knew a thing. It's all right, Patsy. We're not doing badly at all. We've got a picture of Draper, and we know we had no motive for stealing those securities. Somebody else in this trail of letters will help us along further. Well, this one's for Ben Kramer, care of Kramer's Garage, 118 Land Street. Well, this is it. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kramer doesn't seem to be around. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I hear voices back there. Come on. You already got back double what you owe me. Yeah, now just give me a break, Shelley, please. Oh, That's all I ask. Megan Kramer, will you? I collect what's coming to me. But, but I can't keep on paying. It's breaking my back. I'll break your back if you try to welch, Kramer. I give you the place before you took my dough. One for ten a week. I, I can't do it, Shelley. I don't like to just... true, gentlemen, but I'd like some information. What? Who are you, wise guy? Nick Carter's the name. Nick Carter. Hey, Kramer, did no, you... No, 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 honest. Honest, oh, Shelley, I... Nick, what's going on? Nothing, lady, nothing. I'll be going, Kramer. I'll see you later. Nick, what's going on here? It's obvious Mr. Kramer's been caught in a loan shark racket. Something pretty well known to the police. But something that can't be stopped until the victims are willing to give evidence. What was that one for ten they were talking about? Mr. Kramer pays a dollar a week for every ten he borrowed. Right, Mr. Kramer? I... I don't want to talk about it, Mr. Carter. It, it, it ain't safe. If, if I could only just lay my hands on $1,500 and, and, and get out from under... Mr. Kramer, yeah. we, we've got a letter for you. Huh? It's seven years old. Seven years? That, that don't make no sense. Well, this letter was mailed to you, but never delivered because something happened to the postman, Robert Draper. Remember him? Draper? 
Oh, yes, yes, of course. A, a friendly little fella. Blue eyes he had, bald. He wore a handlebar mustache. A handlebar mustache? Yeah, yeah, I, I even remember the day he scrammed. Hacky, who used to keep his cab in my garage, he saw Draper. He drove him and another guy someplace. Yes, go on. Where was he driven? Who was the man? Now, 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 leave me think, Mr. Carter. It was such a long time ago, I, I can't even Kramer, think... Kramer, I want the name and address of that cab driver. Well, let me... I, I, I remember now. It was... Someone's five feet out the Yes, door. Kramer's been hit. Oh, but Nick, the killer. You gotta get Kramer's evidence. The killer can wait. Patsy, get to a phone. Call an ambulance, quick. Right. Got me bad. Kramer, listen. Can you hear me? Who drove with Draper in the cab? Oh, no. Where'd they drive? Shelley's bowling alley. The thug we just met, huh? Good. Do me a favor. Anything you say, Kramer. That that seven-year-old letter. Read it to me. Certainly. Mr. Ben Kramer, dear sir... We are happy to inform you that your contribution has won second prize in our slogan contest. And close, please find money orders totaling $1,500. $1,500? Why, that's just what Mr. Kramer needs to pay off. Mr. Kramer doesn't need any money anymore, Bessie. Oh? He's dead. Birthday greetings, seven years old. And now murder from a delayed mail delivery. What new and strange developments will arise from Nick's odd mission? We'll see in just a moment. The wisest worker is the one who saves as much work as possible, yet gets the job done. That's efficiency. And the efficient way to take perfect care of your floors and linoleum is to depend upon Linux self-polishing wax. Try it just once and prove to your complete satisfaction that here is the ideal way to new beauty for your floors. It takes only a jiffy to wipe Linex self-polishing wax on any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor, and it dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome luster. You'll notice that Linex self-polishing wax gives that satiny beauty only real wax can give. You'll find, when you step on that floor, that Linex self-polishing wax is the anti-skid finish, or your floor will be less slippery than it was to start with. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories. And you'll be delighted with the way the finish lasts, for Linex self-polishing wax has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax. Yes, this new formula, developed by leading research chemists to give you the finest, is well worth trying. And once you've tried it, you'll follow the example of all those wise American women who use it regularly. So ask your dealer now for Linex self-polishing wax for all three great Linex home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to household beauty. And now back to our story. Investigating the strange disappearance of Robert Draper, postman, accused of absconding with registered securities he was carrying... Nick and Patsy pick up the trail of the old mystery by delivering mail found in the postman's abandoned pouch. Now we find them in the street after the sudden murder of one of their witnesses. What do we do now, Nick? Wait for the homicide squad to arrive? Oh, no. Sergeant Matheson will only hold us up, call us material witnesses and all that. Now I want to get on with the case. At the Shelley bowling alley? No, not yet, Patsy. We Hmm? haven't enough evidence for a direct frontal attack on Mr. Shelley. Oh. Let's get on with the mail delivery. There are more clues waiting for us to pick them up. Who's next? A uh, postcard addressed to Mr. Parker Flynn's Homewood House. Homewood House, huh? Mm-hmm. That's the exclusive apartment house in the corner facing the river. Uh-huh. Come on. Let's see what Mr. Flint can tell us. Good afternoon, Mr. Flint. Your butler said we'd find you here in your aviary. Oh, uh... Uh, good afternoon. You've got a charming place here, Mr. Flint. Yes, I, I'd like it. I suppose I look silly pottered around a glass house filled with a lot of birds, but, well, I I like it. Uh, uh, let's step into my living room. We can talk better there. Eh? We won't keep you from your hobby long, Mr. Flint. Let me introduce myself. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bourne. Get out of here. Beg your pardon? Get out of my house. Uh, Mr. Flint, now, you... let's get this straight. I hate police. 
I'll have nothing to do with police anywhere, anytime. Now get out. Nick, what, what on earth is... Wait, Patsy. Parker Flint. Thought that name sounded familiar. Eh? Yes, I remember. Parker Flint, third. Tried and convicted of second-degree murder seven years ago. Oh, you remember, eh? You also happen to remember that Parker Flint III, my grandson, is serving a life sentence in state prison right now? I do. And will your capable memory recollect that he was innocent? That he was convicted on clumsy circumstantial evidence that would have made an idiot laugh? Well, what do you mean? Young Flint claimed he was on a walking tour across the country. The murder of an enemy of Parker's was committed August 30th, 1938, in this city. And on that day, he was 50 miles outside town in a village named Samson. The defense couldn't prove it, Mr. Flint. So they convicted him. Not because he was guilty, but because they hadn't anyone else. Make an example, they screamed. Show there's some the same justice for rich and poor alike. Uh, they made an example, all right. And then you'll be interested in the case I'm working on, Mr. Flint. Eh? Another man runs the risk of unjust conviction. I'll have nothing to do with the police. Go on, get out. But Nick's not a police. Mr. Man. Flint, justice sometimes miscarries. Men are wrongfully convicted and sentenced. It's a human factor in law that can't be avoided. I made it my job to prevent that factor of human error as far as possible. Now, I'll help you with your case, Mr. Flint, but you've got to help me with mine. Eh? Well, what, what is your case? It's your old postman, Robert Draper. Draper, oh, I remember him well. Know him well, in fact. Supposed to have disappeared about seven years ago. Supposed? Yes, he did disappear, though. I saw him around this neighborhood seven weeks afterwards. Uh, Actus is suspicious. Uh, though he was hiding, had his head wrapped up in a turban. A turban? Golly. Yeah, what's more, he seemed to be afraid of someone called Gray. Seemed to see this Gray everywhere. Gray, huh? That's interesting. Very interesting. Anything else that might help? No, 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 that's all. And now, Mr. Carter, about about my case. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I lost my temper, but you understand, don't you? D- do you think you could offer any, any hope or anything? Yes, Mr. Flynn. I can give you more than hope. I'll give you back your grandson. Oh. In the form of this postcard that should have been delivered seven years ago. A postcard? From your grandson. Sent from the village of Sampson, New York, postmarked August 30th, 1938. Oh, which proved he was where he claimed he was. Heaven. Congratulations, Mr. Flint. This is the one piece of evidence that'll free him. Yeah. Well, Nick, how do we stand? Any closer to the vanishing postman? Yes, indeed, Patsy. Mr. Flint brought us a good deal closer. How so? That turban, for one thing, is very significant. And Draper's fear of someone called Gray, even more so. But we haven't come across anyone named Gray so far. Now hold everything, Patsy. Here's our next stop. Residence of Miss Jennifer West. Miss West's got a seven-year-old package coming to her. Well, let's hope we can trade it for information. Information, Mr. Carter, about our missing postman? Yes, Miss West. Well, I really don't know any... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. No, no, you're wrong. It's the orphan's benefit. No, no, the 18th. I put you down for a box. No, certainly you can't get out of it, dear. It's a worthy cause. Yes, yes. All right, bye. Now, let's see, uh, where were we? You were going to tell us what you remember about Mr. Draper's disappearance. Oh, but I don't know anything. I don't even remember him. Well, here's a photograph of him. Hmm, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. It isn't a bit familiar. But I have such a miserable memory for faces. And in my work these days, I see so many. Day in and day out. Child Welfare Association, the canteen, the city hospital... City Hospital. Oh, I met the most interesting man there yesterday. He was in the psychiatric wing, room 325. Um, but, Miss West, we... with this strangest um... disease. Monochromatism, they call it. And he's so cheerful about it. Monochromatism? Oh, it's a technical name for blindness of some kind. Such a nice man. His name was... His name was... Uh, was Gray. Gray? Mm. Oh, Nick. I heard, Patsy. Thanks a million for your help, Miss West. Mm. And here's your reward. This long overdue package. Seven years overdue. Why? Why, that's Gary Horton's handwriting. Oh. Once upon a time, Miss Byrne, I... I thought Gary and I might... 
Oh, well, you understand. Yes, Miss West. But he's so very shy, and I... Oh. Oh, look, my dear. It... It's flowers. Artificial flowers. No, they're not artificial. That's a bouquet of live forever flowers, and they're from... Gary. Oh, here's a card. Dearest Jen, I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. Never had the courage. Now I have. Will you... Oh, Miss West, it's a proposal. Seven years ago. And he never knew I hadn't received. He thought my silence meant... Oh, oh, excuse me, please. Uh, let's get out of here, Bessie. I have an idea that for the first time today, Miss West's phone is going to hear her say yes. So now we're headed for Shelley's bowling alley. Huh, Nick? Right. But why now? Why don't we hustle up and see that man, Gray? The one Draper was afraid of. You'll see. Hmm? Here's where we stop. Let's go. Nick, what happened to the postman? Was he murdered by Shelley? Did Shelly murder Kramer, too? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, golly, what a busy place. And there's our old friend, Mr. Shelly. Mm-hmm. Hello, Shelly. Mind if we have a chat? Now, look, don't come pussyfooting around my place. You got nothing on me, Carter. Oh, that's what you think. Bluffin' ain't gonna do no good. Don't try and tell me Kramer talked. He knows better. Kramer can't talk. He was murdered. He... He was what? Murdered. Shot to death. You're lying. He was murdered in an attempt to keep me from uncovering the secret of Robert Draper's disappearance. Draper, the postman? This is a frame-up, Still Carter. innocent, eh, Shelley? Well, suppose you come over to the city hospital with us. Oh, city hospital, eh? Now I know it's a frame. I heard one of your plain clothes men calling city hospital this afternoon, finding out the visiting hours, getting a beautiful frame-up all worked out, and from my own joint, too. What's that? I ain't taking cards on this deal, Carter. I'm getting out of here. Nicky, he's running out. Aren't you going to go after him? That's it. What time is it? Uh, uh, five of eight. And we've got five minutes. Visiting hour starts at eight at the hospital. Nick, what are you talking about? I never thought he'd go that far, Patsy. Come on. We've got to stop a visitor at the hospital tonight. Who? His name is Death. <laughs> Not so fast, Nick. You can stop and rest. I've got to keep going. Well, I'll stick it out. Where are we headed? To the east wing of the hospital. Psychiatry. What time is it? Uh, two minutes after eight. We may have enough time then. Eight. We're going to see that man Gray, aren't we? Yes. Miss West said he was in room 325. Well, this is 315. 317. 319. Here we are, 325. Right here. Uh, yes, it's... It says on the card, monochromatic blindness. You can read the card later, Patsy. Inside, Mm. hurry. Hey, pitch dark in here. Careful, Patsy. Ouch! I I just bumped into one of those rolling tables. Where's the light, Nick? Get down, Patsy. It's a killer. Get out of the way. Where's that rolling table? Here it goes, Patsy. Oh, you got him, Nick. I heard the gun drop. It's only the beginning, Patsy. But the beginning of the end for a... I found you, huh? Oh, Nick, be careful. Oh, no, no, no. At least not without a gun. There. Now, I got wise still. Patsy. Yes, Nick? Try and find the light. Probably alongside the door. Uh, I've got it. Nick. You're sitting on Dan Barnes. Right, Patsy. Dan Barnes, Robert Draper's son-in-law. Barnes is a thief who robbed Robert Draper's mailbag of $10,000 worth of security seven years ago. It was Barnes who took for himself the $12,000 which Draper had saved up before he disappeared. And it was Barnes who hoped to collect 20000 more in life insurance if Draper stayed lost seven full years so he could be declared legally dead. But, but that man in the bed, that's not the same man as in our picture. Well, nevertheless, Patsy, that unconscious gentleman, a near victim of suffocation at the hands of Dan Barnes, is our long-lost postman, Mr. Robert Draper. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he was able to locate the vanishing postman. You know, fine furniture doesn't keep its good looks without help. Not when dust and finger marks and polish accumulation combine to lessen its beauty. 
But Linex Cream Polish disposes of all those bugbears in short order. For Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, renewing your furniture's original handsome appearance in one quick process. Yes, Linex Cream Polish cuts your job in two, saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. It even acts as insurance against future work. For Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oily film to attract more dust. So begin now. Get Linex Cream Polish and learn for yourself the modern way to caring for fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that lightens and brightens your home at an average cost of just two ninety eight a room. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I still don't understand. What happened to Draper seven years ago? As I see it, here's the story, Patsy. Seven years ago, Draper met his son-in-law, Barnes, as usual, to go home and have lunch with him. Uh-huh. He probably confided in Barnes that he was carrying valuable securities and a registered letter. Barnes is the only man Draper would have told, since a postman's job is highly confidential. Well, that's right. They don't go around telling strangers what they carry. All right. Well, on some pretext or other, Barnes lured Draper to the alley behind Shelley's place and shot him. And he took the securities from the bag and left. He thought he'd killed Draper, but the bullet only creased Draper's head, rendering him unconscious. Oh, then what happened? Draper recovered consciousness, but he was badly wounded. Mm. The shock of the wound produced amnesia, and the wound itself produced a brain condition called monochromatism. That's day blindness. The victim can only see at night. By day, he's practically blind and can only see vague shades of gray. So that's what Mr. Flint meant. That's it. And that's what the turban meant. Oh. It was Draper's bewildered attempt to bandage his head. For a few days, he wandered about dazed, without memory, mumbling that he could only see gray. Finally, he was picked up and taken to the hospital. Barnes, who must have seen him wandering around in a dazed condition, realized he was safe so long as Draper's mind was gone and Draper was lost to the public. So he decided to let matters ride and wait. And then we came into the case. Only, I can't understand one thing. Why didn't anybody identify the picture of Draper when you showed it to them? Because it wasn't Draper's picture. What? I realized that when Kramer told me Draper had a mustache, remember? Mm Mm-hmm. Barnes was alarmed when he learned we were on the trail and cleverly handed us a photo of another person, hoping it would throw us off the scent. Oh. Then he followed us as we delivered the mail, waiting to see what would happen. And it was he who shot Kramer just as Kramer was about to give us the information we wanted. And when it became evident we were tracking Draper down, his hand was forced. And then he went to the hospital to try to murder him a second time. Right, Patsy. Unfortunately, Barnes didn't realize that murder is bad medicine. It never cures anything. Not when you're around, Nick. Well, Nick, what's the story for next week? You remember the case of the frightened social director, Patsy? The Mm. man who scattered torn newspaper in preparation for a paper chase and found... Oh, yes, I remember. The next morning when the paper chase started, they found that one of the trails was made of torn $10 bills. What are you going to call the case, Nick? The Factory of Death. And now, a final word from Nick Carter. And a very important word, too, Ken. Friends, right now, there is no better thing you can do for the protection of America's future and your own than to buy United States victory bonds. And by all means, hold your United States war bonds. Help to keep America secure. Help to prevent inflation. Help in the transition from wartime to peacetime by buying and keeping your war bonds until they mature and by buying those all-important victory bonds now. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester... And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. (laughs) 
Dick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brightness. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway is My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The November night has a good hold on Broadway now, and Broadway purrs in its embrace, rubs its cheek against the cool touch, then stops fighting it. And the glitter explodes, the neon rockets its scarlet into darkness, bursts into wishing stars, cascades down on the happy event. The laughter hoarded during the week is spent freely now. The budget of dreams. Have one, kid. It's on me. It's the long night before Monday. Give it to it. Walk a hotel corridor past a room where gaiety is registered for the night. Hung the please do not disturb sign on its door. And the room next to it, the one you're looking for. Hi, Danny. And it's all they're waiting for you. Detective Muggerman and the boy in worn denims, a faded wool shirt, sprawled in final exhaustion across the silk sheet of the hotel bed. The boy, dead of a knife wound. Quite a party next door. You think in a hotel this class, they thicken the wall. All right, Muggerman. But what else have you got? The kid there, stabbed under the heart. Couldn't find the knife, Danny. Couldn't even pry a visitor out of the hotel manager. They're discreet, they tell me. Don't notice unannounced visitors, like this kid must have had. That's why... Well, just tell me what... I was going to say, Danny, they're so discreet in this hotel, that's why the party keeps going next door. Nobody knows there's someone dead, except the manager and a couple of bellhops. What made them sit up and take notice? Kid's phone was off the hook, kept lighting a light on the switchboard. But nobody said they wanted anything. A bellhop came up to find out why. Uh, well, who is he? Registered Joe Blair. Identification card in his wallet, says Joe Blair. That's about all there was in it. The card, some loose change, and these diamond dance tickets. That's his luggage on the chair. Knapsack with a tin of sardines. This is an expensive hotel. How come? I asked the same question of the discreet management. They say the kid came in, told him he hitched here from St. Louis, laid a $10 bill on the desk, says, give me what that buys. Uh, just goes to show you what I... Oh... Really fun time next door, huh, Danny? The moment gathered together and held, an instant composed of drifting laughter that seeped through a wall and added itself to the nice things furnished by the management. Then silence. The moment of requiem for a dead boy. And later, when the room has been emptied, consider the few things neatly stacked on a chair. The paraphernalia for living of a hitchhiker named Joe Blair. Knapsack, wallet, diamond dance tickets. Seventh Avenue Paradise, the tickets read. Dance hall, no refunds. So walk down two blocks, turn left, go up a flight of steps into a place that sells its paradise for a dime a minute. And heaven is 20 Girls 20, the four-piece band and pink lights. Walk over to the very large guardian angel in a dinner jacket. Talk to him. Watch him as he moves away from you and whispers to the lesser angels in evening gowns. And finally, as he walks back with one of them in tow, leaves her with you. Hi. Hello, I'm Danny Clover. Well, the boss told me it was something special. He wasn't kidding. Mostly I tell everybody I don't get off till three. Police, sir. Hey, are you snapping? No, you're, you're not, are you? 
Look, the, bo- the boss just said you were a friend of Joe Blair. You you got to understand when I said I was off the street. At most parties, when I went... All I want you to do is tell me about Joe Blair. Oh. Oh, he's in trouble, huh? Well, if this bail goes over 50 bucks, I'm not going to be any help at all. Joe Blair's dead. Stabbed to death. Dead? Joe? Oh. He was here tonight, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he was early, almost opening time. Bought five tickets. Wait, well, he was standing where you were, and I was standing over there. We looked at each other and both started running, but we met. Did you know him before? No, just... Just dango, like in strange romances magazines. I didn't take a ticket from him either. As a matter of fact, I... Well, I threw ten dollars in the pot so he could have a downy place to put his curly head to sleep tonight. That's how hard the boy struck me. Did he tell you anything about himself? Just that he hitchhiked across the country, he was broke, and he had a guy to see in the morning. A guy named, uh... John, uh, John, John Logan, a bitch Park Avenue type Logan. Other than that, we just looked flame and fire at each other. And that's all you can tell me, huh? Except my name's Vicky, and he didn't ask. Joe's dead. <laughs> what do you know? My name's Vicky, mister. Hi. Excuse it, Danny. But, you know, I... I get the message, Gino. It's late. You're tired. Give me what you got, then you can go home. Those words. Like a good night kiss. <clears throat> what I've got. To wit. Having checked the Logans who breathe Park Avenue's air, I have come up with a Logan who fits our bill. Hmm? A John Logan, to whose household over the phone, the name of Joe Blair, deceased of a knife, is not unknown. You talk to him? Well, how could I, Danny? Said John Logan is now in Europe, where he has been for six weeks, where he is partaking... Who did you talk to? To a wife, I think. She said she was a wife. She said, yeah, I know a Joey Blair, but don't bother me no more with it, she said, as I am on my way to a ball. In the morning, bother me, honey, she said. Honey, she said, to a stranger. You did good, Gino. Go home. You honestly think I did good, Danny? So as I can relate to Mrs. T. Did you honestly... I you, Danny Clover. Look, you. Danny Clover's closed for the night. Sorry to keep you, Danny boy, but tonight you loaded me with a big sorrow. This big, maybe big. Who are you? You walk by me maybe eight, twelve times a day and I don't register with you, huh, kid? No, no, you don't. Warm your hand in Tommy Caps, Danny boy. Tommy Cap. Address, Broadway. Profession, Broadway. You said I made you sad. Why? You come to my girl, and you don't dance with her. Vicky Harper? You don't dance with her, and all it costs is dimes. You talk to her about a hitchhiker what's stabbed in a class hotel. This kind of schmooze upsets an innocent thing like Vicky. Gives her migraines, up here. I come to protect her from... Can't she take care of herself, Tommy? Take care of herself? She's so stupid, she gives a vag ten bucks to sleep on silk. That's my Vicky, innocent, good-hearted, generous with her cuts from dimes. For this, she has to suffer from policemen who come bearing only murdered hitchhikers. Why? Stick around, Tommy. We can make you suffer, too. Because maybe you reached Joe Blair. Because maybe... Sarge, your man's a comic. He's a comic because I got an alibi ten blocks long. I'll give you addresses, kid. I'll treat you like a baby while you check. I'll check. Now, good night, Gino. Hey, Danny, your kid, how's about I give you a lift home? My car's outside. We can go any... No, cut... thanks. How about you, Sarge? I'll ride you home to wherever you live. Brooklyn, the Bronx, Canarsie, wherever you want to well, go. Well, if you're sure it's not out of your way. What's out of my way? It's late, and I ain't had man talk for days. Come on, let's go, Sarge. Uh, Danny? Yeah, Gino? Just so you won't forget, I left a memo on your calendar to go see the Park Avenue Logan next a.m. Now, is it okay if yeah, I... Go ahead, Gino. It's all right. Your man said it was all right, Gino. Throw him a kiss good night. Where do you live, Gino? Where do you want... And go home. Back to the room and wonder idly at the fact that there were no unfinished chess problems to solve or stamps to paste in albums. Things that a man in the profession was supposed to be good at before going to bed. Just go to bed. And try again for the dream you had so long ago you've forgotten what it is and not find it again. Just sleep. Sleep and wake up to morning and dress again and coffee again and to work again. To the Park Avenue address of Mrs. John Logan. 
Stop at the desk of the apartment hotel and be given a floor number. Three flights up and down a hall. And stop. Because a man and woman are standing in front of the door. And start to turn away because they're embracing. Hey, you. And not quite make it. You. Come here. You see what you were looking for? I'm looking Don't for... Don't believe him, Al. I never saw him before in my life. You sure, baby. No. You. Say something real fine to me, Buster. Like why you run up and down this hallway at practically dawn. Else, poor you, big and all, you'll bleed a lot. Oh, yes, you will. Police. Oh? Show me. That's right, Mrs. Logan. The badge says police. Oh, yes, you will. Yes, you will. Cut it out, Ruth. We got company, Albert. You call me Mrs. Logan, the way we said. Because I'm your employer, and I can hire you and fire you and hire you and fire you. And hire. <laughs> you mind her? I don't mind her. You know, you're lucky, mister, being a cop at a time like this. I really would have, right through that wall there, I'd have knocked you, and I could have. Barbell muscles. I lift them. Yeah, it's a fine form of exercise. I approve of it very much. Who are you? Hers. Mrs. Logan's bodyguard. Like she said, hired to guard the body and the home and the welfare while Mr. Logan's in Europe. And I miss him, too. Don't you forget that, Albert. I don't want anybody to forget that. You or you or any of you. Or say yes, ma'am, to me, Albert. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> A boy named Joe Blair mentioned your husband's name, Mrs. Logan. Old Joe. How's old Josie today, I ask you? Dead. Murdered. Old Josie's dead and murdered, Albert. You'd better get some sleep, Mrs. Logan. Look, mister, I was bringing a... from a party. It's my job. Mrs. Logan, to... how do you know Joe Blair? Mm hmm? Picked the lad up in St. Louis and dumped him in Indianapolis. Hitch hitchhiked with me. Hitchhiked. I told you, Albert. Yes, ma'am. On my way back from sunny California to driving along, there was he. In St. Louis, Mo. Knapsack on shoulder, thumb in the air, wind on his cheek. In Indianapolis, he moved over an inch toward me. I pulled up near a cop, smiled at Joe, and told him goodbye. My life with Joe Blair. You want anything else with her, mister? Yeah, I do. When she's sober, see that she gets that way. That's my job. Do it. I'll get around to you later, both of you. What do you think, Danny? Oh, what do you mean, Margovan? I mean, what do you think? Well, I only asked because I gave you the reports. Watch you spend 15 minutes looking at him. Now all I want is a reaction. You want me to stand on my head? Okay, okay. I just thought all this data I gave you might... You know what's in it as well as I do. Joe Blair has a record of vagrancy in a half dozen towns. That just doesn't happen to solve a murder for me. I'm sorry, but it doesn't. Okay, okay. I, I just thought there was something you might know that I don't know. And whatever was in these reports... Are... You gonna bite my head off if I answer? Answer it. Lieutenant Clover's office, Detective Mugman speaking. Who? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wait till I write it down. West 68, huh? Okay, I got it. Thanks. Danny? Yeah? Kid named Tommy Cap, the boy that took Tartaglia home. The call was about him. What about him? He's in an alley. We better go get him. <laughs> Officers, now let us through. Break it. Why don't you go home, lady? It's supper time. There he is, Danny. We got him, all right. Yeah, we got him. It wasn't that way at all. We didn't have him. The thing that had Tommy Cap, the thing that had fixed his hands in half open fist. It was something else. The heavy nail driven through a fence a long time ago, its point bared through a rotting two-by-four. That was it. Tommy Cap had been pushed against it, and it held him. 
killed him. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The Sunday afternoon edition of CBS Radio World News Roundup, broadcast on most of these same stations, keeps you up to date at all times. There's hard-hitting news and analysis by noted CBS Radio reporters Bill Shadell, Howard K. Smith from London, Charles Collingwood covering the nation's capital, and U.N. correspondent Larry Lasser. Every Sunday, CBS Radio's great team of correspondents and reporters give you their weekend of observations, as well as the news that will shape history in the days and weeks to come. The sounds you hear on Broadway are fragments, words broken off and windblown that drift your way, the swift dart of subway noises, and a horn, and a whistle, and footsteps... The brief, wild sob of the faraway river. You've got to listen close so you'll know if that sound began with laughter or despair. The difference it makes, not much. Broadway reacts to clowns and death in nearly the same way. The blonde who had a little accident on a street corner. Or the dead man you saw propped against a fence in an alley. Something to tell your family about. How the policeman pushed you back so you couldn't see how it all ended. But I saw... I had to stay to the end until Tommy Cap was lifted down and shrouded and taken away. Until Tommy Cap was made a matter of official concern. Then I left. Go to a place, back to headquarters, write it down to be transcribed later by a stenographer, to be dated by a dater, stamped by a stamper, to be put in a file by a clerk. I just came from records, Danny. Just about through running Tommy Cap's card through the IBM. Uh, Anything? Just about what we figured. Petty stuff? Yeah. He was a steerer, Danny. You know, a kid latched on to convention people, showed them bars, took them to the village, Harlem. How come he had a record? A little trouble conning the ladies a couple of times. Oh? How? He'd promote them for neckties, maybe a sport jacket, meals. The couple times we know about, he tried to put the bite on them for dough. Two, three hundred bucks. Twice the ladies squawked. Uh huh. Well, did you get his address? Sure. Rooming house off of West 49th. Might be something interesting there. I don't know. It... You mean it's an interesting rooming house, Muggerman? A landmark or something? Why don't you ever let me finish anything, Danny? I'm sorry. What about it? Not the rooming house. The roommate. A musician, a piano player named Norm Persak. What's interesting is he plays piano at the 7th Avenue Paradise. That dime a dance joint. You think that's interesting, Danny? Yeah, I think that's interesting. Thanks, Muggerman. Thanks a lot. <laughs> You Norm Persack? The one, the only Norm Persack. Come in, man. Don't stand that open doorway. That way lies madness. First, you listen to this, man. You close your eyes and listen to this. All right. I just found it. I reached out, and there it was waiting for me. You hear that? You hear the melody? You hear the song? It's, it's different. Yeah, yeah. You got a real taste for a policeman, man. How did you know I was... Are you kidding, man? You made a stir at the 7th Avenue Paradise last night. Norm Persack never forgets. And why I'm here, you know that, too? Sure, man, because I feel it. You can ask me why my roomie is dead, why Tommy Cap died like that on a nail. That's right. I don't know. If I could figure those things, man... You see Tommy last night? Yeah, twice. Once in the night, the next time around dawn. That's the crazy time. Tell me about it. Night, Tommy walks in here, dons a Brooks Brothers suit, you know, with the vents in the back, you know? Yeah. Flips the vents at me, walks out. The other time? Dawn. Tommy walks in on me, gathers up the silk shirts, the ties that glow in the dark, throws a kiss, says, See you around, kid, this is farewell to nothing. His parting words. You tell you where he'd been, where he was going? He said where he was going. Stands because he hit me for 50 bucks before he left. 50 bucks for wires. Wires? Telegrams. They sell them down the corner hotel. You know. Yeah, I know. You're lucky, man. Here. Yeah. I'll give you a song to exit on.
And go to the corner hotel, show a badge, ask a question. Let the whispers make the rounds of the palm deck lobby. And finally, let them come back to you in the shape of a man who pokes his pince nez at your lapel. Oh, look here, you. Well, anything you say. You could have come in the back door. This is a family hotel. Some of our people even have children. I'll try to set a good example, Mr... Rocket. Francis Rocket. Now, just what is it you want of us? Man came here last night, Mr. Rocket, late, to send some telegrams. Sometimes wanderers come in off the street and do that in here. This man was different. He sent them, walked out of here, then was found in an alley, murdered. Well, that'd be Tommy Cap. Uh, the Times mentioned it today. I often told that boy to end that way, in an alley, if he persisted Did in you tell me, Mr. Rocket, who he sent them to? You could keep a record or something that would... To hotels, to every major hotel between here and... He Saint... sent them to... To what? Pay attention, please, to hotels. The exclusive ones between here and St. Louis. The Mayberry in Indianapolis, the region in Columbus, etc., etc., etc. I call the list for him from our owner's hotel guide. You remember what he said in them? I only counted the words, sir. I didn't stoop to explore their meaning. I could tell you this, however, if tell you... Tell me. Re he requested an answer to his query in each. A care of this hotel, collect. None have come in as yet. However, when they do, I'm afraid... Collect. I'm afraid. Don't be afraid anymore, Mr. Rocket. When they come, just phone them into us. We've got a fund for collect telegrams. Good for you. You're finished with me, I presume? Of course you are. Yes, Mr. Rocket. Yeah, I have that, uh-huh. Yeah, Indianapolis. Columbus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Springfield, too. Thanks for calling again, Mr. Rocket. You heard, Danny? Nothing from any of those places either, huh? Same answers as from Wheeling and Pittsburgh and Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. No one registered by the name of Ruth Logan in any of the big cities on the route. It's not positive, Danny, but... Oh, hi, Gino. Detective, you summoned me to your presence, Danny? Yeah, I did, Gino. Last night, Tommy Cap drove you home, didn't he? Oh, no, he did not, Danny. He remembered after we drove for a little while a most pressing engagement to phrase him. So he dropped me at a subway station and waved me a cheery farewell. While you were driving, Gino, did you talk about anything? A most refreshing conversation, Danny. About his work, about my work, man to man, straight from the shoulder. You didn't mention anything about the Logans, did you, Gino? You know I know better than that, Muggerman. I've been in this business 20 years. You should behave outside of the shop as good as me. Oh, Gino... Gino, did he try to talk to you about the Logans? Indeed, he made mention of same, but I deftly sidestepped the issue. That's when he dropped me. What else is on your gentleman's mind? Nothing, Gino. Nothing at all. Hello. I'm Danny Clover, Mrs. Logan. I'm... I met you in a haze once, didn't I? Right here, Mrs. Logan, this morning. Come in. There's nobody here but Albert. Hey, Albert. We know him, don't we? You back again, Buster? I'm interrupting something. I'm teaching the ape a waltz. Watch us. Come on, Albert. Now, look, baby. You... Say yes, ma'am, Albert. Yes, ma'am, but I ain't waltzing. We didn't before, anyhow, did we? Did we? Turn off the record, Albert. Yes, ma'am. We ran it down this morning, mister. Did I have fun, mister? Hi, mister. This morning we talked about Joe Blair. You remember that? Every word of it. I'm glad you do, Mrs. Logan, because now it's got another murder in it. Look, mister, I'm paid... I know pay... you're employed. You get hired and fired. Then hired again. You was... Come on, Waltz. <laughs> Don't stand there, Mr. Waltz, with me. Leave him alone. Stop making a jerk out of yourself. Say please, Albert. A man walks in here and talks about two murders, and I'm going to say please. You're a jerk, Ruth. J-E-R-K, jerk. The ape spells. Give him a penny, mister. You people want to perform, go right ahead. I'm still going to talk about murder. All right. We'll listen. Won't we listen, Albert? A question, Mrs. Logan. All right. You left Joe Blair off in Indianapolis, and you kept right on going, that right? Right. Right, right, right. From Indianapolis, where did you go? 
Columbus. I stayed there overnight. Where'd you stay? What hotel? The Regent, where I always stay. I think it was a region. Maybe it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't at any other first-rate hotel in Columbus. I always stay at first-rate hotels. I was at the region. We've checked every good hotel between St. Louis and New York and most of the motels. You didn't stay at any of them. Isn't he clever, Albert? You should be like him. Bust is getting interesting. Let's listen, huh? You drove right through, didn't you, Mrs. Logan? I'm a frail little girl. That's a long, long ride for a frail little girl. Not if Joe Blair helped you drive. He must have been pretty good company. (laughs) Curly-headed company. All the way from St. Louis. He must have been interesting. Curly-headed. And you must have interested him. He got to New York and he didn't want to let you go. He gets cleverer all the time, doesn't he, Albert? Yeah. On the trip cross-country, he found out you were wealthy, you were married. He figured he had a good thing. called you. Made you meet him at his hotel. When this is over, Albert will waltz and waltz. Yeah, yes, ma'am. You met him, Mrs. Locke, and decided you were a fool to have ever picked him up in the first place. A knife got mixed up in it, and when you walked out of his room, Joe was dead. If what you say is true, then I'm a murderess. Did you hear that, Albert? Uh, someone else figured all this before the police did. Tommy Cap, he found out about a hitchhiker mixed up with a wealthy married woman, so he checked all the hotels between here and St. Louis for blackmail purposes. You're right, baby. The mister is clever. We're going to waltz, Albert. Don't forget. So Ruth sent you, Albert, to have a little talk with him. In an alley. Where you're going. You killed him. An accident. He backed into a nail. Maybe I'll find one for you. There's a lot about this dancing I haven't taught you, Albert. Hmm. Our song, Ape. Shall you? Second. Okay, if you want it this way, Albert. You ready, Mrs. Logan? Or you'll make me go? Or I'll make you go. I wouldn't give you the pleasure. Anytime you say, mister. The wheel spins on Broadway, and you bet against the dealers of the night. On the blood red of neon, on the black of the searching wind. Pick a color and make a prayer. And the wheel stops. The red pays off with heartbreak. And the black with dust in your mouth. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Kathy Lewis was heard as Ruth Logan, Ed Max as Al Mundo, High Everback as Norm Persack, Paula Victor as Vicky, and Billy Happett as Tommy Cap. Lovers of fine music are already familiar with the strong, melodious voices of the choral airs on CBS Radio. This is to remind our many Sunday night Coral Airs listeners that this excellent choral group will be heard at a new, earlier time on most of these stations starting tomorrow. Bill Anders speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Thank you.
My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of The Barefoot Boy with Shoes, Gone. There were three women in it, three guys, and seven cats. It figured for an easy trace job. All I had to do was find a missing guy named Thaddeus Mink, a painter. Only before it was over, a couple of people turned up dead. And what made me think maybe I was trailing a killer with a screw loose was what happened to those seven cats. The thing teed off for me when a letter came to the Lion Detective Bureau in the morning mail. My boss, the Lion, opened it. You could see the dollar signs in his eyes. Ah, Jeffrey. Well, well, look here. That rich uncle of yours finally kick off? What do you mean? You look so happy. Oh, it's not that. Jeffrey, listen to this. Uh, <clears throat> the Ezra Park Duffield Art Gallery's Pasadena from the sanctum of E.P. Duffield. Already I don't like oh, it. Oh, now, 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 Jeffrey. Mr. Duffield encloses his personal check for $50. For which we do what? Uh, yes, well, uh, <clears throat> now let me see uh... No, we find a missing person, Jeffrey. A man by the name of Mink, Thaddeus Mink, a painter. Uh, Mr. Duffield says uh, we'll be doing an uh, an inestimable service to the world of art. Duffield say why he doesn't go to the cops? Well, he does mention that he has personal reasons for maintaining secrecy. They all say. What do you mean by that? Listen, Lion, the L.A. police look for missing persons free. Guy doesn't want the free service, he's got a reason. Maybe he wants a finger man, maybe it's a stakeout. Jeffrey, do you think that if I thought... Sure I do. You don't mean that. I mean it. Only count me out. I don't risk my private op license for 50 bucks. See you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Mr. Duffield says in his letter he's coming here to the office himself this morning. Well, you see him, fatso. I got a short thirst. Jeffrey! I'll be in Dugan's place on Hill Street if anything good turns up. You mean you won't take the case? You take it. All right, Jeffrey, I will. Well, that ought to be Duffield now. I'll let him in and me out. How do you do? Are you Mr. Lyon? I'm Regan. Uh, that's Lyon behind the desk. I see. I'm E.P. Duffield. Yeah? Oh, come in. Thank you, Mr. Regan. Uh, 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 Miss Duffield, come in, come in. Shall I sit here, Mr. Lyon? Uh, yes. Well, run along, Jeffrey. I'm taking this case, remember? Hey, you're waiting in Dugan's place on Hill Street until something good turns up. Yeah, that's right. See you. I went to Dugan's or sat looking into it. What I kept seeing was E.P. Duffield. Red hair, gray-green eyes, tall, about 5'11". But not too much of her, just enough. Any place you looked. I looked up and I was still seeing E.P. Duffield. That's because she was there. Mind if I sit down, Mr. Regan? Bar's public. Thanks. What'll the lady have? Nothing, thank you. Oh, Lion didn't take your case? Well, he said you were the operative. So? Mr. Regan, I have an art gallery. Ezra Park Duffield Galleries, Pasadena. He was my father. I'm Esther Patricia Duffield. You wrote a letter. Said you wanted somebody to find a missing person. A painter named Thaddeus Mink. That's right. You didn't go to the cops. Why? Cops trace missing persons free. Well, but you see, Mr. Regan, I couldn't. They wouldn't help me. Give me more. I've never seen Thaddeus Mink. I don't know what he looks like. Keep on. It's true. You see, he's a painter. He sent me a number of paintings by express. But I haven't been able to locate him. I've tried, but... Mr. Regan, if you'd come to the gallery and see his pictures, I think you'd understand. Will you come? You put up a 50-buck retainer, lady. You want me to look at pictures for 50 bucks? I look. In here, Jeff. With you, lady. The mink paintings are here in my office. There they are. Cats. Yes, cats. And look how he paints them. How evil he makes them. Yeah, I see what you mean. Cat phobia, Jeff. Sometimes an artist becomes great through passionate love. And sometimes through passionate hate. And mink hates cats. Is that it? (laughs) 
It's made him a great painter. Is that why you want me to find him? I have just these few canvases. I want more. They'll be worth thousands of dollars. Mm. You paint those circus pictures, too? No. No, I did. You? A few years ago. I traveled with the circus, but my paintings aren't much good. Hmm. Mink ever paint anything except cats? One picture. You here? I have all his pictures. But you've never seen him. I told you we sent them express. I tried to trace him, but I couldn't find him. All I have are the paintings. These are the cats and the one other. All signed the same way. Not with his name, but with the print of a cat's paw painted in one corner. Where's the other one? Over here. I keep it draped. It frightens me. Look. A woman. You see, Jeff, he's painted her back as she stands at the mirror fixing her hair. The back of an ordinary woman. But in the mirror, her face, the eyes, are of a cat. And the way her fingers curl and hook into her hair... Like cat's claws. Yeah. Well, maybe she's something we can go on. What do you mean? Well, maybe somebody else has painted her, too. Maybe she's registered as a model. We find her, maybe we get a line on Mink. Might work. I found her photo in an agency. Mrs. Margaret Ames lived in Hollywood. I drove out there. Only when I got there and I rang the doorbell, I got a big surprise. Sergeant Bowles of the Hollywood Division L.A. Police opened the door. Regan, what do you want? Came to see Mrs. Margaret Ames? Yeah, it figured. She a client of yours? You do a lousy job, Regan, a lousy job. There'll be a law against you private guys. Always getting people killed. She got strangled, Regan. It killed her. Mind if I look? Come on. Thanks. Like I say, uh, the deceased a client of yours? Nope. You know her? Nope. A lot of good you're going to give us. There she is. Sort of surprised look on her face. Maybe she hadn't planned to get strangled this morning. Oh, could be. Neighbor lady phoned us up. She come in to borrow coffee. That's what she found. Scared the hair piece off of her, she said. Mrs. Ames live alone? Divorced, lives alone. We got nothing, Regan, nothing. <laughs> Police haven't a line at all on who might have killed Margaret Ames, Jeffrey. No, no. Here, let me check the late edition. Hmm? No, oh, yes, yes. Here, yeah, here, yeah, here you are, my boy. You think they may have turned up something by now, huh? Well, Sergeant Bowles wouldn't have phoned me if they had. No, no, I suppose not. Jeffrey, here's an interesting item in the second section of the paper. Yeah? It says that in a place called Mountain Crest on the mountains near Los Angeles, lion, lion. somebody's been putting out poison meat. Yeah, but here's the strange thing. The pieces of meat have been tied up in trees. Huh? Yes, and several cats have been poisoned. Hey, wait a second. Poison, meat up in trees? That could be it. It could be what, Jeffrey? Maybe the poisoner ties the meat in trees so dogs won't get it. Only cats. Why, Lion? Well, I don't know, Jeffrey. Maybe because he hates cats. Jeffrey, you mean that uh, that, that cat painter, Mr. Mink... It's worth a try. Mountain Crest, you said? Yes. We'll keep in touch with the Margaret Ames murder, Lion. I'm going to Mountain Crest. <laughs> It was only a couple of hour drive, but I got started late and it was dark when I got there. Cold up there, snow above the 4,000 foot level. Mountain Crest was half a dozen houses, abandoned lumber mill, and Mountain Crest Haven, a rundown auto court with a gas pump and cafe. I pulled in and stopped at the gas pump. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, but we didn't expect no customer up here a mean night like this. You run this place? Oh, gosh, no, I work here. I'm Jimmy. Everybody around here knows me. That is, everybody there is around here. Some gas, mister? What it'll hold. Hey, you ought to go inside and warm up. Have a cup of coffee while I fill her up. Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, Bunny will serve you. Bunny? Uh, she come up here a couple of weeks ago. She's the waitress. Ah, your girlfriend, huh? No. No, she ain't. I went inside. Maybe I saw why Jimmy's face clouded up when I asked him if Bunny was his girlfriend. Bunny was behind the counter, ordinary, pretty kid, corn yellow hair, about maybe 19. 
But on a counter stool talking to her was a slick-looking guy, 25, thin-faced, pinstripe suit. I walked over, slow. But he didn't mean nothing What are you hot for? You got no right to butt in. Well, I butt in, I butt in. Listen, you can't talk to me like that, Art Jones. Oh, no, you think you're smart? Oh, you want something? Oh. Yeah, I could use coffee, Bunny. How do you know my name? Jimmy told me. Uh, I'll see you later, Bunny. Bill collector? Him? That's Art Jones. He's in one of the cabins. Mm, you like the cold weather? He doesn't know what he likes. Cream or black, mister? Uh, black. He didn't look like your type, Bunny. He takes me places. Dancing down to Anaheim. Sure. Here's your coffee. Anything else? No, not now. Why don't you go with Jimmy? He hasn't got a car. Yeah, but the next time I will... I don't know where Art gets off, just because Mr. Mink gave me a... Mink? Yes. He gave me a painting. He's a painter. But that's no reason for Art to get sore. Why, Mr. Mink is old. He must be 35. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You live around here, Mink? In a cabin up on Lime Peak. Far from here? A couple of miles. You live alone? Mm Mm-hmm. He's... He's sort of funny. I think he's scared of people. But I guess he likes me. You know him, mister? By reputation. He's a very sweet man. What I hear. He gave you a painting of a cat, huh? Yes, he did. Cat's paw painted in a corner? Yes. It was a picture of a dead cat. A dead cat? Read in the paper some cats got poison around here lately, around Mountain Crest. Seven of them. A courtier mink might have done it? Oh, no. He loves cats. He loves them. Now, what I heard, I heard he hates them. I phoned the lion and told him what I had. He had something for me. Cops had traced the strangled woman mink had painted. Mrs. Margaret Ames' maiden name was Margaret Mink. She had a brother someplace, cops said. His name was Thaddeus. Next call I made was to Pasadena. Speaking. Hello, Esther. Jeff Regan. Oh, hello, Jeff. I located your painter, baby. Thaddeus Mink. You have? Yeah, in a cabin up here in the mountains. I'm near there now. Where are you? Place called Mountain Crest. Mink's cabin's up a couple of miles from here. Well, that that's fine, Jeff. Jeff, I want to see him first myself. He's very queer and temperamental. I'm sorry, baby. Um, I've got to go up there first thing in the morning. Mink's maybe mixed up in a murder. <laughs> I rented one of the cabins at Mountain Crest Haven, got in bed and read some Edgar Allan Poe to quiet my nerves. About six the next morning, the wind dropped. Wind had brushed everything white, still, smooth. I started for Mink's cabin on Lime Peak about eight. Bunny went with me. There it is. Yeah, smoke through the pines. That's from his cabin. We're almost there. Hey, hold it. What, Jeff? Footprints. In the snow. Coming from that way. From the highway, there's a shortcut that way to the road where it goes over the summit. Man's footprints must have been made this morning since the wind dropped or they'd have been covered over. Now, oh, come on. Oh, wait a minute. What is it? Over there. Same footprints going back toward the highway. Running. Steps are longer and the snow is kicked between them. Yes. Come on, maybe something's happened. We ran for the cabin. It stood in the pines in front of a shelf of rock. The footprints led to the door, then running away from the door again and toward the highway. There weren't any other tracks. The cabin door stuck, but it was unlocked. It always sticks. There. There. Mr. Mink? Mr. Mink? Come on. It wasn't Mink. It was a thin-faced slick looker in a pinstripe suit. And in his stocking feet. Art Jones... Strangled. Five foot eleven of beautiful red-headed dame, E.P. Duffield, Duffield Art Gallery's Pasadena, hired me to find a missing cat painter named Mink. First track I got led to his sister. But that was a dead end. 
Somebody had strangled her. Then I went up in the mountains. Somebody had poisoned seven cats at a place called Mountain Crest. Maybe Mink. Yeah, Mink lived up there, only when I got to his cabin, there was a corpse on the floor. Art Jones, Bunny's pal in the pinstripe suit. Strangled. No shoes on. I searched the cabin, not a shoe in the joint. Half an hour later, Bunny and I got back down to Mountain Crest Haven, the combination gas station and auto court where she worked as a waitress. <sighs> Ooh. Ooh, this is better. Mm-hmm. I'd better get you some hot coffee. You're not used to the coffee. Uh, after I phone the sheriff. Where's the nearest place I got one? Meridian Township. Yeah, I'll be back for the coffee. Jeff. Yeah? Jeff. Mr. Mink couldn't have killed Art. Funny. Art Jones went up to Mink's cabin this morning. You and Art were quarreling about Mink last night. Art was jealous. Art was crazy to think that Mr. Mink... Maybe. But he went up there. He saw his footprints going in through the snow. The ones that came back out were made by the same shoes. I checked that. But Art Jones didn't make them. No. No, I know. The killer took Jones's shoes after he strangled him and wore them when he left so he wouldn't make tracks with his own shoes. Mr. Mink didn't do that. Well, there weren't any other tracks, Bunny. One pair of footsteps in, one pair of footsteps out. Jones in to see Mink. Tell him to lay off seeing you, probably. Who out? I'll get you some hot coffee. Sorry, kid. So that was it. Case just about wrapped up. Mink must have strangled Jones. Jones was strangled just like Mink's sister. If there weren't any other tracks in the snow, it didn't make sense anybody else had been there. I phoned the sheriff at Meridian Township. It took five or six minutes to get him on the phone. His name was Lyle. Sheriff Jesper Lyle, what can I do for you? My name's Regan, private investigator from Los Angeles. Huh? You better put out a description on a Thaddeus Mink, Sheriff. I can give details. Short, about 35 years. That's out already. Huh? Out already. Mink, wanted for questioning homicide, L.A., connection, street, regulation of his sister, Margaret Mink Ames. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. On the wires at four yesterday. Don't think he did it, though. Don't seem the kind. Sitting right here beside me in the office. Give me that again. You got Mink there in your office? Yeah, we ain't got cells, Bob. Ain't big time, you know, like you folks down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheriff, Hmm? tell me one thing. When did you pick Mink up? Uh, yesterday. He'd picked Mink up four hours after the wanted was sent out by L.A., eight o'clock last night. Mink was in the Meridian General Store buying cat food. Yeah, and he told the sheriff a sad story. He loved cats. Loved them. Had four. But they'd come down with something, suffered. Mink had had to put them out of their misery. And when he found out they'd passed the disease around Mountain Crest, he put poison up in the trees to save the cats of the town the misery his cats had suffered. He'd bought a new cat, though. That's why he's buying cat food. So that made everything fine. Case all wrapped up. Yeah. Like a hot rod around a telephone pole. Sugar, Jeff? Jeff? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yeah, thanks. Here. Thanks. Anyway, I'm glad it wasn't Mr. Mink. Yeah, Mink didn't strangle Jones. Couldn't have. Sheriff had him. Well, I'm glad. Jones went up to the cabin to see Mink. Saw it about Mink giving you the painting. That part still holds. Made tracks in the snow. Didn't walk back out. Got strangled. But his shoes walked out. Somebody in him, you think, Bunny? Not Mink, not Jones. Somebody with a motive to kill Jones? Hmm? You didn't like him. I, well, Did you? I, Art Jones? Yeah, well, you went I... with him because he took your places, only maybe you didn't feel good about it. He wasn't your type. I guess he wasn't. He wasn't. And then he began to crowd you. Mink business, for instance. You figured he didn't have any right to butt into your life. Well, that's true, but... What about Jimmy? Jimmy? Yeah, the kid that works around here. More your style. You seem like a nice kid. He is. Yeah, only Art Jones got in between you. What are you thinking? I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking somebody must have been in Mink's cabin when Jones got there this morning. Somebody that had gone in before the wind dropped, so the tracks covered over. Somebody that would have killed Jones. And you think you sleep that... in one of the cottages here at the auto court? Yes. Sleepwalk, maybe? Jeff, I don't like now, you. Now, listen, baby, the sheriff will be getting up to Mink Cabin in the next ten minutes on my say-so. Half an hour later, this joint here's going to be jumping, only not with customers. 
With cops, deputies asking questions. Now, let's get ahead of them, huh? Well, I didn't kill Art, if that's what you want to know. I know you didn't. What? <sighs> well, then... No, you couldn't have. You couldn't have done the job, strangled him. Strangling's not a girl-sized job. Well, then why did you ask me all those questions? To get answers, baby. About you and Art Jones and Jimmy. Jimmy? Yeah. Only two people had a motive to kill Jones. You and Jimmy. Look on her face said she was scared, but that might be it. Jimmy liked her, didn't like Jones. I started to look for Jimmy, and what he was doing when I found him didn't help. He was stealing my car. Hey! Hey, get out of that car! Jimmy! Jimmy, get out of that car! You won't get away! Come here! Come here! Come out! All right, this will hold you. What are you trying to do? Come here. Let me go. I got an arm lock on him. All of a sudden, he quit. Fear had worked two ways on him. Made him fight, made him quit. You better talk, Jimmy. Like fast, huh? Wait till I shut off the motor. We'll go inside, out of the cold. And then I want answers. I... What I saw on the seat of my car when I reached in to shut off the motor stopped me. A pair of shoes. Art Jones' shoes. Still wet from being in the snow. I took Jimmy into the cafe, sat him on a stool. Bunny came in. Jimmy. Jimmy, what did you do? I, I didn't do anything. You tried to steal my car. You stole the keys out of my cottage. You'd have gotten away if the motor hadn't been cold. Jimmy. Jimmy. Why did you want to steal my car? Because I, I had to get away. Because you killed Art Jones? No, I, I, I didn't kill him. I... I... Go on, kid. Get it out. I... I had to get away. I, I had to. Jeff, please. Keep out of it, Bunny. You think a lot of Bunny, Jimmy. Well, I... Yes, I do. You didn't like Jones? No, I didn't. Where'd you get his shoes? I found them. Yeah? In the snow by the highway. Look, the sheriff will want a better story than that. You'd better practice up on me. Well, I... I got up early. You sleep here someplace? I've got a room in the kitchen. Go on. I went up the highway a ways I was trying to think. Well, because of Art Jones and Bunny. I didn't think I had any chance with her, I guess. But then I saw the shoes in the snow by the highway. I brought them back. Anybody see you coming or going? Why, yes, yes. Yes? Well, they were scraping the road. There's where I found the shoes. I checked Jimmy's story and it was okay. He had a snowplow crew of witnesses. So that made it great. Two people had a motive to murder Jones, Jimmy and Bunny. Bunny couldn't have strangled Jones and Jimmy didn't. Well, if nobody with a motive to murder Jones had murdered him, then it had to be this way. Somebody without a motive to murder him had. I walked back up to the cabin where Jones was strangled. Sheriff Lyle and his deputies had been and gone. They'd made tracks in the snow. But then I saw some tracks they hadn't made. They were the paw marks of Thaddeus Mink's new cat. I asked myself where I had seen cat's paw marks before. That gave me the answer. I went back down to Mountain Crest Haven and made a phone call. I got the right answer. That left me just one place to go. It took a while to get there. Yes, this is a surprise. Painting? Oh, just touching up this still life. Been better, lady, if you just stayed E.P. Duffield art dealer. You... You mean because I paint so badly? It's part of it. You're more the outdoor type. Tall, strong. Ah, I suppose that's so. Those circus paintings over there. You painted. You showed me yesterday. Yes. You were in the circus. Strong enough for that. Jeff, just what are you trying to get at? Not trying. I've got. I phoned the model agency from Mountain Crest a little while ago. Model agency where I got the track on Margaret Ames Mink, Mink's sister that got strangled. You'd gotten her address a couple of hours before she was murdered. That doesn't mean anything. You wanted to be a great painter. Yes. Yeah, but honey, you didn't have the stuff. What happens? Thaddeus Mink sends you his paintings. He is a great painter. Go on, Jeff. Sure. Mink didn't sign his name to his paintings. Painted on a cat's paw print instead. So? Mink was a shy guy. He found out nobody knew him. Nobody knew he'd painted the great paintings of his you had. Except his sister. She'd posed for one. You killed her. And, Jeff? And that left Mink. 
Him dead, you'd be the genius that painted the pictures. Yes. Well, he is dead, Jeff. And I am. You went up to Mink's cabin after I talked to you on the phone last night. Nobody home, but you waited. Guy came in early this morning, you strangled him. Wore his shoes to walk out. I said, Mink's dead. Uh Uh-uh. Mink's not dead. You've never seen Mink, and you strangled the wrong guy. A guy named Jones. (laughs) Jones? Not Smith. Jeff, I'm not a fool. You're lying to save your skin. My skin? Your skin. Hasn't it occurred to you that there's somebody else who knows who painted the cat pictures? Hey. You mean Regan. That was in it from the first, Jeff. Jeff, bursting in like this into my office, perhaps trying to make love to me. You shouldn't have done it. Not when I happen to be armed. Put that gun down. Oh, no, Jeff. There. Now, stay still. Go. Esther, you should stick to strangling. It's more accurate. Next day, I gave the lion a little lecture on art. Very well, very well, very well, Jeffrey. You seem to have become quite an authority on art. But I'm afraid I'm a little more interested in art, uh, Jones. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, you went back up to Mountain Crest, I suppose. Yep. Uh, that nice young boy, Jimmy. How are he and that girl, Bunny? Uh, say, Jeffrey, uh, why did he try to steal your car and run away? Well, only he and Bunny had a motive to kill Jones. Jimmy found the shoes, then overheard my call to Sheriff Lyle. He knew he hadn't killed John. So? You mean he suspected... Well, he was scared. All he could think was to get those shoes far away. He knew there was strong evidence. E.P. Duffy would toss them out of her car, but he didn't know that. He thought that Bunny... Oh, I can't believe that. He was in love. That mixes you up. Yes. Yes, it does. Only Bunny hadn't done it. Jimmy hadn't either. If the two people who had reason to kill Jones hadn't killed him... It added that Jones was killed by mistake. Yes, I see that. In Mink's cabin. So it made sense the killer meant to kill Mink. Only he didn't know what Mink looked like. Only one person fitted that. E.P. Duffield. Why, that's brilliant, my boy, brilliant. Yeah, but uh, what about Thaddeus Mink? Mink? Oh, Sheriff Lyle released him. And when he found out how much dough his paintings are going to bring him, he turned philanthropist. He did? Yeah. Gave us a present in What? Yeah, right outside the door. Oh, Jeffrey, it may be one of his valuable paintings worth thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. Could be worth that much. Big enough box. You open it. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, do you think it... Oh, Jeffrey... Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon, original music by Dick Aran. Jeff Regan, Investigator, will be back next week at the same time. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in seconds. Its zippy, tangy quality leaves a happy aftertaste. For a reliable yet refreshing mouthwash, use Rexall MI-31. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. 
Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Dick's special guest star tonight is... is, uh... uh, What was your name again? I'm sorry, but I really can't tell you. You can't tell me. Well, Rexall brings you Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Mr. Diamond. Morning, Charlie. Now, uh, fix me something, will you? Like that, huh? You look pretty good. Oh, you should have seen me when I got up. Both my heads were hissing each other. I'll fix you my special. You snap right out of it. Well, take it easy. I tried snapping out of it this morning and scattered myself all over the room. You relax for a minute. Just getting to work? Yeah. Helen gave a party last night. I think it turned out to be the finals of the roller derby. Have a swallow a roller skate, Charlie. Once on a dare, a mouse. Oh. Sorry. Charlie! You gotta mix it. Oh, that's a horrible machine to have in a bar. Some poor guy's liable to end up with a shell shock. Here, hold your breath so you don't change your mind. What's in it? In your condition, that is a very touchy question. You just drink it, you'll feel better. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. No fudging all the way. Charlie! Uh, all the way? What are you, chicken? Oh. Oh, I knew it, I knew it. You snitched this stuff from a fire extinguisher. Tastes terrible, don't it? What are you going to thaw me out with, a chisel? Now I know it ain't that bad. No? A mortician would pay good money for the formula. Well, look what came in the front door. Hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Pardon me, but I'm looking for someone. There's nobody here but me and Mr. Diamond. Here's a picture of him. Has he been in here? Oh, lady, a lot of people come in here. No, I mean this morning. Mr. Diamond's my first customer. Oh. Uh, something wrong, miss? I've just got to find him. I don't know where to look. Oh, what made you think he'd be in here? I'm trying every place that's open. I lost him in this block someplace. Lost him? Well, he... Well, he just disappeared. Uh, who is he? My husband. Oh. I stopped to look at some hats in a window. I started talking about how pretty they were, and the next thing I turned around and he was gone. You called home? We're living at a hotel. He hasn't shown up there. I, I've called everyone I know in New York. You're from out of town? Yes. Oh, I'm so worried. Well, honey, from this picture, your husband looks old enough to find his way around. Why don't you go on back to the hotel and... You the... don't understand. My husband had quite a shock earlier this morning, and he was acting strangely. So you figure he might have gone looking for a drink? I don't know what I thought. It isn't like him to wander off like that. I'm so worried. Well, if you're that upset, why don't you go to the law? Missing persons. Oh, I thought about that, but I can't. You can't go to the police? I can't explain why. It it just wouldn't be good. Would you mind a completely new remark? What? Haven't I seen you before, Miss... Uh... No... Mm, nice name. Mr. Diamond sees a lot of people. Used to be a cop himself. Oh. Private detective now. Private detective? Seems to me I've seen your husband someplace before, too. Is this an old picture? Yes, I carry it around in my wallet. Are you really a private detective, Mr. Uh... Diamond, Miss... Like Sam Spade? Well, no, no. Sam drinks and runs around with women. I lead a rather sheltered life. <coughs> Steady, Charlie. Mr. Diamond, I'm really frightened. I'm sure something awful's happened to my husband. Will you help me? I might, if you tell me two things. What are they? Why you can't go to the police, and if you can afford a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, I can afford the money. You should have answered the first question first. Now I'm almost tempted to forget the last one. But I can't go to the police. Uh, dear. Dear, when people can't go to the police, it worries me. Your old man got a record or something? A record? Well, I've seen both of you someplace. You sure you aren't working some kind of a racket? Oh. Oh, oh, oh now, now, lady, take it easy. I lose my husband. I come in here for help, and you think I'm some sort of a criminal or something. Look, dear, I... I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't want to go to the police, and it has nothing to do with breaking the law. Shame on you, Diamond. Here, lady, here's a handkerchief. Thank you. Look, uh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. 
You're terrible. Oh, please, please. Look, I- I'm in pretty bad shape myself. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll help you. Wonderful, Mr. Diamond. Where can we talk? Hey, she turns them off like a hydrant. You'll help me? Oh, yes. A uh, hundred a day in expenses. Certainly. Get her. Yeah. Are you sure you didn't dip into one of Charlie's specials? I don't drink. This isn't drinking. It's like diving into an active volcano. Where can we talk? Uh, one of the booths. Good. I don't want anyone else to know about this. You mean after this build-up, I ain't gonna, even going to hear what it's all about? Come on, dear. Oh. Uh, relax, Charlie. Have one of your specials. Who knows? You may be the first one to reach the moon. Is this booth all right, Mr. Diamond? Uh, just fine. Now sit down, dear, and tell me all about it. Well, there's really not much to tell. I took my husband to the... Well, to an appointment this morning. What kind of an appointment? I can't tell you. And you can't tell me your husband's name? No. Not even his first name? Well, I... I guess I could tell you his first name. It's Richard. Richard? Yes. You can't tell me any more? No. You want me to find him and you want me to trust you? If you will. Will you trust me? Yes. Then I'll try and find Richard, but I'll need some help. I'll try. No, 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 please. I'll need some outside help. Who? A policeman. Oh, no, I told you. And I told you. You want me to trust you? Okay, that's what I'm going to do, but you've got to trust me, too. But the police... If you and your husband aren't in trouble with the police, you've got nothing to worry about. But the police... Not the police. A policeman. One man. But he'll find out why Richard disappeared. Well, don't you want to know why? I know why, but I don't want anyone else to know why. You don't want anyone else... You know why, but you... Oh, don't let me do this to myself. I just want to find him. Okay, okay. I promise the policeman won't say anything. I'm trusting that you have a good reason for not telling me any more than you have, but to find a man, this man in the picture, and an old photograph at that, to find this man needs a lot of doing. Checking hospitals. Hospitals? Now, don't start crying. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. When you've got to check hospitals, morgue... Morgue! Look, 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 dear. You wait here. No, I'm going with you. Good girl. Charlie! Thank you for being so patient. A pleasure, miss. Shall we go, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah. And Charlie. Yeah? I'd like to thank you, too. Anytime. Your hospitality and good manners are only equaled by your loyalty and perspicacity. Huh? All in all, you've been a living doll. Being a person who lives out in left field most of the time myself, I realized that these little disturbances in my life were pretty average. So with cute little anonymous tagging along behind, I left Charlie's fancy bistro and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and the good Lieutenant Levinson. When we walked into the squad room, we bumped right into the one thing that science had been working 24 hours a day to find a cure for. Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, how are you, Diamond? Hey... Oh, unpucker, Otis. Mrs. X will think the lieutenant uses you to unstop sinks. Mrs. X? What kind of a name is that? You want to meet the lady? That's the name. Mrs. X? How do you do, Sergeant? Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, ain't I seen you someplace before? Otis, haven't I seen you someplace before? Now, what are you talking about, Shama? Sure you've seen me before. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, but this is nothing. Stick around him for a whole day sometime. Come on, let's see the lieutenant. Uh, I'll see you later, Mrs. Oh, uh, uh, yes, Sergeant. It's been a pleasure. Otis. Yeah? Your eyes are hanging out so far they cover your badge. Oh. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. I'm... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is Mrs. X, Walt. Dear, this is the mighty arm of the law, Lieutenant Levinson. How do you do, Lieutenant? How do you do, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. X? Oh, let's not go into this thing again. The young lady prefers to be known as Mrs. X. Now, all I want you to do me a favor. Yeah, a uh, young lady. Uh, haven't I seen you someplace, someplace before? before? Yeah, Walt. Even Otis is with us on that one. I said the same thing when she found me in Charlie's bar. Now, the young lady's lost her husband, and I'm going to help her find him. Here's his picture. See if you got anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you sure I haven't seen you? Walt. We'll solve that one later. The picture. Go make like a policeman. Okay. She got a record. Lieutenant. Oh, uh, well, I, uh, I never forget her face. He's been trying to ever since he got Otis. Now, come on, Walt. Get a report for missing persons. Check the hospitals and the morgue. The morgue? Oh! Uh, oh wait, wait, wait. 
Uh, it's a habit. <laughs> Honey, we got to do these things just in case. <laughs> but you think he's... Uh... Give me that picture. <laughs> lady, lady, please. Now, now, now. What's your husband's name? Uh, she can't tell you that, Walt. What do you mean she can't tell me that? I can't. Now, you look, Diamond, if this is one His of your... first name is Richard. Richard what? That's something I really can't tell you. I wouldn't have told Mr. Diamond the Richard part, but it just sort of slipped out. Now, wait, what are you two trying to do to me? You come in here and ask me to locate this guy in the picture, and you won't even tell me his last name? Look, Walt, I promised you'd do me the favor without the questions. The young lady seems to have a very good reason for not wanting to give her name or her husband's. Now, all I want you to do is check the morgues. Uh... What's the matter with her? She wants her husband. Yes, I want my husband. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's always a pleasure when a customer herself tells you why she likes your product. And last week, one said to me... You know why I really prefer Rexall Milk of Magnesia? It's because one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and then the next one thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity, or it can't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? It's the degree of thickness or pourability in a liquid. Rexall conducts scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall milk of magnesia to be sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity. And that's not done just to please you with its consistency. What's much more important, it means you'll always get uniform dosage from every bottle of Rexall milk of magnesia. And I thought it was all an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, I checked, and no no one that looks like this guy is in any of the more, uh, usual places. Well, that's fine. Now let's start looking for him where I lost him, Mr. Diamond. Oh, swell. Well, Walt, we really just stopped by to say hello. Killing time, you know. Sure. I appreciate everything you've done, Captain. Lieutenant. Of course. Thank you very much. But now, Mr. Diamond and I have to go and find my husband. Richard. Yes. I think you'd better wait a few minutes. What for? Yes, we've got to hurry. I've got to find my husband before the 8 o'clock plane leaves this evening. You're leaving tonight? You didn't tell me that. Well, Richard has to be in California by tomorrow morning. Got a little job to do? A very big job, Captain. Lieutenant. Well, what do you want us to wait for? Because I've got Otis checking on this girl, this Mrs. X. Oh, no. Walt, you promised. I promised nothing. You assumed. Oh, you're a fine buddy. Buddy schmuddy. You might be taken in by her sweet innocence, but not me. You double cross Mr. It. Diamond, you promised. But I didn't, lady. I just checked the morgues. Uh... Oh, now you shut up, Walt. Well, I never. I've seen this girl someplace, Rick, and I've got a sneaking suspicion she's wanted. Wanted? You can't cross me like this, Fatty. Wanted? Won't tell me her name, huh? No. Won't tell me her husband's name, huh? No. Then you're hiding something. Yes. Yes? Why, yes, meaning of course. Now you stop that, Rick. Rick. Is your name Richard, too, Mr. Diamond? No, my friends call me Rick. You ever in Chicago, lady? Of course. Of course? O-F-C-O-U-R-S-E. You Meaning... stay out of this. You run around with Tony Capone when you were in Chicago? You talking to me? I'm talking to her. Well, I'm glad. Tony never gave me back my elk's tooth. Well, I don't know why you're talking to me, Captain. I never gave Mr. Capone an elk's no. tooth. Oh. It's Lieutenant, dear. You gotta stop promoting him. You'll get a swell head. Oh, you rat! You call me Lieutenant? No! I... Well, gee, don't scare me like that. I got something on this picture you gave me. Her husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. X. Hello, Corporal. <laughs> yeah. Otis. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, you won't like it, Lieutenant. I won't like what? What I got on this picture. Something's happened to Richard. Now, take it easy. Well, what did you find out? I'll tell you whether I like it or not. Well, I sent it down to the boys in the morning. No, no. Uh... 
<laughs> what you've done, you mallet head. Well, gee, what did I say? Yes, said more. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, honey, honey, listen. This morgue is where they keep photographs. Oh. Well, what did they come up with, Sergeant? She sure looks pretty when she cries like that. Oh, there's... Uh, oh, oh, uh, well, I shall quote from the report. <clears throat> uh, person in said photograph resembles one Richard Diamond private detective. What did you say? Come to think of it, you do, Mr. Diamond. I shall continue. Member of the New York police force for seven years. Height six feet one. One hundred and ninety. Eighty. Uh, the general confirmation of the head. Note, right ear... Order, shut up! Oh, it gets real interesting. You didn't tell me about getting mixed up with that fan dancer back in 39, Diamond. I was simply interested in starting an ostrich farm. Otis. Uh, yeah? Do you think that picture looks like Mr. Diamond? Oh, uh, kind of. Thank you, Patrolman Lovelo. <laughs> Yes, yeah, and if I ever catch you wearing a sergeant's stripes again, I'll put you on a beach so far off that I have to fly food into you. Now get out of here. Sergeant Levinson. Lady, please, it's Lieutenant. Well, I don't care what it is. I think you were just horrible to that nice little policeman. Is that right? It certainly is. And I'm going to write a letter to the governor about you. Now, wait a and minute. And what's more, I'm going to tell him what a horrible, mean, impolite person you are. But... I come in here with Mr. Diamond, and simply because I won't tell you my name, you accuse me of being a mop. Mop? Yes, mop. One of those gangsters' girls. Mop. Yes. And just because everyone thinks they've seen me before, I'm accused of all sorts of things. But, lady, I... No telling what's happened to my poor, wonderful husband. Oh, 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 oh lady, please, lady. I... <laughs> you big bully. Yes. Well, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Can Sergeant Loveloon have his stripes back? Yes. No, thank you very much. Come on, Mr. Diamond. We've got to find Richard. Goodbye, Major. Well, I was in it up to my neck. Any other time, a client like Mrs. X would have scared me right into four months of hibernation. But she was such a cute little screwball that I just had to go along with it. We took the picture that looked something like yours truly and started making the rounds. Starting with the last place, Mrs. X had seen her husband... We showed the picture to every shop owner within a four-block circle, but no one had seen him. Mrs. X kept uh, checking with the hotel, making me stay at a good distance so I couldn't hear the conversation. But no one had seen her husband. We ended up right back where I first ran into her, Charlie's. Wow. Well, find him? No. Uh, look, dear, why don't you check again with this place that you and your husband went to this morning for his business appointment? Maybe you went back there. Well, I guess I could try it again. Phone in the back on the wall. Thanks. I'll call him. No luck, uh, Diamond? No. How do I get into these things, Charlie? When someone wants to give you a hundred a day in expenses, you get into them. Phone. Brilliant deduction. Hello? A little lady will get it. Mm. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? It's for you. Captain Levinson. You've been promoted? Several times in the last hour. You think he's heard something about Richard? Might be. Yeah, what is it, Fatty? I thought you might be there. What made you think of Charlie's? Oh, well, it's pretty obvious you had a hangover. Well, maybe I stuck a bicycle pump in my nose and pumped up my head just to get a laugh out of Otis. You'll have to do better than that. You told me you met the girl at Charlie's. Shrewd, shrewd. Is it something important? Honey, just relax. I'm getting to it. But if it's about Richard... The girl there? Yeah. What's on your mind? Well, I don't know if it means anything. We just got a report from the Johnson Sanatorium. Johnson Sanatorium? Never heard of it. Over on 84th Street. The missing husband? I don't know. The report fitted his description, but who knows from that old photograph. Well, it's worth checking. What's the address? 644 East 84th Street. Seems they found this guy wandering around the streets. Johnson Sanatorium, 644 East 84th Street, huh? Did he give his name? Uh, amnesia. Loss of memory. Seemed to be suffering from shock. Thought I'd let you get there first. I'm kind of sorry for the girl when I realized the story might be kosher. Okay, Walt, I'll check it, thanks. Meet you there. Well, honey, that might be... Hey. Hey. Charlie. Yeah? Mrs. X, where'd she go? Took out of here like she was shot out of a gun. Something wrong? When are you going to stop asking stupid questions? Well, that tore it. Mrs. X was probably on her way over to the Johnson Sanatorium and with a good head start. 
So I went out and grabbed a cab for 84th Street and kicked myself a dozen times for getting mixed up in a situation like that. Why not forget the whole thing and get some rest until my head returned to a normal circumference? Answer, because I'd wasted a whole afternoon looking for the missing husband and hadn't even got a retainer. Yes, sir. Is something I can do for you, Prince? I'm looking for the man you reported. Hello, the... Rick. Oh, Walt. Have you seen Mrs. X? I just this minute got her. She's been and gone. What about the guy you got the report on? Took him with her. Uh, the young lady came in, took a look at the man, claimed it was her husband, paid his bill and left. And you let him go like that? I thought the man had amnesia. Well, yes, he was suffering from some kind of shock and had temporarily lost his memory. But you just let him walk out of here Rick, with... Rick, let him finish your story. Mm. Uh, the, the minute the man saw the young lady, he snapped right out of it. She said they had to hurry to catch a plane or something, had a lot of packing to do. Did she uh, give her name? Yes, he signed the release. Uh, here, let me see it. Now, uh, take it easy, Rick. It's signed Mrs. Richard Diamond. She used my name? Is that your name? You're darn right it is. She leave any address? Phony, I checked. Oh, swell. I'll cover the airports if it'll make you happy. Oh, it'll make me very happy. She did nothing for my hangover. She didn't pay me one red cent for my trouble. And I think I may be getting hives. Oh, I'm going over to Helen's and have a complete nervous breakdown. How do you feel now? Oh, I'm all right, Helen, dear, but my ulcer's just had a parade. Any word from Walt? No. Miss Helen? Yes, what is it, Francis? A young lady at the door for Mr. Diamond. I'll get it. I'll bet you will. Wow. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Now, look, I've got something to say to you. I can't stop to talk. My husband's waiting in the car, and we have to catch a plane. Now, you look, I... I want to thank you very much for all you've done, and I want to apologize for running out on you. But your husband... He's fine, thank you. He just lost his memory for a while. Now, I'm not I haven't got time to tell you anymore. We've got to catch a plane. But you... Oh, I said that. Here's an envelope. But I... It explains everything, and there's something in it for you. But you can't... And here's something else, because you've been so wonderful. But... Mmm... I hope if you ever get to California, you'll look us up. Goodbye, and thank you again for everything. You're wonderful. Bye. Well. Hmm? All right, Blue Eyes. What was that all about? Hmm? Oh. No, that was her. Oh, uh, she. Uh, the girl. The girl? Uh, uh, Mrs. X. What's that? Hmm? Oh, it's an envelope. Said it would explain everything. I hope it does. Especially that fond farewell. Oh, that. She was just being grateful. Yeah. Go on, open the envelope. Uh, pardon, Miss Helen. Now it's the phone. Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond. I better tell him about the girl. You'd better read what's in that envelope. Hello, Walt. Uh, Rick, that dame phoned on us. Asked where she could find you. Oh, that's how she's found the place. Yeah, the melon had told her you might be over at Helen's. Gave her... She's been there? Uh, just left. And she left an envelope that she said would explain everything. Well, what did it say? I haven't read it. Well, read it. I want to know what this is all about. So does Helen. Well? Well? Five hundred bucks. The explanation? What about the letter? Well, it says, uh, uh, Dear Mr. Diamond, I know that I've caused you a great deal of trouble. So I wish to take this opportunity to... Thank to thank you for your patience and understanding. As for an explanation, well, here it is. But I count on your discretion and hope that you will keep my secret. This morning, my husband and I went to a doctor because I hadn't been feeling well. We discovered and were overjoyed to find out that I was going to have a baby. Immediately, I informed my husband that I had decided to give up working until after I had the baby. The realization that I wasn't going to make any more money for the rest of the year was too much for him. The shock made him lose his mind, and he, well, he just wandered off. Although he has recovered his memory, the thought of having to support us both for the rest of the year has left him nervous and despondent. So I'm taking him back to the coast of the family psychiatrist. I wish to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your kindness and help. Signed, O. Signed, O. Rick! Helen, Helen, what's wrong? He's fainted. What? He looked at the signature on the letter and just flopped over. Well, what about the signature? It's signed... June Allison. (laughs) 
Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Yes, whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. June Allison appears through the courtesy of Metro-Golden-Mayer and will soon be seen co-starring with Dick Powell in the MGM motion picture, Right Cross. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, and Bob Sweeney. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Bill Bendix leads the life of Riley again Friday on NBC. Buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you by Del Monte Foods, the brand preferred by more women than any other line of canned fruits and vegetables in the world. from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, The Diorite Bowl. I had just opened up the tambourine that morning and was back in the kitchen glancing over the menu for the day. Chris, my bartender, came in, nodded toward the front, said somebody wanted to see me. So I went out through the cafe, and there at the door, peering nervously in from the street, stood a skinny little girl, 12 or 13 maybe, dressed in the robes of the fellaheen. A small vessel was touched in her hands, and what I noticed most was the strange look of anxiety and fear on her soft, round face. The same fear sounded in her voice. Most kind of Fendi Jordan. Uh, that's me, little lady. What can I do for you? My my father sends his humble regrets that he could not come today. Your father? El Mamad, he who brings the honey. Oh, El Mamad, of course. 
Well, he's told me all about you. I am the daughter, Sharon. If you will take the honey. Sure. Come in, Sharon. Come in. No, no, I cannot enter. I will go now. Well, wait a minute, Sharon. You got some money coming, remember? Oh, the money, yes. If you would get it quickly, sir. She waited there as I set the vessel of honey on a shelf behind the bar, then went to the till for some cash. El Mamad had been making his deliveries to my tambourine regularly for a long time. I needed honey for one of my mixed drinks, and the fine product from his apiary seemed especially good. Or maybe it's just because that I liked El Mamad. I was surprised that he hadn't shown up himself, and the actions of his daughter had me wondering. There you are, Sharon. Not the shock here, Fendi Jordan. Uh, why didn't your father come in this morning? He... My father remains at the farm. I was sort of hoping to see him. We always had coffee together. Is uh, everything all right with him? I... Please, if any, if you would permit me to depart. Well, of course, Sharon. Go on, run along. Give El Mamad my regards. <laughs> he was quickly running away, and I was sure now her worry was connected somewhere with her father. As I stood watching, I saw a short, plump man in continental dress appear out of a doorway. The greedy eyes in his pudgy face shifted my way for a second. Then he drifted after Sharon. I kept thinking about it as I finished up the tambourine and finally decided to find out from her father what it was all about. I drove across Cairo, south along the river and into the hills that fringed the desert. Soon I pulled into El Mamad's little farm, past the pigeon roost at the gate and onto the house. Down the hill beyond were his well-kept apiaries swarming with bees that fed on clover fields from the Nile below. Nobody was outside the house, so I knocked and waited. Who is this? It's Rocky, El Mamad. Mind if I come in? It's Fendi Jordan. Welcome to my humble home. Thank you. Is uh, your daughter here? She has retired to the other room. But why would you ask of her? Just a little worried, El Mamad. Is something wrong? Wrong? Sharon was frightened when she came to my cafe. When I asked about you, she wouldn't answer. She ran away crying. Please, please do not be concerned. She is but a sensitive child. And... Oh, there's something else, El Mamad. A short, pudgy man trailed her away from the cafe. Now, look, maybe it's none of my affair, but if you're in trouble, I'd like to help. Uh, Effendi, I deeply respect your most gracious friendship, but what transpires is not for you. The man following wasn't one of your people. I beg you, concern yourself no more. Who was he? What do you want? Why are you locking yourself up in this house? Uh, all right. Maybe I'd better drop it. Oh, wait. Forgive my poor hospitality. I will have Sharon prepare the coffee. We will drink together. Huh? Do you think you better answer that? Well, maybe I'd better. No, no, I will answer. He moved hesitantly to the door, slid back the latch, turned the knob, and cracked it just a little. And all at once, the door slammed open wide. Ah! Held by the heel of a hulking Turk who strode heavily in. He had thick, sneering lips and a long, pointed black mustache. His huge hand held a small gun. I have come, El Mamad. I, I pray you go from my house. What's this about, mister? Who is the American? His name is Jordan. He has no part in this. He will most wisely keep it so. Now, where is it? I... I cannot tell you. You know of what I speak? The bowl. Get it quickly. Please, if you would but go away and return at another time, then I will be ready to... What is this you say? Did you not make the agreement? It... It is as you say. However, I need must have more time to think. But a little more time. There is no more time. Give it to me. But, no. But I cannot. Then I... I will take it in my own way. Perhaps it is on the shelf. No. I swear it is not here. Please, I beg you. Yeah, so. Soon I will see. Oh, Mama, what's this all about? What's he looking for? Effendi Jordan. I cannot tell. I cannot tell. Enough. So, El Mama. You choose to make it difficult. Very well, I will return. Very soon, for the last time. What does that mean? You, Jordan, will come with me back into Cairo. I do not wish you here. I do not wish you here. At all! I don't argue with a gun, so when he waved it toward the door, I went out with the Turk right behind me. He got in the car beside me, and he didn't say any more as we drove back into the city. So as we hunked our way through a crowded street not far from the tambourine, he was suddenly out of the car and gone. In another five minutes, I was back again on the tambourine and headed for the phone. Just before I got to my office, a man seated at a back table spoke to me. A moment, Mr. Jordan. He wore the fez of the upper-class Egyptian, and I decided not to pass him up. It is most important, Mr. Jordan. Could it wait for a while? I'm afraid not. I am Kasha Bey of the Egyptian government. Ministry of Antiquities, Mr. Jordan. Oh, I see. 
What can I do for you? Uh, please sit down. I will explain as quickly as possible. <laughs> now, Mr. Jordan, is it possible that you have ever heard of the Diorite Bowl? Does it mean anything to me? A most wonderful relic of ancient Egypt. Fourth dynasty, almost 5,000 years old. Small, but of great value in its proper place. Well, that's very interesting, but how does that concern uh, me? Please, I will continue. Uh, there is such a bowl now in the Egyptian museum, but we have a strong reason to believe that there is still another. Equally as valuable, it, it was unearthed recently, quite by chance, by one of the fellahin while tilling his soil. Yeah, I follow. Go on. Uh, it is the law that all such relics, when found, be turned over immediately to the Ministry of Antiquities, mm -hmm. for which the finder is paid a fair price. However, there are, shall we say, uh, temptations which sometimes lead the finder to withhold the relic and sell it on the black market for a much higher price. You see. Well, uh, let's get back to the diorite bowl. Uh, Mr. Jordan, such is the case with the finder of the new diorite bowl. It came to our attention only recently when he moved to sell it on the black market. What's his name? El Mamad. A good friend of yours, I believe. I thought so. Why come to me, Kasha Bey? You must know where he lives. Oh, why indeed, Mr. Jordan. If we asked, would he not deny? Then in his fear, might he not dispose of it quickly and perhaps even destroy it? At all costs, we must preserve this rare antique. Oh, that makes sense. What about the police? We prefer that they remain out of it until the bowl is quite safe with us. Otherwise, the consequences might be serious. And what am I, the uh, go-between? Correct, Mr. Jordan. As an intermediary, you are a most wise choice. Please, please assure El Mama that we have no desire to prosecute. The Ministry of Antiquities wants only the diorite bowl, and at once. How do I convince him? That should be easy. We are still willing to pay a nominal fee, uh, 1,000 pounds, which I leave with you in this envelope, Mr. Jordan. Now, wait a minute, Kasha Bay. I haven't agreed to all this yet. Oh, for a friend, Mr. Jordan, please think it over. Once you have purchased the bowl from El Mamad, you will bring it to me at Talbot House. Until then, Mr. Jordan, I bid you goodbye. Kasha Bay turned and walked out without a second look at the bulky envelope he had laid on the table in front of me. I picked it up, put it in my pocket, went into my office, and finally put my call through to Captain Sam Sabaya. But by the time he answered, I wasn't sure what I wanted. Cairo Police, Sabaya speaking. Oh, uh, hello, Sam. It's Rocky. Oh, Rocky. What is on your mind? I'm, uh... I was wondering if you have much contact with the Ministry of Antiquities. Well, naturally, Jordan. In a nation such as Egypt, it is the most important branch of the government. We work very closely with them. Mm hmm. Any trouble with the black market in antiques? Most assuredly. We are doing everything we can to control it, but a most ticklish business, I might add. Yeah, why? You must realize that antiquities are of intangible value and must be preserved at all costs. The police take a hand only when other efforts have failed. Uh... Who's Kasha Bay at the ministry? Jordan, there are a great number of employees at the ministry. Do you expect me to know all their names? Tell me, why do you ask? You ever hear of the Diorite Bowl, Sam? The Deor... There is such a relic in the museum. Yeah, but another one, about to get out on the black market, maybe. Jordan, it is time now that you explain the purpose of your questioning. And at once. Oh, just working a crossword puzzle, Sam. Thanks. <laughs> Well, so far, Kasha Bay's story checked. And the place to get the rest of it was from El Mamad himself, out at his apiary. So I kept the money in my pocket and went out the back door to go for my car. All at once, I wasn't alone. Go the wall, Jordan. Quick. The point of his heavy knife at my throat meant business, and I backed up like he said. He was the pudgy, shifty-eyed character I'd seen earlier that morning following Sharon. He was wearing elevator shoes now, but it didn't help. Uh, we meet at last, Jordan. Watch out, you'll cut yourself. Or you. Silence now. I get what I want. Even if it takes following little native girls? You'll keep your hands back while I search. I warn you, this knife... Why don't you send the Turk around? He gets rough, too. The Turk, I do not know. I got news for you. He didn't find anything. But I find something, do I not? <laughs> An envelope filled with Egyptian pounds. You will need this no more. Look, whatever your name is. I thought with this you were going to the home of El Mamad to get the bowl. Oh, was I? I do not like it. Tell me some more. I do not like you, Jordan. I tell you to keep out of this. I tell you to return to your cafe. And you keep the money. I do. I keep the money and give you warning, Jordan. I grabbed for his knife hand and he darted back, the knife clattering to the ground behind him. He whirled and picked it up by the blade, and as I dived in, he swung. The handle glanced off my head the first time, the next time squarely across the face. My knees hit the dirt and he spun again. And I clawed at the cobwebs, waiting for the knife, but the blackness got there first. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan.
Pass the ketchup, please. That sounds familiar, but it means so much more when you say, Pass the Del Monte ketchup, please. Yes, it means so much more, because Del Monte ketchup does so much. Adds so much zesty, hearty flavor to the foods everybody likes. That's because Del Monte ketchup is made with pineapple vinegar. Pineapple vinegar. Yes, pineapple vinegar. The big secret of Del Monte catsup flavor. Pineapple vinegar is one of the big reasons Del Monte catsup is livelier and more satisfying. Catsup experts say the finer the vinegar, the better the catsup flavor. And pineapple vinegar is superlative vinegar. It has a special way of bringing out every bit of tomato flavor in catsup. It blends perfectly with the special herbs and spices to make the liveliest catsup that ever pleased a man. Yes, pineapple vinegar is the big flavor secret in Del Monte catsup. For real spice tomato goodness, I wouldn't be without Del Monte catsup. It really makes plain foods come to life. And for all its goodness, Del Monte catsup costs less than many other quality brands. Try Del Monte catsup. You'll like it. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Diorite Bowl. When things began to clear, I was still lying in the alley. My first thought was for the thousand pounds Kasha Bay had given me. As I reached for my inside pocket, I remembered it was gone. So was the pudgy man with a knife. It was somebody else bending over me. It's Cindy Jordan. Sharon. How did you get here? My father and I came most urgently to see you. Well, it's about time. Where is he? But your face is Cindy. You have been hurt. Get your father, Sharon. My father? It is the Jordan Bay. Come quickly. He has been waiting in the street. Oh, oh my good defendant, Jordan. What have they done to me? Forget about me, El Mamad. I want to know some things about a deer right bull. Uh, then you have already learned. That's right. You're in trouble, El Mamad. I know. That is why my daughter and I decided to come and accept your offer of help. What I would tell you brings me only shame. Now, go on. Some time ago, I unearthed in my fields the bowl of which you speak. I was aware at once of its priceless value and hid it away. Didn't you know the law says you turn such relics over to the authorities? They'll pay. I knew, my Effendi, I knew. But I... I am a most poor man. I knew that I could sell elsewhere for a much greater sum. Finally, after much hesitation, I approached a certain man in Cairo and arranged for the sale. A short, pudgy man, continental dress? Ah, as you say. His name is Varios. I agreed to deliver the bowl at the time of payment. But then I began to realize my wrong and sent word to Varios that I had changed my mind. Only you changed it too late. Varios sent the Turk out to convince you. But even before that, I had received most violent threats. But I was sealed to my bargain. You can understand my fear. I knew not what to do. I can tell you that, El Mamad. You will help me lend my offending? It's simple. Turn over your dear right bowl to the government right away. It is my wish. But Jordan Bay, They I... won't prosecute. I have their promise. Then you have talked with them about this. Kasha Bay of the Ministry of Antiquities came to see me about it. He's waiting for an answer. Then you may tell him that I am ready. Just one thing, El Mamad. The money Kasha Bay gave me to pay is gone. Varios took it from me. So, the will of Allah... It is just punishment for my great wrong. I took El Mamad and his daughter Sharon up to my room over the tambourine and told them to wait there. My only job now is to get Kasha Bay and bring him together. I picked up the phone, then changed my mind and decided to go get him just in case. Just as I got out the door to the street, a black limousine pulled up and a familiar figure stepped to the curb. Jordan. Oh, hello, Sam. I was just leaving. A moment, a moment. I've come for a word with you. Sure, what about? I think you very well know. Not more than an hour ago, you phoned me regarding a relic known as the Diorite Bowl. One not now in the hand of the government. When I questioned your interest, I got nothing. I told you, Sam. What you said was only evasion, such as I have come to expect of you, Jordan. Now listen to me. There is something going on, and I intend to know what it is. Don't, don't let me stop it. So, still you will tell me nothing. It would, of course, be futile at this point to warn you away from what does not concern you. Then we're both wasting time, aren't we, Sam? Yeah. Sam got back into his car and drove away, and I headed for the Talbot house. I wasn't more than two blocks on my way when I noticed Barrios, the guy who had cuffed me around in the alley, following behind. I decided to shake him. It took only a few blocks, and then I reached the Talbot house. I told Kasha Bay El Mamad was waiting. Right away, he came with me back to the tambourine. 
We all sat down in my office, and Tasha Bay was all business. El Mama, uh, Mr. Jordan tells me that you are ready to turn over to us the deer I bowl. I trust in Jordan Bay's counsel, Casa Bay. I still say you'd better do it, El Mama. As you advise, Effendi. We hold to our promise not to prosecute. Once the bowl is in the hands of the ministry, neither you nor we need ever speak of this again. Mamad knows the money's gone. Oh, most regrettable, but it cannot be helped now. Unless we call on the police and tell no, them... No, no, that... I beg you, for the sake of my daughter and I, let us have this done quickly. Very well. Where is the bowl? I hid it well, where none would suspect. My father speaks truly, Kashabi. Oh, where is it? The dear right bowl is in one of the hives of my apiary. In this hive, there are no bees, but the bowl is there and safe. And how does one know which hive? It is marked with paint, a cross of yellow. You are telling the truth this time. Before Allah, it is so. Sir, come in. Now, wait a minute. Who's out there in the cafe? You may see for yourself, Jordan. I enter Kasha Bay. Hold the gun on him, sir. Do not let them move. They will not move. Jordan, it is the rude man who come to my house. What does this mean? Since when does this big Turk work for you, Kasha Bay? Since the beginning of this, Jordan. Is it not yet clear? Yeah. The one thing you're not with the Ministry of Antiquities at all. But my Effendi, did you not tell me that... Sure, El Mahmoud, I told you. Looks like I sold you a phony bill of goods. Most conveniently for me, Jordan. Now, to allow no one to enter or leave this room until you hear from me. I invite them to try, Kasha Bey. The Turk stood menacingly with the gun as El Mahmoud drew Sharon to him and sat with bowed head. Kasha Bey stepped to the alley door, opened it and went out. I stood wondering how I'd let myself be suckered into a deal like this. Looked like we were in for a long wait, but I was wrong again. The shots had come from the alley. We all whirled, and that included the Turk with a gun. I grabbed the chance and slammed down on his arm. He dropped the gun, and I came up with it just that quick. I held an eye as I opened the door and glanced out to see Kasha Bay sprawled face down on the alley. And the back of Barrios running far down as he turned into the street. I knew he'd heard the whole conversation from the window, and I knew where he was going. Tell Mama, can you hold a gun? If it needs be, Effendi. Take this one here and hold it on the Turk. Shoot if he moves. That I will do also. And Sharon? Yes, Jordan Get Bay. to the phone there on my desk and call Captain Sam Sabaya, the Cairo police. Tell him to rush some men over here to pick up the Turk in Kasha Bay. And tell him I said to hop out to your father's apiary the quickest way he can. Most quickly, I will call the captain. Most quickly. Right away, I was out and driving across Cairo fast, knowing that Barrios was doing the same. It seemed like every camel and donkey and jalopy in Egypt was on the streets to slow me down. Finally, I was out on the winding road leading south. Just at dusk, I pulled up the hill past El Mama's house. I got out and ran down the hill toward the apiaries, and I saw that Varios was already there. He had just lifted one of the hives and was picking up a small bowl from underneath. I kept right on going, weaving cautiously around the hives filled with bees already settling for the night. Varios saw me and started backing up, carefully at first. Have a care, Jordan. No one will take the bowl from me. I kept closing in, still no weaving one, toward him. You. Keep back, Jordan. Do not try. I was getting close, time. too close for Barrios. I watched his hand go to his pocket. I as it came out with a gun, I ducked. They missed, but the crack of the gun brought the bees swarming violently from the hives toward the sound. I kicked over a hive for good measure and was running. I made it away with only a couple of stings, and when I got where it was safe to look around, I saw Barrios scrambling away down the hill, slapping wildly at the bees that covered him like a thick moving blanket. Suddenly he stumbled and fell rolling. And that's when the bowl flew from his hand, struck a rock, and shattered into a million pieces. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. You know, folks, the best way to find out the real value of a cooking sauce is to ask experienced cooks who use it. You see, there's a mighty good reason why Del Monte tomato sauce has been a favorite with good cooks for a whole generation. Let Mrs. U.E. Smalley of Pasadena, California, tell us about it. She said, Well, I guess I've used hundreds of cans of Del Monte tomato sauce during the past 26 years. I wouldn't be without it. You like to use a product you know is dependable, and that is certainly true of Del Monte tomato sauce. Every can is nice and smooth. Nobody needs to tell me that Del Monte tomato sauce is made from ripe tomatoes and fine spices. Its flavor tells me that. Food that tastes good does you more good, I always say. And my tomato sauce recipes are family favorites. Del Monte's extra flavor makes any dish better. Thank you, Mrs. Smalley. 
Yes, in tomato sauce, it's the flavor that counts. And the rich, spiced tomato flavor of Del Monte tomato sauce brings out all the best flavor of the food you cook with it. Del Monte tomato sauce is so low in cost, too, yet it does such big things for dishes like stew, spaghetti, and hash. Next time you go shopping, buy the original tomato sauce. Del Monte. Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. Well, Sam Sabai and his men showed up a couple of minutes later. We grabbed some head nets and got down the hill to Barrios. By the time we'd managed to scrape all the bees off of him, he was unconscious. The puppy little man was in a bad way as we took him back into town, into a hospital. From there, Sam and I hurried on to the tambourine. The police had already come and gone, taking the Turk and the body of Kasha Bay with them. But El Mahmoud and his daughter were still there, anxiously waiting. It didn't take long to tell them everything that had happened. And so, one of the most valuable relics of Egypt is gone. For all this, there is nothing. My father! Quiet, Cheryl, my daughter. There is nothing to be said. El Mahmoud, although certain of your actions since finding the bowl cannot be condoned, you can hardly be held to be blamed for its final destruction. Ah, oh, it is gone because of my own grief. But please, my father... Sharon, it is not well that you speak before the men. There are so many who can be blamed. Is that not so, Jordan? Sure, Sam. I neglected to make one little phone call. The Ministry of Antiquities about Kasha Bay. The trouble was his story checked too well. Needless to say, the bay was not with the Ministry, but he knew much of their methods of operation. As for Varios... Yeah, that's pretty clear, Sam. El Mahmoud made a deal with Varios to sell the bowl, and very wisely changed his mind. But Varios wasn't to be stopped and started making big threats, trying to get Mahmoud to reveal where the bowl was hidden. And somewhere, Kasha Bey stepped into the picture. Yeah, he heard about the Doriat bowl and wanted it too. I figure he sent the Turk out to Mahmoud's house just for my benefit. How so, Jordan? Well, once I knew that El Mahmoud was in real danger, it was a cinch I'd do everything possible to help. After Kasha Bay's pitch about being with the Ministry of Antiquities, all I had to do was talk Mama into turning the bowl over to him. And I did. Now that it is destroyed, what will they do? Well, it is difficult to say. The loss of such a priceless article will not go unnoticed. My father, listen to me Sharon, now. I told you but that... But I must think. The dear right bowl is not lost. Oh, what, what is this you say? I also have a confession to make. I knew where the bowl was hidden. And that my father was in danger. It was only for that reason that... What are you saying, Sharon? Only that... That I took the bowl from the hive. Replacing it with a common crock from the kitchen. Then what did you do with the diorite bowl, Sharon? In the diorite bowl, I placed the honey. And brought it to Jordan Bay only this morning. Jordan, Jordan. Sam, we'll find out. Where are you going? Right here behind the bar. I sat on the shelf in plain sight when she brought it this morning. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, careful with it, Jordan. Effendi, it is the one. It is indeed the one. There can be little doubt. A remarkable find. A relic almost as ancient as Egypt itself. Sharon, my child. Did I do right, my father? Ah, oh, by your innocence and love, the grace of Allah has been with us this day. Eh, Mama, you can rest assured the Ministry of Antiquities will pay you well. You better take it out of here, Sam, before they catch me mixing drinks in it. I fully intend to, Jordan. When you look on it again, it will be on display at the Museum of Egypt for all to see. Uh, I got news for you, Sam. I'll be just as happy if I never see it again. For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte ketchup and chili sauce, Del Monte tomato sauce and canned tomatoes, and Del Monte tomato juice. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jane Avello as Sam Sabaya, and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is The DeMarco Affair. For real country corn patch flavor, buy Del Monte corn. 
Golden cream style or whole kernel. Both styles, both Del Monte. Both mighty fine. One thing more. Your Red Feather community chest organizations need your help. Give generously during this campaign. Remember, everybody benefits when everybody gives. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Lucky Night. Cities are noisy, sprawling things, tentacled with streets and avenues, scarred by towers and ditches, built of shacks and mansions. They combine the beautiful and the ugly. And the people of the cities are as diverse and varied as the buildings, rich and poor, educated and ignorant, the hurrying, scuffling, pushing mob that makes a city live. They are the principles in a million stories enacted every day in the city's streets and its buildings. Here, for example, is the beginning of one story. A man running down a street in the cheap section of the city just after nightfall. He darts across a narrow street without looking. He comes to the intersection of a street and alley just as a car turns the corner. Hey, you hit him. How bad? He's dead. What are we going to do? Two. Get out of here. Drag him in that alley. Oh, yeah, but he's dead. That's hit and run driving. We ought to return. You heard me. Drag him in that alley and let's get out of here. Yes, the man lying dead in the alley marked the beginning of a story. A very important story to Mr. and Mrs. Craig, Albert and Carolyn. Two lovely people who run a boarding house a few blocks away. It's a vital story to them because it involves money. And anything that involves money is more important than life itself. To Mr. and Mrs. Crake. And another thing, Albert. You've got to go up and see Mr. Sedgwick right this minute because he ain't paid his rent for next week. He's a new boarder and it's best we show him right off that we ain't going to put up with back rent. Yeah, it'd be a lot better if we could get that Mr. Sedgwick out of here. I don't like the looks of him. Besides, he burns the electric too much at night. <sighs> it's getting so too honest, people ain't able to run a decent, respectable place no more. Yeah. Well, anyhow, you go right up and see that, Mr. Sedgwick. And if he ain't got the money, out he goes. I don't like the way he looks at me, Caroline. Hmm? He has got a funny way of looking at people. 
But that ain't got nothing to do with the rent. And you tell him... Who's there? Your star boarder, Mr. Cavier. Oh, dear. Now, what does he want? Good evening, Albert. Caroline. You ain't to call us by our first names. I told you that. A friendly gesture on my part, Mr. Craig. But I didn't descend into these charming quarters of yours to discuss the amenities of nomenclature. Now, you stop that fancy talk. And don't bring that cigarette in here. Hmm? Uh, You ain't been smoking in bed now, have you? No, but it's an idea. At least the feeble glow would provide more light than the ceiling fixture. Uh, You're complaining again, and you're getting a good room at a reasonable rent. There ain't many boarding houses in the city where you get... No, you're right. There aren't many boarding houses in the city where the boarders have to race home at night to make sure they can get their evening paper. Or where the owners get up at four in the morning to steal the cream off the milk. Are you calling us thieves? No, I don't think so, Mrs. Craig. I'd have to qualify that. Sneak thieves, I should say. You... Oh, oh, no, stop it. Let's don't argue about it. What about the hot plate in my room? What's the matter with it? It belies its name, Mr. Craig. It is no longer a hot plate. It has become a refrigerator. You broke it. In the passage of time, sweet Caroline, mechanical and electrical appliances get out of order. But uh, we can't get parts, Mr. Campion. All right. Let's get to something else. The bedspread, for example. It has become one of the most exciting games I've ever played, to find a spot in the spread free from holes. It embarrasses me when I have guests. We can't afford a new one, Mr. Campion. We shall forget the bedspread and take up the subject of the ceiling fixture. That ain't broke. Well, not exactly, but it certainly is eccentric. It goes on and off, Mr. Craig, like a lighthouse. Though guaranteed to be untouched by human hands, yet it flashes ambitiously and energetically. Ah, you keep finding fault with everything. I am not alone. And now that I've registered my complaint, I shall retire to the damp chill of the crypt I occupy, and for which I pay 68 bucks a month. If you don't like it, you can get out. That, Mrs. Crake, is a line which becomes you well. Good night. Eh, young puppy... For two cents, I... Such extravagance. And from you, of all people. Good night. Well, I never... Albert, as soon as we can, we'll put him out. Well, Carolyn, it might be hard to rent that room. And he does pay regular. Well... Oh, Mr. Sedgwick. Eh? You go right up there and get the money for Mr. Sedgwick. Now, Carolyn, maybe he'll bring it down. Night ain't over yet. You're scared of him. I don't like the way he looks at me. We'll both go. Huh. All right. There goes that Miss Barton turning on the water again to wash her hair. Miss Barton, you close off that water good and don't use too much. <laughs> yeah, she knows all right. Her being a day behind with her rent. Mr. Sedgwick? Mr. Sedgwick! Your lovely knuckles, Caroline. You'll skin them. You keep quiet. Wouldn't you uh, rather I told you that Mr. Sedgwick went out? How do you know? He went out the front door some time ago. Now go away and stop pounding. I have work to do. <laughs> I'd like to slap that smart alecky Mr. Campion's face for him. Uh, uh, never mind, Caroline. Never... Uh, let's go for our walk. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Craig, you are a remarkable couple. You do take the cream from the milk, and you do read the newspapers before the boarders get home to save a couple of pennies. And now you go for your walk. Not for exercise, though. It's to save electric light bills. Every night it's the same, down the same street, past the warehouse, over to the brewery, and along the street running through the wholesale district until you finally get sleepy and turn homeward. Albert, if that smart Mr. Campion tells you that he ain't using electric light in that lampy board, he's lying. Yeah, if we could just catch him at it. He's got enough light in his room. He don't need no more lamps. It's costing us money to put up with him. That's right, Albert. <sighs> money, money, we always got troubles. Uh, wait, wait a minute. That's a man laying there. <laughs> Drunk, most likely. Yeah, that's right. Honest people have to slave for their money, and some no good like this drinks it up, and then... I don't smell no liquor. Well, maybe 
I'm going to look closer. Keep away from him, Albert. Maybe it's a trap. He might be a hold-up man. Carolyn, it's Mr. Sedgwick. It is. Look. What's the matter with him? He's... he's dead. Albert! Uh, looks like maybe he got hit by an auto. What's that? His pocket. It... it's stuffed with money. And him owing us rent. Hm. Look, Carolyn, it... it's... it's so much. Albert, what do you suppose... Shh, shh. Ain't nobody in sight. Uh, what are you thinking? Huh? Me? What are you thinking? Nothing, nothing. I ain't thinking nothing. Ain't nobody in sight. But uh, it'd be stealing. Ain't nobody in sight. Oh, Albert, it's so much money. Uh, looks, uh, uh, probably he, he come by it bad. I never did like the way he looked. Like like one of them gangsters. Yeah, he wouldn't do no good with it. And he owes us rent. Yeah. It's his kind that spend it on some chorus uh, You and me, we... Albert, are you going to do it? Or ain't you? Well, uh, ain't nobody watching Ain't nobody saw him before us either. And uh, there wouldn't be no money. Albert. Carolyn, come on, come on. I got it. With the prologue of tonight's story, Lucky Night, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If you're a Whistler fan, you've heard me say that with new Signal gasoline, you now go farther than ever. But if you've gotten the impression that drivers interested in mileage are the chief buyers of Signal Gasoline, you'll be interested in a little experiment I conducted this week at a Signal station asking customers why they preferred Signal Gasoline. An engineer in a 1942 Buick told me that new Signal helped him get maximum efficiency from his motor. The driver of a 1937 Ford told me that with new Signal in his tank, his tired old car actually felt young again. And a traveling salesman emphasized the importance of Signal's good mileage. Now, if it seems strange to you that three drivers interested in three different qualities should all find them in the same gasoline, well, I can clear up that mystery for you in a hurry. You see, scientists, by rearranging the atoms in gasoline molecules, put amazing power into new Signal gasoline. And because that power helps you get greater efficiency, extra performance from your motor you naturally get maximum mileage. That's why, while you're enjoying its quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock, you'll find you do go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. You've taken the money from Mr. Sedgwick, Albert and Carolyn. But look, isn't someone behind you? Faster, walk faster. Just a shadow, wasn't it? But you didn't know that, Mr. and Mrs. Craig. That money is heavy in your pocket, isn't it, Albert? Faster now, both of you. Hurry home to hide the money in the mattress. Yes, in the mattress with the rest of your miser's hoard. But faster again. The memory of Mr. Sedgwick lying back there is pursuing you, and you've got to get away. Faster now, faster. Carol and I... Lock the door. You didn't lose it, did you, Albert? No, no, I got it right here. You've got to put it in the mattress with the rest well, of Well, welcome home. Back early, aren't you? Mr. Campion. Yes, sir. Were you expecting someone else? No, I wasn't. Hey, what have you two been doing? Running? No. Why should we be running? You might have heard the nickel I dropped upstairs. Hey, you ain't funny, Mr. Campion. I wasn't trying to be funny, Albert. Now, look, what's the matter with you two? Uh, Mr. Mr. Craig ain't feeling good. Oh, he looks a little pale around the gills. Someone chasing you? No, no, nobody chased us. Why'd you ask that? Well, from the way you dashed in here, I thought perhaps you'd robbed a bank or something like that. Uh, we're honest people. Mm, to a certain extent, yes. Are you calling us thieves again? I explained that once before tonight. But... You two certainly do look excited. <laughs> and the only thing that could bring a flush to your careworn cheeks would be money. Perhaps left by a rich uncle? We ain't got any uncle. And that ain't no way to talk, Mr. Campion. Okay, we'll forget it. I'm going for a walk. Uh, a, a walk? Hmm? Well, sure, why not? 
The ceiling fixture gave up the ghost altogether a few minutes ago. Can't work anymore. Uh, which way are you walking? Hmm? What? Does that make any difference? Well, of course not, but uh, it's, it's damp out. Yes, uh, you might catch a chill. Huh. Oh. Your solicitude is absolutely amazing. Can this be the Crakes? The same people who all through the winter dole out heat by fractions of degrees? <laughs> you, uh, you want that light fixed, don't you? Unless I am to become a mole, light would be welcome, well, yes. Well, then you go along with Mr. Crake, Mr. Campion. Aha! What's the matter? I see. See what? Mr. Crake has... What have a... I got? Wire. Wire to repair the ceiling fixture. Oh. If I help him, it saves the electrician's fee for you. You're always poking fun at us. Oh, no, Mrs. Crake. Well, come along, Albert. You and I shall play Stein Metz to the ceiling fixture. Yeah, all right. Oh, but Mrs. Craig. Huh? I should still like to know what encounter brought you two home before sleep deadened your elfin steps and dulled those brilliant minds. Are you coming, Mr. Campion? Uh, certainly, Mr. Craig. Yeah, certainly. Albert, you better leave that package with me. Oh, I... I forgot. Package? What package? In his coat pocket. Albert, give it to me. I ain't going to leave you alone with it. Uh, Mr. Campion. Uh, yes, Albert? Uh, there's wire and stuff in the cellar. You get it yourself here. Here. Uh, here's the key to the basement. What? Wonder of wonders. The key to the Craig cellar. And shall I find vintage 1902 or perhaps the skeletons of former boarders? You, uh, you fix the light, Mr. Campion. Uh, if there's anything you need, you can buy it tomorrow. We'll pay you for it. None. Absolutely numb, I am. This is the epitome of surprise. The key to the cellar, an offer of payment by the Crakes, all in one evening. You going to fix it or not? Certainly. Tomorrow may see the Crakes back in usual form. Therefore, tonight, I shall gather the golden fruits of whatever occasion this munificent uh, behavior. You're a fool. You mentioned package and there ain't none. I want to see how much is there. We could have counted it later. How do I know you wouldn't have took it some from yourself? Oh, you shut up and come on. We'll count it in our room. So you count the money, Mr. and Mrs. Craig. And how much is there? A hundred? Keep counting. Three hundred? Oh, much more. Five hundred, seven, a thousand. Keep counting. Perspiration is beading your foreheads. Your hands are damp, sticky. The bills stick to your fingers. Now you reach two thousand, three, thirty-five hundred. You're not through yet. Keep counting, counting. Your breath hot, your eyes glazed with greed. Ah, now you've finished counting. How much? Five. Five thousand dollars. <laughs> and we found it. Just found it. We went for a walk and we found it. It's allowed. <laughs> you wait, everybody. Oh, we're rich. We're rich. Who's, Who's there? there? Campion. Is anything wrong? Uh, no, no. There's nothing the matter. But I thought I heard Mrs. Craig. Uh, did you fix the light? Oh, yes. Here's the key to the cellar. Well, uh, put it under the door. Put it under the door. Shh. Uh, just uh, shove it under. Okay. But uh, are you sure there's nothing... Uh, that... Just go to bed, Mr. Campion. I'm going out for a walk. If anyone calls, I'll be back in a half hour. Albert, he can't go. Maybe he'll go the way we did and see him. Uh, did you hear me? Uh, sure, sure. I, uh, uh, Mr. Campion. Yes? Hey, it's, uh, it's awful chilly out. Well, if you'll observe closely, I'm the possessor of an overcoat. A serviceable Benny, wouldn't uh, you? Uh, wouldn't you like a nice cup of, uh, of tea? I, I beg your pardon? Well, you like tea, don't you, Mr. Campion? I don't understand. And tomorrow we'll have a new hot plate for you. Yeah, yeah maybe we can pick up one secondhand. Mr. and Mrs. Craig, take a close look at me. My name is Campion... I've been living here for six months, during which time you must have seen that I am not affluent in any way. I have no influence with the governor. I know no politicians or statesmen. What little money I have, I spend for bare necessities. In short, Albert, Caroline, why are you spreading this soft soap with such a lavish hand? <laughs> We're willing to let bygones be bygones. Oh? Well, thanks very much for the offer of tea. 
But I shall take a walk just the same. He'll go the way we did. I know he will. Forget it. Close the door. Well, what if he does find him? All he'll see is that Sedgwick laying in the alley. We didn't kill him. Anybody could see it was Otto that done it. And Campion can't know about the money. Cedric was only here two days. But we gotta hide it in case. Uh, in the mattress, with the rest. We ain't got time. What if Mr. Campion does know about the money? Uh, what if he sees Mr. Sedgwick and comes back here? We ain't got time to open the mattress and close it again. Well, then what do we do? Uh, put it in the fireplace until tomorrow morning. Then what? Uh, when the bank's open, you go clear over to the outer side of town. If it's a nice day, you can walk. Uh, change one of the big bills into littler ones. Uh, you're crazy. What good's that gonna do? You see. Now listen. Then go to another bank and put the littler bills in a bank account. We ain't got none. You can open one. Uh, maybe do the same thing for a week until all the money is out of here. Ain't nobody knows us on the other side of town. Yeah. Yeah, I see. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. And then, uh, when we're good and sure nobody else knows about the money, we can take it out of the banks and bring it back here. See? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that's smart. That's pretty smart, Carolyn. <laughs> I bet even Mr. Smarty Pants <laughs> Campion couldn't think of nothing like that. <laughs> That's a splendid idea, Albert and Carolyn. Splendid. You hear Mr. Campion come back. Go to his room upstairs. He does not knock on your door. He says nothing. So you sigh with relief. But you spend a sleepless night just the same. What if he does know and guesses? Then it's morning. You leave the house, Albert. In your pocket is a hundred dollar bill. You start for a bank across town, the bank where no one knows you. You reach the bank, give the bill to one of the tellers. He looks at you hard. Is there some suspicion in his glance? Is there, Albert? But he changes the bill and you hurry out. You start for another bank blocks away. But before you get there, a newspaper headline catches your eye. You can't read it all, but two words make you start and turn pale. Bank robbery. You read as much as you can, but your lifelong miserliness doesn't let you spend a nickel, just five cents for that paper. Then one phrase strikes your eye. Marked money. Marked money. Now you hurry home. The other bank is forgotten. You should take a taxi, but you don't think of it, even though fives and tens are clutched in your pocket, the dampness from your hand making them a pulpy mass. Now you're home, safe. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Craig. Uh, I, I can't stop now, Mr. Campion. Okay, so you can't stop. Don't you want to know why this policeman is here? Policeman? Where? Using the phone down the hall. It seems our good friend Mr. Sedgwick has some shady dealings. Sedgwick? Yes, you see, there was a little incident. Well, I, I got to go to Carolyn. I, I went out to get some medicine. I'll, uh... Oh, the law will wait, Mr. Craig. The law will wait. Carolyn! Carolyn! Is, is the policeman gone, Albert? No, he ain't. I saw him coming down the street while I was looking out the window for you. Why was you gone so long, Albert? Oh, never mind that. He what? came up the stairs and he rang the bell. Uh, I couldn't answer the door. I just couldn't, Albert. So I pretended I wasn't here. Uh, then Mr. Campion came down and knocked on our door. Did he hear you? He know you was here? Uh, I must have made some kind of noise because he talked to me. I didn't say nothing. Then I heard the policeman and Mr. Campion talking. You tell me what they were saying. I couldn't hear it good. I put my ear against the door, but I couldn't hear nothing but low talk. Uh, and that's what it's for. That's what it's for. What are you saying? Where's the rest of the money? Still in the fireplace. Are they going to arrest us, Albert? Are they going to arrest us for taking money from Mr. Sedgwick? The paper said it was marked. Oh. The bandits took marked money from the bank. The serial numbers was all wrote down. Now we got it. That Mr. Sedgwick was a crook. We got to give it back. Yeah, you're crazy. Then we 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 got to tell him we stole it off Sedgwick. We got to get rid of the money. Albert, what are you doing? Burning it. Oh no, Albert! No, let go no. of my arm. That that fellow at the bank. He looked funny at me. It took me twenty minutes to get back here. He told the police before I got back. You burning it! Burning it! You shut up! Oh, I don't burn it! Oh, shut up! Oh! Albert, you didn't have to hit me. You didn't have to hit me. Shh, shh, shh. That's a police. Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, quiet. That's a policeman. Now you go keep him away. The money's nearly gone. Then, then he can come in. Go ahead now. Go ahead. Don't stand there like a fish. Go ahead. Who? Who is it? Campion with a stout minion of the law, name of 
Is his name is McCarthy. Just a couple of seconds more. Just a couple of seconds. I, uh, I ain't dressed. Oh, come, come, Mrs. Craig. It's after ten. You were up early this morning. I heard you. It's done, Carolyn. You can let him in. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Don't you be surprised if someday somebody stops you on the street and asks such questions as, what do you consider the most important qualities in gasoline? Or, why did you select the brand of motor oil you're using? The questioner will probably be from the research organization which Signal Oil Company regularly employs to find out how they can serve you better how they can help you get more pleasure from your car. It's this policy of finding out what the motorist wants, then giving it to him, that has led to the development of ever finer signal products, including that amazing new signal gasoline that's so packed with power you can actually feel the difference and see it and hear it. Give it a try. The chances are you'll say signal gasoline has everything. For after all, new signal gasoline, like all signal products, is the answer to what you, the motoring public, have told Signal's research people that you want. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Albert and Carolyn, it was just too good to be true, wasn't it? You thought it was your lucky night. That your good friend Mr. Sedgwick, lying dead in the alley, would turn out to be a profitable investment after all. But there were too many things you didn't know, too many strings attached to that $5,000. That's why you're relieved now as you watch the last of it smolder in the grate after admitting Officer McCarthy and Mr. Campion. Uh, What's that, Officer? What about Mr. Sedgwick? Well, when we found his body lying there in the alley, we had to find out where he was staying. That's why I'm here. You say he's been living here? Only for two days. Uh, we didn't know nothing about him. Sure, or no honest folks would. Him with a record a yard long and more aliases than you can shake a stick at. Uh, as soon as I read about the bank robbery, I said to Carolyn, that Sedgwick is the kind of a man who looks like a robber. Sedgwick? Robber? Is that right, McCarthy? Lord, no. Small stuff with Sedgwick's line. Sneak thieving. The bank robbery's been cleared up and all the money's recovered. No, that's not right. It's in all the morning papers. The Crakes never buy newspapers, McCarthy. Papers cost a nickel. But I read, I saw... Uh, Did you read the paper? Well, I couldn't read it all, only what I could see. A typical Crake action. Peek over and read as much as possible on the newsstand or over a shoulder. But Sedgwick, he he had $5,000. He... Five thousand... How do you know? He had it. We know. Not a penny on him when we found him. Oh, oh. That night you came in, excited, out of breath. Oh, no, I can't believe... Oh, no, this is too much. McCarthy! Sedgwick was a sneak thief. He was. Albert. Uh. Caroline. Uh Uh-huh. Did you keep money in your room here? Did you? Oh! The mattress! It's been split open! You! You burned out all the money, you fool! You burned out all the money! (laughs) What's she talking about? Briefly, McCarthy, poetic justice. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Russell Hughes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, 
reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Fred Larkin, Johnny. New Jersey fire and casualty. Hope I didn't get you out of bed. Well, you sure did, Freddy, but how are things in Trenton? In Trenton, fine. In the little town of Vineland, I'm not so sure. Vineland? About halfway between Philadelphia and Atlantic City? That's the place. What goes down there? Fire. Arson? That's what I hope you can find out. Well, uh, any reason for suspicion? Yes. The man who holds the policy on $83,000 worth of bedding. Bedding? Mattresses, box springs, it went up in smoke two days ago. Okay, Fred, I'll grab the first train. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey Fire and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Trenton, New Jersey. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Smoky Sleeper matter. Expense account item one, ten seventy five, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Trenton. Item two, eighty cents, taxi to Fred Larkin's office on West State Street. He lost no time in getting right to the point. That's right, eighty three thousand total loss. Well, who's filed the claim, Fred? Name is Ben Murray, sole owner and manager of Ben Murray Furniture Sales in Philadelphia. Sort of a small chain scattered around all over the city. I thought you said the loss was in Vineland. It was. That's where he had a big warehouse. Well, if his stores are in Philly... He claims it's cheaper than maintaining a big warehouse in the city. Also, apparently, it's close to a couple of sources of supply. He's been a good account, Johnny. We've made a lot of money on his policies. Well, it sounds like you've issued him quite a few. Well, we have. You see, in addition to the usual coverage on his stores, we've issued him a lot of short-termers on warehouse contents from time to time. I don't quite see what you mean. Uh, His whole business is based on special sales. Pre-inventory, going out of business, distressed merchandise, fire and water damage sales, summer, winter, spring, and fall sales. Anything you can think of. No kidding. Periodically, he loads up his vinyl warehouse with stuff he's accumulated for the next big sale. And we insure it. This time, it was $83,000 worth of box springs and mattresses. Wow, that's a lot of betting for just one sale. Uh, Don't worry. He'd have got rid of it. His salesmen are the sharpest bunch you ever saw. Too sharp, if you ask me. Almost like a bunch of con men. You know what switching means in the retail trade? Isn't that when they advertise a well-known item at a very low price? That's it. Then when you try to buy it, they just uh, happen to have sold the last one. That's it. But by that time, they've got you in the store where they can use the high-pressure pitch to sell you some inferior item at an even higher price. And on a no-return basis. Yeah, by the time the customer gets wise, it's too late. Exactly. I suspect they're not above using the label switch, too. You know, have some local manufacturer make up a cheap item, then put a nationally recognized label on it, or a pretty good copy. My, my, what nice clients you have, Freddy. Well, what can we do, Johnny? As long as we don't catch them red-handed in something that directly affects us. Well, you don't need to write any more policies. Mm, The company says different. At least until such a time as they try to pull something on us. Or we find proof of such doings. I see. Now, where will I find this Ben Murray? Either his main office in Philadelphia or down in Vineland, looking over what's left in the shell of that warehouse. On what exactly does Murray base the amount of his claim? Face value of the policy, which in turn was based on the cost of the goods to him. Huh? You mean you used the figures he gave you? Mm-hmm. Hardly. We got the figures from the actual bills sent him by the manufacturer. Well, I wondered. I don't blame you. No, Johnny, that 83000 is exactly what the mattresses and box springs cost him. 
It was a special order from one manufacturer, made up especially for one big sale. Can your secretary check on Murray's whereabouts for me? Sure. All right, then let me use your phone. I may be able to save us all a lot of time, labor, and soap. I call my old friend Adam Bowles, who lived within a few miles of Vineland, who, before he retired, was one of the top arson men in the country. Investigator, I mean. He wasn't home, but I left word for him to drive to Vineland and meet me in the lobby of the East Landis Hotel whenever I got there. Meanwhile, Fred's secretary had learned that Ben Murray was in his Philadelphia office. Expense account item 3560 for a train to Philadelphia and cab to the main office of Ben Murray Furniture Sales. The place was a madhouse. Okay, Dollar, go ahead in. It's that first office on the right. Thanks. And listen. Oh, wait a minute. Sales department, call me back. I'm busy. Listen, Dollar, if you can get a word in edgewise with Ben, ask him where's the contracts for that West Philadelphia deal, will you? Oh, sure. Sales department. Yeah? Well, turn a hose on some of that stuff and call it a flood sale. Look like that. Make the picture in that advertisement look good, see? Put a lot of stuff around. Pictures on the wall, rug on the floor, stuff like that. Yeah, make the suckers think they're getting a 25-piece dining room suit, not just a table, four chairs, and 20 crummy dishes. Dollar, sit down. Thanks. Yeah, make it look like they'll be getting everything they see in the ad. Yeah. Now, did you get them sofas in from Sterling? Okay. Put a price ticket of 95 bucks on them, and then mark it down to 49.95, and we'll clean out the whole... Mr. Murray. Huh? He what? Sterling charges 25 bucks for those lousy sofas. Listen, we're giving them twenty-two fifty for him, except for the demonstrator we show on the floor, the good one. Who does he think he is telling me the price he's going to charge me? Oh, the lousy bunch of chiselers trying to hike the price on me. Boy, what a business. From the looks of that outer office, you've got plenty of it. Yeah, yeah, volume, Dollar. That's what does it. I work on a narrow margin, see? Oh. Yeah, sometimes I even lose money, just to keep the volume up. I got nine stores, see? They're all over Philadelphia. Hey, Ben. Yeah, what's the matter now? Pine Street wants to know the sale prices on those three grades of night cloud mattresses. What'll I tell them? What are the cost prices? All the same. Thirteen bucks a piece. Cost us thirteen bucks, huh? Well, price them at, uh, at, uh, thirty-nine ninety-five, forty-nine ninety-five, and sixty-nine ninety-five. Okay, Ben. Hey, Larry. Narrow profit margin, huh? And now, look, Dollar. Your card says you're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, if it's about that fire I had down in Vineland a couple of days That's ago... That's exactly what it's about. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, oh, for... Yeah, what is it? Oh, yeah, well, listen. Hey, pick that other phone off the hook, Dollar. That noise is killing me, will you? Why not? I might learn something. Well, you tell him I don't care if he's a Department of Internal Revenue in person. Hello. We pay hey, for Ben, I like got him. a dame here in the store who found out that bed we sent her wasn't the same that? one she saw on the floor. Well, well no. Wait, wait we just a minute. I, uh, uh, she threatens okay. to go see the, the Better way. Business Bureau. Up well, up. look, uh, this That's isn't Ben. Huh? Just hold on a minute, will you? Hold on. you tell that bookkeeper we got there, he either keeps the books the way I tell him, or either he... Well, look, I'll call you back, see? Did you hold that call for me, Dollar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah? Yeah? Well, don't take any chances. Give her anything she wants. Give her the one she saw on the floor. Go out and buy her one, a good one. Just make her happy. Keep her from... Uh, from well, you know what I mean. Yeah. Troubles, troubles, troubles. When I look, Dollar, you think there was anything wrong with that fire, you prove it, I'll give you this whole business. What do you think I am, a crook? I haven't said that. Yet. Then, then what's the idea of investigating? Not you, but that fire. We always investigate when a claim this large is involved. Oh, yeah? Do it automatically. Look, I'm trying to run an honest business here, just barely scraping by. That phone call just now. A customer ain't 100% satisfied, we make her satisfied. Oh, sure. To keep her from blabbing about the way you rooked her. Oh, look, look, get out of here, would you? Can't you see I'm busy? I try to run a decent business here, and punks like you come in and... Oh, if I'm... Yeah, hold on. Look, you got some legit reason to investigate, Dollar. You come around then. Maybe I will. Now go on. Get out, will you? Gladly. Listen, Charlie. You tell him he tries to outsmart me, I'll sue him for every cent he's got. Expense account item four. $50 deposit on a drive-your-own car. I crossed the Delaware River Bridge and finally picked up Route 47 for the 35-mile drive down to Vineland. Flat country, this, with plenty of beautiful trees and rich farmland and occasional cranberry bog. 
The soft smell of ripening peaches greeted me from the vast orchards I passed. It was all very pleasant. Certainly a complete contrast to the noisy, unhealthy joint I just left. And I could see only too plainly why Fred Larkin suspected arson in the warehouse fire. Sure. If a character like Ben Murray didn't resort to arson, he'd feel he was missing a good bet. Proof of arson, however, is a different matter. And not always easy to come by. That's where I wanted the help of Ed Bowles. But Ed hadn't got to the hotel when I arrived in Vineland. So I drove over to the police headquarters at 610 Wood Street, a block north of Landis Avenue, the main drag. There I found Sergeant Louis Tommaso, who'd been working on the case. Be glad to take you over there, Dollar. Just the other side of Chestnut Avenue. That's over south of town. All right, Sergeant. I'd like to see that warehouse, or what's left of it. Oh, there's plenty left of the warehouse. All metal construction. Come on. That in itself might make it hard to spot our... Dollar, we went over the... Lieutenant, Mr. Dollar and I are going out to the Benmer warehouse. We went over that place with a fine-toothed comb, both during and after the fire. You came up with nothing, huh? Nothing that would give any cause for suspicion. Sergeant, do you know a man by the name of Adam Bowles? I certainly do. He's been giving me a lot of help with this. You know, just to sort of keep his hand in. And he's found nothing? Not a thing. But of course, he's the kind that never gives up. Yeah. Well, let's get on over and take a look at that place. It was obvious that the whole contents of that warehouse was damaged beyond repair. And apparently the big steel building had been packed to the roof. I looked over some of the damaged mattresses very carefully, sometimes with the aid of my pocket knife, and I learned some rather interesting things. Things that showed the best possible reasons for wanting to burn up a lot of merchandise like this. Hmm. Wow. Well, have you seen enough, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, I guess so. But I still want to talk to Adam Bowles. So let's go on back to... Wait Tom. a minute, wait a minute. Looks like Ed pulling up in that car there. Huh? Well, so it is. Hey, Ed! What? Johnny! Yeah, well, hi, Ed. Sergeant, don't tell me you'd send for a half quit like Dollar. <laughs> Just again. a minute now, Stinky. Why, the greenest rookie on the force would get further. Ed, than... I'll brain you. You two know each other. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> Johnny, how are you, baby? Great, just great. You got my message, huh? Yeah, but I hereby inform you that, as usual, you got here too late. Oh, is that so? When I found out you were coming, I decided I'd better get to work, if only to show you up. <laughs> so I did, and I found out who started the fire. Well, I've got a pretty good suspicion myself. Who did it, Ad? Poor old Jerry Cumber. Who? Jerry? The old town near do will Yep, that poor foolish old wino. Well, how did it happen? Oh, he was just wandering around that night, as he often does, with a bottle to keep him company. Found the back door of the warehouse open, thought he'd take a little nap, or rather sleep it off. He certainly had his choice of nice soft beds. Yeah, so he went to sleep with a lighted cigarette in his fingers. And there you have it. And the funny thing, Sergeant... Yeah? The only charge you can really hold the old bum on is being drunk and disorderly. And, of course, trespass. What? Well, you look it up. You'll see I'm right. As for you, Johnny, you can just go on back to your company and tell them to pay the claim. Oh, that's so? Yes, sir. Case is closed. At least for you. That's where you're wrong. Huh? After a couple of things I heard at the Benmer office, plus a couple of things I've seen here, Adam, I think this case is just starting for me. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For a long time, people have been saying that the earth is shrinking because transportation is getting faster and faster. And because this is true, people are getting closer, too. Today, our neighbors are not only the ones who live next door to us. They're all over the world. It is axiomatic that one should help his neighbor. But Americans have gone a step further. In addition to individuals helping individuals, now many American cities help many other cities through the Sister City program. Now, perhaps you've heard how it works. If not, here's an example or two. In the fall of 1959, a large area of Nagoya, Japan, was struck by a devastating typhoon. Her sister city, Los Angeles, California, sent tons of relief materials to Nagoya by way of an Air Force plane headed for the area. 
the Marines, and the Navy rendered vital emergency aid during the disaster. When earthquakes shook Viña del Mar, Chile, during the summer of 1960, her sister city, Sausalito, California, sent hundreds of dollars' worth of relief materials to help out. Another case in point, the school children of Clovis, New Mexico, sent a number of cultural exchange packages to students in their sister city of Adana, Turkey. There are hundreds of such examples, because there are hundreds of sister cities. By using this means of diplomacy, friendship and understanding have increased throughout the world and paved the way for permanent freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Smoky Sleeper Matter. From the looks of things, the case was practically over. The fire at the warehouse full of box springs and inner spring mattresses had been accidental. And it looked, I underline that word looked, as though Ben Murray's claim for reparation to the tune of $83,000 was entirely justified. Ed Bowles, the finest expert on arson I knew, had produced the man who started the fire as proof. So, on the surface, there was nothing for the company to do but pay Ben Murray's claim. But I smell a rat. A big one. Expense account item 5, 75 cents for a person-to-person call to Fred Larkin and Trenton. Well, Johnny, if you're satisfied with Bowles' conclusion that it wasn't arson, well, that's that. We'll have to pay off the claim. Uh, what if I could prove fraud? Fraud? What do you mean? Look, Fred... You told me you saw the bills, the manufacturer's bills, to Murray, giving valuation on the bedding that was stored in that warehouse. Yes, I have photostats of those bills right here in my desk. But what... Are... Good for you. Dig them out, will you? Oh? Why? Go on, go on. Dig them out, Fred, and read them to me. What if there was no arson? I failed to see what you're driving Look, will at. you do what I ask you? I'm trying to save your company some money. All right, all right. Ah, uh, here now. Uh, now, what do you want to know? Well, the labels on the remains of the mattresses I looked at at the scene of the fire... Those labels indicated there there was a model called the Night Cloud Sleep Rest. And that checks with these bills. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, there were 3,500 mattresses called Night Cloud Sleep Rest. Well, forget the quantities. What was the manufacturer's price to Ben Murray on that Night Cloud Sleep Rest? Now, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Johnny, they cost Ben Murray exactly $25.50 apiece. And there's an equal number of box springs to match. $25.50? That's right. But I overheard him say in Philadelphia that he only paid... Hmm. What, Johnny? Uh, nothing, nothing. What other models are on those bills? Uh, Night Cloud Super Sleep. And the price? Uh, just a second. And look while you're figuring, you might be interested in knowing that the labels on that sleep rest indicated a retail price of $69 each. Some profit, huh? Uh, here now. Johnny, the Night Cloud Supers cost Murray twenty-six twenty apiece. Wow, hey. All right, I got it. And he claimed to be working on a narrow profit margin. Now, the Night Cloud Perfection Sleep cost him uh, $27.14 each. Good. Any more? Uh, those were the only ones he bought and stored in the warehouse. All right. Now, give me the name and address of the manufacturer. Easy. Golden Bedding Corporation, Woodvine, New Jersey. Good. Now, one more thing. Can you think of the name of another big chain of furniture stores, you know, like Ben Murray's, only in uh, New York or Chicago or some other big city? Well, of course, there's Glauder Brothers in New York. Glauder Brothers. Only they're such a disreputable outfit that when they try to talk insurance with us... Freddy, got... that's all the better. Thanks a lot. Now, wait, Johnny. You still haven't told oh, me... Oh, I will, Freddy. Don't you worry. I will. Why I didn't get pinched for speeding somewhere along Highway 49, I'll never know, because I certainly didn't hold back the horsepower. Just short of the town of Tuckahoe, I turned off on 557, and then a few miles later pulled into Woodvine. Although it's a small community surrounded by farms that boasts a big hat factory, a couple of clothing factories, a vast, sprawling state institution, and on the far edge of town, the Golden Bedding Corporation's huge plant. I figured the best thing to do was put on a bull front and bull my way into the president's office. But any such tactics proved entirely unnecessary. Barney Glauder, huh? Uh, yes, Mr. Golden, uh, but just Barney's good enough. Well, I should say it is, because you must be Barney Jr. I've known your papa for years. Sit down, my boy. Would you like a cigar? Why, uh, no, no thanks. You don't look like your old man, though. You know that? Not a bit. Of course, I haven't seen him since 42. <laughs> Barney Glauner. Yeah. Well, what are you doing in this part of the country, huh, Barney? Oh, um, business. Uh, pleasure trip. Business, huh? 
What's the matter? We haven't had any orders from you people lately, huh? Well, up to now, I haven't really had anything to do with the business. <laughs> Living off the old man's millions, huh? <laughs> Smart boy. Did you go to college? Yeah, full four years. Yeah, that's the way. Smart boy. Now you are in the business. Buying, maybe? Well, if you mean from you, that depends. <laughs> if you're as sharp as your papa. How old is he now, huh? Pop? Yeah. Oh, uh, let me see. Yeah, how's your mama? Mama? She... Uh, look, Mr. Golden, if mm-hmm. you if you don't mind, uh, we'll talk business first. Huh? <laughs> Chip off the old block. Sure, business always first. After maybe you come out to the house and have dinner, huh? Talk over old times, your family. Sure, maybe. All right, you go right ahead. Tell me what you want to order. A thousand mattresses and box springs, huh? Ten thousand? Anything you want, my boy, and at a good price. Well, like I said, that depends. Uh-huh. What kind of a deal, is that what you mean? Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. Your papa's a very smart man, you know that? He's a good businessman. I know what he's thinking, so I know what you're thinking. All right. If you want to give me a nice big order for a lot of merchandise, I'll name you a price that you... Listen, Barney, I've got such a good customer in Philadelphia these days, not mentioning any names, but you'll pardon me, I don't even miss your papa's business. Understand me? But to get your business back again, I'll make you the same type deal I give this man. For a firm order, that is. You understand? No cancellations. You'll, uh... You'll, uh, pre-ticket the merchandise. That mm-hmm. is, uh, put the list price on the labels for me, uh, for us. Any price you say, regardless of the cost to you. Uh, look over here, my boy. The pictures of our merchandise here on the wall. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Night Cloud Perfection Street. Well, we'll put on any name you like. One should sound like some national brand, we'll think up a name for you. Not a bad deal. So far. And we make up as many models as you want. You know, we change just the ticking. They look different. All 196 springs, I personally guarantee it. Only 196? That's all you need, sure. Nobody can tell the difference. Except, of course, the demonstrators you keep on the floor to show the customer. Uh-huh. The demonstrators have 392 springs. Those you can jump on and bend them anything you like. Yeah, and the customer thinks that's the kind he's getting. What else? <laughs> I tell you, Barney boy, just as smart as your old man. Yeah. Now, uh, what about the price? Ah, the price. Now, Barney, this you can't resist. You understand, out here in the country... Low overhead, no labor problems, nobody snooping. Yeah, yeah, I know. How much? Well, for you, my boy, how many? Well, uh, say uh, 10,000 units. 10,000 units. All right, I'll give you a special price. How much? Well, now, this depends on the ticking material. Hmm? You look here. See? First class material looks like twice the money. Go on. Plain blue and white ticking, that costs you. And remember, Barney, this is very special because of your papa and getting back his business. So, at 10,000 units in this ticking, $14.93 and you never saw such a buy. That okay? Eh, strikes me as a little high. A little high? I'm not making a thing on it. Look at here. This, the fancy ticking, this is real class. $15.06 a unit. Now, you can't beat that. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, of course, Barney, my boy, if you want to order a few no, more. No, no, no. I, I, I think maybe I can do better up in New England. In New England? Who? Tell me who. Well. All right. All right. Now, look. I told you, I've got a big customer in Philadelphia. Well, all right. Never mind. We'll do it the same way for you we do for him. All right? On the books. How do you mean? No, well, I mean fourteen ninety three cents, huh? Only what would you think if the bill I send you says twenty nine ninety six? hmm? Double? Mm-hmm. You'd make it look like I paid twice as much? So? Yeah. Yeah. For tax purposes, I'd only be showing about half the profit I was actually making. Mm-hmm. Smart boy, Barney. Or, uh, suppose I insured the stuff for the amount your bills showed, and something happened to it. Well, that's right, sure. However you want... Excuse me. Hello. Oh! <laughs> Hello, Ben. I was just thinking of you. I hear you had a lucky fire up there. What? Oh, no, not now. Listen, Ben, I've got a customer. I've got... No, I've got an important customer here, the son of a very dear old... F... What? Yes, he is. Yes. A blue shirt and a bow tie. Oh, no. Oh, no. Ben, I'll call you back. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Johnny Dollar. In person, Mr. From the Golden. insurance... Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Too no, bad no, Ben Murray's no. call interrupted our conversation. Oh, what have I said? That was a very interesting lot of facts you gave me, and I strongly suspect it'll not only put Murray out of business, but you too. 
And a lot of people you've been oh, dealing I'm with. A dollar. Brother, I hate to think of what the Better Business Bureau oh, will do when they get hold of these facts. Business Bureau. To say nothing of the Federal Trade Mr. Commission. Dollar, listen to But me. I have a notion it'll help to clear up one of the dirtiest chip rackets in years. There's no need Even to Even the long suffering public understands this sort of shady operation when it's brought to their no, attention. It's not at all. As for the decent, legitimate national firms you've been practically now, stealing from. Me, dollar, will you please listen a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Business has been good. I've made a lot of money. Oh, now, wait Maybe a minute, you, you could use a little bit. You know, we'll call it the commission, huh? Say $10,000. In cash, it wouldn't show. Golden, I wouldn't even spit on that kind of money. Oh, I could maybe persuade you. You couldn't persuade me to have any part of it. Brother, you've had it coming for a long, long time. And believe me, I'm going to see that you get it. Understand? Yes, Dollar, you make it... I understand. I understand you, too. You dirty crook. You faker. You liar. You cheating, dirty, conniving, chiseling liar. You ruined me, you hear? You ruined me. Yes, Fred? I'm afraid that your nice client, Ben Murray, based his insurance claim on a lot of values that didn't exist. On the hiked-up prices. Hiked up to cheat you and the income tax boys. And if that is not right fraud, I'll eat my shirt. So you can just forget about paying that claim or any part of it. And I hope that you and the company will take whatever legal steps are necessary to put these guys out of business. Expense account total, including incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $130.49. And cheap at half the price. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kansas state flag is dark blue, and in the center is the state seal, surmounted by a large sunflower, the official state flower. The seal reflects the history of Kansas, the train of ox wagons going west, for most of the great roads pass through Kansas. An Indian is depicted chasing a herd of buffalo, Recalling the words of the official state song, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. For this truly was the home of the buffalo and Indian. The east is represented by a rising sun, and the promise of future prosperity is indicated by the steamboat on the river and the farmer plowing the field. Above a mountain range are 34 stars, for Kansas was the 34th state admitted to the Union. Over all is the state motto, Ad astra per aspera, to the stars through difficulties. Kansas state flag, the flag of the 34th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 23, 1927. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the case of a girl who was willing to kill for money she didn't need. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Russell Thorson, Jack Edwards, Will Wright, Paul Dubois, Lawrence Dopkins, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. From somewhere beyond the threshold of neon, the happy holidays beckon to Broadway. And the wilderness of plastic and chrome dons its ribbons of tinsel. Garlands of evergreen are hung against the shriek of subways. And behind plate glass, puppets with shrewd mechanisms perform their frenetic dance. The metallic music flows out of the horns of loudspeakers. The women walk slow, 
sway gently to its holiday rhythms. And everywhere, the image of gaiety is reflected in spangles that whirl on winter's wind. So paint the grin across your mouth, kid. It's the merry time. And somewhere within it, a phone call, a drunken voice that pleads you into a desolate, wind-littered street, into a tenement scarred with shadows, into a room also desolate. A man sprawled on the floor in drunkenness, his arm flung toward the woman who lies away from him, his fingers reaching, trying to touch her dead face. And the other man who clings to your lapel has waited there only so he could tell you about it. That bruiser had nothing to do with it, doesn't it? I called it in. I waited here for you. Me, along with those two, just so as I could tell you about it. Who that are you? Bruce, Bob. Robert Coker. I got a wife and a good name. I don't want to get mixed up in this mister. The woman? That's Mrs. Baker, Charlie's wife. Boy, has that boy got a hangover waiting for him when he comes to. Imagine. You and Charlie, you're enjoying yourself. You get invited in for a little nightcap. You walk in, and there's Mrs. Baker lying on the floor, head all twisted like that. She was strangled. Yeah, yeah. That's how I figured it, too. When we walked in, saw her, I said, Look, Charlie, boy, look at your missus. And Charlie kind of yelped like a dog or something. Tried to make it to her. But he passed out on the way. I never touched him, mister. Honest, I didn't... You and Mr. I... Baker were out together, then you came home? Yeah, but not like you think. We were to the office party. Charlie and me, we got adjoining desks. Big deal, office party. Booze and paper cups dance a little with the steno you've been wanting to touch all year. Then you take Charlie boy home and... And look, mister, okay if I go home now. I've done everything could be expected. Okay, Call your wife, I... Mr. Culker. Tell her you won't be home for a while. And wait, then. Watch the barrier of faces form at the doorway, the same faces that gather always when sudden death is done. Faces tempered only by the quality of shirts, neckties, and hairdos. Quality this time, tenement, frayed. And in a while, the medical examiner, the nod toward the dead, the black satchel opened, and the stethoscope that hears no heartbeat. The official pronouncement that a woman named Lucille Baker, age about 32, married, no children, had been strangled to death. And the other nod to the two men who had been found with her. Take them along. Get out. Go. And back to the office. Give orders to interview everyone at the party. Turn Mr. Baker over to the officer whose extracurricular duty includes the sobering of suspects. Question Mr. Coker again. His story sticks. Then a door opens and a very sober man walks in. What they just told me, I don't believe. What are you doing here, Bob? I just told them what happened. I told them we came back to your place. You wait outside, Mr. Colker. Sure. Sure, whatever you say. Just take it easy, Charlie boy. Sit down, Mr. Baker. Your wife is dead. Lucille. I want you to try to tell me just what happened tonight. Uh, the office party, I... I went there. I was having a fine time. Yes, I was. I was having a wonderful time. Look, it was the end of the day, and at first I wanted to go home, but they, they wouldn't let me. They said, look at all this free booze. Lap it up and forget it. <laughs> and now... Uh, go on. Well, I tried to call Lucille three or four times. I don't know how many times to tell her I was having a good time not to wait up for me, but the line was always busy. What else do you remember? Bob said, come on, let's go home. When we got there, that last thing I remember, Lucille lying there. I was saying to myself, just like this, I am drunk. You, you think you see all sorts of things when you're drunk, and this is one of them. That's, that's not Lucille. I'm not even home now. I wake up and it'll... it'll, it'll The room shorn suddenly of everything but a man sobbing. And this is only one in the long array of grieving that has been displayed you over the last years. The grief for the loved dead, sometimes with laughter of strange texture, with silence sometimes, anguish, bitter. And sometimes this, like this man's, and always the walking away from it. And release him and his friend, Bob Colker. Go home. Sleep. The next morning, back to the tenement where a woman had been strangled. Ask questions through inch-open doors, and the children of the tenement shrivel away from you as if you were a cold wind. The doors that are never opened to you, the furtive whispers and scurrying behind them, the giggles. 
And finally, at the mention of the dead Mrs. Baker's name, a woman who begins a weeping suitable for police callers invites you in. Oh, that poor, poor creature. Taken from us like that, choked like that, cast away. Please, won't you come in? I'm Ruthie Alexander. Let's just shut the door, shall we? My neighbor's curious, nosy, so pathetically nosy. May I get you something? Hot chocolate tea? Something with a bite to it? Uh, No, thank you. You knew Mrs. Baker? I knew Lucille. Better than... How awful to be a man and have to suffer weeping women. You were saying you knew Mrs. Baker well. Better than she knew herself. The promises life offered that girl. Although Lucille wasn't pretty, mind you. Not in the real sense of the word. But she had her qualities hidden, kind of. Sly. It intrigued you men. You're saying that she... Nothing of the sort. Why, Lucille, the poor unimaginative creature, and I say this of her, and I was her best friend, mind you, and have the right. Lucille backed away from men. I honestly think they frightened her. She was married to a husband who loved her. Of course he did. Of course he did. Why shouldn't he? She could have even had a man like Teddy Fletcher. Teddy was dying for her. Lucille told me all about it. Fletcher? A fellow who works at the Dorsey Company where Lucille's husband worked. I told her so many times, a man like that, Lucy, they don't grow on bushes. They... You know something? What? That Lucille. She was a deep one. Sly, like I said. I wonder. I just wonder if she and Teddy... <laughs> Oh, how, how awful of me. <laughs> but will you have a cigarette at least? I'll light it for you. Draw the first puff. And refuse the kind offer. King-sized, cork-tipped, gratis and all. Give her back her solitude. Leave her to her tearless weeping. Now she'd have something really to cry about. She'd wasted a cigarette. To the offices of the Dorsey Novelty Company, Incorporated Limited. Be greeted, be given a catalog concerning current novelties. Be frowned at because I didn't want it. Be listened to, be ushered past the office force and slogans about geniuses at work and courtesy and cleanliness and accuracy. And be shown to a cubicle. Yeah? Mr. Fletcher? Yeah, what is it? I'm Danny Clover from the police. I'm expecting somebody from down there. Sit down, please. Thanks, sir. I'm trying to get some information. I know, I know. All right, you know. Tell me what you know. Just one thing. You think I killed Lucille? Did you? I was in love with her. Did you kill her? I just told you I was in love with her for two years now. I built my plans around her, day-to-day plans. That adds up to being my life, doesn't it? You think I killed her? It'd be like killing myself, wouldn't it? All right, we'll go on the premise you didn't kill her, Mr. Fletcher. Tell me about last night. I was at the party. Everybody got loaded. Not me. You don't drink, huh? Now, when it's better to stay sober. Last night was such a time. Oh, why? Last night, Charlie Baker was here getting tanked. Last night, Lucille Baker was home being lonely. Then you left the party because her husband was here and went over to see her. Is that it? It's the way I planned it. It didn't work. You want to tell me why? Yeah. I called Lucille from here during the party a lot of times. She said, I'm a wife with a husband. Stay where you are. Admirable, huh? A wife, if it killed her, and it killed her. Then you gave up and went home. I needed solace. I found Isabel by the water cooler. Isabel? Isabel Mitchell, pal and buddy, sweater and skirt. We smiled at each other over paper cups, linked arms, and went to her place. Drank and did childish things like pin the tail of the donkey. Drank, drank, drank. Your alibi, huh? I want to talk to her. I guess she's still at home getting rid of last night's head. She didn't show up today. Nice kid. Where does she live? Two rooms on West 37th, 905, apartment 2. Look, Mr. Clover, that Hamilton wall clock says noon, and it's never wrong. You're not going to join me for lunch, are you? Thanks a lot. And the ride now to West 37th, to the block of the brownstones and the low rent and the corner grocery store. And next to the tailor shop that advertised proudly how it had held the line since 1950, find the number, 905. Walk past the door to apartment one, 
and a few steps more to apartment two. Apartment of Isabel Mitchell. Knock and get no answer. And open a door, walk in. The living room decorated in row house decor. Dregs of last night's drinks, Coolidge modern and empty. And the kitchen. The light still burning, the perpetual distance sound in the exposed water pipes. And strung from them, the girl. The girl twisting this way and back. Only slightly. The lifeless girl. The murdered girl. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Confidentially, Edgar Bergen has a split personality, and it's hard to say whether he's funnier as the harassed Bergen or as that saucy figment of his own imagination who does the harassing, Charlie McCarthy. We leave it to you to figure out, between the laughs, every Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations when you hear Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. In the days before Christmas, Broadway puts on its flashy clothes and the flashy smile. Everybody's on his way to con Santa Claus. The blonde who walks with you stops to adjust her nylons in front of the jewelry store. The brunette who tells you to pick her up for lunch in the lingerie department. The redhead who behaved all year long. And while the reindeer dash across the tundra of the spectaculars, the recruits from the Bowery shake their little bells and nod lovingly at tiny tots. Get out the Christmas list, kid. That's where your friends have been all year long. And at headquarters, consider other things. Official musings. The dying of Lucille Baker, a woman strangled. Consider what chain of circumstance led from her to the murder of another, Isabel Mitchell. Consider... And be interrupted by a police sergeant named Gino Tartaglia, who sometimes had things in his mind. I got a headache, Danny. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Why don't you take an aspirin? Such astro- condolences are touching, Danny, and I thank you for them. However, my symptoms are psychosomatic. Psychosomatic. A word Mrs. Tartaglia read to me last night, from a book. It's the type headache which is prone to deep thinkers, so science explained to Mrs. T, and she to me. You've been thinking deeply, Gina? Indeedy, as concerns the current situation in the murder of Lucille Baker and the subsequent same of Miss Isabel Mitchell. Oh? A theory to wit. Mr. Ted Fletcher is a killer. Murdered the woman whom he loved, Mrs. Baker. Then murdered the girl he flirted with, Isabel Mitchell. But Isabel was his alibi, Gina. Why should he murder her? I got my headache making it sound reasonable to me, Danny. But I think I know why he killed Miss Mitchell. Yeah, I can think of a reason, too. You mean, like that, so soon? Well, it had figured, Gino. You tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. The way it stands now, Gino, Fletcher can't account for his actions of last night. Nobody remembers when he left the party. Let's just assume he left with Miss Mitchell. He took her home and left her... You've been peeking into my brain, Danny. He left her, went to see Mrs. Baker, killed her. Came back to Miss Mitchell and asked her to be his alibi. She refused. Indeed, Danny, indeed. So she was the only one who knew he was a killer. She refused to help him. He killed her. Our theories make a lot of sense, don't they? Maybe. Have Fletcher picked up, Gino. I'm going out. Okay, Danny. Where can I reach you if I need you? At that novelty office. Maybe I can find out why that happy party had so much murder in it. Told the girl you're a detective? That's right. Show me, show me. Girls get impressed with guys who show them shiny badges. Don't bother to read the small print. All they care is that a muscle man with a favor to ask. You through with it? Yeah. Take back your badge. I produce novelties like that by the carload. Just had to be sure you weren't giving the girl a fast shuffle. Some questions I want to ask you, Mr. Dorsey. About time you got around to me, huh? It just so happens I'm the head man in this little enterprise. Maybe the personnel didn't get around to telling you. They didn't need to. I saw your publicity on the wrapping paper. Yeah. You had a little confab with Ted Fletcher, the girls tell me. Sorry, it didn't occur to me I need your permission. Oh, it's not that, kid. It's just that I got a happy enterprise here. You walk in, talk murder talk, it spreads gloom. Everybody gets unhappy until I think of something. The office party the other night, that was one of your thoughts? Yeah. 
Yeah, it was. Happened to be my birthday. I let it be known in a loud voice. And before long, the personnel is pitching dimes into a kitty. A good time was had by all. What did you think of? Who? Ted Fletcher. Personally, I can't stand the guy. Good worker, but I can't stand him. What do you think of? Just keep talking. Fletcher. Not much to look at, but oh, you kid, what he does to the emotions of the ever-loving opposite sex. You know what I mean? You gotta agree, because you got him tabbed for killing Mrs. Baker, I understand. I tell you, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Charles Baker works for you, too. Give me your thoughts on him. Baker's a good boy, nose to the grindstone type. I got a lot of plans for him. Been to his home, made his impress the boss type of food. Met his wife, the former Mrs. Baker. Yeah, and do you have an opinion? Mm Hmm? Dull woman, plain, boring. You know, Baker's better off without her, in my opinion. I tell you, because you asked. And Isabel Mitchell, who also worked for you, who was also at your birthday party, who was strangled, murdered. Hmm. Kind girl. Had a kind word for everybody, but everybody. Prove it to you. Fletcher meets her at the water cooler at my party. Isabel gives him the kind word. Fletcher takes her home. That was a busy, busy night for Fletcher, wasn't it, guy? Anything else, Mr. Dawson? That cuts it as far as I'm concerned. You too, huh? I bet you got loads of things to do, just like me. So goodbye, huh, guy? Mr. Clover? Yes? Is it all right if I just walk in here into your office? Of course. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I'm Lois Nolan. Yes? I work at the Dorsey Novelty Company in the office. I run an IBM machine, time study cards. I don't guess you noticed me, did you? Seems that I do. I guess you're wearing another dress. No, I was wearing this dress. You just didn't notice, that's all. Why have you come here, Miss Nolan? I wasn't at the party last night, so your men haven't questioned me. I see, and you want to be questioned, is that it? Well, I was a friend of Isabel's. You were? Though we had differences of opinion, as they say, about friends, boyfriends... Personally, I like fellows from whom I can better myself. And Isabel. Yeah. She was not the discriminate type. Life, she once said, was a laugh and a song. Look what it got her, some laugh. Yes. Well, now if you'll pardon me, Miss Some Nolan. laugh. If you knew where I just came from, you wouldn't say some laugh. Where did you just come from, Miss Nolan? From her uncle's house. In buckets, that's the way he was crying. He didn't say a word. But if you could have seen his eyes, those tears... Then he said, Lois, I cannot cry anymore. Isabel was a good girl, and now she is gone. I didn't know she had a family. No one's claimed it. Because that man is a nervous wreck, after all Isabel did for him. Where does her uncle live? In Brooklyn, 2020 Stockton Street. I hope I have been of some help, since Isabel was a dear friend of mine. I was was always broad-minded enough to forgive the things. You've been a great help, Miss Nolan. Thank you very much. And the house in Brooklyn, like all the other houses in the long file, the peeling paint, the sagging porch, the parlor curtains drawn aside to reveal the Christmas wreath, then drawn further to permit a clearer view of the man who walks their quiet street. And having noted your passing, open their windows, crane to see at whose door you'll knock. Then in faraway voices, announce it to friends, relatives, and neighbors. The voices drain away. Then, for a moment, the stillness is almost complete except for the wailing of vessels in the harbor, the cry of wind trapped against street lamps. Then break it, and the man in the woolen sweater wonders at you with pale eyes, washed-away eyes. Oh, you must be from the mission. I phoned. I have the magazines all tied and ready there. I'm uh, from the police. About Isabel. Yes. Come in, come in. You'll take your death of cold. I haven't been to claim her body because I didn't know if it was right. I'm just her uncle, and Isabel moved away from me over a year ago. I thought maybe she'd got someone closer to her. That's not why I came. No? Then why? Well, I thought maybe you could help us. Maybe you could tell us things about her that'll help us find her murderer. Isabel came here to live with us when her mother died. Then my wife died, and Isabel stayed on. It was nice when she was here. And then she went away. Tell me about it, Mr. Clayton. It was nice. Gay, exciting. Young men called on her, brought her things, brought me cigars. 
sat and talked with me while they waited for her to dress. She was pretty, real pretty, worth waiting for. You remember the men who called on her? No, no, just boys, nice-looking fellows. And you haven't seen Isabel since she left? Oh, yes, I didn't say that. I saw her many times, but only quickly. I'd call her and tell her to come pick up little things I had for her. Oh? Things, presents. They weren't really from me. They were from this nice fella. He must have liked Isabel a whole lot. You know how I know? Tell me. Well, he'd bring her these things and make me promise not to tell Isabel they were from him. He said he'd tell her when the time came when he was ready to. And and I'd say, Charlie... Charlie... Charlie Baker. Nice fella. You know, he made me tell Isabel I was giving her those things. Look at me. What would I have to give a girl like Isabel? This is the first time I've been in a place like this, Mr. Clover. I've passed the jail many times, but I've never been in. These are just the detention cells, Mr. Baker. Detention cells? You mean they're not permanent? You're not sure about Fletcher? Fletcher was picked up as a suspect, and that's still all he is. He's a killer. We'll find out. I still don't know why I'm here. I want to put your story together with his. Oh, then you'll know, huh? Then we'll know. Oh, Fletcher's sleeping. With a conscience like his. Look at him. All right, come on, Fletcher. Wake up. Wake up, killer. On your feet. I brought you a visitor, Fletcher. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Is that what you got to say to me? You, my friend, killer. Break it up. I said, break it up. Yeah. What am I, crazy, dirty my hands on him? You know what they got for you, killer? A chair. And you're going to sit in it. Fletcher, I told Baker how it was between you and his wife, Lucille. I'm glad you did. We were going to tell him we didn't get a chance. Lover boy. Killer boy. I didn't kill her. Is that what he keeps telling you, Mr. Clover? Uh Uh-huh. That's why you just keep him in the detention cell, huh? That's right. Look, Charlie. All right, I'm looking. You got to understand, Charlie, about Lucille and me. I loved her. She loved me. If we could have worked it out, I would have married her. Loved her? Loved Lucille? You? She wasn't a beautiful woman, Charlie. You know that. She was a gentle woman. Talking with her, you you weren't afraid of the world anymore. Well, Fletcher, if that's what she did to you, that's what she did to you. Didn't she do that to you, Baker? You were pretty broken up when she died. Did you ever have a wife who was murdered, Mr. Clover? No? Then don't tell me how it should feel. You and my wife, huh, Fletch? I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't kill her, Charlie. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. What happened last night, Fletch? Lucille wave you goodbye and you let your emotions run away with you? It was all over and you couldn't remember a thing, so you say you didn't kill her? Is that what happened, Mr. Fletcher? I told you what happened. Get him out of here. Just a few more things. About a girl who worked at your office also murdered Isabel Mitchell. You had your hands full last night, didn't you, killer? I ask you, get him out of here. No, I want him to hear something. There's another way this thing adds up. You could have killed your wife, Baker. What are you talking about? I was at the party. Everybody knows that. Everybody will vouch for me. I don't know. A party like that, people coming in and out, nobody remembers much about anything. You building something, Mr. Clover? Maybe. You could have left the party long enough to kill your wife, then go back to it. No one would have known the difference. Then play drunk, have a friend take you home, find your wife dead. Have a seat, Charlie. You might as well. His cots take a little while to get used to Now, listen, Clover. Then early the next morning, cry on my shoulder. Be released. Go around to Isabel's place and whisper to her the happy news about your wife's being dead. You're crazy. Why would I go to her? Because you were crazy about her. Crazy about her? Isabel? (laughs) Isabel! (laughs) What are you laughing at? He's right, Fletcher. You shouldn't laugh. Mr. Baker was crazy about Isabel, gave her presents. What are you talking about? But on the sly, Isabel didn't even know where they came from. After you've gotten rid of your wife, you could tell her, huh, Baker? But she wouldn't have any part of you. You killed her. (laughs) In love with Isabel. Her? A girl like that? 
Oh, Charlie, you stupid man. A girl like that when you had your own wife. Shut up! Shut up, shut up! Isabel was sweet and she was wonderful. You know how I know? She wouldn't look at me because I was married. That's the kind of a girl she was. She was good. I killed my wife for her and she took pity on me. She was good. But she still wouldn't look at you, so you killed her. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I had no more to live for. Why should she go on living? Why should somebody else have her? Who else would have done for her what I did for her? Nobody. Just me. But she didn't want me. <laughs> she had to die. <laughs> It's an enchanted island, this Broadway, or a desert of dust. Look at it, and it's a magician's pitch with golden mirrors and fountains that plume with jewels. Then you blink, it all dissolves. It's a crumbling wall, corroded with pain. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calford as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Featured in tonight's cast were William Conrad, Harry Bartell, Peggy Weber, Lou Merrill, and Herb Butterfield. All the best fun-making from Arthur Godfrey's daytime shows on CBS Radio. That's what you hear every Sunday afternoon on most of these stations when King Arthur Godfrey and his round table hold court. Hear it tomorrow afternoon. And remember to enjoy King Arthur Godfrey and his round table every Sunday afternoon on CBS Radio. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, those lovable rascals Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race.
join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Six-Week Cure. Reno, Nevada. A simple city like any other American city. The one made notorious for its gambling clubs and for harboring the sickest people in the world. The temporary home of would-be divorcees taking the six-week cure from the ills of marriage. You could see their strained white faces on the streets and in the restaurants and the clubs. The faces of women not quite sure what had happened. Not quite sure why they were here. Not quite sure where they were going tomorrow. You know something, Rice? All my life I've been hearing about gay divorcees. But the babes around here do not look so gay to me. There's nothing gay about a marriage that doesn't work, Mark. For most of them, this is the bitter end of a sweet dream. That's never fun. Yeah. Well, leave us not stay around to be poor parents, huh? You got your business free insurance company all cleared up. Leave us get back to New York. What's your rush? We can take a little vacation. Some great fishing in the mountains here. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Not with me. I remember the last time. I got more hooks into myself than I got into the fish. Besides which, I wind up eating nothing but bread. Because it is the only food we have which don't have bones in it. <laughs> All right, Marcus, you win. Yeah, besides, I'm not so uh, sure that you'd go fishing. What do you mean? There is a dish sitting at that table over in the corner, and she has been making passes with her eyeballs ever since we come in here. And she ain't no trout. Where? Huh? Oh, it's... it's Olga Petrov. You know her? Yeah, she's coming over. I most certainly do know her. Olga, Olga, baby. Ray. Oh, Race, I wasn't sure it was you. Olga Petrov, if there's a better ballerina in the world, I've never seen her. She moved with infinite grace, and your heart left your body to walk beside her on stage or off. It's been so long, Race. Paris, just before the Germans took over. You left without saying goodbye. Boris was jealous, remember? And with good reason. I was beginning to fall in love with you. That's nice, Race. That's very sweet. Oh, oh, excuse me, Olga. This is Mark Donovan, my very good friend. Hello, Mr. Donovan. Oh, baby, sing it again. <laughs> By the way, how is Boris? He's fine. He's here with you? He's here, Ace, but not with me. Don't tell me that you're... Yes. I'm here for what you so quaintly call the six-week cure. Divorce. I'm really very sorry to hear that. Where are you staying, Grace? Well, we're really not staying. We came in on the plane this morning to settle a claim. We're going right back. Grace, please stay for a little while. I'm in trouble, desperate trouble. I am staying at a... a dude ranch ten miles out on the highway. There are accommodations open. Mark will drive us out. We can talk it over on the way. What went wrong, Olga? I know you didn't take your marriage lightly. I guess I am a war casualty race. Even at this late date. The ballet is ruined temporarily in Europe. They can't support it. Not on the scale Boris demands. They can barely find food. I know. So we came to America. You know Boris. You know how he likes to live like an emperor. He found somebody to finance a tour. Patron of the arts? I would hardly say that. He was financed by a man named Joe Rockland. Big Rocky the Hood, financing a ballet company? That's right, Grace. Big Rocky, as you call him, is in love with me. And he's forcing you and Boris to split. <laughs> I wish that were so. If it were, we could run away. But it isn't. There's another woman. Another woman? Boris must be blind. He isn't in love with her. At least, I don't think so. But she's very wealthy. That's an attraction Boris cannot resist. Want to tell me who she is? Fran Maitland. Wilson Maitland's wife. But she's still married. She's here too, Race. Getting a divorce. We are all what you call... one big happy family. She started to cry and I put my arms around her. She wasn't meant for tears, not this baby. Her perfume was taboo, exotic like everything else about her. Even if Fran Maitland had all the money in the world, Boris Petrov was a chump to give this up. I'm sorry, Race. All I know about dancing or life, I learned from Boris. He has been all things to me. I don't relish the thought of being alone. I know. And you're going to find it difficult to be alone with Big Rocky after you. Very difficult. The bar Triple X Dude Ranch was very much on the sedentary side so far as the guests were concerned. The most strenuous activity seemed to be the lifting of cocktail glasses. 
But there was nothing sedentary about the owner of the ranch, Ma Westcott. She was pressing 70, but doing it the hard way. This gentle old lady, believe it or not, could sit on a Mustang like Roy Rogers. She could also pilot her own helicopter. Understand you're something of a flyer, too, Mr. Ace. I've never been checked out in a helicopter. It's good for keeping the herds in sight. Most ranchers think I'm crazy, though. It's something new in range riding. They'll come around, Mrs. Westcott. Maybe you'd like to come with me someday and see how big this ranch really is. Anytime. Good. Get you away from these crazy females for a while. Women oughtn't to be without their men, folks. It makes them mean. Oh, oh, been looking all over for you. It's my son, Buzz. What do you want? Oh, that fool woman, Mrs. Bryan, ain't back my ride yet. She must be lost. Someone ought to go find her. You were supposed to go with her. Well, I had other things to do. Sure. Shining up to that Fran Maitland. Now, I told you to stay away from the gap. Now, don't go yelping at me. You're coming, or ain't you? I'm coming. Excuse me, Mr. Ray. I'm going to close down this gap. Old oh, girl's quite a character, ain't she? He spoke from just behind my left shoulder, but I didn't have to see his face to know him. Joe Rockland, Big Rocky. Hardly the type to be calling anybody else a character. I turned and looked into those small black eyes. He was wearing a bow tie, and if it had been the kind that lit up, it would have spelled murder done cheaply. You getting a divorce, Race? I'm not married, Rocky. Ordering several kinds of divorces. Sometimes a guy gets his arm broke. That's a kind of a divorce from using it anymore. And sometimes a guy gets tired of living and signs off. You could call it a divorce. What you say and what you mean aren't the same. I you're a smart race. I sort of feel there ain't no reason for you to be in Reno. I'm a friend of Olga Petrov's. She's playing a tough hand. I want to stick around until the cards are counted. Boris and me can take care of that. I don't remember inviting you to my wedding. I'm coming anyhow. Just to make sure there's no shotgun pointing at the bride. So you really did come for a divorce. The tough kind. Well, from now on, I'm your lawyer. I'm going to handle the whole thing for you. Starting with a broken arm. Afraid you're even going to supply the arm, Rocky. Let me go, Reese. All right, go. Now get out of here. And see you again, fella. I... I'm sorry, everybody. We're we're old friends. He gets playful. You think you're pretty good, don't you? Huh? Big man. Tough guy. Just like my husband. Sorry to evoke unpleasant memories, Mrs... Mrs. Towner. Mrs. Robert Towner. But you can call me Sylvia. Because you're just like him. Just like my big, tough husband. What's your name? Race. Frank Race. Huh. Share of yourself, aren't you? Just like Robert. Well, you're just a man. Just another heel. I'll be rid of him in another week. What do you think of that, huh? Congratulations. <laughs> I'm lonesome. I don't like to be alone. I'm almost 30 and I don't like it. I gave him 10 years. Now I'm alone. You could go back to him, Sylvia. <laughs> Ever think of that? I don't think of anything else. I can't. You know why? He doesn't want me back. Because I had him arrested for hitting me. And I should have killed him. You better come outside. People are staring <laughs> at you. Why do I care? I... Yeah, sure. I'll come out. <laughs> now get a grip on yourself. Take your hands off me. Stop it. You're getting hysterical. Take your hands off me. Let go. All right. I never want to see another man again as long as I live. Yes, ma'am. Well, Ace, you seem to have lost your way with the ladies. Oh, hello, Boris. Olga told me you were here. Olga told me a lot of things, too. What are you setting her up for? We are getting a divorce, that's all. <laughs> that should not disturb you. You are very fond of Olga. Of course, you may have some rough competition this time. Don't be a fool, Boris. That girl never looked at anybody but you. You've been her whole life. She will find another life, just as I will find another one. With Fran Maitland, your new life might be more interesting than you think. More interesting and less peaceful. Is that so, Mr. Race? I hadn't seen her come around the end of the ranch house, but suddenly she was there. A striking woman of 35. Everything about her was reckless. Her face, her figure, the way she wore her clothes. I had met her once before investigating the loss of some jewelry. And once met, Fran Maitland was not easily forgotten. Let's hear your theories about life with me, Mr. Race. It might brighten my day. I've been bored. That's your trouble, baby. 
You get bored too easily, and it takes a new man to snap you out of it. Mm-hmm. Are you volunteering, Race? For assignments like this, I never volunteer. I do not like your attitude, Race. I do. I love it. I'm finding you more and more intriguing, Race. Don't try too hard. I don't fit into your collection of oddities. I'm not an artiste like Boris, and I can't match Buzz Westcott's drawl. What do you mean by that, Race? I'll tell you what he means. He means I've been riding with Westcott while you've been chasing after Sylvia Towner. She's younger than I am, Boris, darling, but she doesn't have any money. Her husband won't settle a dime. Well, I can see you two lovebirds have a lot to discuss. Excuse me. Mark and I had only one interest, keeping an eye on Olga Petrov, and we avoided the rest of the guests until night came. It was Ma Westcott who broke up a dull evening for us by taking us for a ride in her helicopter. I do this every once in a while at night, check up on Rushton. You know, I don't see how you can spot him from up here. Got a powerful spotlight. Uh-huh. Just have to shine it down when I see something suspicious going on. Can she part of the herd up ahead there? You see him in the moonlight? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When we get over him, we'll light off. <laughs> Hey, what a gimmick, huh? You think the Texas Rangers would give up their ponies and learn to fly things like these instead, huh? I'll hang right over them now. Turn on that light, will you, Race? Sure. Well, look at that. That he ain't scared of anything seeing a light from way up here. Mark, they're used to a thing called the sun. It comes up every morning. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Wait a minute. Look, they're on the other side of the herd. It's one of our horses. Yes, and he's saddled. Hey, he's standing by something. What is it? I don't know, but we better go down and find out. Ma Westcott set the helicopter down and we walked around the herd to where the horse stood. The animal was nuzzling the thing we had seen on the ground. It was the body of a woman. I knelt over her. A pointed branding iron had been stabbed through her throat. It was Sylvia Towner, and she was dead. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. Adventures of Frank Race. Sylvia Tonner had had her last drink and her last heartache. Mark stood guard over the body while Ma Westcott and I flew back to the ranch house to call the authorities. There wasn't much to be done, so I went to the cottage to turn in. Don't go in, Race. It's a nice night. It was rocky again. But this time he wasn't playing it on the physical side. He was using science. The science of a deadly automatic. It produced the desired chemical reaction. It dispelled my inclination to ignore him. I figured we might take a little walk down the road. I had a car there. We could take a spin the night air. Who knows? Might give you pneumonia. Or lead poisoning? Well, that's a possibility. You're a cinch to catch a fatal disease. Like Sylvia Towner? I got a theory about her race. I think you killed him. I think I can clear myself. Nah. You and Sylvia had quite a beef today. You were trying to get romantic in broad daylight, and the dame had to scratch you up a bit. Boris told me. You spent quite a yarn. Oh, it gets more interesting. Go ahead. She rides off. You wasn't around all afternoon, so it figures you followed her. I was in my cottage. Yeah, but the cops won't know that. You followed her, see? You was mad about them scratches on your pretty puss, and boom. You blew your top and killed her. You ought to change your brand, whatever you're smoking. You can't sell that to the police. Oh, I ain't finished. I'm coming to the best part. Goody. You went for a plane ride, and who spotted the body? You. That is something a guy always does to cover up. 
Only after the call for the bulls goes up, you get nervous. Yes. So you hop into your rented car, which I have down by the road. You drive out to a lonely spot. Then you take this automatic, which also happens to be yours. I just lifted it. And you blow your brains out. Neat? Very neat. But there's one weak point. Yeah? What? Your chin! <laughs> Give me that gun! Sure, here! <laughs> Missed again. Come on, let it go! <laughs> Into the bushes, Rocky! Race, what is it? Somebody with a long-range rifle trying to get into the act. Keep low. Give me the gun back so I can blast. Who's back? Mine? Keep low and stay happy. Whoever it is took a powder. It wouldn't stay around. Lights are going on near the other cottages. You're right. Now you can get lost, Rocky, and don't come back. You, my friend, are a real sweet pal. What's wrong, Marcus? Ah, uh, leave me out in that cactus with a dame who was in no condition to be company for me. And them coyotes howling. Well, thanks for lovely evening. It was fully as interesting here. Rocky had me set up for an obituary that would have blackened the family escutcheon. Talk English. You think Rocky croaked the dame? I don't know. Anybody could have done it. There are too many people and too many reasons. Even Robert Towner is a possibility. Sylvia's husband. He might be around someplace. But he's very unlikely. Why? Because he'd have no reason to be taking rifle shots at me or Rocky. I've got to find out who was behind that rifle. Who they were shooting at and why. You know something? If we toss this crowd into a mix, Master, we could whip up a dilly of a cake. Mark, tomorrow we start a mingle with the guests. Sooner or later, one of them will make a mistake. The next morning, a tennis match got underway, and I found myself teamed in the doubles with Fran Maitland. Our opponents were Olga and Boris Petrov. Nice recovery race. These are tough opponents. Watch it. Got it. Very good, Fran. And I get this race. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. Ah, that's the set for us. <laughs> Congratulations. You are still very good, Ray. Well, we had a win. I don't think I could leap that net as easily as you and Boris do it. Oh, it seems to me it's time for a little liquid refreshment. I'll go back to skeet shooting in the future. It's it's less strenuous. Hey, who is that on the horse? He comes like the pictures of the Pony Express. It's Buzz Westcott. Looks like there's something wrong. Oh, boy. Oh. You men better come help me. We've got to get a wagon. What's happened? It's that Mr. Rocker. Found him out on the range. He'd been shot. The bullet had gone through Big Rocky's back. And if he had known who fired it, it was knowledge he'd never pass on. He was dead. But his demise filled in one bit of information. He, and not I, had been the target of the long-range rifle of the night before. How long you reckon he's been dead, Rich? I should say since early this morning, about 5 a.m. Anybody who's conscious at that hour deserves to be shot. How can you say such a thing? Have you no heart? Well, God. All right, Svengali. This is no place to be choosing up sides. You fought with him yesterday, did you not, Rich? That I did, Boris. And I may fight with you today if you don't get out of the way and keep quiet. Look at this wound, Wesker. I won't bother Entered the back between the shoulder blades and came out through the stomach. It follows a downward course. Does that have a significance, Grace? Yes. It means that the shot might have been fired by somebody mounted. Well, might have come to the top of that hill there, too. That's possible. Well, here comes Ma. must have told her at the range. All of you. Get off the range and get back to the ranch and stay there. Mrs. Westcott, there's no point in blaming anybody for this until we... I thought... ain't blaming anybody but myself, Mr. Race. I never liked this guest business, and I'm closing it down today. Now, I want everybody off the place by sundown. Now, wait a minute. I reckon I got something to say about that. Well, you just reckon again. This ranch is mine until I die, and I ain't close to that yet. You don't like it, you can clear off through the rest. Now, load them on the wagon and follow me. I'll go with you, Mr. Westcott. I don't need an extra hand, Mr. Race. You can go back with your friends. I don't want you to put them off the ranch just yet. If you do, the murderer may never be caught. That's none of my affair. I ain't the sheriff. No, but you're a suspect. You, uh, mind explaining that? The shot that killed Rockland was fired from a point above and behind him. It could have been fired by a rider or from the top of a hill. It might also have been fired from a helicopter. I'd, uh, have to have a reason, wouldn't I? Your son might have been the reason. You told him to stay away from the guests. Sylvia Tonner fluctuated between loneliness and hysteria. Maybe Buzz was getting involved with her. That wouldn't make me kill Mr. Rockland. It's always easy to tie up a second murder if you have a motive for the first. Sort of got me corralled, haven't you, Mr. Ace? I don't like it, but that's the way it is. 
All right. I'll meet you halfway. Everybody can stay for 24 hours. <laughs> Listen, Ray, see off your rocker. What do you want to go ride in the night for? You're setting yourself up like a clay pigeon. It's the only way to play it. We haven't much time. You go into the house and just drop a hint that I've discovered something. It may force a move. Yeah, like the move Big Rocky got. He rode out of here, too, and he come back very unhealthy. Yes, he did, but... What's the matter? Rode out of here. Did he ride out? There was no horse near him, and it was too far for him to walk. I don't get it. He was packed out, Mark. He was killed here and carried out there. Get your flashlight out. Open that corral gate. Yeah, yeah. Look, what, is, what are you looking for? It's just a chance. I'll show you if I find it. One side, boy. Come here, fella. Come here. All right, Mark. Hold the light close. Yeah, yeah. No. Try that room there. Yeah, sure, but if you'd only tell yeah. me what... Here it is. Here it is. Look. All right, so he's got a streak of dirt on him. So what? It isn't dirt, Marcus. It's blood, dried blood on his hide. And now I know I'm mistaken. It... Well, what's that? I was looking for one murderer, and there were two, or rather, there were two. You mean Rocky was one of them? Yes. He killed Sylvia to keep her away from Boris. He was safe. There were other suspects with good motives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But who bought Rocky? We'll know within the hour. You're still going to spread a little propaganda in the ranch house. All right, sure. Well, what do you want me to say? Tell them that Rockland wasn't killed on the range. Tell them I'm checking the scene of the murder. Yeah, but Race, you don't know where. Yes, I do. Rocky was killed in his own cottage. That explains the course of the bullet. He was in bed asleep, and the murderer fired the rifle from the window above the head of the bed. Hey, John, let's go to Redmond. I'll stake myself out in his cottage. Go past the word. Race. I'm here, Fran. Couldn't we have a little light? We don't need it, baby. It's more romantic this way. Besides, I found what I was seeking. What did you find, Race? I dug a rifle slug out of Rocky's mattress. It was clever of you to change the linens. What made you suspect me? Rocky was a rough customer. Your infatuation with Boris was wearing thin. You wanted to dump him. That didn't gel with Rocky's plan, so he made threats. But you beat him to the gun. I'm a determined woman. You should get to know me better. I don't think I'd get to know you for very long, though. My divorce settlement is quite liberal, Race. I, I might make you forget a lot of things. Money and me. That should be a tempting combination. Money and you are tempting. But I imagine there's a rather forbidding pistol in your hand, isn't there? Yes. I tried to be more clever the last time. The rifle seemed to be a rather unlikely weapon for a woman to use. Not for you, Fran. You made a mistake. You mentioned skeet shooting as one of your favorite pastimes. Why don't you move out of the shadows, Race? To give you a better shot? That might make it quick and painless. I have some bad news for you, Fran. Mark Donovan steered you here deliberately. And right at this moment, he's outside the window drawing a bead on you through the screen. That's right, sister. Oh, you... Ah! Oh, help me. Take it easy, Fran. I only meant the winger. That's all you did. She's fainted. She'll live to stand trial. Oh. Well, you sure got that alga dame out of a pickle. I wonder, Mark. Boris has nobody to run to now. So he'll stick to her for a while. It'll give her a chance to be miserably happy for a little longer. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. But, uh, Grace, will you tell me something? I should be delighted, old boy. Look, look, look. Why did a nice thing always marry Hilton? Huh? That is one of the mysteries of life, Mark. One of the major mysteries of life. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Lynn Allen, Charlotte Lawrence, Alice Drake, Michael Ann Barrett, and Tom Holland. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmarns. Be sure to be with us again this time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Mark Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It was Gilbert and Sullivan who said, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one, end quote. But tonight, just on the stroke of eight, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite ferreter of felonies, is seated in his apartment. He looks down on the bay at the masthead lights rising and falling with the swell as Phyllis, his easy-on-the-eyes associate, does things with eggs in the tiny kitchen, a kitchen which hangs like an eyebrow on the forehead of Telegraph Hill. Uh, yes, Angel? How's the shoulder? It's fine. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, it's pretty good. Why? Ah, uh, because I think you're using it as an excuse to get me over here every night to fix your dinner. Well, Angel, some fellows have etchings. I use scrambled eggs. Uh-huh. Well, from tonight on, if I come over to your apartment, it's to be as a guest. You're going to do cooking. Oh, Angel. I mean it. I'm through being a detective by day and a cook at night. All right, come and get it. Oh, boy. Hello. Hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Inspector. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to sit down to a plate of scrambled eggs. Why? I got a body. <laughs> you sound like something out of a horror film instead of Inspector of Homicide. What kind of a body? It's been in the water a week or so. It looks like an accident. Autopsy surgeon seems to think it was an accident. Sergeant here says it was an accident, but... Uh... You think it's murder? Could be, Mike. Where are you? You know where Olium is? Right on San Pablo Bay? Yes. I'll have the police boat pick you up at the jetty. Oh, swell. The sergeant will pick you up as fast as he can get there. Well, uh, give me two more seconds. Two more seconds? Yes, Inspector. One second for each egg. There she is. Pull alongside. Are we going aboard that yacht? Yeah, the inspection board. Ah, it's a trim-looking craft. Yeah, about 200,000 bucks worth. Hi there. Can you make it up the ladder or do you want a bosun's chair? Oh, half an hour aboard ship and he talks like an admiral. <laughs> we'll use the ladder, Inspector. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter, Angel? Can't cook his own dinner because of a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he can climb a ship's ladder. Well, I... Okay, okay, you go first, Mike. Okay. Well, kids, you made good time. Mm hmm. Sergeant brought us up the bay as if he knew every wave. He does. Born and raised at San Rafael. Well, <laughs> where's the body? On the engine room hatch. Mm hmm. Any uh, wounds? One blow on the head, which could have been made if he had fallen off the rocks. Water in the lungs? Yeah, Phil. Oh, so he was alive when he hit the water. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Dressed in sailor pants, a reefer jacket, scarf. 
shoes don't look like a sailor's. Uh, what besides the shoes make you suspect murder, Inspector? A dead man's hands, Mike. No calluses. And the nails have been manicured. Mm. Sailors don't have soft hands and manicured nails. Well, good work, Inspector. Good work. But uh, how come uh, you're aboard this ship? Is the owner aboard? No, Mike. But we've sent for him. We came aboard because the Bay Patrol found the body near the ship. And because of this. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. The North Star, owner Nelson Carter. And this is the North Star? Yeah, Phil. Autopsy surgeon said the body has been in the water about ten days. Oh, it's pretty hard to identify him now. Any missing persons reported? I don't know. The sergeant checked with the missing persons bureau when he went back to pick you up. Yes, sir. Nobody reported missing, Inspector. Say, uh, who's aboard? I noticed the anchor light is trimming clear. No smudge on the glass. Must have been lighted tonight. That's right, Mike. Captain is aboard, also the quartermaster. Oh, I don't see any cabin light. No, Phil, the portholes are covered with heavy green curtains. Uh, did you uh, question the captain and the quartermaster? Yeah, Mike. Very noncommittal gents. Said they didn't know the dead man. Never seen him before. Didn't know anything about him, and then they both retired to their cabins. Well, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? No, uh, not particularly. Well, most people are inquisitive, Inspector, especially about anything that smells of murder. Inspector, did you search the ship? Yeah, they're doing quite a bit of repair work. Huh? Placing all the paneling in the stateroom and so on. Oh, uh, Inspector, did you take a look at the uh, ship's log? No. After all, Mike, we really haven't anything definite to go on, not even a legitimate reason to suspect murder. I think we have. Well, so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent for you. But to try and tie the murder up with the captain or... With the ship, even. But I do tie it up with the ship, in a way. What do you mean, Mike? Point number one. We're agreed that this dead man isn't a sailor because of his hands. Uh -huh. Agreed. Point number two. We think that these sailors' clothes aren't his clothes, all except the shoes. Oh, yes, Mike, but I still don't see how dead you... Dead men can change clothes, Angel. Oh. So that suggests uh, violence. Now, take a look at the inside of that right trouser leg. Mm -hmm. You see that uh, smear of orangey red? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. So what? Well, that was made by red lead. The stuff they use to keep iron and steel from rusting. Go on, Mike. Now, take a look at these stanchions on the port side. Freshly painted with red lead. I didn't notice that before. Well, neither did I until right now. But you'll notice, Inspector, that there's no trace of red lead on the inside of either of the dead man's shoes. I see what you mean. To get that smear on the pants legs, whoever was wearing those pants would be sure to get some on their shoes. Right, Inspector, if he were wearing them voluntarily. Now, that smear suggests that he was carried. So I give you a suggestion. The murdered man was stripped of his own clothes, then these sailors' clothes were slipped on him and he was dumped into the bay. And these sailors' clothes came from this ship? Yes, Inspector, yes, these clothes are from this ship. And for that reason, I think we should question our four suspects. Four suspects? I... I don't get you, Mike. Four suspects? Yes, yes. The captain, the quartermaster, the owner. Yeah. And the fourth? The fourth is the ship's carpenter. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the news you've all been waiting for. Post-war gasoline is here. Right now, as we speak these words, Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries are shifting to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, you'll be able to buy a new 76 gasoline that will knock your hat off. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are hurrying it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil Minuteman hasn't received his first shipment of this powerful new gasoline yet, he will within the next two weeks. And just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up. And then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. <laughs> Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are still aboard the yacht North Star. The dead man's body still lies on the engine room hatch as Mike knocks on the captain's cabin door. What do you want? This is the inspector of homicide. I'd like to talk to you again. Well, I won't say glad to see you because I'm not. 
I won't say sit down because I'm hoping you won't stay long. We've uh, sent for the owner, and I thought we could save time by asking you a few questions. Who are you? I'm Mike Shane, private detective. I don't know that I got to answer any of your questions. Oh, you don't, of course, but I'd like to ask one question anyway. Well? Where's your master's certificate? Why, you went... And don't tell us it's in the chart house, because uh, we looked there. Now, Captain, you may not like to answer Mike's questions, but I think you'd better answer mine. Where is that certificate? Here in the drawer. I haven't had time to put it up yet. I only took over this ship yesterday. Oh, only yesterday, huh? Yes. I answered an ad in the paper. The man wanted a navigator to be captain of his private yacht. I got the job. What about the crew? Only need three. I'll pick them up in San Francisco tomorrow. What about your quartermaster? Is he a new man, too? Yes, I hired him yesterday. you got there, Sergeant? Ship's carpenter named Wilkinson. What about the owner, Carter? Couldn't you find him? No, he's down in South America. Been there for three months. What's that? I said the owner of the North Star's been in South America for the past three months. But that's impossible. I spoke to him a couple of days ago when he hired me. Uh That's what Carter's secretary says, and he ought to know. I brought him along in case you wanted to ask any questions. Mm -hmm. Who else is that in the police launch? Well, the woman is Mrs. Carter. Oh, has she heard from her husband lately? No, not for three weeks. Mike. Yes, Angel. You and I have the same idea. I'm beginning to have the same feeling, kids. Well, let's have the secretary up first and have him look at the body. What's his name? Jackson. Mr. Jackson, will you come up the ladder, please? I wonder... Yeah, Mike? I wonder if the ship's carpenter is one of the old crew or a new man. Did you know him, Captain? one of the old crew. I didn't hire him. You want to me, Sergeant? Ah, uh, yes. This is Inspector Homicide. How do you do? Mike Shane. Hello. Miss Knight. How do you do? I wonder if you'd come over this way, Mr. Jackson, to the engine room hatch. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, uh, why, well, that's... That's... Mr. Carter? Yes, that's Mr. Carter. Hmm. Inspector. Yes, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion. Shoot. I think we should take the body back to San Francisco. Yes? Then we should take everybody, and I mean everybody, to police headquarters. Sit down, Mr. Wright. You're a carpenter on the North Star. Yes, sir. Tell me, how long since you were aboard? Well, nigh three months, sir. Not since Mr. Carter left. Is that right? That's right, miss. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, take a look at this reefer jacket. Hey. Hey, that's mine, sir. I left it in my bunk. And these pants? Mine, too. But there wasn't no red lead on them when I laid them on the bunk. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Carter say anything to you about redecorating or repairing the paneling in the staterooms? No, miss, not to me, he didn't. And uh, you think he would have, if that's what he wanted done? I think so. But uh, Mr. Carter was always one to be full of surprises. He could have done it without saying anything to me. You don't know of any reason why anyone should want to kill him? Not me, sir. I didn't know anything about his private life, only as the owner of the North Star. Did he and his wife use the North Star much? Oh, yes, quite a bit. Sailed a couple of times to a wire with her, lots of trips to Vancouver, B.C., He was in the shipping business, you know. Yeah. Well, Mike, unless you have any more questions... Uh, Yes, just one. Where was the North Star anchored the last time you were aboard? She was tied up at her own jetty, three miles northeast of Olium. Oh, so she's been moved in the past three months. Yes, miss, out into the middle of the bay and about uh, three miles south. Uh Uh-huh, I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Wright. The sergeant will show you out. And bring in Mrs. Carter, sergeant. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mrs. Carter. I know this has been quite an ordeal. You identified your husband? Yes. We suspect murder, Mrs. Carter. Have you any reason to suspect anyone? No, my husband hasn't... hadn't an enemy in the world that I know of. You thought he was still in South America? Yes, although I haven't had a letter for a month. 
I, I used to hear from him regularly every week. I suppose you inherit your husband's property, Mrs. Carter? I suppose I do. Half of it is mine anyway. I inherited it from my mother. Did, um... Did your husband say anything about repairing or redecorating the paneling in the salons? No. But that reminds me of something. Yes, Mrs. Carter? Well, I heard Mr. Jackson talking to someone on the phone the other day about paneling. I didn't know what he was talking about, but then I paid very little attention to my husband's business. I see. And you can't help us anymore? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid not. If I think of anything, I'll call you, Inspector. Thank you. The sergeant will show you out. Bring in the captain, sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, we may be out to call on you, Mrs. Carter. It might be necessary to search your husband's papers. Certainly, Mr. Shane. Sit down, Captain. Thanks. I take it that if you only took over command of the ship yesterday, you haven't given any orders? No, I spent yesterday and today checking supplies, looking over the ship's gear. You knew nothing about uh, the replacing of the salon paneling? Oh, yes, yes. The man I thought was the owner told me he was having it replaced and the workman already knew what to do. And this man that you thought was the owner, what did he look like? I don't know. I never saw him. But you said you spoke to him when he hired you. I spoke to him on the phone. Aha. Now we get somewhere. What was his phone number? I don't know. He called me. I wrote him an answer to his advertisement and put my phone number in the letter. Called me on the phone and told me to report aboard yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's all you know? That's all I know. I saw the ad, answered it, and he told me the berth was mine. I came aboard, and that's that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I guess you'd better get back aboard ship. I'll wait for the quartermaster. I'm sure he doesn't know any more than I do. As you wish, Captain. You're quite certain that the quartermaster doesn't know anything. How can he? I picked him up on the waterfront this afternoon. He's only been aboard a few hours. I see. All right, Sergeant. We'll see Mr. Jackson next. Uh, just a second, Inspector. Yes, Mike. I think maybe we ought to take a trip out to Mr. Carter's home before we talk to Jackson. All right, Mike. Keep Jackson and the quartermaster till we get back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Yes, Inspector. Get out into the corridor and see if the captain and Jackson or the quartermaster get to talking. Right, Inspector. Atta boy, Inspector. Uh, are you serious about going out to Carter's place? Well, yes, honey, why? Well, I've been following your advice, Mike. Yes, Angel? I've been listening to the tone of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the captain is lying. Or at least not telling the whole truth. Why, Phil? Well, he said he hadn't given any orders since he went aboard. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd been checking stores and looking over the ship's gear, but... Well, then why who do you... painted the stanchions with red lead? The captain? Those stanchions were still damp. Well, it takes red lead quite a time to dry, but Angel... Angel, I think you have something there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know quite what it is, but you have something. Thanks, Mrs. Carter, for waiting up for us. Oh, not at all. Naturally, I'm anxious to do anything I can to help find my husband's murderer. Hmm? I'm afraid I, I hardly realize he's dead. Yes, there isn't much we can say, Mrs. Carter, except that we'll get his murderer if anybody can. This is... this was my husband's office, his home office. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson always worked here when my husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd better check the desk first. Bill, you take the straw, Inspector. I, I don't know any about shipping schedules. Say, Mike. Phil, yeah. hmm? what is it? Here's the North Star's clearance to leave her jetty on the... an anchor in the bay. Dated the 26th of last month. Well, it might mean something. We'll, uh, we'll remember that. Hey, what have you got there, Mike? Well, something not quite on the up and up, I think. In the fireplace there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Burned envelopes and letters. Here, Inspector. Yeah. Here, if that isn't part of a Panama stamp, Panama. then I don't... That's where my husband was when I last heard from him. Well, this was mail the 21st. Airmail. The last I received was the 18th. Mail the 21st, and the North Star changed her moorings on the 26th. Yes, Angel, yes. Just time to receive this letter and change the ship's moorings. Does that mean something? It uh, depends, Mrs. Carter. It depends. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. I think we should pay a visit to the North Star's jetty, three miles northeast of Oleum, as I remember it.
We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who may have tuned in late, we are repeating the announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries have been shifted to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, depending on your locality, you'll be able to buy a powerful new 76 gasoline that beats all pre-war performance. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are delivering it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil man hasn't received his first shipment of this sensational new 76 gasoline, he will within the next few weeks. Just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new post-war 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are facing one of their most baffling mysteries. A murder with apparently no motive and no clues. We pick them up at the jetty where the North Star is usually tied up. Well, there's not a thing that I can see. Bare jetty. Odds and ends of rope, freshly painted staunch. Yes. Everything connected with the North Star seems to lead to staunch. What, what is it, Mike? Look. Look. A piece of red glass. Looks like part of a ship's lantern. Port lantern. A natural deduction, Inspector, since we're on a jetty. But look again. Then look at the railing here. Hmm? A long scratch with paint rubbed into it? Yeah. A scratch made by an automobile bumper and rear fender. Yes. When the car was backed up to turn around, whoever was driving scuffed along the rail and broke this tail lamp glass. Sergeant. Uh, yeah, Mike. Check with Mrs. Carter's car, Jackson's car, and uh, the captain's if he has one. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. But uh, first get hold of Chips. Chips? Uh, the ship's carpenter, Mr. Wright. Oh. Get hold of him and tell him to meet us aboard the North Star as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then? And then... Then bring everybody back out to the ship, but not before you've checked all the automobiles. Yeah, Mike. And what's our move, Mike? Back aboard the North Star and lay a trap for a murderer. Oh, that constant creaking of the ship gets me. I think we're in luck. I don't believe the captain or the quartermaster are back on the... No, Mike. Captain said he was going to wait for the quartermaster, so they're both back at headquarters. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. What are you looking for, Mike? I don't know. But I'm giving these port stanchions the once over. Say. What? You see that dark stain on the deck? Yeah. Sure. What about it? You know what made that? No. Do you? No, but I'll make a good guess. Fresh water. Fresh water? Yes. Deck should always be washed down with salt water. It leaves them white and sparkling. Fresh water makes them dark. Yeah, but even so much. Shh, shh, shh. I hope this is Chips, our ship's carpenter. Oh, there! Oh, Scar! Yeah. Here's the line. Try up and come aboard. All right. All right. All right, mate. Well, what can I do for now, you? Tell me, what will dissolve red lead? Red lead? Why, oil will if it ain't too old. And you've got to scrape it. Uh, take a look at the stanchion. Oh, what? That off in no time. You've got oil aboard? Sure thing. Okay, let's get going. All right, sir. Now, now for a quick look at the salon. You know, this was a pretty cleverly conceived murder. If that body hadn't been found for a week or two, there would have been no trace of this murder at all. There isn't much trace even now, Mike. Well, not enough for your district attorney or grand jury, but enough for me. And I think we can trap the murderer without too much difficulty. Well, this is the salon in here. Oh, oh what a beautiful place. Yes. Doesn't seem to me that the paneling needs redecorating. Uh-uh. But I tell you what it does look like, Mike. Yeah? Looks as if the paneling had been torn out in the search for something. The ship's safe, perhaps? Mm. Could be, or something hidden behind the paddling. There goes Chips. <sighs> Why do you call him Chips? His name is Wright. All ship's carpenters are called Chips. At least in the books I read. Well, here we are. I found these rags in the captain's cabin. Good. Look like they've been used for the same job before. Let me see those. Hmm. Blood? I think so. Here, use this one. All right, sir. This is going to make a mess of the deck. Well, okay. uh, that's all right. All right. Do, do I hear a boat coming? Yeah, I hear it too, Phil. Hurry, Chips, hurry. 
Get some more of that red lead off. All right, sir. I'm going like the roaring 40s, I am. Ah, that's the stuff. You got it down to the old paint there in spots. He was right off when it's still soft this way. Ahoy, the star! I up and come aboard, Sergeant. Bring everybody aboard with you. I think this ought to do it. Hey, 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 what's going on there? You'll ruin that deck. I think this deck's already been ruined, Captain. But let that go for a moment. The uh, inspector had you all brought out here to see what we were doing. Yeah, what are you doing? We're taking off the last few layers of red lead that somebody put on this stanchion. Now, would you know who did it? And you did it, Captain? You've been aboard two days and this red lead was still soft and wet. Could it have been put on without your knowing about it? Red lead often takes a week to dry. That stanchion hasn't been painted since I came aboard. That stanchion is the clue to this killing. What do you mean? Mr. Carter was killed aboard his own ship. Oh, Mr. He was probably hit on the head with a marlin spike, but that's beside the point. The main point is that while his killers were changing his clothes, putting the ship's carpenter's clothes on him, he bled quite a bit. Some blood was spattered on the deck. The killers tried to clean that with fresh water. Yeah. Then they were afraid that some of his blood was on the freshly painted stanchion. So after they'd thrown his body overboard, they repainted the stanchion. But not before they got a smear of red lead on the pants leg as they heaved him overboard. Oh, but who would do such a thing? My husband... The captain, for one, Mrs. Carter, and I think the sergeant has the answer to the other. Right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, we found the car. The car? What car? Yes, Captain, the car which was used to take Mr. Carter out to the jetty while the North Star was still tied up there. That car has a broken taillight and a badly scraped fender. And it is where, Sergeant? In Mr. Jackson's garage. Jackson, you fool, I told you... Shut up, you idiot. Cut out the arguing. You'll need all the arguments you can scrape together when you face the jury. Okay, Sergeant, you can handle them. Tastes good. Nearly six in the morning and I'm hungry. You know, I was afraid that the inspector wasn't going to get a confession from those two, the captain and Jackson. They were tough monkeys. Oh, not so tough, really. They had just spent so much time plotting and carrying out this murder that they, they couldn't realize they were trapped. Oh, such a senseless murder, too, Mike. All murders are senseless, honey. But I don't think they started out with the idea of murder in mind. As I see it, the secretary of Jackson had uh, made several trips on the North Star. He knew that wherever they went, Mr. Carter always had plenty of ready cash. Mm -hmm. He just got the idea in the back of his head that the money was hidden somewhere on board. He didn't know where, but uh, when Carter went to Central and South America, he determined to make a haul. Mm -hmm. So when the crew was on vacation, he got together with this man who called himself the captain. They started taking the salon apart, huh? Right, Angel, right. Jackson needed someone who knew something about ships. And then when he saw from the mail that Carter was coming home, he, he got panicky and destroyed the letters to Mrs. Carter? Mm-hmm. He met the unsuspecting Carter when he arrived, took him out to the jetty where the North Star was berthed, set out into the middle of the bay and killed him. Ah, oh, dressing him in the carpenter's clothes so if he were found, nobody could identify him. Mm-hmm. I see. Have some more coffee, Mike? Sure thing, Angel. How's the shoulder after the night's excitement? Oh, pretty good, but... I still think you'll have to come over for a few nights and fix dinner for me. I will not. You can eat out if you're too lazy to fix your own dinner. You know, I've been thinking, Mike. Yes, Angel? Wouldn't it be nice to have a yacht like the North Star and go any place any time you wanted to? Oh, I don't know. Look what happened to Mrs. Carter. She lost her husband on account of the North Star. <laughs> of course, darling. I don't have a husband. Well, don't give up hope, Angel. Now, if you were to fix my dinners for the next few weeks... Mike Shane, I believe that's all you think about in a wife, a good cook. Oh, no, Angel, not quite. But uh, being a good cook is a good recommendation. <laughs> Before we sign off, I'd like to repeat the special announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. As fast as Union Oil Company's trucks can haul it, a powerful new 76 gasoline is being delivered to your Minuteman stations. Watch for the signs to go up at all Union Oil stations, announcing the first shipment of the new 76 gasoline. Then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of powerful post-war gasoline, soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Tune in 
Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Written and produced by David Taylor, tonight's story was based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Bill, Jerry, that was a gunshot. Let's hit the store again, Jerry. Okay, Bill. That did it. Yes, but, oh, darling, look. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denny. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Saint of George Street. Twice a day, morning and evening, five days a week for five years, Fran Leland has traveled from George Street to work in the offices of Gerald North Publisher and home again. In a few moments, she will be making the trip once more. This time, though, it will be different. Fran is going back to George Street to stay. But first, there is one last goodbye to be said. Hi. Oh, Mrs. Leland. Come in. I'm leaving now, Mr. North, but I wanted to stop and say goodbye. Tell you how much I've enjoyed working here. Well, thanks, Mrs. Leland. Oh, uh, you've met Mrs. North, haven't you? Oh, yes. Hello, Mrs. Leland. Mrs. Leland and her husband are going into business for themselves, Pam. Really? Oh, that's wonderful, Mrs. Leland. What, what kind of business? Well, it's nothing much, Mrs. North. Ray and I are opening a little variety store on George Street. Oh, you must be terribly excited. Mm-hmm. And, and, and scared. <laughs> Every penny Ray and I have been able to save in the last five years is tied up in that store. Oh, you'll make out. Of course you will. Oh, but I know how you feel. Jerry, remember when you went into business for yourself? Oh. <laughs> we were so frightened we couldn't eat. Oh, which was just as well because we didn't have money to buy any food. <laughs> uh, Mr. and Mrs. North, Ray and I are giving a little party at the store tomorrow evening, the night before our official opening. Just a few people, friends and neighbors and other storekeepers on George Street. I'd like to have you come. Why, we'd love to, Mrs. Leland. Oh, you bet. Thank you. And stop being frightened and just be excited. Your store is going to be a huge success. I just know it. Oh, I hope so, Mrs. North. I hope so. Ah, there. How's that, hon? Oh. Just right. And how about a kiss for your big businessman husband, eh? Well... Come here, you. <laughs> oh, Fran, honey, why the tears? I- I'm just so happy, that's all. <laughs> oh, darling, hold me just for a minute. Sure, baby, sorry. Uh, so this is the way you run a business, <laughs> eh? Papa, Papa, Gino! <laughs> I bring the wind over the party tonight. Hey, maybe we got to have a glass right now, huh? Just the three of us. No, 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 no. I got to get back next door. Miss Solomon, she just to bring in the kids' shoes. Six pay, half salts and ease. I got to have them today, Papa used to say. <laughs> and, of course, you said, all right, Mrs. Solomon. <laughs> What's it to do but to do it? <laughs> I'll take the wine in back. Okay, hon. Hey. Hey, Gino. Look here. Huh? Come here, look. It's something you haven't seen. <laughs> just delivered a little while ago. Hey, how about it, huh? Ramon, she's beautiful. Yeah? Listen. Oh, she's just on the real good, the real good. <laughs> the music, music this side ahead. Oh, what's that? Hiya, Papa. How's Crick? Okay. But to you, the name's Mr. Favari, not the Papa. <laughs> yeah? Well, okay, Papa. Hello, Mr. Leland. I'd better get back and fix the shoes for Miss Solomon. Yeah, see you later, Gino. Swell old guy, ain't he? 
Everybody likes old Gino. Yeah, what can I do for you, Mr... Davis. Deke Davis. Nice place you got here. Thanks, but... To... Open for business tomorrow, I hear. That's right. Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Leland, you being new on George Street, you probably don't know how things operate down here. Operate? I don't understand you. Well, it's this way, Mr. Leland. We got an organization here on George Street. You know, a sort of a club to help the people. It's called the George Street Political Association. I'm not interested in politics. Ah, oh, sure you are, Mr. Leland. You gotta be. George Street's a funny place. Things can happen. Someday a bunch of kids might come in here and start fooling around. And, well, you know how some of these punks are. They might tip over a counter and do a lot of damage. Now, the association doesn't want that to happen. So we're putting you down for, oh, say, 50 a month. So that's it. That's what, Mr. Leland? The old protection racket. <laughs> protection racket? Nah, nah, you got it all Get wrong. Get out of here. Now, just a minute, fella. You, you heard me out. Take your hands off me. All right, right mister, you're asking for it. Ray. Ray, what in the you world? Stay, stay out of this, honey. Now, listen, you. You get up, get out, and stay out. You shouldn't have done this, fella. Ask your wife. She knows George Street. She'll tell you all about it. You know what that guy tried I to... I know. Everybody on George Street knows Deke Davis. Who he is, what he is, who he works for. But I'm afraid he's right. Ray, you shouldn't have done that. No, Gino, I want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. North. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. North is Gino for party. How do you do? You are the man Francesca's work of <laughs> That's right. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. North. Francesca, she's telling me all the time what a nice man you are. You know, Gino practically raised Fran after her mother and father died. Yeah. She's a wonderful girl. And you should listen to her, Raymond. Listen? You tell me what do you do to Dick Davis. Oh, if he'd have got out like I told him to, I wouldn't have had to sock him. Well, this sounds interesting. Oh, my goodness, Mr. Leland, what happened? Oh, a mug named Dick Davis come in this afternoon trying to sell me protection. Protection? Yeah, you know, the old Dodge. Of course, he didn't call it protection. He, he wanted me to join an outfit called the George Street Political Association. Fifty bucks a month. Today. Raymond. Raymond, do it. Huh? All the people, everyone with the store, they all belong. Belong? You, you mean they pay? All right, all right, they pay then, but it's a best, Raymond. I know. I have my shoe shop on George Street for 25 years, I know. $50 a month, she's a lot of money, but... Well, I know that too, but... Look, Gino, it's not just a dough. You bet it's a lot, especially when friend of me are just getting started, but it's... it's... Well, it's the principle of the thing. I think you're absolutely right, Mr. Lee. Oh, Mr. North, maybe he's right. But sometimes being right... Is... Oh, come on, Gino. Let's break it up, huh? How about getting Mr. and Mrs. North some of your vino, huh? Okay. I'll be right back. He makes the stuff himself. Wait till you taste it. Wow. He seems like a wonderful man. Oh, uh, it's just a word for Gino, Mrs. North. Wonderful. The saint of George Street. That's that's Papa Fafari. Ray. Uh, Ray. What is it, honey? Darling, that, that car out in front. Car? Look. What about it? It drove up a couple of minutes ago. There are a couple of kids in it, and they just keep staring in at us. Oh, now look, honey, don't Ray, get... look out! Oh, get away from that window, Pam. What, what happened? The man in that car just tossed a brick through it. A dirty little rat. Ray, no! Stay here! Please, Ray, stay in here! What do you think, Hollister? Yeah, I think you'd better get a new window, Mr. Leland. That's real funny. What about the guys who heaved that brick? What about them? Aren't you going to try to find them? Sure, I'm going to try. Oh, real hard, it sounds like. Hey, Mom. Look, Mr. Leland, me and my partner have seven cases already. This one makes eight. You'll get your share of the time, but that's the best we can do. What about this guy, Deke Davis? He's behind this. We'll question him. We won't get any answers, and he'll have an alibi, and even if we arrest him, Sam James will have him out on bail in an hour. Sam James? Mm -hmm. Who's he? The president of the George Street Political Association. Bird, who's really behind this? 
Deke Davis is just an errand boy. Well, look, Detective Hollister, if, if you know so much about this racket, why can't you do something about it? Racket, Mr. North? What racket? Mr. Leland here was asked to join a club. He refused his window was smashed. Well, that wasn't just coincidence. I know it, you know it, Papa Fafari knows See? it. And so does Mr. Leland. But what we know and what I need to make an arrest aren't the same thing. Uh-huh. So there's nothing you can do, huh? That's about it, Mr. Leland. I'm sorry, well, but... there's something I can do. I'm not going to take this line down. But I'm, uh, I'm going to fight back. How, Mr. Leland? I don't know, Mr. North. But I'm going to fight. And that's the whole rotten story, Bill. Ray Leland needs help. All the help he can get. But what can I do, Jerry? This is homicide. Investigating broken windows is a little out of our jurisdiction. Now, don't you start being facetious, Bill Wigan. I'm sorry, Pam, but now, I... Now, look, Bill. You have a pretty good entree to the commissioner's office, don't you? Well, yes. Well, Ray I... Leland is trying to organize a protest meeting, Bill. A meeting of all the merchants on George Street. He, he thinks it would help if he could announce that some important police official, perhaps even the commissioner, would be at the meeting and speak. Well, okay, Jerry. I'll see what I can do. Thanks, Bill. But there's just one thing... Now, is Leland sure he can organize a meeting? No, Bill, he isn't. But he says he can be sure that he can guarantee it if he can talk an old fellow named Gino Fafari into helping him. Look, Raymond, what do you do? That's your business. But they won't listen to me, Gino. Well, do you blame them? No, Fran, I don't blame them. They don't know me, but, Gino, they do know you. And they... they know George Street. They know this racket is just as much a part of the street as the rest of the dirt and filth. Darling, you're not the first man who thought he could change things here. There was a man named Allegro. Gino remembers him. Allegro. <laughs> See, si, I remember. He tried to fight Sam James, and then one night he was run down by a car. A hit-and-run accident, the police had to call it, even though they they and everybody else knew it was murder. Darling, if Allegro couldn't win, you can't. She's a right, Ramon. Oh, you don't really believe that, Gino. You just want to believe it, because... Because why? Because I'm scared. Say, I'm scared, Ramon, that I'm not ashamed of it. Well, neither am I. I'm scared, too. But there's a difference between being afraid and being a coward. Uh, Ray! A coward? I'm sorry, Gino, I... I shouldn't have. <laughs> Me? Gin of a fairy, a coward? I'll tell you something. Something I never tell before. In Italy, 30 years ago, I fight the fascist. I'm a put in a prison. I'm a beaten and a tortured. I'm going to be shot, but I escape and I go on fighting the black shirts until... Then I... fight them again, Gino. You know. That's what these guys are. Sam James, Dick Davis, all of them. They're black shirts. They're fascisti. But I'm an old man. All you have to do is talk to the others who own shops on this street. Just just ask them to come to the meeting tomorrow night. Don't do it, Gino. Don't let him talk Shut to me. Shut up, Fran. Into... How about it, Gino? All right, Raymond. All right. I'm sorry, Francesca, but... Well, what's to do but to do it? Come in. Well, come on, let's have it. What's happening? Nothing good, Sam. Papa Fafari was in every store on the street this morning. Papa Fafari? And everybody's going to be at that meeting tonight just because he asked them to come. They'll be hanging from the chandeliers. And look at this. A handbill that guy Leland's got out. Sam James must go. George Street merchants are through... Ah... They're all over the street. And I hear some people named North have promised the Fari and Leland that the police commission will be at the meeting. What are we going to do, Sam? Pour me a drink. Sam, you got to listen. Pour. Sure, Sam, sure. Here, Sam. <coughs> well, the street's got to be taught a lesson, Dick. Like when that Allegro guy, when we got him? No, no, we don't have to go that far. Not yet. But somebody's got to get hurt. Leland? Huh? No. Papa. Oh, Gino? Oh, now wait, Sam. You know how the street feels about that sure, old guy. Sure, sure, I know. And that's why he's our boy. And the street will realize if it can happen to Papa Fafari, it can happen to any of them. Now take care of it. I don't like it, Sam. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm just telling you to take care of it. Okay, Sam. And Deke. Yeah? I just want Fafari hurt, and that's all, understand? 
So when you go calling on them, be sure you leave your hardware at home. Popper in the hospital is one thing. Popper in the morgue is another. practically filled. Uh-huh. Oh, Jerry, look, there's Mrs. Leland. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go over and speak to her. Hello, Mrs. Leland. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. North, I didn't see you come in. How are you, Mrs. Leland? I'm all right. Is uh, Mr. Leland here? Yes, he's down in the front of the hall talking to some men. Oh, well, uh, why don't we all go down no, and have... No, no, I want to stay here, Mr. North. I'm waiting for Mr. Fafari. What? Isn't he here yet? No, and I can't understand it. I've called his shop, but... He doesn't answer. I'm worried. Oh, well, now, I'm sure everything's Mr. going to be... Mr. North, please. Is there a Mr. North in the hall? And Jerry, that man's asking for you. Mr. North. Yes, sir, right here. You're wanted on the telephone, Mr. North. Oh. You can take it back there. The pay phone on the wall to your right. All right, thank you. Well, who are you supposed to be calling you here? Well, there's only one way to find out. Excuse me. Hello. Jerry, this is Bill. Bill, where are you? Still in my office. Now, look, Jerry, something's happened. I just received a call from the George Street Precinct about this shoe repair man, Gino Fafari. Yeah, what about him? Well, about 20 minutes ago, he was found in the alley between his shop and the Leland store. Dead. Dead? Yeah. He'd been beaten up, then shot. <laughs> You big, stupid moron, do you realize what you've done? Uh, I had to do it, Sam. I had to. Had to, had to. You couldn't handle that old coat without plugging him? Uh, let me tell you what happened, will you? I know what happened. You killed a guy. You murdered a man. And if they catch you, you'll go to the chair so fast. Uh... Sam, will you listen Look, to what I... Look, I told you not to pack around, didn't I? Now answer me, didn't I? Yes, Sam, yes. Yeah. Well, why didn't you do like I said? If you'll just listen, Sam, the old guy pulled a knife on me. So you shot him. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to kill him. But he's dead. Now oh. stop blubbering. Now stop. Now, give me that gun. Why? Give me it. Here. Where'd you get it? From a guy when I was out in Chicago last summer. Oh, is there a number on it? I filed them off. Well, then it can't be traced back to you. No. That rod could belong to anybody. Okay, now get rid of it. Now take it down to the river. No. No, I don't trust you. I'll do it myself. Oh, I'll do it, Sam. I said I'll do it. Now, you're going to need an alibi. I can fix that. Now, it's got to be good. It's got to be solid and airtight. Oh, it will be. Okay. Then with this gun in the river, we're set. Now, just keep your head, Dick. Now, don't get the jumps. Don't get rattled, and then they can't touch us. Oh, Gino. Gino. Jerry, get Leland away from here, will you? Sure, Bill. I'll take him into his store. <laughs> Pam's there with Mrs. Leland. Okay, I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Come on, Mr. Leland. We're just in the way out here. Let's let's go on into the store. This is my fault, Mr. North. I shouldn't have left him alone. I didn't think they'd try anything with Gino. Is that you, Jerry? Yes, Pam. Is Fran in the back room, Mrs. North? Yes, she is. I want to see her. How is she, Pam? She just sits, Jerry. She won't say a word. She sits and stares into space. Uh, come on. Fran? Fran, honey, please listen Don't to me. Don't touch me, Ray. Fran, you... you... had to be a hero. You and your principal. Well, your precious principal just killed one of the sweetest old men who ever lived. Look, Mrs. Leland, the police will get the men responsible for this. That won't bring Gino back. No, And don't you... kid yourself. The police won't get them. This is George Street, Mr. North. George Street. Sam James and his gang will get away with this just the way they've gotten away with everything else. Not this time. I'll get Sam James if it's the last thing I ever do. Now, just a minute, Leland. Get out of my way, Mr. North. Well, where are you going? That's my business. Look, Leland, let the police handle Sam no, James. No, Fran's right. The police haven't got a thing on Sam James, and they won't get anything. Nevertheless, you... But I'm not the police. I don't have to worry about evidence. Now, get out of my way. You're staying here. We'll see about that. Leland, listen to me. Oh. Jerry. Jerry. Darling, wake up. We've got to stop him. <laughs> All right, now, Dick, now beat it. 
And don't come around here again until... Who's dead? Get that gun out of sight in the drawer. Who is it? Ray Leland. Leland? I'll talk to you. Uh, just a minute. You gonna let him in? Oh, what's the matter with you? Why not see him? I have nothing to hide, have I? No, Sam, but... Okay, Dan. Mr. James. Coming. Now, you get going, Dick. Out the back way. Okay, Sam. Well, Mr. Leland, come in. Lock it. Huh? Lock the door. Say what? Lock it or you'll get this knife in you right now. Okay. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? Now get away from the door. Now, Move! Lord. Okay. Oh. All right. Now, I want to know who killed Gino Fofari. I know you didn't do the job yourself, so who was it? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? Has something happened to old Gino? Stop that. You stop. Now, look at me. I'll let go. I'll catch you, Lucy. If you don't tell me who killed Gino. Now, I look, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I didn't even know the old guy was dead. Okay, you filthy little rat. You're going to get it, right? No. Now, let go. Come back here, you. Well, you stay away from me. Stay away from me, you crazy fool. Now. Now, you stay away, you hear? Well, that gun isn't going to do you any good, Sam. Get out of here. James, Leland, open up, please. Police, please, you hear that, Leland? I heard it. All right, then. Now, use your head. Get away from that door. I got something to finish with you first. Now, don't be a fool, Leland. Look, I don't want to shoot you, but I will if you don't get away from that door. Dude, don't get in there. Come on, Jerry, let's see if we can strain the door. Okay, Bill. He should have talked, Sam. Yeah. Good Lord. Leland. Bill, is he... No, no. Not yet, anyway. Uh, call an ambulance, Jerry. All right. The phone's in the bedroom. Uh, I'll find it. Look, it wasn't my fault. He jumped me. He wanted to kill me. Relax, James. You were right outside the door. Now, you heard him. Yes, yes, we heard it all. Then you know what was it's not my fault. You know I had to shoot him. It was in self-defense. I quiet, will you? You're in the clear. That's right. Sure, sure. I'm in the clear, in the clear. Uh, so hand over the gun, huh? What? The gun. Give it to me. Why? What do you want with the gun? I shot him in self-defense. I'm in the clear. You said so yourself. Then why don't you give me the gun? Well, I... Is it yours? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I mean, no. No, it isn't mine. Then whose is it? Well, it's... Uh... Bill, what's the matter with him? I don't know. Give me the gun, James. Here, here. That's funny. What, Bill? This gun is a thirty-eight caliber, and Gino Fafari was killed with a thirty-eight. You think... It... I don't know, Pam, but ballistics can sell. You know, maybe Leland got Sam James after all. And when ballistics matched up the bullet the doctors took out of you with the one that killed Gino Fafari, well... Sam James cracked and told the whole story. Good. Now I'm glad I didn't kill him. Well, Dick Davis would probably never have been caught if you had. Yeah, Mrs. North, and not only that, but... Oh, I don't know. I, I was wrong. I should have done as you said, Mr. North, and left it to the police. When Fran talked to me the way she did, I just went off my nut. Well, you're going to be out of the hospital in a few days, Ray, and everything will be all right. Oh, with Fran feeling the way she does... Uh-uh. Fran's outside, Ray. She... Outside? Yeah. She'd like to see you. You're kidding. No. Well, why? I... I mean, for what she said. She... Sure, but Pam had a long talk with her, and, well, they decided that this is the way Papa Fafari would have wanted it. <laughs> and you know how women are. <laughs> I'm pretty wonderful, Mr. Nard. I think so, too, Mr. Leland. I think so, too. exciting adventures next week. Listen in, won't you? There's always mystery well sprinkled with humor on Mr. and Mrs. North. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
New post-war Old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Isn't there any way out of here? I've gone over every inch of it, Patsy. There's not a chance. Oh, it's like being buried alive. I almost wish he had shot us. It would be better than than dying like this. I'm going to make him wish he'd shot us, too. What? In fact, I'm going to make him come back to do it. Right now. And now, the case of the bearded queen... Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Today, Scubby Wilson, reporter on the Globe Gazette, finally got delivery on his new car and is preparing to give Nick's secretary, Patsy Bowen, his one and only girlfriend, the first ride. Why don't we turn this corner and you get a look at it, Patsy? <laughs> the slickest, smoothest little convertible that ever came out of Detroit. No more riding the elevator, eh, Scubby? No, ma'am. When Scubby Wilson drives by, strong men will turn green with envy and fair ladies will swoon oh. with delight. <laughs> oh. You gonna let me drive? Well, I might let my wife drive if I ever get one. So if you'd care to qualify. Uh-huh. For the umpteenth time, Scubby, no thanks. Oh, I mean it, Patsy. With a car like that, think of what a honeymoon we could have. Canada, maybe, or the Rockies. Uh-huh. Thanks, Scubby, but I think I'll stay single and a pedestrian. That's only because you haven't seen the car yet. Oh, and now before we turn the corner, maybe you'd better shade your eyes. It may prove a bit dazzling at first. <laughs> well, but... let's turn the corner and see. Okay, I'm a good woman, but don't say I didn't warn you. Now, behold the pride of the motor car industry, the glory of... Well? Holy cats! My new car is gone! Somebody's stolen it! All right, Sergeant. And if the car should turn up this afternoon, will you call me here at my office? Thanks a lot. Goodbye. What did he say, Nick? Nothing yet, Scubby. Uh, they put it on the police radio, but it wasn't very encouraging. There's been an epidemic of car thefts lately. And none of the stolen cars has been recovered. Oh, gee, Scubby, that's tough. Oh, fine, fine. Fifteen hundred dollars, and I only drove it twenty blocks. Brother, that's the most expensive taxi ride I ever had. Have the police any ideas, Nick? Yes, yes, they do, Patsy. I think it's the work of a gang of boys about 16 or 17. Why, kids that age wouldn't be able to sell the cars if they did steal them, would they? Oh, well, not unless they were booked up with some crooked used car dealer who had a place where the cars could be repainted and the serial numbers changed. Uh Exactly. If kids are stealing cars on a large scale, they're working for some adult. And there's nothing more rotten than a crook who makes criminals out of youngsters. Mm, Some kids seem to be born that way. Oh, no, they're not, Scubby. No, they're not, Scubby. It's a matter of environment and training. Remember, these boys grow up with no place to play except the streets under the elevated. Give them a fair chance and they're all right. That's true, Scubby. Nick proved it with the downtown boys club. Right. Why, some of those fellows down there had pretty bad records and we got them. But now I'd trust them anywhere. Oh, I know. But at the same time... Oh, let me get it. Hello. Yes, speaking. Huh? Oh, hey, that's great. They found it. They did? Not even scratched, huh? You sure? Oh, swell. Oh, who took it, do you know? Oh, yes. Yes, I know him. Well, thanks, Sergeant. I'll be right down. Was it stolen by somebody you know, Scubby? Somebody we all know, Patsy. Huh? It's Danny Walker, Nick. Danny Walker? He belongs to the downtown boys club. Are you sure? Sergeant Brady says they've arrested him and he admitted taking it. I can't believe it. Come on. We're going to look into this thing right now. Oh, lay off, will you, Nick? I told you, if I'd known the car belonged to a friend of yours, I wouldn't have took it. It's you I'm interested in, Danny, not the car. I don't like to see you here in jail. You're the first member of the club who's gone into trouble in more than a year. I want to find out why and help you if I can. I don't belong to your club no more. I quit a month ago. When my folks moved over to the west side. Oh, is that so? 
I knew you hadn't been around lately, but I didn't know you'd quit. Oh, them clubs is kid stuff. I'm 18 years old. Danny, listen, we've been pretty good friends. Oh, now. look, Nick, you're a good Joe, see, even if you are a private eye, but let me alone, will you? No, Danny, I won't. When you came out of reform school, you gave me your word to go straight. And until now, you have. What's changed you, Danny? What's happened to you? Well, I... I lost that job you got me, and I had to get some money quick, see? It was kind of a debt. Of, of honor, like. So I swiped the car to get the dough, and I got caught, and that's that. You stole that car for somebody else, didn't you? No, I didn't. I stole it for me. Danny, look, I came here to go your bail because we're friends and because I thought you honestly wanted to go straight. Now, you can help me protect other boys from getting into trouble the same way you did. If you'll only tell me who's... If I'll turn stool pigeon, huh? Well, I won't do it. No, sir, I tried going straight and it didn't work. I'll take this rap, but I'll make up for it when I get out. I'll make up for it plenty. Patsy. Oh, there's Scubby in front of that delicatessen. And there's a space where we can park. I hope he's been able to find out something. Hello, beautiful. Hello, Scubby. Hiya, Nick. You have any luck, Scubby? No, not much. There's a gang in this neighborhood, all right, but the kids wouldn't talk to me. They have any regular place to meet? There's no settlement house and no boys club. But some of them hang out at the West Pine Street garage. A garage? Now, don't get excited. I know it sounds like a perfect lead, but I met the boss. And if he's a crook, I'm Jesse James. Well, I'd like to talk to him anyway. What's he like? Nice old fellow. Name of Bainbridge. And everybody calls him Pops. I think you and he will have a lot in common. What? Not you, Nick. What? I said I think you and Pops Bainbridge will have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> oh, never mind. You'll see for yourself. Come on. Oh, I just don't know why to think, Mr. Carter, why Danny used to mind the gasoline pumps for when I'd go out to eat. Maybe there'd be 30 or $40 in the cash register, and he never touched a cent of it. I'll swear to that. I see. Oh, Pops, any calls? No, not a thing, Joe. Hey, I want you to meet my friends. Yeah? Miss Bone, Mr. Wilson. Hello. And uh, Mr. Carter. Hello. Oh, yeah. Nick Carter. Well, how do you do? This is Joe Ferner. He keeps his taxi here, and I take his calls for him. Uh, Nick Carter, the private eye, huh? Uh-huh. Heard about you. I'll be up front, Pops, in the office. All right, Joe. Come on, Mr. Carter. And you folks, too. I want to show you something. I didn't tell Nick about this, Mr. Bainbridge. I oh. thought you'd like to do it yourself. All yeah, right, in here. We'll ride down the elevator. Now, will you push the button, Mr. Carter? The one Mark B. We'll go in the basement. Oh, certainly. But what's this all about? You'll see in a minute, Nick. Oh, a cigarette, Mr. Bainbridge? Yeah, the name's Pops. No thanks, I don't smoke. Scubby, don't you see the no smoking sign on the wall? Oh, sorry. Golly, these garage elevators are big things, aren't yeah, they? Well, we park cars on the upper floor and use this elevator to take them up. Oh. There now. <clears throat> now, wait till I find the light. There we are. Why, it's a club room. Oh, look, Nick, a handball court, and there's a dart game. Yeah. Uh hmm, -huh. and a radio, checker game, and chess. Mm -hmm. Hey, you've done all right here, Pop. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't much, but I've seen a lot of boys get into trouble hanging around the streets, so I... Hey, here's it. a deck of cards. Like to try a hand at gin rummy, Nick? <laughs> oh, no, thanks, Oh, Ruby. look, Nick, somebody's been doing a little art work on these cards. You see the beard on this queen of hearts? Whoever drew that has talent. Even changed the expression on her face. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> I hoped I was helping the boys by fixing up this place, but now I don't know. Well, why do you say that, Pops? Well, look what happened to Danny, one of the finest youngsters I ever knew. Now, maybe hanging around the garage here got him wanted in a car of his own. I'm afraid it's not that simple, Pops. Well, thanks for your time. You've been very helpful. I'm just sorry I couldn't do more. You've helped me a great deal. A great deal more than you know. What's the gag, Nick? You didn't come to the jail just to play cards with me. Oh, yes, I did, Danny. Let me deal your hand. Okay. You know how to play poker, don't you? Sure, but I ain't got no money. I'm playing for higher stakes than money. Uh, wait. Huh? Never mind picking up your cards. I have you beaten. How do you know? We ain't looked at the hands yet. I have three aces, and you're holding a pair of sixes. 
You a mind reader or something? Turn him over and see. Well, I'll... Hey, what is this? You stacking the cards on me? No. I was reading the backs of the cards, Danny. A uh, mark deck, huh? So what? See this card? Yeah. Five of clubs, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, show me those marks, will you? In a minute. This is the ten of diamonds, right? Right. And the seven of spades? The queen of hearts? Wait a minute. That queen of hearts. It's got a beard on it. Has it? Pete Krovick put that beard on there. I seen him do it. Oh. So you played with this deck before. You huh? bet I played with them before. Where'd you get them cards? Don't you know? Who gave me a... Come on, quit holding out on me. You're holding out on me, aren't you, Danny? Yeah, I... I guess I have been. I guess I've been a sucker, ain't I? Taking the rap for somebody who... Who what, Danny? Listen, Nick. Did you mean that about going my bail if I helped you crack this case? Danny, the minute you tell me who's behind these car thefts, you're on your way out of here. Oh, no. Get me out first, then I'll talk. All right. may take me a couple of hours to make the arrangements, and I have to see a client at eight. But if I can't be here, I'll send Scubby to bring you to my office. That's okay. And don't worry about your case, Mr. Carter. I'll crack it for you. Good boy. Brother, I'll crack it wide open. That's Nick's house over there, Danny. Okay. You better park on this side, Scubby. Nick's car's in front of the house. Sure. Only be here a few minutes anyway. Got to meet a guy for an interview pretty soon. Oh, come on. Nick's waiting for us. Gee, I feel like the mayor or something with two of you bringing me here. Well, Nick didn't want to take any chances. On me running out, huh? No, on anything happening to you. We're your bodyguards. But (laughs) you're guarding me from what? Nobody even knows Nick sprung me. Maybe not, but I still think that green sedan was following us. That green sedan must have been your imagination, Patsy. Either that or we lost him in the last block or two. I hope so. We're here, Nick. Oh, hello. Is everything all right? Yeah, hi, Nick. Everything's fine. You bring the reports on the other car thefts, Patsy? Well, oh, Nick, I'm sorry. I left them in the car. Oh, I'll get them for you, Miss Bowen. Won't take a chance. Oh, no, Danny, let's come into it. Danny, look out! Oh, oh, hey, oh, good grief. Oh. He ran into him on purpose. Come on. It was that green sedan I saw following us before. Patsy, call an ambulance. Right. Scubby, head off any traffic. Sure, Nick. Here, Danny. Here, Danny. Let me put my coat under your head. Danny, can you hear me? It's Nick. Nick. It was him, Nick. I know, Danny. Don't try to talk. Got to... Got to tell you about those cars. All right, son. What about them? The eye. What eye? What do you mean, Danny? Look for the eye in the L... L... Ah. Danny... Oh, the poor kid, he's fainted. No, Scubby. He's dead. The I and the L. Can Danny's dying words be the clue that will lead Nick to the head of the car thieves and Danny's killer? We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Bearded Queen. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Back at the office, Nick, Patsy, and Scubby are puzzling over the connection between the automobile thefts and Danny Walker's dying words, look for the I in the L. Nick, the only way I can figure it, it must be some detective on duty around the elevated trains. Naturally. Scubby, look, Brady, and ask him confidentially if any L detective has shown sudden prosperity since these car thefts started. Sure, Nick. If only we could have got the license number of that green sedan. Yes, well, at least we have the fragments of glass from that shattered headlight. That may help us to identify it. Uh And the police are checking every garage in town for a green sedan with a broken headlight lens. I felt sure that car was following us. But I didn't see it when we got here. Probably parked the car up the street with his lights off and his motor running just in case. And when Danny started to cross the street alone, the murderer saw his chance and took it. Right. Well, the next thing is to find out if any older men sat in those card games with Danny. You think the leader of this gang played cards with the boys? Not only played cards with them, he cheated. Oh. Danny realized it when he saw the bearded queen of hearts in that marked deck. So-called debt of honor, he stole Scubby's car to repay, was a gambling debt. Well, then maybe the same trick was played on some of the other boys. That might account for the rest of the stolen cars. The way I figure it. After a boy had stolen one car, it wouldn't be hard to frighten him into stealing more by threatening to expose him. Well, that's the lowest trick I ever heard of. I agree with you, Scubby. Yes. Well, when we find out who won with that marked dick, 
I think we'll have the leader of the gang and Danny's murderer. Perhaps Bainbridge ought to know. Right, Patsy, and that's where we're going. Scubby, as soon as you've talked to Sergeant Brady about the detectives, phone me at the West Pine Street garage. A couple of older fellows who sometimes used to play down there, Mr. Carter, but hey, I don't... Pops. Oh, Joe. What's the matter? No gas tonight? Oh, I didn't hear, hear you drive up. Been here two, three minutes. I'm so busy talking to your friends, you didn't see me. Oh, we were talking about Danny Walker. Yeah, nice kid. Too bad he had an accident, wasn't it? How about putting some gas in my can? Yeah, sure, Joe, sure. Right away. Hey, answer that, will you, Mr. Carter? Oh, yes, yes. It may be for me anyway. I'm expecting a call. Well, maybe it's for me, too, Nick. I'd better come with you. Nick, I didn't want to be left alone with Joe. Did you see the look on his face and how scared Pops was? Yes, I noticed it. You better stay right outside the booth here. Yes. Hello? West Pine Street Garage. That's you, Nick? Oh, yes, Cubby. What did you find out? Not a thing. As far as Sergeant Brady knows, there's nothing against any of the detectives around the elevator. Of course, there's been no time for any investigation, but Sergeant Brady thinks we're on the wrong track. He may be right. But the I and the L is the only thing we have to go on, and I'm going to follow it through. Okay. Oh, uh, say, will you ask Pops if he found my cigarette lighter? I had him. We were going down to the basement there. Remember when Patsy pointed out that no-smoking sign and I... Scubby! That may be it. That may be what? Never mind. You at headquarters? Yes, why? I'll call you back in 15 minutes. Give you the whole story for your paper. Did he find out anything, Nick? Wasn't anything to find out. Where are Pops and Joe? Uh, they went out to the gas pumps. Good. I want to take another look at that elevator. Are we going down to the club room? Not this time. I must have been blind not to have seen it before. Seen what? An elevator made of steel plates riveted together, push-button controls, and a no-smoking sign painted on the wall. Well, what's unusual about that? Here's the elevator. Step in. I'll show you. Uh-huh. See, Patsy? One of those rivets is right in the middle of the eye in no-smoking. The I and the L. The letter I and the no smoking sign in the elevator, of course. Danny died before he finished the word. But, well, how does that... This elevator is run by push-button controls, Patsy. A button for each floor. I know, but... There were another floor. A secret floor. The control button for it would have to be concealed, too. And that rivet in the letter I may be it. Push it, Nick. Let's find out if... Nick, we're going down to the boys' club room. I think you'll find we're going past the club room, Patsy. But we can't go past the basement. No? Ever hear of a sub-basement? Huh? Why, of course. Yes, we're passing the club room. There is a secret floor. Maybe we're going to discover a lot of secrets. Well, this seems to be it. Whatever it is. Gosh, it's dark here. Well, there should be a light switch near the elevator. Yes, here it is. Nick, it's another garage. A complete paint shop. And mechanical equipment for working over stolen cars. Look, at the other end of the room, a green sedan. With a broken headlight and the fender all dented. That's the and... car, all right. The one that killed Danny. Oh. Stop her. You two, sister. Joe, I, I thought you were... I came down while you was telephoning. I've been standing right behind this pillow waiting for you, baby. You and the boyfriend. Now, look, Joe. Carter, take your rod out of your pocket and drop it on the floor. No, no, don't turn around. Whatever you say. But you're not playing this very smart. Smarter than you, Gladfoot. And take that pocket, oh. too, sister, just in case you might be packing some heat. Where's Pops? Have you done something to him? Me? I don't do nothing to nobody, unless it's an accident. Of course, I do have an awful lot of accidents. Hit and run accidents, Joe? Sometimes. But I'll be able to do better than that for you two. Something real neat and artistic. Now, wait. You don't realize the police know we came here. So you come here. Then you left, see? Nobody will find this cellar. Nobody will ever find you. So long, suckers. I'll see you again tomorrow the next day. And when I do, you're going to have one of the neatest little accidents that ever happened. Nick, isn't there any way out of here? No. No. Just this one big bare room. Nothing but the pillars that support the building. These workbenches and garage equipment. And the elevator shaft at the other end. But it's like being buried alive. I almost wish he had shot us. Patsy, I'm going to make Joe wish he had shot us. What? In fact, I'm going to make him come right back to do it right now. Nick, why are you taking off your shoes? I may want to walk quietly before I'm through. Hand me that monkey wrench there. Oh, that won't be any good against the gun, Nick. Better than nothing. Let me have it. 
Okay. Now, you get inside that green sedan. Lie down on the floor. You'll be as safe from bullets there as any place. All right, Nick. This switch box on the wall contains the main electrical switches for the entire building. One for the lights and one for power. We've got to keep the garage going upstairs as a blind. But it can't operate without lights. So we cut the lights. Oh, Nick, be careful. I will. I'll be behind this pillar next to the switch box. Joe will have to get those lights on again and quick. And he'll have to pass me in the dark to do it. I left the power switch on so the elevator still runs. He's coming. Oh, Nick. I'm afraid. Don't worry. It'll be over in a minute. One way or the other. Nick and Patsy wait tensely in the darkness, unarmed as the elevator descends, bearing a killer with a gun in his hand and murder in his heart. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Bearded Queen, today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Trapped in the, in the dark sub-basement of the West Pine Street garage, Nick, armed only with a monkey wrench, waits behind a concrete pillar near the light switches for a killer. Across the room, the elevator comes to a stop. The beam of a flashlight cuts the pitch blackness, and a voice says, That was very clever to turn off those lights, Mr. Carter. Clever, but fatal. You leave us no choice but to dispose of you and Miss Bowen now. Come on along with that flashlight, Pops. We'll turn the switch on again. Yeah, not so fast, Joe. Carter probably intends to ambush us, even if he doesn't have a gun. Yeah. I'll stay here by the elevator and keep the flashlight on you just in case. Good idea. When the lights is on, we can finish him off nice and easy. I'll get the switch. Yeah. Remember, I have a gun, Mr. Carter, so don't think... Joe! Hey, Pops! What happened to the flashlight? How'd you come to drop it? Stay right where you are, Joe. Yeah, okay. Mr. Carter's a very accurate at throwing a wrench. The flashlight's broken. You know where I am, Joe, so if you hear a sound in any other part of the room, shoot! Don't worry, I will. Where's that squirt? Did you get him, Joe? I couldn't have missed it that range, Pops. But I don't know whether it was him or her. It was neither, Joe. Hey, Pops, you don't hear me! Help me! Joe! Joe, are you all right? Joe, why don't you answer me? This is Joe's gun on your back, Bainbridge. Oh. He doesn't have any more use for it. You better drop the one you're holding. Yeah, yeah. I will. All right, Patsy. Find that light switch. We're taking these two crooks to headquarters. Straight ahead on this street, Scubby. You can't miss the sign out front. The West Side Boys Club, grand opening tonight. Okay. I'll say, Nick, when you jumped on Joe Ferner in the dark, how'd you know exactly where he was? By the flash of his gun when he fired at something across the room. Oh. And I still don't know what he was shooting at. <laughs> I do. Huh? When I heard Bainbridge tell Joe to fire at any sound, I threw my shoe out of the window of the car I was hiding in. And sure enough, he shot at it. <laughs> Good for you, Patsy. Very clever. It distracted Joe's attention just long enough for me to jump in. Great stuff, Patsy. Will you marry me? Oh, Scubby, please. Oh, okay, beautiful. <laughs> and then after I had Joe's gun, it was easy to find Bainbridge in the dark. He kept calling to Joe, so all I had to do was to follow the sound of his voice. Uh-huh. This is it, Nick. The new West Side Boys Club. Just look at the crowd. You have your speech. In my pocket. Good. You know, I'm prouder of being asked to speak at the opening here tonight than I would be if I were asked to address Congress. I guess the other boys who were mixed up with Bainbridge and Ferner will be here, won't they? Well, of course, Cubby. Nick got them all suspended sentences because of the trickery used to make them steal those cars. And thanks to clubs like this, those boys will now have a chance to grow up right. Hey, Patsy, you know what? What, Scubby? I just realized. Now that you've ridden in my new car, maybe you'll change your mind about marrying me. Oh, well, Scubby, I... I must admit I'm in love with... Me? Ah, uh -huh. no, darling. Your car. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. <music> Nick 
Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Scubby is played by John Kane. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you by Del Monte Foods, the brand preferred by more women than any other line of canned fruits and vegetables in the world. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For well, this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, The DeMarco Affair. It was well after the dinner hour at the tambourine. A couple of dock workers lingered at the bar, sipping arak. I was at the side table with the evening paper when the phone opened up in my office. As I went back, I made a note to close up early if business didn't pick up. It was a good night for some rest. Anyhow, that's what I thought. Hello, tambourine. Monsieur Jordan. Monsieur Jordan. Yes, yeah, speaking. This is Henri DeMarco. Oh, what can I do for you, Mr. DeMarco? It is about the photographic postcard of the tambourine which you ordered from me. They are now ready. Oh, well, thanks for calling. You, uh, you will come and get them now? Oh, no special rush, Mr. DeMarco. I've still got a few on hand. Monsieur Jordan? Yeah? Could you possibly come to my shop and pick them up right away? You mean tonight? Yes, yes, tonight. Well, I suppose I could if it's necessary. Then I will expect you, Monsieur Jordan. I will expect you very shortly. The click on the line told me he'd suddenly hung up. Well, maybe he just needed the money real quick, something like that. DeMarco had done my work for the past couple of years, mail home picture postcards of the tambourine that I kept up front for the tourists. And we'd come to know each other pretty well. So I decided I'd better drive over and see him. It took me into one of the sections of Cairo where the poorer Europeans lived. I parked under a dim street lamp and walked down a dark passageway to his little photographic shop where I got my first surprise. The lights were out and the front door was locked. So I moved around, tried the back door. It was locked, too. And that's when I heard a, a sharp chopping sound from inside. Getting to a low window, I peered in and made out the shadow of a man swinging away with an axe, hacking DeMarco's shop to pieces. I gave the window a couple of shoves, it slid up, and I went in to see what I could do about it. He whirled as he saw me, lunged and swung down with a hatchet. I ducked and then piled in, grabbing for his arms. He twisted half around, I hung on, staying in close. He tried again, I half blocked his swing, but it landed flat behind my left ear and I went down. Through the haze that followed, I heard him scramble out the window, and by the time I could pull myself to my feet, he was gone. I lost no time cutting on a light and getting to the phone at the front of the shop and calling Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. In another 15 minutes, he was there, and I was briefing him on all that had happened. In other words, Jordan, it is the usual story. Well, that's the way it happens, Sam. You receive a phone call, you come, and as always, you are in the center of a violent brawl about which you can explain nothing. Always it is the same. All right, then maybe you can explain where DeMarco is right now. He's supposed to wait for me here. Yes, you have told me. Now, the man whom you encountered here, please describe him. I can't. It was pitch dark. Oh, yes, of course, of Look, course. do you want me to report these things or not? Jordan, I... Jordan, let us have no more of this. I regret my show of impatience. 
It is only that I have had other matters on my mind. Don't blame me for that. Indeed, I do not. I will explain only that a recent and important duty has been to watch so certain members of a criminal ring here in Cairo. Now, in spite of all my efforts, they have disappeared one by one. Perhaps even from Egypt. Your superiors aren't going to like that, huh? As you say, I have been under extreme pressure. But let us get on with this. Yeah. That guy didn't miss much. As you say, a most thorough job. Cameras, lighting equipment, projectors, all destroyed. Mm. Strange indeed. What's in there, sir? It is a photographic dark room. The intruder did not touch it. Maybe he just never got around to it. Perhaps. It will be necessary now to examine the shop thoroughly. What about DeMarco? After phoning his home, I will put out a call for him through missing persons. Oh, yeah. Are you uh, through with me? If you like. Would you like a guard to protect you back to your tambourine? No, no thanks, Sam. Uh, that is where you are going, is it not? Well, you never know, Sam. You never know. I figured Sam knew where I was going, but he nodded a dismissal. I went back up the dark passageway and along the street to where my car was parked. The figure was standing on the street side of the car, and at first I didn't see him. When I went around to get in, he shoved his heavy frame between me and the door. He had a full, crooked mustache, and he needed a shave. Ya salam alaikum, Jordan. Or is that not the way a greeting is given in Arabic? Yeah, between friends. Then we are friends, Jordan. Step aside, you're blocking my way. How is that a way to talk to a friend? Aside, I said. You are too hasty, Jordan. Uh, Figured there'd be a gun. Goes with your face. Oh, face you recognize? Sure. You go crass. Cairo bum. And crumbs like you have a way of sticking in memory. All right, what do you want? A chance to be of service to you. I am concerned with your safety. Well, if you're losing any sleep over to try a pill. Your actions these past few hours cause me grief, Jordan. You were in the shop of Henri de Marco. It is not safe at this hour. Oh, were you that hatchet man? Jordan, you called the police to the shop of Henri de Marco. That perhaps was your duty as a citizen. But to persist in showing interest in de Marco is not your duty. Nor is it wise for your safety. I suppose you can explain that. What I say is quite clear. Andre DeMarco is not your concern. Andre DeMarco's affairs are not your concern. What if I want to make it my concern? The gun barrel presses your stomach. A trigger may easily be squeezed. Hmm. You ever tried since then? Jordan, I am not talking to hear myself speak. I'm a patient man, but be certain you do not try my patience. Go back to your bed and forget the happenings of this evening. Keep out of the DeMarco affair. You may live to wish that you had. Assalamu alaikum. Friend. Hugo Crass backed away, keeping the gun level and dropped quietly into the shadows. I got in the car and drove away fast. Crass's advice was all I needed, only I didn't take it. I soon found DeMarco's home. A modest, flat-roofed sandstone house on the Sharia Ramad. At my knock, the door opened a little and the pretty face of an Egyptian woman peered anxiously out. Who is it, please? The name is Jordan. Oh, it's about Mr. DeMarco. You, you are the Mr. Jordan who runs the cafe? Yeah, that's right. Oh, please, enter the house. Oh, thank you. I am the wife of Mr. DeMarco. Can you tell me where he is, Mr. Jordan? I was hoping you could tell me. You see, I... Oh, Mr. Jordan, permit me to introduce Roberto Aleman. He is the Andorian consul. A pleasure, Senor Jordan. Andorian consul, Mr. Aleman? Yes, so few people know of my country. It is the small country between France and Spain. You may find it on any map of Europe. Oh, yes, of course. Senor Jordan, did you not know that the Marco is Andorian? French extraction, but nevertheless, Andorian. No, I didn't know. Uh, look, I... Uh... Uh, please, feel free to speak before Mr. Aleman. He and my husband are close friends. Friends? As are all Andorian in Cairo. You see, there are so few of us. That is why we have become closely knit. Mr. Aliman came tonight in answer to my call. I have been so worried about my husband. And when the captain of the police called a moment ago... Well, then you know what happened at your husband's shop. Only that it was smashed. And now my husband is not to be found. You, uh, you say you were at the shop, senor? Yeah, that's right. He called me about an hour ago, asking me to come over and pick up some photographic work he'd done for me. At such a late hour? Yeah, I wondered about that, too. But he seemed urgent. But you have not seen him? No, he was gone. Any idea what it's all about, Mrs. DeMarco? 
there is so much that I do not understand. For many days, my husband has lived under a great strain, about which he would tell me nothing. Would he have any enemies? Oh, Mr. Jordan, my husband is a kind man, devoted only to me, his wife, and to his humble business. But enemies? No. Well, we've got to find him, Mrs. DeMarco. I'll do what I can. I am most grateful. I turned to go, but before I reached the door, the loud screech of tires from the street sent us racing to the window. Just in time to see a black sedan pull quickly to the curb, the back door fly open, and a figure sprawl out on the sidewalk. In another second, the car was gone. And even from where we stood, we could see what it had left behind. It was the missing photographer, Henri DeMarco. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. First thing in the morning, any time during the day, as a mealtime appetizer. It's Del Monte tomato juice for real satisfaction. Yes, first thing in the morning, any time during the day, or as a mealtime appetizer, a chilled glass of Del Monte tomato juice really hits the spot. It has just the right tang, all the freshness and funny flavor you'd expect from Del Monte. Del, Del Monte tomato juice is fresh tasting. Yes, indeed, all the rich flavor of fully ripened tomatoes. Del Monte tomato juice is natural tasting. Close quality control by Del Monte assures you of true natural flavor. Del Monte tomato juice is refreshing. That's right, real tomato flavor that makes you ask for more. Fresh tasting, natural tasting, and refreshing. That's Del Monte tomato juice. Look for the green can with the familiar Del Monte red shield. Keep several cans in the refrigerator. You'll find they come in mighty handy. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The DeMarco Affair. Well, one look at Henri DeMarco told us he'd taken a beating he'd long remember. Between the three of us, we got him into the house. There, we found that, aside from plenty of bumps and bruises, he wasn't in too bad a shape. Some cold water and plenty of smelling salts finally brought him around. Then we waited for his story. But it never came. To every question, he only shook his head, telling us to forget it. Alleman and I finally gave it up and left. I was still trying to figure it out the next morning when Sam joined me for coffee. <coughs> Jordan, I am convinced that what we learn of this affair will not come from DeMarco. Oh, you saw him already this morning, Sam? For quite some time. <laughs> Get up early. <laughs> there is a saying of my people, Jordan. It is dangerous to help for the sun to rise above a sleeping head. Who knows what's dangerous? Maybe DeMarco thinks it's dangerous to talk. But he says not even that. He refuses to press charges. He will not say who was involved. He says only that it is a closed affair. Mm. You, uh... Find anything in his shop after I left last night? Nothing that leads us anywhere. The destruction of his photographic equipment is puzzling, but not so much as his silence. Yeah. Jordan, you still say that DeMarco told you nothing on the phone last night to indicate that he was in danger? Mm. Didn't have to, Sam. It was in his voice. Mm. Then obviously what transpired from that time until he was thrown from the car at his house was enough to seal his lips. Mm. Wonder if he thinks we'll give it up this easy. Mm. Well, there is little we can do until DeMarco sees fit to cooperate. Well, there's still Hugo Crass. Yes, I shall not forget this man who threatened you, Jordan, this Hugo Crass. I will have my men apprehend him as soon as possible. Perhaps he can shed some light on this affair. Sam thanked me for the coffee and went out. Just as his limousine pulled away, the tambourine phone started ringing. I took the call. Hello, tambourine. Ya salam. Alaikum, Jordan. Oh, not again. Pleased to speak to a friend. You better crawl back into your hole, Crass. The police will be looking for you soon. Oh, pity, Jordan. That you have told them about me. Yeah, well, I'm bad on keeping secrets. Then it is apparent, Mr. Jordan, that I must find a way to keep secrets. You got a plan? Of course I have, Jordan. And you will not like it. Yeah. <laughs> that was all it took to send me right across town to DeMarco's shop to start digging for answers. It was open this time, and DeMarco was there, puttering around in back. 
He'd cleared away most of the wreckage. I saw a lot of brand new stuff out of boxes from the Cairo Photo Supply Company. Cameras, lights, and everything. DeMarco came hurrying up. Ah, oh, Monsieur Jordan, uh, it is uh, good to see you again. Oh, are you feeling by now, Mr. DeMarco? As well as can be expected, thank you. You have come, of course, for your tambourine postcards. I, I will get them. Oh, there's no hurry about that. It will take but a moment. I must apologize for the inconvenience I caused you last night. Oh, I think nothing of it. I see you got some new equipment. A few items, the tools of my trade, Monsieur Jordan. Without them, I could not be in business. Oh, naturally. Hey, those cameras must be pretty expensive. A bit costly. Ah, here you are, Monsieur Jordan. Oh, thanks. I didn't know you were that well fixed. A big problem? Having to buy all that stuff at once, it'd be rough on anybody's pocketbook. Oh, that. Well, there is the installment plan. Oh, sure, yeah. Installments, of course. Uh, uh, the cards, Monsieur Jordan, I made them up just as they were the last time. I trust they are satisfactory. Oh, I'm sure they are. And here's a check to cover the job. Uh, so kind of you. Uh, but I would have sent a bill. Mr. DeMarco, when you called last night, I got a hunch you needed help. I, uh, I again must apologize. I came hoping I could give it. I still think I was right. Now, look, when guys start smashing things, roughing people up... Monsieur Jordan? Yeah. Is there anything else I can get for you now? No, no thanks. I'll be going. I opened the door and looked back, but DeMarco had already turned to his work. So I decided to talk to DeMarco's friend, Roberto Alleman. I found a phone book, got the address, went to a modern office building near Solomon Pasha Square, up to the fifth floor, and in a door labeled Andorian Consulate. When Alleman saw who it was, he pushed aside some passports and a visa stamp, the usual stuff on a consul's desk, and stood up to greet me. Senor Jordan, I rather expected you. Please sit down. Oh, thanks, Mr. Alleman. I presume you have come to me regarding our mutual friend. Yeah, that's right. I just saw him in his shop. Oh, so he's already back at work. Well, perhaps it is best. Uh, were you able to learn anything from him? No, not a thing. Mm, distressing. His silence is bewildering to all of us. I, I feel especially sorry for his devoted wife. Tobacco's scared, Mr. Alleman. Something's hanging over him. Somehow we've got to find out what it is. I agree. Have you anything to suggest, Senor? Well, it might not mean much, but uh, we could try something. Yes? DeMarco has a complete layout of brand new photo equipment in his shop. It was delivered today. So soon, Senor Jordan? Yeah, it surprised me, too. Now, look, as his consul, maybe you could check something. DeMarco told me he bought the equipment on the installment plan. Why, that is possible. He's a man of small means. Well, supposing you call the place where he bought the equipment, just to make sure. A very wise move, Senor. We must explore every possibility. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the uh, Cairo Photo Supplies. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote the number down here. Good. One moment, please. Hello. Roberto Aleman of the Andorian Consulate speaking. I would like some information regarding a recent purchase by an Andorian national at your establishment. Confidential, please. His name is Henri de Marco. Would you tell me on what terms? Mm -hmm. I see. No, 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 no. That is all. Thank you very much. Well, Senor Jordan, I fear that we have caught our good friend in a bit of a falsehood. Yeah? De Marco did buy the equipment, but not on the installment plan. He paid straight cash. I thanked Alamon and left. Well, I knew going to DeMarco again wouldn't help. Anyhow, the dinner hour was coming up, so I went back to the tambourine. I was still mulling it over that night after the help had knocked off, and I was alone. Before locking up, I was behind the bar cleaning out the cash register, facing the back mirror. That's when I saw the front door slowly open. In stepped a man with a crooked mustache. It was Hugo Crass, and he still held the gun. You are a poor one for taking advice, Jordan. You are a poor one for minding your own business. <laughs> I had died behind the counter and the bullets plowed into some of my best whiskey and shattered my mirror. But I had other things to think about. I grabbed my gun from under the counter and came up firing. My shots were wild, but they sent Crass scrambling to the door. I fired again. Crass half spun around but kept moving. 
I got around from behind the bar, made it to the door, and out onto the street, just in time to see a car race off and disappear into the night. Police headquarters, Tobias speaking. Sam. I thought you said you were going to pick up Hugo Crass. Calm yourself, Jordan. He will be found. And what happens in the meantime? I'm a sitting duck. Please explain what you are talking about. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. He's been throwing shots around my tambourine. Indeed, Jordan. Are you going to hunt him up now, or aren't you? Jordan, I will now ask you something. Why did you not tell me everything about this man, Henri DeMarco? Do you not think that I can learn things for myself? What are you talking about? I haven't held anything back from you. So, then did you tell me that DeMarco has been living in Egypt illegally for the past five years without credentials or passport? Well, did you tell me that he is still wanted by the Andalian authorities for tax evasion in his own country and that his name is not really DeMarco at all? Well, Jordan... I didn't know, Sam. I am sure that you did not. Now, before you again make demands of the police, remember that you, too, have a responsibility to us. Yeah, sure, I remember. Is that quite everything now, Jordan? Yes, yeah, Sam. Everything. And I meant just that. All I had to do now was make sure. I pocketed a bunch of keys and a flashlight. Then I stepped on the gas across the Cairo night to the office building off Solomon Pasha Square. The elevator had stopped running, so I took the stairs to the fifth floor. I paused on the last step. The dimly lit hall was deserted, and I got to the door that said Andorian Consulate and began with the keys. Trying them one by one. Sure, it had to be the last one on the ring, but it did the trick, and I was inside the dark office. I had even better luck with the file drawer. It gave me part of what I wanted. Passports, a visa stamp, a lot of regulation-sized photos. Some attached to the passports, some not. I closed it and moved to the desk. That's when I heard the key in the door. I cut the flashlight, but there was no place to go, so I stood there as the door opened and he found the switch. His hand was in his right coat pocket and he left it there, not moving. Senor Jordan. Yeah, hello, Alaman. I ask you the meaning of this. Sure you do. You really want me to tell you? Do you quite realize the penalty for breaking into the office of a foreign government? Do you realize... Ah, cut out the act, Alaman. He's finished his last week's racing sheet. Have you quite lost your mind? No, not anymore. You're no consul at all, are you? How dare you, Senor Jordan? I demand that you leave at once. If you were the Andorian consul, you'd have known DeMarco was wanted by your government. You'd have known he was an illegal entrant into Egypt. Are you presuming to tell me what I know? Well, the fact is, I think you did know about DeMarco. I think you were holding what you knew over his head to make him work for you. Doing what? Pictures for phony passports. You convince the few Andorians in Cairo that you're their consul, they turn over their passports to you. Then you sell those passports to anybody who'll pay the price to get out of Egypt. After you force DeMarco to order the passport photos just enough to resemble the buyer. (laughs) Do you think anyone will believe your fantastic theory? All Captain Sabai has to do is wire the capital of Andorra. Shall we call him? Come no closer, Jordan. I've been watching him. As his hand came out of his pocket with a gun, I kicked the open door. I slammed it to his hand, the gun oh. dropped to the floor, and he grabbed for it. My foot came down on his wrist, oh. my knee caught his jaw. Oh. Adam and rolled away, and I picked up the gun, and that was that. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. Catsup experts say the finer the vinegar, the better the catsup flavor. And that's one big reason why Del Monte catsup has such marvelous flavor. Del Monte catsup is made with pineapple vinegar. Pineapple vinegar is a superlative vinegar. Only Del Monte makes it. Only Del Monte has it. But it isn't that you taste the vinegar. It's what it does for the other ingredients that is so important. The special way it coaxes out all the rich tomato flavor in catsup. Yes, pineapple vinegar is one of the big reasons why Del Monte catsup is the liveliest, snappiest, best-tasting catsup you ever tried. I know. That rich tomato flavor really perks up everyday foods. You just can't beat Del Monte's rich tomato goodness on meatloaf. Or on hash or chops or hamburgers, on any food that calls for catsup. Mm -mm. You'll find that appetizing Del Monte catsup flavor makes you want to come back for more. Try Del Monte catsup soon. For all its goodness, it costs less than many other quality brands. Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. (laughs) 
Well, all I had to do was call Sam and then hold Roberto Alleman there in his office till Sam and his men got there. On the way down to headquarters, Sam told me that he'd picked up Hugo Crass less than an hour before, and he'd confessed to working for Alleman. After putting Alleman in a cell next to Crass, Sam sent for Henri DeMarco, and we waited in the office till the man brought him in. Uh... <clears throat> Mr. DeMarco, you have been told that Roberto Aleman is under arrest? I have, Captain Sabaya. And I am now willing to confess everything. You should have told us from the beginning, DeMarco. You are right, Monsieur Jordan. I know that your efforts were only in my behalf. Yes, yes. Now, your statement. You knew then that Aleman was not a consul at all. At first, I did not know. At first, we all believed him. Why should we not? Yes. Go on. I respected his station. So when he brought certain photographs to my shop with instructions as to what I should do with them, I did as he said. But when I began to realize what was happening, I went to him. And then came the threat. Yes. He said that he would expose me. Please, I have lived respectably in your city. I married a good woman of your people. For her sake... But you continue to do what he said. For a time. Finally, I would have no more of it. I am not a criminal. And I told Aleman that. Just before you called me last night... I knew what he would do to me, Monsieur Jordan. I was frantic for help. Sure. But before I got there, Alleman had his men pick you up and leave a guy to smash the place. After slapping you around, they planned to dump you back at your shop. Until they saw the police there. After they got my promise of silence, they gave me money to buy new cameras and equipment so that I might continue in business as before and do their bidding. Captain, had I known what I do now of Alleman... But many were fooled by him for a time. Were we not? Jordan. <laughs> I figure Andorra doesn't even have a consulate in Cairo. Quite true. One can get away with many things in Cairo for a time. Sure had a slick racket. Mr. DeMarco, acting as you did under coercion, I feel sure that no charges will be preferred against you. However, regarding the charges of your own government... Captain Sabaya, I am willing and ready to return to Andorra and right my wrong as best I can. You will please step outside the office and wait there. As you wish. Thanks for going easy with him, Sam. Mm -hmm. Little does DeMarco know how much he has helped. Huh? This problem of certain criminals who have been mysteriously escaping from Egypt, we know now how they did it. With fake passports issued by Roberto Aleman. Then the Egyptian government shouldn't be sorry at DeMarco now that it's cleaned up. No, I should think not. After DeMarco has paid his debt in Andorra, my country should have no objection to his returning here and taking up his business once again. Can I count on that? I am counting on it. In, in fact, Henri DeMarco has promised on his return to take some um, family photographs of me and my wife and four children. For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte catsup and chili sauce. Del Monte tomato sauce and canned tomatoes. And Del Monte tomato juice. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jane of Ella with Sam Sabaya, and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music composed and conducted by Richard Durant. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is Black Ball. <laughs> The best-liked brand of peaches in the whole wide world. That's Del Monte peaches. Sliced or have, they're truly delicious. Del Monte peaches. And now, before we sign off, we just want to remind you, this year, more than ever before, your community chest needs your support. Give all you can. <laughs> Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Signal. Signal gasoline. Yes, Signal gasoline is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The House on Sycamore Road. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Sometimes weakness results only in failure and disillusionment. Sometimes it's much more serious than that. It can take a sinister turn, sending its victim down the spiral that ends only in death. That's the way it was with Harold Phillips on the day he and his wife, Muriel, rented the house on Sycamore Road from old Sabina Fielding. It wasn't much of a house, but it was destined to be the most important element in Harold's life. Like Sabina, it was old. But there was a kind of majesty about it, veiled as it was behind a mat of unkempt shrubbery and a pair of magnificent elms in the front yard. Muriel had objected to it, of course. But there was no other alternative. Rents were sky high, and the house on Sycamore Road was the only answer. As they stand talking with Sabina in the front hallway, Muriel is a little impatient. Well, that just about covers everything, Mrs. Fielding. Yes, I think we'll make out very comfortably here. It's hard to leave. Never thought I'd mind it this much. Of course. Uh, It's been in the Fielding family for now. Let me see. Well, uh, there was Rodney and Lisa. Uh, Yes, uh, five generations. Five generations? Yes. I I do hope you young people will be happy in it. A fine house in its time, you know. A proud house, just like the Fieldings. Yes, we're a proud family. (laughs) None of us ever had money, excepting Richard, of course. Uh, That's my grandson. Richard had money, but it it didn't do him any good. Well, even he's gone now. I'm the last now, the last Fielding. And I'm afraid I haven't much longer. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Mrs. Fielding. Oh, no, no, no. I'm an old woman, Mr. Phillips. Yes, it's hard to leave. Oh, (laughs) that clock. I can remember when my daddy bought it. Let me see now. Was that 68 or 69? Uh, Mrs. Fielding, Harold will be glad to drive you into town. 68 or 69? Uh, Eh? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'd better be going. I'd be glad to take you. Oh, well, uh, it's only two blocks to the bus stop. I can still walk that far without any trouble. I really think it'll be easier for you now, having just one room in town. You'll be closer to everything. Yes. Yes, so I'm told. Are you sure now? You don't want me to drive you? Oh, you're very kind. And I do like to see that in young people. But I can manage, thank you. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Phillips. (laughs) Goodbye. I know you'll be happy here. I'm sure of it, Mrs. Fielding. Goodbye. Goodbye, young man. Young people, she says. We'll be very happy. For heaven's sakes, Muriel, she'll hear you. I could scream my head off in here and she wouldn't hear me. Come to think of it, screaming wouldn't be a bad idea. Will you quit it? That old crone is probably laughing herself silly right now after palming off this old barn on us. But, Muriel, you know as well as I do it's the best we can do right now. Where have I heard that before? Or I'm getting sick of it, Harold Phillips. I'm getting fed up with shabby substitutes. Well, I've got a job. I don't know what else you want. Classified advertisements on a stupid hometown paper. What kind of a job is that? Well, it's the best I can do, and this house is the best I can do. You may as well make up your mind to it. I know, I know. I've been through all that before. But I'm not getting reconciled to it. You can make up your mind to that. Anything else? Yes, you. I can't say it's very inspiring, living in a moth-eaten shanty with an ink-stained nobody. Muriel. And this flock of antiques. That old clock she's so proud of. Listen to it. If you think I'm going to sit here day after day with that thing ticking in my ears... What's got into you anyway? I'm fed up, that's what. Now what are you doing? I'm going to stop this clock. Any objections? Will you be reasonable? Will you shut up? 
Where's the catch on this thing? Oh, look out. You'll knock it over. All right. So I'll knock it over. Oh, now look what you've done. Harold. You hadn't lost your temper again. Harold. Look. Why? What in the world? Look at all that money. Just look at it. Stuffed away in back of the clock. Hundreds. Thousands. Harold. Oh, Harold, darling. As you sit listening on Monday nights to Signal Oil Company's program, The Whistler, has it ever occurred to you how many millions of persons around the world have never even heard a radio? Missing a lot of pleasure, aren't they? Oh, but wait a minute. Before you start shedding tears for those folks, just consider the pleasure you yourself may be missing if you haven't yet tried new Signal gasoline. No fooling, folks. You'll never know how much driving pleasure there's left in your car till you try Signal's new super fuel. For new Signal gasoline is packed with performance that's so apparent you can actually feel it, see it, hear it. Here's what I mean. With new Signal gasoline in your car... When you touch the starter, you feel your motor spring instantly to life. When you step on the accelerator, you see your car step ahead with pickup that makes you proud. And even when your motor's working hard uphill, you hear it purr contentedly. Proof of signals higher anti-knock. What's more, because you'll be shifting less and shifting waste gasoline, you'll enjoy more high gear miles, actually go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. I know that's the kind of performance you'd like to enjoy from your car. And here's the easy way to get it. Just drive into one of the friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and say, fill her up with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. like a dream, isn't it, Harold? You and Muriel, kneeling on the floor of Sabina Fielding's old house, literally surrounded with the money that spilled from the old clock. Muriel's in seventh heaven, as you count it. She even called you darling, didn't she? You work automatically, sorting the bills, twenties, tens, fives, into small, neat heaps on the scarred hardwood floor. How much is it, dear? How much altogether? Wait, let, let me finish. I simply can't believe it. 80, it's like a dream. 90, 100. There, that's the last 100. How much altogether? It hardly seems possible. How much, Harold? Tell me. $50,000. Oh. 50000 in currency, small bills. It's probably been hidden away in this compartment behind the clock for years. $50,000. I never thought I'd see this much money all at once. The things we'll be able to do. All the marvelous things I've always dreamed of. All the clothes. Maybe go abroad. Who in the world? Harold, who can it be? I don't know. Who oh, can't let them in, all this money? We won't answer it. We won't let them in. Well, we'll have to. They can see the lights are on. But all this money. Well, stay here and hide it. I'll see who it is. All right, then. All right, but don't let them in. Nobody must see this money. Nobody must know we have it. Yes? Huh? Who are you? Looking for someone? I figured maybe the old lady fell asleep and couldn't hear me. Old lady? Sure, sure, the old girl, Mrs. Fielding. Oh, oh, well, uh, Mrs. Fielding doesn't live in this house now. Uh, now, wait a second, Oh, she doesn't Jack. live here now. She lives in town. Uh, who are you? My wife and I are running the house. Who are you? Well, I think you might do well to tell me who you are first. Okay. I'll come in and we'll talk things uh, over. Uh, no, no, please, uh, wait a minute. Now, listen, Jack. Look. You see, my, my wife is very ill. We, we can't have any visitors. I don't want to talk to your wife. I can't talk to you now. I'm very busy. Good night. Okay, mister. But I'll be back. So long. Who was it, Harold? Harold? Who was it? What did he want? Wait, wait. Or why are you snooping from behind those curtains? Well, I want to make sure. They... Yeah. Yeah, he's getting in his car. There he goes. There who goes? Who was it, Harold? Uh, uh, a man. Oh, uh, 
Did you set the clock up against the wall again? Yes, the glass was broken. I threw the pieces in the fireplace. Well, where's the money? I put it back in the clock. Who was it? Oh, I don't know. A fellow about my age had a red scar on his right cheek. He wanted to see Mrs. Fielding. He wouldn't give me his name. It's funny. Uh, he said he'd be back. What are we going to do about the money? We can't leave it there. Maybe we could... Harold, what's the matter? Hey, I think I know who he is. Muriel, what did Mrs. Fielding say about Richard Fielding? Something about money? He's dead. She said she was the last, don't you remember? I'm not so sure. That's the trouble. I'm not sure at all. Muriel, we may as well face it. It's not our money. It belongs to him. Don't be stupid. He's dead and she doesn't know anything about it. We found it. It's ours. For the first time in our lives, we have a chance to get off the treadmill and get somewhere. But it isn't ours. Besides, she needs it. She's going to die. We've got a whole lifetime ahead of us. But, uh, I don't know, Muriel. What if it is his? What if he knows about it? We don't know for sure that he's dead. We can find out for sure. How? Mrs. Fielding knows. We're going to call on her the first thing in the morning. <laughs> It's quite a problem, isn't it, Harold? You know it's wrong to take this money, but $50,000 is enough to set you staggering. Muriel didn't make that decision, did she? You would have made it all by yourself. Yes, Harold, there's only one thing that keeps you from taking it. The thought that someone else may be in on the secret. The man with a scar on his face, for example. You can't sleep all night thinking about him. And neither you nor Muriel stop for breakfast the next morning. At nine o'clock, you're both talking to Sabina Fielding in her furnished room in town. Uh, sorry, I can't be a better hostess. I'm feeling mighty poorly. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Fielding. We just thought we'd drop by and see if you were settled yet. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're so kind. I'm really very happy you came. I don't get many visitors, you know. No one cares much about an old woman. Of course, we don't want to tire you. Oh, fiddlesticks. <laughs> You're a little like part of the family now, living in my house. You do like my house, don't you? Oh, we're in love with it, Mrs. Fielding. It's a lovely old place. Oh, I'm so glad. You see, I didn't want it to go to anyone who wouldn't understand it. Houses are like people, you know. They have to be understood. Not everybody understands my house. It certainly has atmosphere. That uh, a clock is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Oh, you like it? It's always been my favorite. I'm happy you like it. I guess you understand my clock, too. Richard always wanted it, but he didn't understand it, so I never gave it to him. Why did he want it, Mrs. Fielding? Yeah, I never knew. Richard and I never got on together. Always said he had bad blood in him. Oh, he could have been such a nice boy. Handsome and strong. Until the accident, at least. Accident? Yes. He was never the same after the accident. He had it coming, though, Richard had. There was bad blood in him. I uh, I don't like to talk about my grandson. Uh, do you ever hear from him? I don't want to talk any more about him. No, no, not any more. Ah. Uh, would you have some tea? It's a little early, I wish but... you'd tell us about uh, Richard. Uh, have you uh, any uh, idea... Muriel, I'm afraid Mrs. Fielding's tired. We'd better be going. Oh, but well, I, I'm sorry to be this way. Uh, now, perhaps some other time, uh, when I'm feeling oh, better. Yes, of course. Yes. Well, come along, Muriel. <laughs> That convinced you, didn't it, Harold? It all fits. The scar on the face of the man who called on you last night ties in with Sabina's story of Richard's accident. Her remark about his fondness for the clock. It was too easy, wasn't it? Fifty thousand dollars isn't hidden in a clock and then forgotten. It's Richard's money, and he's bound to come back for it. There was no reason for tiring Sabina any longer. Muriel would have worn her out with questions. After all, Muriel isn't the kind who gives up easily. After you've arrived back at the house, she keeps it up, never letting down for a minute. Harold, of all the ass and There was nothing else to do. She would have told us if you hadn't... Sometimes I think you have the mentality of a child. What more do you want? She practically came right out and said it. He had money. He was in an accident. The scar, you remember? He always wanted the old clock. Could she make it any plainer? All right, all right. 
Joe, move. What are you going to do? We can't do anything. He knows the money's there. What do you mean we can't do anything? We can leave, can't we? When? Right now. Huh. That's a prize suggestion. Why, he could trace us in five minutes. We'd be in jail in a week. Listen, Harold. You've got a chance. For the first time in your shabby, ordinary little life, you've got a chance at something real. Are you going to throw it away? Well, I... I don't know. Sabina knows nothing about the money, Harold. There are only three people in on it. You and I and Richard Fielding. And he's coming back here. He said so. You'll probably never have another chance, Harold. What are you suggesting? Think it over, Harold. There isn't much more time. Yes, think it over, Harold. Is she right? You can see her point, can't you? You will never have another opportunity like this as long as you live. Just more of the same, day after day. Thousands more classified advertisements. Scrimping, pinching pennies, trying to make five dollars do the work of ten. And only Richard Fielding stands between you and everything you ever wished for. Only Richard Fielding. Uh, oh, what's that? Someone's at the door. It's too late. He's come back. Well, what are you waiting for? Let him in. Huh? He's getting impatient, Harold. Let him in. But but he's come for the money. Why, Harold, what's the matter? You said it belonged to him. I don't, I don't know, Muriel. Nothing else we can do, is there? We can't take it. You said so. We'd be traced. Oh, no, you're right. He, he can't take it away. It's the only chance we'll ever have. There's no other way, Harold. Or is there? Why, I... What do you mean, Muriel? He might be difficult, Harold. There's the poker beside the fireplace. Oh, no, I couldn't. All right. Give the money back to him. But it's mine. He can't. Harold, get hold of yourself. Muriel. Harold, get the poker. Yes, yes, Muriel. The poker. Yes? Hi, I'm... Uh... I'm back again. Hey, you remember me, don't you? I was here the other night. Sure, sure. I, I remember. Uh, what do you want? I'd like to come in for a minute. My car stalled outside. All right. Come in. Yeah, I uh, got this far from town, then my jalopy stopped dead on me. I, I didn't even know it was your house till I found myself on the steps again. Well, uh, come in the living room. I... Uh... I've been poking up the fire. Yeah, I noticed. Who is it, darling? Oh. Hello. Good evening. What's the matter? What are you looking at? Didn't you ever see a scar on a man's face before, Mrs. Phillips? How do you know my name? I've been in town today asking a few questions. He's the one, Harold. It's he. Now, wait, Jack. Now, Harold. Wait. But... <laughs> oh. The poker, Harold. Pick it up. I, I think I'm going to be sick. Pick the poker up. Put it back where it belongs. I, I've killed him. I've killed a man. Harold, stop it. Get control of yourself. I'm going to be sick. Stop it. I don't feel any better than you do, but it's done now. We've got to go through with it. I've, I've killed him. Maybe you haven't. you better see. Oh, no, I can't. You've got to, Harold. Think of all that money. He's out of the way now. We don't have to worry. See if he's dead. Well? Yes. Yes, he is. Go through his pockets. Oh, I can't. You've got to. See if he had a gun, his identification. There's an automatic and a shoulder holster. You see? He would have killed us. A wallet. Fifteen dollars in it. That's all. It has to be more than that. His identification. Oh, there's nothing else in it, Muriel. A handkerchief in his pocket. There's nothing in this. Nothing here. And that's all. Well, we've got to get rid of him now. Get rid of him? We can't leave him here. Take him out to his car. It, it's stalled. That was just an excuse to get in here. Where are those chains? Chains? The ones you had in the car, are they still there? Oh, yes, I think so. All right. Weight his body down with them and we'll drop him in the river. We can leave his car somewhere. Uh, He'll never trace him. No identification. And then what? And then we can take our own sweet time. You can give notice at the Express in the morning, and we'll leave town in a couple of weeks. You can say you've got another job. But the, the money... Don't worry about it. 
There's no one left to talk, is there? You've killed a man, Harold. It stopped you for a while, didn't it? But after that first wave of nauseating panic, you can think more clearly. The weighted body goes into the river, the car left on a lonely road. Then during the next few days, you try to appear normal at work while you wait for the news to break. It's hard to concentrate, isn't it? Mr. Gardner, your boss, has to call you on the carpet because of absent-minded errors you make in the daily classified section. The others notice you aren't eating at lunchtime. Five days, six days, a week. Nothing happens. They must have found the car. They couldn't miss it parked down the highway ten miles. Finally, you deliberately stroll into the city hall and look up Chief of Police Norton. Well, hello, Harold. Sit down, sit down. Have a chair. Thank Where you. have you been keeping yourself? Missed you at the lodge meeting the other night. Oh, I've been pretty busy. How about you? <laughs> Never a dull moment around here. You know, police work's funny. Yeah? Sometimes it gets so quiet you can hardly stand it. Have trouble keeping the men in line. Eh, you can hardly blame them playing around with traffic violations day after day. <laughs> men, all of a sudden, everyone gets so darn busy he wishes he had six hands. Yeah, look, like now, for instance. You got a handful, huh? Uh-huh. This is a quiet town, Harold. Too quiet sometimes, almost like a snake coiling up ready to strike. Last week, nothing but traffic violations. Well, maybe a bunch of wild kids breaking a store window somewhere. This week, stolen automobiles. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Just gave the story to one of your boys. That isn't all. We got a murderer on our hands. Huh? Uh-huh. Somebody right in town, too. Just like I was saying, Harold, it's a quiet old burg, but I suppose as long as people get together, there'll be murder. Hmm? Yes. Well, uh, uh what was it? Uh, who... uh, 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 just like all those nosy newspaper guys, aren't you? Sorry, Harold. We can't say anything until we get him. You, uh, got any leads? Sure. There's always leads. Don't worry. We'll get him. When we do, you'll know about it. Oh, excuse me. Norton speaking. Yeah. Fielding? When'd you find the body? Oh, gosh, that's tough. Huh? Well, yeah, Harold's right here. Just happened in. What's it got to do with him? What? Well, that's a funny one. Wait a minute. I'll get Phillips. Say, Harold, what did... Hello? He just ducked out the door. I'll get hold of him for you. Muriel. Muriel. Harold, what on earth? What's wrong? Don't ask questions. We've got to get out of here. What's happened? Norton's found out about Fielding. They found the body. What? Hurry. We've got to get away from here before he comes out here. Too late to run. Get the money. It isn't any use, Harold. Why not? If they found the body, they're sure to catch you. You can't hope to get away by running. Me? What, what do you mean, me? I'm not running away, Harold. You're an accomplice. You think so? Well, you're just as guilty as I am. Why, if you hadn't been so... Oh, no, you don't. It's your word against mine. I had nothing to do with it. You had everything to do with it. I told you I was tired of being married to a failure. You failed again, Harold. You even failed at murder. You won't get away with it. What about the money? What money? In the clock, the clock! I didn't know there was any money in the clock. And I'm sure no one will find any there, even if you tell them to look in it. You've hidden it. You've hidden that money somewhere else. Have I, darling? You're going to take it all for yourself when you're rid of me. That's why you said there was no hurry. You planned it this way, didn't you? Perhaps. Well, you won't get away with it, Muriel. You won't. I don't know how you can stop me at this point, darling. You see? That's Chief Norton at the door now. I watched him drive up outside while we were talking. Better let him in. Oh, no. Not until I've taken care of you first. No. Hell, no. Oh, I didn't get rid of Fielding's gun, you see. Hell, no. Please. Please, I, I didn't mean anything I said. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, let's take a look at a few of the new post-war products we've all been waiting for. 
According to news releases, the first of the new nylon hosiery will be of pre-war quality. The first new automobiles will be 1942 models with improvements added. But when it comes to gasoline, new signal gasoline, ah, that's another story. For new signal is not just pre-war quality gasoline, not just old-style gasoline improved but an entirely new type of motor fuel with performance features that until recently were reserved for war. You see, science has long known that gasoline is composed of molecules, and each molecule is an arrangement of atoms. The way those atoms are arranged determines how much power you get from the gasoline. Well, in old-style gasolines, the molecules were left just as nature made them. But recently, certain chemists found out how to take gasoline molecules apart, then rearrange the atoms in an entirely new way. The result is New Signal, an entirely new type super fuel with quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, and longer mileage. Because these are all features you can actually feel, see, and hear, we urge you to let just one tank full of New Signal gasoline talk for itself. Let its performance in your own car show you why New Signal actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now... Back to the Whistler. It was too late to do anything else, wasn't it, Harold? Too late to do anything but get even. And you did it very efficiently. Muriel, your wife, she's dead now, lying at your feet. As Chief Norton comes into the room. Harold, what got into you? You killed her deliberately. It doesn't matter. Good Lord, man, what are you talking about? You've committed a murder. Doesn't that mean anything to you? She was as guilty as I am. She was in on it, too, understand? She wanted the money, the 50000 She wouldn't give me any peace. When Fielding came back for his money... Fielding? What Fielding? Richard. It was his money in the clock. She made me kill him, Norton. She made me. He came to the house for the money? Yes. He had a scar on his right cheek? Yes, of course he did. Oh, will you drop it? I've had enough. Wait a minute. You've made an awful mistake, Harold. What? The man you killed was the murderer I told you we were looking for. He was Richard Fielding's partner in a bank robbery last year. Murderer? Yes. They quarreled over the money and he killed Fielding. When he broke out of the pen last week, they notified us. Figuring he'd check in here sooner or later. Yes, but... Down at your office. What were you talking about on, on the telephone? Sabina Fielding. She died last night. Sabina? Yes. But I thought... <laughs> Funny. I've always thought Sabina was a pretty good judge of character. She sure missed the boat this time. What do you mean? She must have taken a fancy to you and your wife. Left the house and everything in it to the two of you. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Leslie Edgley, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try New Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.